Hi everybody, I was just grabbing some water real quick. <clears throat> Uh, apologies if I at all sound a little stuffed or anything like that. I'm still <clears throat> on the tail end of recovering from sickness, so, you know, I might sound a little bit different. But, uh, anywho, <clears throat> let's get into it. Uh, so, let me go ahead and uh, sort of give everybody... A expectation of what to expect. Okay, yes, uh, somebody already uh, asked a good question. Uh, no, I will not be openly discussing spoilers in this stream. Let me describe what this stream is for and what it like what it is and like the general plan. Okay, so this is something that I only kind of want to do like a, a little bit occasionally, just in my free time, uh, as opposed to like some of my other stream series type things. Um, so this is sort of, uh, my plan is to stream, it, for those of you who don't know, Umineko is an eight episode series. Uh, each episode is like its own arc. Uh, it's like each episode is really long. Um, so my plan is over the course of maybe like four, five-ish streams, something like that, I am going to be going through the entirety of episode one. Um... Because episode one is like, I mean, obviously it's the beginning. And also by the time you reach the end of episode one, I think you will find out whether or not Umineko is for you or not. So 
Uh, there are a lot of people in my audience that have not read Umineko, and I have recommended it over and over and over and over again over the years. So my idea is basically like, I'm going to go through episode one, basically give everybody who hasn't gotten on board yet a taste of what Umineko is, sort of get them accustomed to the idea of the story and see if it's for them. And from there, after I finish streaming episode one, they can go off on their own and read the rest if they'd like. Uh, or if the streams do unusually well, then I may, may continue it in the future. Uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. But for now, this is just kind of an onboarding tool. Like for those of you who have not joined the Yumineko Club yet, uh, here is your excuse to do so. That being said, uh, no spoilers in the chat for anything past what we are reading, please. I'm being so serious about that. Do not spoil it for people. Um, I will be reading out the character voices myself, uh, as I usually do in my streams, so there's also that. And uh, lastly, uh, Umineko, for those of you who don't know anything about it, does have some pretty triggering content in it, some pretty sensitive content. In this episode in particular, we won't be getting into uh, some of the, the worst stuff there is in the series, but uh, just be aware uh, going forward, I will warn for specific things when they appear, but uh, Umineko, particularly even in just like the early parts, does heavily feature a uh, talk and depictions of abuse, uh, particularly with family members. Um, there's also just like some generally like eh, kind of gross anime humor in the early parts of the story as well, though it does become far more infrequent as it goes, thankfully, but... Uh, there's your general warning for that stuff as well. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll give more specific warnings when certain things come up, but just be aware that if you do badly with some of that stuff, you might want to skip out. And uh, trying to think if there's anything else that we need to get into before we start, but I don't think so. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, I think that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? <clears throat> oh, and obviously, uh, let me know if the audio is too quiet or too loud at any point. Episode one, Legend of the Golden Witch. Welcome to Rokenjima. The Golden Witch extends to you her heartfelt greetings. Before anything else, please make yourself at home. There is nothing to think too deeply about. Just be silent and take in the events in their entirety as they unfold. That is all that is asked of you. The difficulty level is standard. Let us at least begin on the trodden road. This story is undoubtedly nothing more than fantasy. It could not possibly have any relation to real persons, organizations, or events. <laughs> uh, Dull Sonic, wait, a visual novel has difficulty. Okay, so that's actually an interesting thing uh, that should be brought up about uh, the When They Cry novels. So the When They Cry novels do not have branching choices. Um, it is not like a visual novel that you actually need to uh, play. The difficulty here is referring to the difficulty uh, in terms of, like, solving the mystery, basically. Um, in terms of, like, comprehending the story material. Because these stories can get really complicated. So it's basically saying, this is how hard it will be for you to wrap your head around this. <clears throat> Thoughts on the Zero Escape franchise? I have not played it, uh, but I will, eventually. <clears throat> okay, let's go. You've been indulging in alcohol again, haven't you? The old physician let out a sigh as he removed the stethoscope. Two elderly men could be seen in the dimly lit study, which was filled with dust and a sickly sweet stench. In the corner of the room, which was much larger than what most people would call a study, there was an expensive-looking bed, a man undergoing a medical examination, and the physician conducting it. 
There was also what appeared to be a servant watching over the whole scene. The bottle is my friend. It is no less a friend than you, and has stood by my side even longer than you have. <laughs> no, there, there's not an English dub. It's just me. <laughs> the man who had bared his chest for the stethoscope spoke unapologetically as he straightened out his clothes. Kinzo-san, your body only appears to be well thanks to the effect of the medicine. However, if you continue to drink such strong spirits, the treatment will become meaningless. Trust my judgment. Temper your drinking. I thank you, though only for the sentiment, my friend. Genji, another glass. Water it down slightly. That way Nanjo can save face. Are you quite sure? After eyeing both the master who demanded the alcohol and his doctor who forbade it, Genji, the old butler, silently gave a slight nod and carried out his master's orders faithfully. Nanjo, the man's personal doctor, let out a deep sigh once again as he watched the butler busy himself alongside the liquor cabinet. There was a smell filling up the room. The sweet, poisonous aroma felt as though it melted the heart, if not the soul itself. It was the smell of that venomous green drink that the man couldn't bring himself to part from. Nanjo, you are my close friend of many years. I'm deeply grateful for all that you've done to keep me alive this long. I've done nothing. After all, you never listened to my advice as your physician. <laughs> and you never listen when I warn you about a mistaken chess move you're about to make. It seems we're even. My lord, thank you. I wouldn't die if I ran out of your medicine, but I would if I ran out of this. With one eye on Nanjo, who had his face set in a resigned expression, Kinzo took the glass that Genji was holding out to him. There are probably very few people who would associate the venomous color which filled the glass with an alcoholic beverage. Nanjo, be honest with me. How much time do I have left? Well, no. How short must I make it to get you to stop drinking? Nanjo once again let out a sigh of resignation. As he watched Kinzo down the glass, regardless, he spoke. You don't have much time. What precisely do you mean by that? Let us illustrate it with this chess game here. You're closing out the game quite well, but I do not ultimately see you cornering my king. Nanjo's gaze was directed at a side table with a stately chess set placed on top of it. Judging by the positioning of the pieces, the match was well into the endgame. The black rook and bishop were cutting deeply into the enemy lines. The white king had already been castled and cornered, so that even an amateur could see that the match would reach its conclusion before too long. Every time Nanjo came to a medical examination, both of them would make a few moves. Nanjo was stating with confidence that Kinzo would most likely fall into his eternal sleep before this game could be concluded. These were less the words of a physician than they were the words of an old friend. Were you a normal patient, I would recommend that you write a will at this point. And what is a will, Nanjo? Handwritten instructions to the vultures on how to devour and scatter my corpse. No, not at all. As the word suggests, it's a way for you to record your will for later generations. It's far more than just a means to divide up your inheritance. Oh. And apart from the division of the inheritance, what might I write of? Mm, there's your regrets, uh, matters you have left unfinished, uh, things you want to be passed down, and things you want to tell. Anything you want. <laughs> things I want to be passed down, and things I want to tell. Ridiculous. I, Ushirimi Akinzo, have not one thing I want to tell or leave behind. I was born with nothing. I will die with nothing. There is nothing I wish to leave to my foolish children. Even if the end were to come today, even if it were to come right now, I shall accept this fate of death without a trace of fear. Kinzo-san, I created everything. My fortune, my prestige, everything. Those were built up by me and they will be lost along with me. There is nothing I wish to leave behind. Nothing! After I'm gone, I care not if it all goes to waste. I desire no tomb, no coffin. Those were the terms of the contract I made with the witch. When I die, everything will be lost. 
That is the b that has been part of the promise since the beginning, and that's why nothing will be left behind. There is nothing I can leave behind. After reaching a furious crescendo, Kinzo suddenly slumped over. His expression was limp and feeble, as though an evil spirit had possessed him and then left. However, I do have one regret. I have nothing to leave behind, but there is one thing I cannot leave undone. You would do well to write it down. Of course, it would be best if you could finish it before your time comes. However, even if the worst happens, those who come after you will carry it to completion. You must leave behind your regrets so that they can be resolved, even if you are unable to do so yourself. That is the purpose of a will. When Nanjo tried to gently pat Kinzo's shoulder, the dying man flew into a sudden rage and batted away Nanjo's hand. That is no good! No good! No good! It must be done while I still live! At the moment of my death, my soul will be devoured by the demons of the contract and wiped out of existence! For me, there will be no peace or another world after death. That's why everything must be done before I go. That's why a will has no meaning for me. And if I had the time to write such a thing, if I had such time to spare, I'd want to see it. I'd want to see it one more time. I want to see Beatrice's smiling face one more time. Beatrice, why do you resist me so? I would return everything you have given. So, by the way, actually, let me interrupt myself real quick. Yes, this is how you pronounce her name. Uh, I know most people pronounce it Beatrice, uh, but it is the Italian pronunciation. So, <clears throat> th there you go. <laughs> that's just, that's how I'm going to say it. <clears throat> anyway. I would return everything you have given me right this very moment. I'm prepared to lose everything. So please, show me your smile what, just one more time. Beatrice, I beg of you. You must be able to hear this final plea. That's the kind of woman you are. I beg of you, show yourself to me! You're here, aren't you? You're standing there invisible, listening to every word I say. And even now you're mocking me from somewhere in this room, aren't you? Please, appear before me one more time and smile. Feel free to scold me even if snatch away my life by your own hands if you wish. I don't want to die alone like this. I cannot let myself die. Until I've seen your smile just one last time. Oh, Beatrice. Beatrice. I offer up this life of mine. I offer it up to you. I'm begging you. Beatrice. And uh, I think this is the last line before the OP. So let me just go ahead and uh, get some of these things out of the way temporarily. Enjoy the OP, everybody.
Welcome back. The first day, October 4th, 1986. Oh, I feel chills. Going back to this is so much. Uh, I love Humineko, dude. <clears throat> Whoa, things sure move with the times. I can't believe we'll be able to make the trip in just 20 minutes. Uh, I don't know if it affects anything, but I know Joe, Con Joe Corono got copyright issues from the OP. They played the Steam version, though. Um, yeah, I couldn't see anybody getting strikes for this particular song, but if it does get a strike, then uh, on the VOD, I'll just cut it out, unfortunately. Uh, if that's what happens, if you're watching the VOD and there was, like, a skip there, then that's probably what happened, but whatever. I just wanted everybody to hear the OP. What am I going to do? Cut out such a banger? <clears throat> I couldn't help but scratch my head and marvel at how far things had come in recent years. We used to go by boat. Back then, we were all forced to endure nearly half a day of swaying back and forth over the sea before we reached Nijima. Things have gotten so much more convenient these days. Still, I've never been on a plane this small. I've flown in a huge jumbo jet before, but this will be my first experience in such a tiny one. It's going to shake, isn't it? They say the smaller boats shake more, so I guess the same rule probably applies to planes. <sighs> Just spare me. <laughs> Don't worry, Bathurkin. It'll shake much less than the boat did. Yeah, is that you, George Oniki? <laughs> Don't scare me like that. You just shaved three years off my life. Anyway, what's shaking got to do with anything? Um, by the way, if you're wondering about the green text, uh, it gives you a little glossary, I believe? Yes, um, so if you didn't know, Aniki is a bro, older brother, and man senior to the speaker, so there you go. Uh, if anybody needs me to pull up those glossary terms whenever they come up, just let me know. <laughs> you don't think I'm actually scared of the plane shaking or maybe falling out of the sky or something, right? Oh, of course not. My mistake. I'm sure that you've changed a lot since we last saw you. After all, it's been six years since then. You're not a kid anymore. <laughs> Sheesh, and here you are old enough to smoke and drink. I've got no interest in smoking, but I've always wanted to try some booze. <laughs> well, if you got your dad's genes, I'll bet you can hold your own when it comes to drinking, right? Well, I usually drink for business rather than pleasure. It's pretty hard to do business in Japan without it. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, I was thinking I'd take my first shot at it tonight, at dinner. That's no good, Bathokun. You're still a minor. Drinking alcohol is known to stunt the growth of minors, and... Um, never mind. Come on, I'm tall enough already. In fact, it'd be easier to find clothes if I shrunk a little. I've puffed my chest out proudly. Until I hit my growth spurt, my height was below average in my class. But then I grew and grew, and before I knew it, I was over 180 centimeters. I guess I have all that muscle training and those shady mail-order performance-enhancing drugs to thank for that. Before then, I'd never dreamed that I'd shoot 10 centimeters above George Aniki, who'd reached his peak height early on. Damn, I'll bet my, all my relatives look, all say, Look at how big you've grown, Battler-chan, or something. Uh, worth noting that Battler is canonically 18, so he's a minor in Japan, but not necessarily in other parts of the world. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's just mostly referring to the fact that he's not old enough to drink. But, yeah. That kind of thing is really embarrassing, so I hope they can cut me a break. Anyway, my name, Battler. Well, it's pretty damn weird, don't you think? I've got to wonder what my parents were thinking when they gave me that name. Uh, uh, Horse Fry, uh, new OP. It's the, uh, OP of the PS3 version, so. I've never met anyone who could read it right the first time. I usually get called Sento-kun. Too bad, swing and a miss. My name is written <laughs> like this. <laughs> I can't read it. Can you read it? <laughs> no. <laughs> the first part of my family name, Ushiromiya. That's a fairly plausible Japanese pronunciation so far. The problem is my own name. Bat Batora is made up of the characters for fight and person, and it's pronounced Battler. Put it all together and you've got Ushiromiya Battler. Pretty crazy, right? It's crazy enough that my parents decided to call me that, but it's even more crazy that some government worker let them make it official. Both groups are at the top of my must-kill list. 
Anyway, this is one of my cousins. His name is <laughs> Ushiro Mia Joji, pronounced Ushiro Mia George. He's five years older than me, so he's probably turning 23 this year. Since the Ushiro Mia cousins consist of two boys and three girls, I ended up playing with George all the time. And because I've always thought of him as a big brother, I still call him Aniki today. Ooh, Batmakun, look at how big you've gotten. You know what they say, leave a boy for three days and you'll hardly recognize him. It must be in his blood, I suppose. Rudolph wasn't that tall either until around his high school years. Perhaps people end up taller if their growth spurt comes late. Nah, it's nothing special. A real man needs to be tough on the inside, too. Exactly. Batmakun here knows how it works. Real men win or lose based on what they've got inside. Can't ever forget to keep up your training and discipline. You do that, wait very alertly for the perfect moment, and strike. Now, even I, n even I never imagined that I'd become the company president I am today, master of my own domain. Yep, to think I've come this far after starting out penniless and ruined. This portly and slightly chubby man is George Aniki's dad, Uncle Hideo Hideyoshi. He's the husband of dad's older sister. In other words, we're not blood related. He's nice to children, sociable all the time, even quick to get out some spending money to us kids. Simply put, he's an awesome uncle. He speaks in an odd and very noticeable Kansai-style dialect seemingly of his own creation, but he's actually a natural-born Kanto man. Apparently, leaving an impression is everything in the business world. Speaking in a different style than other people is an act that makes him stick out more. However, I hear that he gets embarrassed when talking with an earshot of a real Kansai person, so he switches back to standard Japanese. I don't really get it, but he's definitely an interesting person. That is literally one of the funniest, like, tiny fun facts in Uminako to me, is that Hideyoshi is constantly faking his accent. <laughs> if only you weren't so quick to brag about your life story. That's enough for now, I think. I'm sure Batlerkun's getting tired of it. Aren't you? Nope, not at all. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I think it's pretty cool for a man to have some stories he can brag about. I don't have anything like that at all. Oh, really? I'd imagine a man with your looks would leave girls crying left and right, so I have trouble believing that you have nothing at all to brag about. No, 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 no. You're joking, right? Of course nothing weird like that's ever happened to me. In fact, if you know anyone, I'm all ears. Huh. I'm sure you do have some stories. <laughs> you must tell your aunt all about it later. After all, George never comes to me with anything of the sort. <laughs> this is my aunt and George Aniki's mother, Auntie Eva. She's my dad's older sister. She and Uncle Hideyoshi are a pair of jokers, and they've always teased me back as far as I can remember. This sometimes made them a bit hard to get along with when I was small. That said, I'm currently in the process of discovering that they're still hard to get along with. Even so, George Aniki's family is interesting and fun, and they seem to get along just fine. Sheesh. That's pretty much the total opposite of my family. Batlerkun, have you seen Rudolph, son? Huh? Uh, he headed off to the bathroom a while ago. Is he still not back? <sighs> Maybe the poor geezer dropped dead. Nom 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 nom. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're gonna have to bring up the, uh, <laughs> the, um, glossary for this one. So, uh, Derived from Namu Amida Butsu, a Buddhist prayer meaning I follow the Amida Buddha. It is also known as the Nimbutsu, often heard in contracted forms like Nanmaida or Namu Namu. It is recited to express mindfulness of the Buddha. After the passing of a relative, this sutra is often chanted to express thankfulness and knowledge that the dead have been allowed into, into Amida. <laughs> Amida's pure land, paradise. Most Japanese funerals are conducted as Buddhist ceremonies, and Japanese culture in general is full of rituals and religious customs, but it's common to participate in these traditions regardless of one's own personal religious belief. The country is largely secular. So. Uh, Lerf, Kyrie so hot for what? True. True. Why is she so hot? It's unfair. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> That's no way to talk about your own father. Still, this isn't the first time he's taken so long in the bathroom. Yeah, the guy's always been that way. Does he really have to take a magazine with him every time he needs to take a dump? Oh, what on earth might he be doing with those? <laughs> oh, you don't need to worry about that at all. As long as we're together, I won't let him do that on his own. <laughs> oh, I'll have to get the juicy details later. Sounds like Dad's got his balls in an iron grip. 
You know exactly what would happen with that man if I didn't keep a tight grip, don't you? Oh, no kidding. You're the only one capable of reining in that old bastard. As a son, I'm more than happy to let you take over. Yes, leave it all to me. After all, that's my specialty. This woman is my dad's wife. Her name is Ushiromi Akirie. As you can probably tell from our conversation, she's not my real mother. She's basically my stepmother. My real mom died six years ago. Kyrie-san is the woman dad married afterward. I mean, I'm not a kid anymore. It's way too late for me to start calling his second wife mom. And I doubt she feels like using the word son on this massive kid who's no relation to her at all. We aren't little kids. We know there's nothing to be gained by fighting. So we decided that we wouldn't force ourselves to pretend that we were family. I've decided to act a bit more frank with her, as though she's a friendly neighbor instead. It's much easier to just keep a little distance instead of forcing ourselves to act all close and making each other uncomfortable. curious has been very open about all of this, and thanks to that, we've been able to get along pretty well. As we were capitalizing on Dad being away in the bathroom to badmouth him, the man himself came back, wiping his hands with a handkerchief. Ugh. Badler. Hey, what's up, Dad? Uh, don't pinch my ear! Gah! So, you've been talking trash about me with Mom again, haven't you? What makes it so hard to show a little respect for your father, huh? Damn it, that hurts, you old bastard! Uh, stretch my ear all you want, I'm not gonna be able to fly! Ow! Come on now. Upwards, upwards, sideways, sideways, round in a circle, back the other way, multiplier maxed out, with an extra times two on top. Now say, Father, please forgive me for being so rude. <laughs> like hell I will, go find yourself some members-only store if you want it that much. Gah, let go! This old bastard is my dad. I think I'm pretty tall, but dad's about the same height. It's probably no surprise that Auntie Ava started talking about dad's blood when she saw my height. By the way, my height isn't the only thing I got from him. It seems having weird names runs in the family. Dad's full name is written... <laughs> like that. <laughs> Can you read it? <laughs> Not many could, I'll tell you that. That mess of characters is pronounced Rudolph. <laughs> he must hate Grandfather for giving him that name. Still, there's no reason to pass the weird naming tradition on to me. As the old bastard twisted my ear all over the place, Auntie Ava snuck up behind him and grabbed his ear. Hey, Rudolph. Don't take your frustrations out on your kid. Uh, that hurts, Aunt Eki. The scene before me was a perfect realization of the trope of the older sister who deals out punishment to her prankster younger brother despite his size. Uh, what translation are you using, Umi Project or Manga Gamer? I am using the Umi Neko Project translation, yep. I think that's good enough for now, Evane san. I'll make sure to stretch out his other ear later on. <laughs> My apologies. I must leave some pulling for you to do, curious son. Rudolph? Make sure Kyrie-san gives you lots and lots of punishment later on, all right? You're one to talk, Aoneki, bullying your little brother like that. hideyoshi Nissan, I'd like to thank you very much for picking her up. <laughs> if you hadn't been so generous, she'd still be unsold in the store. Fuck you, dude! <laughs> That's such a terrible thing to say about your own sister! Actually, uh, since Lerf is uh, also a Umineko head like myself... Um, I am going to make you a standard chat mod so that that way you can block spoilers if you see them. <laughs> you have my gratitude and apologies. Hmm? Who are you calling unsold? After taking two or three steps back, Auntie Eva unleashed one of her beautiful high reverse roundhouse kits, kicks, which stopped just a centimeter away from the tip of Dad's nose. After starting out with Tai Chi Chuan for her figure, Auntie Eva had then developed an interest in the Chinese martial arts. I'm pretty sure I probably butchered that pronunciation, forgive me. <clears throat> After that, she went through karate, taekwondo, kapera, and what's it lear she's learning now again? Well, anyway, they say a woman's weapons are in her lower body, and that's literally true for Auntie Eva. Rudolph. Did you know that a single direct blow to the side of the head like that would knock you unconscious? Not so long ago, I accidentally connected in a practice match and my opponent was out cold. Sheesh. What a pain. Guess I have to apologize for a tendency to lash out with their feet, too. Dad, completely unfazed, shrugged and smiled ironically at Uncle Hideyoshi. 
Never had a brother or sister myself, so when I see you two bickering with each other, it makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It sure is nice to have a big family and siblings. Huh, then why not consider making a little brother for Georgekin? He's already a fine adult who's about to go off on his own, so it might be a good time to have another child. Hey, I have a little sympathy for the new kid and all the pain and suffering he'd have to live through. I'm surprised even George couldn't turned out as well as he did after being born from this sinister sister of mine. And what an awesome kid he is. Please, share that with some of our blockhead of a son someday, will ya? That's not how it worked. It's thanks to Ava Nason's proper rearing that George Kun became the good, gentle kid he is now. Isn't that right, Nason? Oh, come now. Oh, come now. <laughs> you think so? Oh, George still has a long way to go. Uh, by the way, how's your little sister Anjie Chun doing? Is, I heard she was vomiting? Oh, that's right. And I was hoping to finally see her face after such a long time. Is she all right? She often catches a cold when the season changes. She's very frail. I did want to bring her along, but we decided to have my family look after her this time. I think that's a wise move. She'll be on the mend faster if she's not exposed to that toxic head house. A child's health is always more important than an adult's convenience, don't you think? I know some great medicine for vomiting colds like that. When we get back home, I'll send it over right away, so be sure to give her some. Thank you very much, Hideyoshi Nisan. I'm always in your debt. And once the conversation suddenly veered off in that direction, we kids didn't have any chance of butting in. For now, I'm just happy that Auntie Ava gave Dad just desserts for tugging on my ear. Looks like we're still waiting for the weather report. George Aniki pointed at the counter. The pending weather clearance sign was still stuck next to the scheduled departure time for the flight we were scheduled to board. According to Aniki, smaller planes are more subject to winds and other effects of the weather, and it's not at all uncommon for flights to be delayed because of that. Wait a sec. It isn't really going to shake, is it? From down here on the ground, it looks just cloudy, not windy. Well, I guess it's different up when, up there when plane, up where the planes fly, bleh. The weather's a bit uncertain today. Auntie Eva was looking at a TV in the lounge. The weather forecast was being broadcast, informing us that a typhoon was approaching the Kanto region. Typhoon again? Guess we're doomed to these with a family conference being October every year. Couldn't he choose a better season? I agree. I've always hoped we could have it sometime around the Obon Festival in mid-August. In that case, why don't you suggest that to Father and Nisan during the conference? Very funny. Why don't you do it yourself? My brother would never listen to anything I suggested. No way. It doesn't really bother me that, that much to have it in October. The one who, you were the one who complained about the typhoon, so I said ask them to change it then. That's all. I only said that typhoons always come around this time of year. You're the one who said you wanted to move it nearer to Obon. Well, you said it too last year. Didn't you say that it would be easier to fit it into your schedule if we had it near Obon? I never said anything like that. Oh, yes, you did. I certainly wouldn't forget something like that. No, I didn't. You're the one that's saying that all the time. Time. <clears throat> Are you aware? Stopping a kick just a hair's breadth away is a very high-level technique. Sheesh, women your age should be more proper than that. Dad and Auntie Ava's argument looked no different from a couple of brats bickering. I expect that's because although they normally act as mothers and fathers, they turn right back into kids again when they meet their old siblings at these family conferences. You're the one who looks like a real adult analyzing it all calmly. Hope I never turn out like that old bastard. I'd much rather end up as an intellectual adult like you, Aniki. Like me? <laughs> I still have a long way to go. I still have very little experience out there in the real world, and I need to work on becoming more bold and sociable. I think you far surpassed me on all those counts, Batlerkin. I'm sure you'll outstrip me fast enough when you become an adult. George Aniki scratched his head and laughed, as though trying to hide his embarrassment. Of course, he was just being humble. Aniki entered a university and became an apprentice at Uncle Hideyoshi's company at the same time, studying both academics and how to become a business emperor in parallel. Then, right after graduating, he got into Uncle Hideyoshi's company as his father's aide, piling up a lot of real-life experience as he devoted himself zealously to his work. He even had his, his grand dreams of one day standing on his own and becoming lord of his own domain. Aniki is a real par paragon of a man, sparing no effort as he strives towards his goal. How far am I going to read? Um, well, I, I don't, like, if, if you mean by tonight, like, I'm not sure exactly how far I'm going to read tonight. Uh, as for, like, in general, um... Uh, I said at the beginning of the stream, uh, basically the plan is to read up to the end of episode one over the course of several streams, 
uh, to just, you know, get people in who haven't ever read Umineko before. And if for some reason these streams do really well, then I might do more. So there you go. It's no exaggeration to say that I really respect him. And then there's me. I'm nothing at all like Aniki. I'm living my happy-go-lucky idle high school life to the max. I've got no dreams for the future. I'd just like to sit back, stay cool, and let the money flow in, but of course that could never happen. When Aniki was my age, he had already formed an impressive objective and had started devoting himself towards studying for that goal, so I guess I can't compare at all. Uh, the end of episode one will naturally include the tea party and epilogues, yes. Yep, it will. <clears throat> My dad just says, sure, you can study at my company, if you like cleaning toilets. Damn it, I'm not going to be in the debt of that old bastard. I'll find my way myself. I guess that intensity is my one qualification towards adulthood. Should I go on those one of, one of those self-searching journeys that are all the rage these days? Well, it's not like I could mooch off my parents for that kind of money. Hmm? Oh! Right then, Uncle Hideyoshi shouted out loudly. Uncle's a really nice person on the whole, but he does have a problem controlling the volume of his voice. When I looked over, I saw that he was greeting Auntie Rosa, who had come late. Oh, ho ho! If it isn't Rosa-san! Maria-chan, long time no see! Long time no see! Ugh! Maria, shouldn't that be, it's good to see you again? Greet your uncle properly. Hmm, it's good to see you again. There you go. Well said. How about some candy as a reward? Oh, huh? Yeah, where'd I put him? Rosa-san, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you too, Maria-chan. It's been too long, Kirie-ne-san. Hideyoshi-ne-san. And, oh my, butler -kun? Look at how big you've gotten. Uh, what's my favorite character? Um, my favorite character is probably Anje, honestly. Um, but like a close second would probably be like... <sighs> Mmm, maybe Ava? <clears throat> oh, come on. <laughs> it's embarrassing hearing that from every person I meet. Hey, Rosa, you're late. If the plane was on time, you'd have barely made it. I'm sorry. We had some trouble making our connection. Our train connection. So we're waiting on the weather yet again? Oh, don't complain. Uh, I can't give thoughts on Erica right now, because I, I don't want to spoil anything past episode one. Um, but I'll, I'll just say that I... <laughs> Erica... I like Erica. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say about her right now. But yeah, but please uh, no uh, big like spoilers for anything past episode one in the chat, everybody, because uh, I want this to remain spoiler safe for uh, people who have not read Umineko before. <clears throat> Oh, don't complain. I much prefer the 30-minute plane trip to spending six hours bouncing around on a boat. Even if we're kept here waiting for an hour, it's still much faster overall. Maria-chan's gotten huge, too. So, how tall are you now? <laughs> I have to keep stuff. Uh, okay, last last question I will answer for now. Who do you consider to be the most attractive? Uh, Cross Trash is on to something by saying Kyrie, but again, it actually does have to be Ava for me. <laughs> Huh. So, how tall am I now? Maria parroted Uncle Hideyoshi's question, looking up at her mother. I guess she doesn't remember her own height. She's probably right in the middle of a growth spurt, so her height must change every month. In just a few more years, she'll probably start looking very feminine. Um, how tall were you the last time you got measured? She just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Hey, it's me with the 1999 pounds. Hey there, hope you're doing great. Wanted to give you this. Just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm doing a little bit better. I'm um, uh, finally. I, I think within the next few days or so, I should probably be sickness free. But uh, we're we're making it. <clears throat> Don't you? Mm. I think she's grown a lot since last year. Let's see, she turned nine years old this year, didn't she? Nine years old. Hmm. That's right, you're nine years old now. Glad to see you're doing well too, Maria-chan. Uh, you... Uh, I guess you've gotten a bit too heavy to play, ra play airplane with. Georgianiki, what a rude thing to say to a lady. Here, I'll do it. Up you go. Hmm. 
When I went to lift her up in Aniki's place, Maria stiffened defensively, staring suspiciously at my face. Ah, that's right. The last time I met Maria was six years ago, and she was only three years old. Of course she doesn't remember my face. Maria-chan, don't you remember? It's Batlerkun. You used to play together, remember? Hmm. I doubt you have any luck. Last time she met Batler, she was only three. You don't keep memories at that age. She must know everyone's face apart from mine because she meets them every year, but I haven't had contact with the Ushirimiya family for about six years now. So it's no surprise that this nine-year-old girl doesn't have any memories of me. Even I can only just barely remember her being a three-year-old crybaby. Maria, this is Batler Onichan, Uncle Rudolph's son. Understand? Uncle's son is... Uh, uncle's... the son... Hmm? Uh. That ooh was probably the sound of her brain breaking, unable to understand the complicated explanation. I guess it was a bit too confusing for her. Maria Chung, this is Batherkin. He's your cousin, like me. Like George Onichan? Batler? Cousin? Hmm. That's right. You got it. This part of Aniki is what makes me really look up to him. For someone who isn't married, he's just great at dealing with kids. I'm sure he'll be an indulgent father in the future. Badler Onichan? Maria looked straight at me with a questioning expression, as though asking whether it was alright to call me that. Yep, that's me, Badler. Nice to meet you, Maria. Hmm, Badler. Maria, you mustn't address him without honorifics. Call him Badler Onichan. It's cool, Auntie Rosa. I don't sweat the small stuff. Right, Maria? We're buddies on a first-name basis, us two, aren't we? Battler! 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 <laughs> That's right! Maria! 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 <laughs> we horsed around for a while to make up for the six-year gap in our friendship. She probably still thinks, me as, thinks of me as nothing more than a big new friend, but things will probably work out as we get to know each other again. But I'm surprised. She's just the way I remember her being six years ago. Seems that people just don't change that much after all. I'm a bit happy that she's still the pure innocent girl I remember. Her name is written as... This. <laughs> that one's not so difficult to read. Of course, it says Maria. The third character looks like a cross, which is pretty cool. Her feelings don't usually show up on her face, so it can be difficult to know just what she's thinking, but that's just how she looks on the outside. On the inside, she's just a sweet, normal girl. Then there's Maria's mother, Auntie Rosa. She's my dad's younger sister. Rosa is written as... Yeah. Here's a name that's totally not Japanese. Sorry to say it, but her name's almost as ridiculous as Dad's. I've got to respect her for her not ending up as screwed up as he is. We'll see about that, Battler. <laughs> when I think about it, all the names in my family sound foreign. Just why is Grandfather so obsessed with this? Because of him, even us grandchildren have to put up with this weird naming sense. It's even more annoying since Grandfather's own name is perfectly normal. Anyway, there's one thing about Auntie Rosa that's a relief compared to the other family members. The old bastard and Auntie Ava have this annoying urge to tease and mock people all the time, but even though he share she shares their blood, Auntie Rosa isn't like that at all. She has the most common sense among the siblings. Like Uncle Hideyoshi, she's a kind aunt who's always been on the kid's side. However, possibly because she's more strict as a parent, she's not liberal with handing out spending money like Uncle Hideyoshi is. <laughs> so she's the worst. Zero out of ten, she doesn't give me money. That's the only reason. <laughs> All right, now we have the entire group of family members who were going to board the plane. As though it had waited for us all to gather, an announcement rang out throughout the lobby. Our apologies for the wait. Boarding will now commence for flight 201 to Nijima. We ask that the passengers please form two lines in front of the counter behind the white line. Rosa, you still haven't gone through boarding procedures, right? Hurry up. Oh no, Maria, come on. Uh. We had to go through a metal detector before going out onto the runway. Our small, plane w our small plane wasn't as massive as an international flight, but it was still a plane. A staff member holding a metal detector checked us all. Once all of us cleared the check, we followed the staff member out onto the runway. Come to think of it, everyone here is in the Ushirimiya family. It's like this is a reserved charter flight or something. Our group stopped in front of the entrance to the airplane. Then, our guide turned around and spoke, looking down at the passenger list as she did. Boarding will now commence. As I call out the names on the passenger list, please take your seats in order, starting from the front row on the right side and going to the, right to left, then on to the next row. I will now begin reading the passenger list. Ushiromiya Hideyoshi-sama? 
Oh, I'm first. Right here. By the way, you have the candies, Ava? I've been looking all over for them, but I can't find them. Ushirimiya Ava-sama. They're in my handbag. I'll get them once we're inside the plane. I've heard that the candies are a good way to protect your ears from hurting due to variations in atmospheric pressure when landing or taking off. That's probably what they're talking about. Hope I can get a window seat. <laughs> Don't worry. There aren't any other kinds of seats. According to George Aniki, there are apparently only two lines of seats. Yep, it's a small plane, all right. It isn't really going to shake, is it? Ushirimiya George-sama. Right here. Don't worry about that, Kun. It won't shake too much. Ushirimiya Battler-sama. Uh, Aniki, how much is not too much? You could just swim if you fall from a boat, but if a plane crashes, you're screwed, right? Well, we all get our own parachutes in our seats, don't, don't we? Wait, we don't? Ushirimiya Rudolph-sama. Come on, Battler, quit being a wuss and get in. Ow, Dad! Don't push me! We don't get parachutes! Ushirumiya Kyrie-sama. Alright, stop fooling around. Let's move along. Ow, Kyrie! Don't push me! This blockhead isn't moving forward! Ushirumiya Maria-sama. Ugh! Forward, forward! Ushirumiya Rosa-sama. Maria, keep quiet. This is your pilot, Kawabata. We'd like to thank you for taking New Tokyo Aviation's Flight 201 today. We estimate the flight to Nijima Airport will take about 20 minutes. We're receiving reports of atmospheric tur turbulence. There might be some shaking of the aircraft, so we ask you do not unfasten your seatbelts after takeoff. Uh, Aniki, did that guy just say we needed to wear seatbelts? In a jumbo jet, they let you undo them after takeoff. So it's gonna shake so much we can't take them off? Damn it, you tricked me! It is gonna shake after all! Where are the parachutes? I knew I shouldn't have taken the boat! Battler, please. Oh yeah, we get the uh, the Hollywood style opening crawl with everybody's names like they're actors. <laughs> oh. Uh, but yeah, um, obviously, since I, I think it should probably go without saying, since I've used it so much and so often in all of my videos. But uh, yeah, do do listen out for the soundtrack. It is so peak. Um, actually, I'm going to turn it up just slightly. Um, and you guys like tell me if it's too loud and if it, or if it like starts to drown out my voice at any point. Um, but yeah. It is like the soundtrack of all time. It's it's really good. And you're just like hearing the like, I mean, not that this stuff isn't good. It is. But like you're just hearing the beginning of it right now. Um, it gets like crazy good as it goes. I'm going to turn it up just a tiny bit more. Anyway, again, let me know if uh, I get drowned out at any point. <clears throat> I should have taken the boat. The boat. Gonna fall. Gonna fall. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Maria, that's enough. But what a surprise. I thought there was nothing that could scare Battler Kun. <laughs> this guy can't handle vehicles for some reason. Always yells about falling and sinking and stuff. You're a disgrace, my man, you are. Ah, oh, shut up. The thing was seriously shaking way too much. I just got a little stressed since it was my first time on a small plane like that. You call that a little stressed? <laughs> Sounds like it'd be fun to take an overseas vacation with you, battler -kun. Would you like to go to Egypt with your aunt? You'd get to ride on a plane for a full 14 hours. <laughs> That's a good plan. battler -kun, you should let Ava Nason toughen you up some more. But boy, were you hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, everybody's got their own strong and weak points. It's bad to laugh at them. <laughs> D Dad, you're laughing too. Hey, Maria chan, you shouldn't laugh anymore. I shouldn't laugh anymore? Huh. Yeah, damn it. 
Is being scared of planes really such a big deal? Everybody obviously thinks I'm a big oaf now. <laughs> Enforcing toxic masculinity, my favorite. Oh no, yeah, the Yoshiro Mia family is so screwed up. Like, just even in like the smallest incidental ways, they are so not normal. <laughs> We split up and took separate taxis from the airport to the harbor. From there on, we would be taking a boat to the island. The islands are right next to each other, so it's not that far. It would be a leisurely 30 minutes by boat. As we arrived at the pier where the boat to the island was anchored, we saw a silhouette waving its hand. Oh? Oh, is it? Jessica! George Nissan! It's been so frickin' long! Ah, uh, Jessica-chan, it's been a year since I saw you. You've gotten taller again, haven't you? <laughs> Don't give me that. It's embarrassing hearing that every year. Hey, Aniki, you've got to be kidding me. That's really Jessica? Wait a sec, George Nissan, this massive beast is Battler? We both stared each other down. She definitely didn't look this grown up in my memories, but I do remember her crazy way of talking. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, go ahead and look at the, the thing about this real quick. So, uh, Jessica's way of speaking. In Japanese, men and women traditionally, or perhaps stereotypically, speak differently, and this difference is much larger than what you find in English. Jessica's speech is masculine, blunt, casual, and assertive. In Japanese, this is quite evident in a majority of her lines using assertive and traditionally male particles like ze and casual, slangy contradictions. Um, or contractions, rather, sorry. Um, the other thing about Jessica uh, and, like, the whole Zé thing, I think, is, like, it is also kind of a reference to Marisa from Toho, which she is modeled after. There is a scene in Episode 2, actually, uh, the original version of Episode 2, uh, not the console port, where she sings a <laughs> Toho fan song, basically, and she is cosplaying Marisa. They have to replace it with something copyright-friendly in, uh, in the ports. But, uh, yeah, so... That's also a funny thing. <clears throat> but yeah, she's uh, she's very tomboyish. Yo, Jessica. What's this now? You're kidding me. You look like a woman now. Uh, sh shut up, Battler. Shut up, Battler. Shut up, Battler. We're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna go past that. Hey, screw you. I'm a blushing flower of 18. Just like hairs grow out, so will other stuff. You think I got yeah 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 yeah? And what about you? Going back any anything to back that up that that back up that ridiculous size? Did you remember to grow any actual muscle? You better believe it. I'll show you how much training I've piled up since back then. Oh cram it! I'll beat you at your own game. This headstrong girl's name is Ushiromiya. <laughs> Japanese symbols. She wasn't born under the same unlucky star as me, sharing the same kind of weird name. Uh, have they read all of Umineko? How far in the Umineko did they get before? Oh, me? Um, no, yeah, I've read the entirety of Umineko. This stream is for the benefit of people in my audience who have not read it. No, no, Kelly, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. No, we're not, we're not gonna do that. No, please. No, please. You see, this is pronounced Jessica. She's dad's older brother's daughter. That older brother happens to be the eldest son of the Ashiramiya family, so I guess that also technically makes Jessica a direct heir to the Ashiramiya family. Since Jessica and I are the same age and had that type of boy-girl rivalry between us, we've always been used to fighting and joking around together whenever the relatives gathered. Jessica grew more quickly. Oh, you're asking if it was going to happen. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's just, it's just like squeaky anime humor. Um... Which is more common in the uh, first couple of episodes of Umineko than it is later on. It gradually kind of starts to disappear, thankfully. <clears throat> so when we scuffled as a contest of strength like this, it usually went Jessica's way. So even though I clearly understand that I'm bigger now, I still feel like I can't win against Jessica with my strength. <clears throat> Whoa! What, what are you getting all serious for? Ow, ow, ow! Hey, 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 this is nothing. Jessica, you've gotten weak. Shut up. I'm a woman over here, believe it or not. No way I was always going to be stronger than a man. Well, that's certainly true. The meat I put on all my arms all went to your chest after all. Shut up, Battler. Looks like it'd be a pretty even test of strength between my... Shut up, Battler. <laughs> I just, I can't with these two right now. 
D stop. Just... <laughs> anyway... Honestly, I was so surprised at how feminine Jessica had become that I had to seriously horse around to hide it. Well, yeah, considering what a bossy brat she was six years ago, anyone would be surprised. And I guess she's just as surprised. She definitely wasn't expecting me to, l to lose to me in a test of strength. After losing that easily, she must be shocked at how much I've grown in the past six years. Six years. Once again, I'm being shown what a huge gap of time that was. Crap. Total defeat. It's like I'm not a match for you anymore. That's not true. Even Balthorcon must have his weaknesses. Right, Maria-chan? Ooh! Gonna fall! Gonna fall! Uh, don't, Maria. Uh, let's keep that a secret, okay? Fall? What the hell is that? <laughs> Sorry, but you won't be seeing that weakness of mine now. After all, the nightmare plane trip is already over and done with. Only thing left is the nice, quiet splashing of the boat trip. Never thought I'd become so fond of that piece of junk boat. <laughs> Huh? George Nissan, is there something wrong with his head? Yes. You'll understand soon. That face! <laughs> George, like... Chat, he doesn't know. <laughs> Very soon. <laughs> At the time, I didn't understand what Aniki meant by that big smile. What have we here? Oh, Butler-san, how big you've grown! Who is it this time? It's an old lady with an apron. Oh. Oh, yeah, that takes me back. I remember now. Remember her, Bathurkun? You remember. She's Kumasawa-san, one of the servants. I could never forget Kumasawa-ba-chan. I mean, you haven't aged a bit in these past six years. Wait, you haven't gotten younger, have you? <laughs> Lately, my skin's been getting smooth, all smooth and silky. And look, hasn't my chest gotten even bigger as well? What? <laughs> yeah, she's she's like screwing with him because he's been such a little shit. <laughs> uh, very funny. My, yeah, 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 okay. Even, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> God, give me a break. I'm, it's chicks I'm looking for, damn it. Not grannies. The jokes I'd cracked about Jessica were being used against me. Come to think of it, she was always the type to tease people. Kumasawa-san, stop that for now. People with one foot in the coffin shouldn't jump around. To sport with the young is the best rejuvenation medicine. <laughs> it's rare for you to come pick us up, Kumasawa-san. What curious turn of events is this? Normally, whenever you're entrusted with something to do, something to do, your lumbago always kicks in. <laughs> Ava-sama, you're as harsh as usual. I found myself with some urgent purchases to make. While I was at it, I thought I would come welcome you all. It does give a bad impression if the one waiting to greet you is a decrepit old woman. <laughs> Auntie Ava spoke sarcastically, but Kumasawa Bachan's years of experience was nothing to sneeze at. She was more than capable of smoothly and coolly letting that comment slide. Well, I'd rather not say it, but old Kumasawa Bachan may be past her prime as a servant. She might act as though she's in good health, but between her headaches and the lumbago, her body's wearing out. To tell the truth, the very fact that she's still working is impressive. How old is she this year again? She must be pushing 80 by now. It's incredible that she's still able to act so brightly. You seem to get more and more lively. Oh, that's right, here you are. Um, it's the tea I was talking about before. Look, I bought some. And please do try it later on. Auntie Rosa showed her, the, show, showed her the souvenir bag she'd taken out of her suitcase. To think that she had, had, to rem had remembered the promise that she had apparently made last year and faithfully bought it. This sort of thoughtfulness was just like Auntie Rosa. She wasn't the kind of person who would forget or break a promise. As for Kumasawa Bachan, she seemed deeply touched by the fact that not only had Auntie Rosa remembered that year-old promise, she had brought that gift for a simple servant like her. This woman is Kumasawa Chiyo-san. She is a senior servant who's been working for the Ashiramiya head house for many years. As you could expect from someone her age, she isn't that good at manual labor, for, but from kitchen work to cleaning and laundry, she's a kind and super servant who can handle just about everything. It seems her only flaw is a t tendency to slack off. I hear she tries to get away from heavy or troublesome work by playing up her chronic diseases. In Kumasawa Bachan's case, maybe we should call that a sort of lazy craftiness, though it probably doesn't impress those paying her salary. Ah oh well, even if she's pretty flaky when it comes to work, I could never dislike her. I guess that's probably because of her cheerfulness and her constant smile. Hey, glad to see you're still in fine spirits. How's your back doing then? 
Even with the medicine, it's not getting one whit better. According to the doctor, nothing can be done for this one. It's what they call an incurable disease. <laughs> Blows me away how you keep getting prettier, Jessica-chan. Be glad you ended up like Natsuri Nesan. Really? Personally, I don't think I look like her at all. I mean, I don't even want to be like my I don't even want to be like my parents. Will I ever do an Umineko character tier list? Uh, maybe? But it would be kind of hard to, because I love them all so much. I mean, they're all also terrible people, but like, you know. Because I got zero respect for him. No, no, you shouldn't say such things. <laughs> it's amazing how many people don't want to be like their parents in our family. Uh, that's me! Hell no, don't you start, dare start taking after me. Your nose looking like mine already pisses me off. What are you talking about? It's ridiculous how completely alike you are and like your father. Come on, you can't be serious. Just how am I like Dad? Your co his copy and arrogance and self-importance. Father's blood's especially strong in you, Nissan. Wouldn't you say, Rosa? Oh, absolutely. Krauss Nissan and Rudolph Nissan are almost unbelievably like Dad. They don't seem bad to me from what I've seen with the first hour. Oh, don't worry. Uh, everybody gets a lot of fleshing out, <laughs> as we shall say. All right, all right, already. Why am I the only one under fire from the girls? Hideyoshi Nissan, please help me out. My, my, Rudolph Kuhn, you're always so popular with the ladies. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> as usual, you're popular enough to make me jealous. Well then, everyone, shall we head over to the boat? Come now, Maria-sama. Son, let's get on the boat together, all right? Get on the boat together! Ooh! Everyone gets on together! Mmm! Hell yeah. This time around, I'm not gonna be scared. I'm used to being shaken by the waves. With that piece of junk fishing boat, I'm less afraid of the shaking than the engine breaking down and the boat drifting off. Oh yes, Bathurkun, I forgot to tell you. That fishing boat was completely decrepit, so it was taken out of use a few years ago. Now we get taken to the island in another boat. Oh, right. Battler's first, it's Battler's first time on the new boat. It's super comfy. And freaking fast. It can go at crazy high speeds. Oh. That means less trip time, right? That sounds great. I mean, a boat might be better than an airplane, but if you're telling me we can spend a you know, little less time exposed to the danger of sinking, that's really just awesomely great. Hmm. Oh. Is Battler gonna fall, gonna fall again? That's only on airplanes. Everything's fine now. You know, it's apparently a modded high-speed boat, the captain's pride and joy. Seems he's tinkered with it quite a lot. He was going on about how he attached four high-efficiency propellers to it, and how it can break 40 knots or something like that. He bragged to me so much I ended up memorizing it. Me too. I remember since we're told about it every year. The captain said that he lost a speed contest with a foreign fishing boat a long time ago and became obsessed with modding. He told us how his opponent back then could go over 30 knots, even though it was only in a fishing boat. To fulfill his first thirst for, for a revenge match, he created an awesome new, whole new super high-speed modded boat. I'm sure you'll just love it, Battler. Super high-speed modded boat? My first thought with this was that this would be much better than some beat-up boat that might sink at any time, but for some reason, I'm getting this feeling of foreboding. Nah... <laughs> hey, Battler, maybe you should just swim to the island. Battler, can you shouldn't lean over the railing too much. You might fall. Uh -huh. Gonna fall, gonna fall. Damn it! So this is why you were all grinning before! The super high-speed boat, said to have been modded to hell and back by its captain as a personal hobby, was definitely nothing like the battered old fishing boat from six years ago. Whoa! It's shaking! It's shaking! I'm gonna fall! Gonna fall! Gonna fall! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Gonna fall! Gonna fall! Gonna fall! If I fall, I'll be in the sea! I'll drown! God damn it! Where's the parachute? No, wait! Where's the buoy? Give me a life jacket! <laughs> what the hell, Battler? What's that supposed to be? <laughs> Jessica-chan, Maria-chan, it's not nice to tease. Battler-kun, if you're scared, then just don't come out on the deck. I think that if you stay inside the boat, you'll be a bit less afraid. <laughs> That's a no thank you, Aniki. Shipwreck victims are always the one inside the boat. The survivors are usually those on deck during the accident. So I'm staying right here. 
But it's shaking! I'm falling! Whoa! <coughs> Jesus Christ. Shaking! Falling! Whoa! Maria, I told you to behave yourself. But, Butler Kun, it looks like you really can't handle it. I'll go tell the captain to slow down for you. Whoa, Auntie Rosa, thank you! Even on the sea, exercise safe driving, reduce speeds, point and call! <laughs> Don't do that, Rosa. Ordeals are necessary for the young. Right, Battler Kun? You can conquer this much, no problem, right? Other otherwise, you won't be able to go to Egypt with your aunt. Whoa, Auntie Ava, you're mean! Oh no, I'm gonna fall! Life jacket parachute! Whoa! <coughs> God doing the like. Eh. No, no, it, turn it over and think that way. What's the enemy aiming for? He wants to make me afraid like this. If that's what he's aiming for, too bad! Like hell, I'll be scared! But stop it, I'm gonna fall! Uh. No, you're not crazy for liking the OG art. I think it's very charming. I had to take a drink of water. Anyway, uh, somebody mentioned in the chat too, like, um, reading uh, Maria as autistic. Yes, that is a very, very common read of her character. And also, honestly, even if they don't, like, say it outright, like, with that word in particular, I'm pretty sure that, like, it pretty much just is, like, canon. Um, were you able to play the HD version of this? Uh, it is called Umineko Project. If you look it up, you can find it. Um, it is, uh, like, basically to be able to legally own it, you have to own a Steam copy of the game and a copy of the PS3 Japanese version so that you can get the code to unlock the RAR file that they give you, but, you know, you can, um, you can look around for ways. <clears throat> but yeah, um, this kind of stuff, like the screen shaking and other, like, weather effects and stuff like that that are included in the project version are not included in the base Steam release, so... That is why it is different. <clears throat> so, after I made a huge fool of myself for a while, Auntie Rosa had a talk with the boat captain, and he slowed down to a more manageable speed for me. <sighs> speed is a bit better. Earlier, I didn't even feel alive. The new, sp the new speed, which I was capable of toler tolerating, was apparently extremely slow. But that just now was completely insane. The whole boat was shaking, sliding and leaping on the ocean's surface, Felt like I was riding on the back of a flying fish. Jessica was still guffawing at me as I leaned over the railing, tired and disheartened. I lost in that strength contest earlier, but I'm glad to know that I got the edge where it really counts. But seriously, <laughs> Damn it, go ahead and laugh. One of these days I'm gonna find your weakness and I'll get back at you, and I'm not gonna read that line. We'll see about that if you ever do find it, okay? <laughs> mm. Butler, all worn out. Yeah, Butler, all worn out. I want to die on land, not in the ocean or the sky. Maria was patting my back, so I patted her head in return. Her expression was blank as usual, but I realized she wanted to console me. Butler, can the captain's throwing drinks in to make up for this. I don't know. Like, I really don't know why so many of those jokes are in episode one. I think it's just like... The typical, like, oh, we have to have a bunch of anime humor to draw in, like, the people who, like, read, you know, um, like, really skeevy dojins or whatever. But, like, again, thankfully it does lessen as time goes on. Um, and Battler gets a lot better, thankfully, as well. Uh, I like Battler, I just don't like his pervy anime jokes, but, you know, uh, disregarding that, I think he's okay. <laughs> to calm yourself down. George Aniki and Kumasawa Bachan brought us each an ice-cold drink with the drops of moisture on the can. Judging from Kumasawa-san's big grin, our parents inside the boat were probably all rolling around laughing at my moment of pure terror. Damn it, I'm so embarrassed that I can't bear to face any of them. If I didn't change the subject somehow, I had the feeling I'd be the butt of everyone's jokes for the whole trip, so I tried to think of something harmless to talk about. Thing is, I played VNs that actually have like better sexual humor than this, since they actually attempt to make jokes. That's true. Uh, it it definitely does. Uh, like I'm, it's when I say that, that's not to say that like all of them uh, are like that bad or anything. It's just yeah, it he's 
yeah. <laughs> Unfortunate, but, uh, you know, such as it is. Hey, Jessica, how are Uncle Krause and Aunt Natsuhi doing? My old man and my mom? Unfortunately, they're fine. Though every other word of their, out of their mouths is steady, 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 which pisses me off. I'm so jealous, because it looks like Uncle Hideyoshi or Uncle Rudolph say that- don't say it- doesn't look like Uncle Hideyoshi or Uncle Rudolph say those kinds of things. <laughs> oh no. When I was slacking off during exams, I was always getting told exams, exams. I thought it was annoying, but now I'm grateful. <laughs> I knew it. George Aniki is as magnanimous as ever. As for me, I have to look after myself. No one says a thing to me. Well, it's not like I'd listen if they did. <laughs> battler son, have you still not returned to your birth home? Well, I kind of go back now and then. I still have lots of clothes and stuff left at the previous house. Huh? Battler has two homes? Uh... Hmm. Uh, something like that. Why? Why do you have two homes? Huh? Hmm? Huh? Hmm? Only Maria, who couldn't really grasp the situation, voiced her naive question. However, the others just shot nervous glances at me, choosing not to respond, even though they knew the answer. Maria, look, you can see the harbor now. Look over there. Can you see it? Oh, saw the harbor, saw the harbor! Apparently, Jessica was trying to be nice by changing the subject. Oh, uh, well. I'd rather not talk about it if I can help it, but it's uncomfortable to have it treated like some kind of weird taboo. I don't mind that much myself anymore. I am an Ushiramiya. But the truth is that for the past six years, I've been living with my grandparents on my late mother's side, and I've even been using her family name. When those grandparents passed away one after the other, I basically had no choice except to go back and live with the old bastard. Don't get me wrong, I didn't just run away from home or anything like that. The only one f at fault here is my dad. I don't really blame Curious on being able to hold that old bastard's reins and write him out is no mean feat. But as for the betrayal that that old bastard inflicted on my mom, well... Unfortunately, I still haven't fully gotten over that. <clears throat> we'll be getting there soon. George Aniki cleared his throat, trying to change the topic. Please forgive my indiscretion. It seems this old woman has said too much already. If I've hurt your feelings... <laughs> I don't mind it. No one's feelings are hurt. Don't worry, Kumasawa Bachan. Kumasawa-san seemed to regret speaking out of turn, but I was far more concerned about being worried over for something like that, so I stood up and passed it off lightly. After that, I had a sip of my drink and headed over to Maria and Jessica, who were gazing at the silhouette of the island. Ooh, Battler, saw the island, saw the island! There, there, there! Ooh, ooh, ooh! Where is it? Oh, I see it now. Even after six years, the island hasn't changed a bit. The small island silhouette in front of us had gotten pretty close. The island's name is Rokenjima. It's a small island about 10 kilometers around, located in the Izu Archipelago. Since they call this archipelago the Izu Seven, lots of people think there are seven islands, but that's not true. There are actually more than seven. Rokenjima is one of the minor islands that don't get counted, even considering that there are probably very few people who know about this island. After all, only the people of the Ishiromiya family come to this island. In other words, it has no ties whatsoever to outsiders or tourists. So you'll never find this island's name in a travel brochure. This is all because of Ro all this is because all of Rokenjima is an estate possessed by the Ushiromiya head house. One only the Ushiromiya family lives there, and only people connected to the Ushiromiya family come and go there. There's nothing there except a harbor and a mansion. The vast majority of the island is still just uncultivated forest. Such a waste when it could be made into a nice golf course. However, when you realize that the entire coastline is a private beach, it starts to sound pretty magnificent. You might have realized it by now, but to put it simply, well, the Ushiromiya family's just rolling in the dough. The fortune possessed by the head house is apparently vast, and Dad the other, and the others who make up the branch families have built up plenty of wealth for themselves, finding success in their respective businesses. I've been living a commoner's life in my grandparents' home these six years, so I'd completely forgotten but the old bastard's house really is elegant, and everything about it is tuned to match the snobbish tastes of the annoyingly rich. Come to think of it, I guess that means George Aniki, Jessica, Maria, and I are all wealthy, high-class gentlemen and ladies. Needless to say, none of us feel that way at all. I don't see myself as being rich, and George Aniki, who takes self-discipline very seriously, doesn't let himself get too comfortable. Jessica's always complaining that she'd rather move to the city than be rich, and Maria's still a kid who isn't even interested in money at all. I guess that attitude itself is snobbish. 
from the perspective of people in poverty who can't pay the bills, we're very lucky to even have the luxury of thinking this way. This isn't the place to explain any further, so I won't. Anyway, it's the same as not being able to choose the parents you're born from. I didn't ask to be born into a rich family, and I don't think it's something I should be hated for. It can be pretty trying when people are prejudiced against you just because you're rich and refuse to judge you by your merits. As I pondered these sentimental thoughts, Maria leaned over the railing and started shou shouting, Fuck the rich! Ah! <laughs> What's wrong, Maria? Did you drop something? Mm -hmm. Gone, gone! Mm -hmm. Maria kept yelling, gone, gone. From her words alone, you would think she had perhaps dropped something, but she was actually pointing out over the ocean as she shouted. What's wrong? What's gone? I'll look for it too, if you want. What is it? Hmm? If she dropped something, she would probably have looked down at the floor, but Maria was pointing over at the ocean. One would assume that she had seen something out over the ocean, but she kept saying that something was gone. Strange. How would I rate Umineko out of 10? Um, well, I mean, like, no piece of media is perfect. Every piece of media has problems, but I'd say it's like a strong 9. <laughs> huh? If I remember correctly, wasn't there a tori or something on the top of the small crag around here? Um, this one is a bit of an easier one to explain. Um... Tori is a ceremonial entry gate to a Shinto shrine. It usually is red and has a very recognizable and prominent square shape. If you've seen that shape before, consisting of two vertical or slightly inward tilted pillars joined by two extended horizontal bars, one crowning the pillars and the others just below. Sometimes many Tori are used in series along a path. So that's what they're referring to. Uh, yes, Maria is definitely super heavily autism coded uh, and it is intentional. That's right. It was definitely there. I remember it well since it's a landmark. The first thing to greet you as you get closer to the island. Wow, you're amazing, Battler. Even though it's been six years, you remembered. It was here, wasn't it? I remember too. There used to be a shrine and a Tory-like thing standing all alone on that crack. And now that you mention it, they are gone, aren't they? They definitely were there last year, I think. Gone. Gone. <laughs> Maybe they were washed away by the waves or something? It was a small crag. It probably got brittle because of its exposure. I think so, too. It actually disappeared during the summer. Apparently, a huge lightning bolt fell one evening and smashed the shrine or some such. The fishermen whisper that it must undoubtedly be an ominous sign to have a thunderbolt fall upon our tutelary god. Lightning be gone, lightning be gone. Kumasawa-san smiled impishly as if teasing us, rubbing her hands together. However, Maria was apparently taking it seriously, and she started fixedly. She stared fixedly over to the ocean where the crag enshrining the local guardian deity was supposed to be. An ominous sign. Oh. Enough, Kumasawa-san. Maria isn't old enough to understand this kind of joke. It's all right, maria Chan. It's just a coincidence. Nothing scary is going to happen. Georgianiki put a hand on Maria's shoulder to calm her down, but Maria's sharp-eyed expression didn't budge. Ominous. Ominous. Maria muttered that word over and over. Apparently, repeating a single word over and over is a habit that Maria's had for a long time. However, since the word she was saying was quite literally ominous, it was a bit creepy. Hey now, Maria. Some disaster really will come if you say that word over and over, you know. I tapped Maria's other shoulder. And then, Maria whipped her head around, stared into my face, and spoke unblinkingly. Hmm. Disaster. Coming. Huh? And just where is it coming from? I answered lightheartedly, trying to break the tension in the air. And in reply, Maria held up a finger, raised her arm high, and pointed up to the heavens. When I looked up, I saw that the sky was still just as cloudy, but it had grown a great deal more leaden than it had been that morning. That's right. They were saying that a typhoon was approaching. We had planned to spend one night on the island, but if this storm doesn't pass quickly, I won't be able to make it to school on Monday. Well, I guess it makes for a pretty good excuse to be absent. Mm. She apparently sensed something ominous in this cloudy sky. She's been muttering for a while now. 
Girls of Maria's age tend to be very impressionable. She's just about at the age where many girls start to get excited about six senses and whether they have psychic potential and stuff. In a way, being sensitive about things like this really isn't out of the ordinary for a kid like her. It's alright, Maria Chan. The weather might get worse around tonight, but tomorrow it'll clear up and become a pretty blue sky. Hmm. Pretty blue sky? Hmm. That's right. By tomorrow it'll be a pretty blue sky. There's no rain that doesn't end, and no clouds that never clear. Hmm. Rain that doesn't end. Clouds that never clear. Hmm. Sure, the typhoon's coming, but it'll be gone before you know it. It's alright, Maria. Hmm. Maria started yelling, ooh, ooh. It looked as though she was having a tantrum because no one could understand what she was trying to say. What in the world is Maria trying so desperately to warn us about? Unable to understand her, we could do nothing but feel a vague sense of foreboding. I've heard that everyone can feel the supernatural, but that it weakens as you age. That might mean that Maria, the youngest one of us all, still possessed some kind of sense that the rest of us had lost. I wonder if that sense is sending her a warning. At that moment, Kumasawa-san quietly opened her mouth. Rumor has it that long ago Rokenjima was. Kumasawa-san, let's not talk about that now. Just as Kumasawa-san was about to tell some kind of story, Jessica sharply interrupted her. For Jessica, this was ex an extremely firm reaction. I wanted to push her further just out of simple curiosity, but judging by how Jessica was acting, it wasn't difficult to imagine that it would simply inflame Maria's unease further. If I did try to press her for the story, the odds were pretty good that it wouldn't be anything bright and cheery. <laughs> I do apologize about that. The wind here is hard to bear for the elderly, so if you would excuse me for now. Gossipers have no reason to hang around after they've been told to stop chatting. When Kumasawa-san finally realized that she'd overstepped her bounds, she went back inside the boat. After she left, Uncle Hideyoshi came along to replace her. Since he'd shown up partway through, he completely failed to notice the complicated atmosphere that hung about the scene. He so he refreshingly and unwittingly swept that atmosphere aside. So in the end, it was his unwittingness that brightened the mood. Looks like we're almost there. All right, just a little more. Took forever at the speed we went today, didn't it? You all know whose fault that is. <laughs> Come on, Uncle Hideyoshi, give me a break already. <laughs> Uh, keep on twisting the knife. Seriously, because of Battler, it has taken forever. Oh. Maria had probably come to the conclusion that no one was going to listen to her. She hung her head, wearing a fretful face. As she did, George Aniki crouched down to meet her eyes and spoke to her kindly. Maria-chan, there's nothing to be afraid of, because we're all together. There's nothing to be afraid of if we're together. Go ahead and say it. Hmm. There's nothing to be afraid of. If we're together. Yes. There's nothing to be afraid of if we're together. Hmm. Yeah, George Aniki knows what he's talking about. If we're all together, there will absolutely never be anything at all to be scared of. Right, Jessica? Yeah, no doubt about that. George Nissan always tells the truth, Maria. Hmm. George Onichan always true. Yes. I don't lie. So, trust me. There's nothing to be afraid of if we're all together. Hmm. George Onichan doesn't lie. I trust you. Yeah, there's nothing to be afraid of if we're all together. Ooh, not afraid. Maria jumped into George Aniki's arms and hugged him tightly. After Aniki patted her head, she jumped away again. Her facial expressions had returned so completely to normal that she looked like a totally different person from moments before. She was once again the ordinary Maria. Ooh, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore because we're all together. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, that's it. You all, you look all better now. You're strong, Maria. Good girl. Ooh, I'm a good girl. Uh, what is the, is it like her personal pronoun that they were trying to highlight? In Japanese, Maria, oh, Maria uses her own name instead of the word I when talking about herself. This is called iliism and is common among young ch Japanese children. It sounds childish and cute in Japanese and can be used by young adult women to achieve the same effect. 
Even the other characters have various ways of referring to themselves because Japanese has more than one word for I. Kinzo, Nanjo, Eva, Jessica, and a number of other characters use Watashi, which is a neutral way of saying I. Battler says Ore, which is a masculine, self-asserting, and very casual way of saying it. George uses Boku, which has a youthful, boyish, casual, and humble feel. Hideyoshi uses Washi, which goes along with his strange accent and makes him sound older. There are many others. However, you will not always hear these words being used, just as you will not always hear Maria using her using her own name, because Japanese is a pro-drop language. Think words like I, you, it, and so on are often simply left out when it's obvious who or what is being talked about. Yep. So, uh, that's a, that's a pretty cool bit of trivia for you. Hey now, what's going on here? Maria-chan didn't get seasick, did she? Hmm? <laughs> well, something like that. We'll be arriving soon. The harbor was already drawing near. Oh, our first scene transition. Let's go. The boat gave a big shudder. Seems we've docked at the harbor. The boat driver came out and jumped to the pier with the mooring rope. Are we about to get, uh, some of my favorite characters? <laughs> a large man in a tuxedo- Yeah! <laughs> and a large man in a tuxedo was waiting for us with a warm, smiling face. I didn't know him, but judging by his clothes, I guessed that he was a servant of the Ushirimiya head house. Welcome home, my lady. You were quite late, and I began to worry. Uh, thanks for caring. The boat had Battler scared shitless, so we had to slow down for him. Seriously, what a pain in the ass. Shut up! I'll remember this when the shoe's on the other foot someday. Ugh. At this rate, the word will spread around the entire family and I'll become the big conversation piece during dinner. Even without this, everybody'd be talking about me because of that six-year gap, but now that I've provided them with an even juicier topic... Ugh, damn it! Why does the Ushirimiya main family have to live on this isolated island? In the meantime, the boat had finished its mooring. A small plank was lowered so that we could get down. One by one, our parents came out of the boat. You must all be quite tired from your long trip. Madam, please allow me to assist you. Thanks. It's been a while, goda son. How are you? Thank you for your concern. It's always my pleasure to serve. Badlerkun, isn't this your first time meeting goda san If I'm not mistaken, you weren't working here six years ago, right? Indeed. So please, allow me to greet him for the first time. It's an honor to meet you at last, Battler Sama. I'm pretty secure about my height, but you're huge. This is definitely our first meeting. If I'd ever met a big guy like you, I'd never forget it. It's a pleasure. I'm Battler. Your return has been keenly anticipated, sir. I've been working for the Ashurimiya head house since the year before last. My name is Goda, your servant. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. If there is any ever anything you need, please feel free to rely on me. goda son, it's been some time. It's been too long, George Sama. Please, allow me to assist you. As usual, you're a reception pro. If you ever need a job, just give me a holler, okay? I'd hire you just like that. You do me too much honor. Please, allow me to assist you, Hideyoshi-sama. Goda-san then lent a hand to everyone as they disembarked, greeting them as they passed. His speech and mannerisms had the refined polish of a professional. He was very graceful, in contrast with his initially rough-looking appearance. His large size made him seem a bit scary at first, but he was, a much more, he was much more polite than my first impression of him had led me to believe. He claimed to have served on the island for two years, but he had doubtless worked at similar jobs somewhere before. Everybody, after everybody disembarked, the mooring rope was untied, and the boat started to steer away from the harbor. It was probably returning to its port, home port of Nijima. The captain waved his hand in farewell. Maria conscientiously waved back. Hmm. I just realized why something's been feeling out of place to me. I can't hear the cries of the seagulls. Seagulls? The birds? I remember that whenever we came to this island, the seagulls always welcomed us with their lively nya nya cries. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely how seagulls sound badly. <laughs> and because of that, whenever I heard the cries of the seagulls in any other place, I get the feeling that I've come to the family conference. Except for the small part of the island where those of the Ushirimiya head house live, Rokenjima had been left uncultivated, apparently transforming into a paradise for wild birds. Seemingly, some cliff face or other had become a home to a huge seagull colony, and so this island was always full of them. Since those seagulls didn't come to greet us, I felt a bit lonely. 
What's wrong, Valakun? Oh, Auntie Rosa. Uh, nah, it's nothing really. I was just saying I can't hear the seagulls, so it kind of feels a bit lonely. Oh, you're right. They've always, they're always so lively, but I can't see hide nor hair of one today. Hmm? Huh? Why no seagulls? Maybe it's because the seagulls are having a gathering somewhere, too. Maria, did you want to see the seagulls? Oh, wanted to. What happened for them all to disappear? Maybe Jessica made all of them into shish kebabs and ate them. Huh? The hell? Don't say disturbing things like that. You'll get Maria all confused. Uh, uh, uh. Jessica and Nachan made them into shish kebabs. Made them into shish kebabs. Uh. I did not. I did not. Oh, why the hell would I do something like that? That's right. That's right. Jessica made them into shish kebabs. Skin and meatballs. Liver and onion. Swim and meatballs. Liver and onion. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> As I made fun of Jessica, Maria tagged along looking like she was having fun. Oh, she really knows how to join in with things. All right then, starting today, I'll make you my number one follower. As I smiled at her, she beamed back overjoyed, I guess happy for this little bit of solidarity. That's not it, Maria Chan. I've heard that wild birds are attuned to changes in the weather and atmospheric pressure, and it looks like the weather will get worse around tonight. It's possible they hurried back to their nests. Ooh, not kebabs? Jessica and Nechan didn't make them into kebabs? I did not! I did not! I told you I wouldn't do stuff like that. All right, Battler, you admit right now that you lied. battler Kun, Maria Chan's a naive girl, so she takes even jokes very seriously. You should choose your jokes more carefully. George Aniki gently scolded me. Even though I outstripped Aniki in height, he still commanded respect as my elder. No choice but to obediently apologize. Hey... My bad, my bad. Maria, that just now is a joke. It's just today the seagulls are all quiet in their nests. Butler lie? Giorgio Nichan true? I was having fun, but you were actually just tricking me? Her pure eyes seemed to accuse me. Maybe I went a little overboard with her after all. Yeah, that's right, that's right. What Giorgio Nichi said is true. The weather's bad, so they probably went home for today. It doesn't mean they're gone, does it? Right, Auntie? That's right. Tomorrow, when the weather gets better, I'm sure they'll come back and let you hear their meow meow cries. Hmm. I'll wait for the weather to get better so they come back. Wait for tomorrow. Wait for the weather to get better. Ooh. ooh. Maria's mood lightened, and when she started looking forward to and she started looking forward to tomorrow when the seagulls would come back and fill the skies. Still, George Oniki really is amazing at taking care of kids. I think I remember Oniki taking good care of me as well when I was a brat six years ago. Aniki might have quite some talent for this kind of thing. Georgekin, you're so amazing at taking care of kids. I think you could work in childcare. Yeah, it's like you were born to do that. To me, it seems more you than doing business in some company president office. Oh no. Childcare is a very respectable job of its own. It's not something you can do merely by liking children. You're truly modest, Georgekin. But Batlerkin, you're quite good with children too, you know. Earlier, even if it was just for a time, Maria seemed to be having a lot of fun. Keep on playing with her like you did just now. Just choose the jokes carefully, though, all right? <laughs> Auntie Rosa winked at me, giggling a little. A real mother, I thought to myself, who's happy that Maria looks like she's having fun. Come on, Rosa. You brats, too. What the hell are you doing? Get a move on. All right, all right, we're coming. The old bastard was beckoning us to hurry up. We'd better get moving. It's not like it'd be too late to have the same discussion after we got our luggage in our rooms. Well then, everyone, I shall lead you towards the guest house where you'll be staying. Please, this way. Goda-san called to everyone and started leading us. Kumasawa-san brought up the rear. A serpentine twisting path led through a dim forest. It ran a bit uphill. I'd guess the path was made twisting so the slope wouldn't be felt too much. But personally, I'd have been happier if they'd been man enough to make some stairs in a straight line. No doubt they made the path twisting on purpose to put on airs of distance and importance. Before long, we saw garden-style stone steps. Ah, uh, now I remember how it goes from here. Go up these, and... At the top of the stone steps, a beautiful guest house came into view. Oh yeah, the first drop of hope, let's go!
This is uh, this is one of the best themes in the entire series, and uh, once you finish it, you will not be able to listen to it without crying. Promise from me. <clears throat> its facade was lovely, of course, but even more than that, we couldn't help but have our hearts stolen away by the splendor of that beautiful rose garden that spread before it. Ah, it's as beautiful as ever this year. A real delight for the eyes. As they reached the top of the stone steps, the people welcomed in by the rose garden voiced their appreciation one after the other. Aren't the flowers less lively this year? It must be because the summer wasn't warm enough. I also believe that is so. When one compares with last year's blooming, it's a pity that this year's is somewhat inferior. Even so, it was a delightful rose garden. I remember that huge amounts of roses used to greet me every year, even over six years ago. This rose garden was the first thing that greeted the people who came to Rokenjima. Even our parents, who came every year, couldn't help but let their wonder slip out. And moreover, it even looked like a powered-up version of the garden from six years ago that was in my memories. This place is always so amazing. It would be wonderful to have a rose garden like this in my own home. Give it up. Who do you think would take care of it? Roses are a real pain with bugs and diseases to worry about. Yes, they are. In fact, I hear that Kyrie Nesan tends to her rose every day and makes sure that it doesn't get nibbled out without her knowing it. Huh? I haven't heard anything like that. What's this? Yes, I do. Though with him, it's the rose that goes off after the insect, so it's really more like some nasty carnivorous plant. Oh, so that's what you mean. Come on, Rosa. Can't you give that a rest just for today? I'll put that sort of thing completely behind me. I wonder. After all, you're a womanizer on an almost genetic level. No need to worry, rosa son. If, if a rose gives me too much trouble, I just chop it off at the root. <laughs> Such frightening talk this is. Guys who are popular with the ladies are always forced to live with danger at their side. I sure hope I turned out a bit prettier in my next life. Hideyoshi Nissan, as I keep telling you, it isn't like that at all. And Kyrie, stop it. You're freaking us. You're freaking me out. You're making my rose wither. Hey, Maria-chan, look over here. These roses are especially magnificent. Roses are magnificent. Huh. Hmm, smells pretty sweet. Look, this matches my elegance perfectly. Hey, cut it out. Maria's gonna imitate you and get hurt by the thorns. She yelled at me as I leaned in with an exaggerated gesture to smell the rose's scent. I thought she was overreacting, but when I turned around, I saw Maria imitating my every movement and thereby putting a broad smile on George Aniki's face. Hey now, Maria chan, be careful. Rose thorns can hurt. Hmm? George Ani chan. This one rose is strange. Hmm. Strange? What's wrong? Maria pointed to a single rose. I immediately understood why she found it odd. In the midst of all these magnificent roses, just one single rose was withering. There wasn't any particular reason. Some roses flourish and others wither. That's all there was to it, but Maria seemed very concerned about there being one un only one unhealthy rose in a group of healthy ones. She must be feeling somehow like it's been left out. So, you feel sad for this rose because it's the only one that isn't healthy? Hmm. The others are all healthy, but this one's sad. Well, they all bloom and wither on their own. I'll bet the only reason that one withered now is because it bloomed earlier than any of the other roses. Yeah, that's right. It probably just bloomed all over the place, fulfilled its duty, and went to rest. You shouldn't get so worked up over it. Hmm. It seemed that Maria's pure, sensitive nature was making her feel some emotional pain for the rose that had withered alone. Even though she understood the logic of it, it still felt lonely to her. Okay, maria chan why don't you look after this rose until we leave then? Hmm? Huh? George Aniki straightened up and felt around in his pocket. He then took out the wrapping from the candy he'd eaten on the plane. He twisted it into a thin string and gently tied it to the rose as a sort of marker. Hey, that's pretty cute. Let's mark it with this. Later on, you can come and give it some water. I'm sure Mr. Rose will be happy. Huh? Oh, come to give it water. I think you should give Mr. Rose here a name. I'm sure that'll make it happy, and you'll get to know it a little better. Name? Name? Mm -hmm. Though she still wore her usual sullen face, Maria crossed her arms and began to consider this intently. At the very least, she appeared to have been completely pulled out of her slump. Nice going, Aniki. George Nissan's always been really understanding. Can't help but respect him. Yeah, I guess that's just his gift. We have gotta learn some lessons from him. Was this garden as fancy as when you were, as this when you were a kid? 
It was only after I left the house that it became this grand. Though I was more fond of the previous rustic garden, Nissan fiddled with it too much with a slightly questionable taste. It was much better the way it was before. Maybe you gotta think positive. No matter how it might have looked, its beauty now is something to be admired. You'll able, be able to relax a lot better if you look at it that way. I didn't mean it like that. I was just saying that I would have liked you to have seen the old, more wonderful, ga wonderful garden as well. Now then, everyone, if you please, I shall be guiding you to your rooms now. Godasan called out to everyone to ask if we were ready. Our hearts had been completely stolen away by the Rose Garden after a year of absence, and we didn't lend him an ear. Since we weren't a travel group, it wasn't like we had a strict schedule to follow. Besides, for our parents, this was their fond old birth home that they had returned to, so they felt no obligation to be pressured by anyone. Understanding the situation, Godasan continued to wait, with a wide smile for our parents to lose interest in the roses and tell him to guide us to our rooms. My! Hey! If it isn't canon kun It's been so long! How you doing? Uncle Hideyoshi suddenly shouted. The little scrungly guy of all time. The, the genderest little man the world has ever seen. <clears throat> In the direction he was waving, there was a slender boy. Meeting him right after a huge man like Gota probably emphasized his small stature. The boy was in the middle of transporting piled up gardening tools and the, and the like in a wheelbarrow. When he realized he was being called to stop, he set down the wheelbarrow, took his hat off, and bowed his head. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I figured he was probably a bit older, <laughs> probably a bit younger than me. I realized by the general atmosphere surrounding him that he was a servant too. Though he did greet Uncle Hideyoshi back, he himself seemed like he might be unsociable. It was a greeting that lacked feeling. When Godasan noticed that our interest had shifted over towards him, he went to the boy's side and introduced him to us. Bathler-sama, I shall introduce you. He's one of the servants who serve at the Oshiramiya head house. Count on son. Greet our guest. I'm pleased to meet you. <laughs> this is the one that your ex showed you to try to convince you to read Uminako. <laughs> That's really funny. I love Canon. He is uh, so, like, muted, like, depressed boy energy. Literally, yes, Mr. Sopping Wet Abandoned Kitten himself. He is so moody. <clears throat> I'm the servant, Canon. Yep, my first impression wasn't wrong. He gave the feeling that he was unsociable, or maybe a bit of a poor speaker. In contrast with Godasan, who was extraordinarily polished as a servant, it was impossible not to feel the immaturity you'd expect of someone his age. No, literally, uh, <laughs> when you say Edgelord himself, um, Canon is like... Canon listens to Neutral Milk Hotel. When Godasan urged him in a whisper to give more, a bit more of an introduction, the boy named Canon only cast his eyes downward. canon son, could you perhaps give them a little more as a greeting? I can't, because we are furniture. It seemed that he wasn't refusing to greet us out of spite, but rather he gave the, the impression that he didn't know what else to add to his greeting and so could do nothing other than stay silent. Uh, um, Kanon Kun's a man of few words. He might not be that sociable, but deep down he's a really good person. Don't get him wrong. You've been working here for three years, was it? So yeah, you've been here long a year longer than Godasan, right, Kanon Kun? Even though it's not like he made a super bad impression, Jessica hurriedly backed him up. I see. Apparently him being unsociable works against him all the time. Cool. Nice to meet you. I'm Battler. I'm 18. How old are you? <laughs> a silence, as if evaluating whether it was a question that must be answered or not. But here again, Jessica plowed ahead. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, he's two years younger than us, so uh, 16, right? Yes, that's correct. It looked at like, if given a choice, he would have preferred not to tell us his age. Him not wanting to tell his age was probably because he thought he would be looked down upon for it. I remember that when I was around his age, I hated being asked how old I was by adults. I see. Sixteen, huh? That's gotta be a delicate time. In that case, I asked something I shouldn't have. <laughs> I'm glad you're about our age. Just be cool and call me Battler. And I'll call you Canon. Thank you very much. But just a sentiment is sufficient, Battler Summer. Jessica looked flustered for some reason. She seemed to think my impression of Canon was worsening because of his rejection. When a, well, I doubt a girl like Jessica understands his fretful male heart. 
<laughs> as his elder, even just by two years. Who would leave him, lead him into adolescence? I took it upon myself to understand that. Count on Could you perhaps be a little more courteous? A smiling face is also the duty of a servant. God, go to suck so bad. I love him. <laughs> I apologize. I shall make an effort. <laughs> go to son. Canon Kun is trying his best, isn't he? It seemed as though he was often worried, warned about his discourtesy, and apparently he hadn't improved a bit. Go to son kept his business smile, but let a small sigh of resignation escape. Well then, I still have work to do. If you'll excuse me. It looked like Canon himself was uncomfortable with remaining silent here any longer. After another perfunctory bow, he turned on his heels and started pushing the wheelbarrow again. Just then, suddenly, the wheelbarrow wobbled and fell, scattering the load. I guess the wheelbarrow with its single wheel caught on a pebble and lost its balance. What have you done? Now, now, quickly clean it up! Godasan urged him along in a low voice, as if to remind him that it's a servant's shame to present a clumsy appearance in front of guests. Showing that he understood quite well without being told, Kanon Kun wordlessly reloaded the wheelbarrow with fallen objects. He seemed to be fine with the light-looking gardening tools, shovels and such, but he looked like he was having trouble getting his arms around and lifting up some sacks of fertilizer. Are you alright? You're so careless. Here. Milady, you'll dirty your garments. Please, leave it to him. With an elegant gesture, Godasan took the shovel that Jessica had picked up. At his back was the figure of Kanon Kun having trouble with the sacks of fertilizer. Hmm. You'll dirty your garments? Don't worry. The ones I'm wearing aren't that elegant. Besides, I hate guys who make the waitress pick up the fork they dropped at the restaurant. I lifted up the other bags that had fallen. Of course, they weren't light, but for me, it was a piece of cake. Kanon Kun turned his surprised eyes toward me. It was the face of one who would never expected, never have expected to receive help from a guest. But, Butler Summer, that's not necessary. I'll take care of everything, so... Don't you worry. I may not look it, but I've got it where it counts. <laughs> Kanon Kun looked like he hadn't yet gone through his growth spurt and was stuck with a sort of weak body. I guess this kind of weight's a bit much for him. It's quite heavy, isn't it? It's natural that it'd be difficult for you. Kanon Kun, don't worry about it. Okay, my time to shine. This makes up for the boat part from before, right? <laughs> As if your antics earlier could be written off just like that. <laughs> I'll tell you about it later, Kanon Kun. Battler's a laugh and a half. Gonna fall, gonna fall! Ooh, ooh, ooh! Banter make the made the job seem quick, and before I knew it, all the stuff had been piled back into the wheelbarrow. For letting you see such unsightliness, I beg your forgiveness. Very well, enough now. Please, go. Letting such a disgraceful thing be seen by the guests who were supposed to be made welcome must have been hideously embarrassing as a servant. Pressed by Goda to hurry up and exit, Kanon Kun left. You're too harsh on him, Goda san. Wouldn't it have been just wouldn't it have just been better if you'd helped him instead of being a bully? You're quite correct. I deeply, deeply implore your forgiveness. Without even a twitch in his smile, Goda san apologized elegantly. Kanon Kun has a ton of things he's good at too. It's just a it's just that being young works against him all the time. It's a crying shame. It's a prickly age. You be nice to him. Keeping a tight lip is just what you want in a servant. Right, Kumasawa-san? <laughs> Rudolph-sama, you truly are harsh. There is no servant as silent as I, of course. Everyone smiled wryly at that shameless lie. Even she herself didn't believe that, not in her wildest dreams. She said that to loosen us all up. Yeah, that's the kind of character Kumasawa Bachan used to be. The mood had stiffened a little. The, the mood that had stiffened a little was clearing up in a twinkling, thanks to Kumasawa-san's cheerful smile. I'd like to put down the luggage soon. Go to Sun. How are we to split up for our rooms? It shall be the same as last year. I shall guide you. Please, this way. We headed towards the trim and elegant guest house. This was going to be our temporary quarters for a night. Kenon watched over a hedge as the guests all entered the guest house. Then, he let his eyes fall on those heavy sacks of fertilizer piled up in the wheelbarrow. In his mind, he kept going over his previous mistake. Battler, big and strong, had picked up the sacks in front of him, the sacks he couldn't lift himself as if they were feathers. It was extremely difficult for an outside observer to guess what emotions that favor had stirred up in Kenon. But as far as you could tell by watching him hang his head from behind, there was something he just couldn't let go. Muttered words escaped his lips. 
but those words he murmured were so soft that they didn't even reach his own ears. Even I. Cannon hung his head, slightly biting his lower lip. I remember the Rose Garden, but I don't remember this guest house at all. Was it built, like, recently? Torion, Visitor's Retreat, was written on a gatepost-like thing, but since everyone called it the guest house, I followed their lead. The brand new western-style guest house that stood overlooking the Rose Garden had a magnificent design carefully done in harmony with the garden. Correct. It was built just the year before last. Since then, we've been having them sl they've we've been having them let us sleep over here. <laughs> yeah, because people seem to like this place more than that junky old mansion we had forever. I wish my room was over here. Hmm. I want one too. Want one too. I guess you could call my house upper class as well, but I was reminded again how completely ordinary it was compared to the head house. It showed a sho shocking display of wealth that they would build this kind of awesome guest house for guests who would come over like once a year. Eva-sama, Hideyoshi-sama, please do make use of this room. Rudolph-sama, Kiryu-sama, please make use of this room here. Ah, yes, I do appreciate how elegant and pretty this place is. Western style truly is wonderful. I can handle the Western style for a few days, but any longer than that, you need the good old Japanese style. Japanese people just relax best on tatami mats. <laughs> We've been fighting over making our new house Japanese style or Western style. Mother still holds a grudge about father having started the construction as Japanese style, and they bicker all the time about it. Your parents get along so well, George and Isan. I'm jealous as hell. Mine are so frosty. And yet they're right with each other when it comes to my grades. All the rooms seemed to be two-person. I was grateful because now I wasn't going to be forced to share the f same room with the old bastard for some bullshit reason like being family. Because Besides, I figured those two wouldn't be able to enjoy themselves with someone like me around. <laughs> What's that creepy smile all about? You're thinking about something dirty, aren't you? <laughs> something dirty? Of course not. Please, enjoy your stay. Ow! Don't, 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 don't. That hurts, you old bastard! Once again, Dad pulled my ears from behind. Cut the crap. I'm getting a stomachache, and I'm not in the mood for this. You're the guest of honor this time around. You play as nice as possible with Dad, Nanichi, and the rest. At the very least, pay attention to what you say in front of Dad, got it? Because wisecracks go over like a lead balloon with him. Jessica-chan, what's the mood of our family head been like lately? Hmm. Same as last year, I guess? Uh, considering they keep saying he's got three months left, he's as lively, grumpy, and irritable as ever. Meaning, he's in his usual bad mood again this year. And the only one who's able to take care of him is Genji-san? Seems the master will only open his heart to Genji-san. What did they mean by this? <laughs> Lately, us small people can net and cannot even get an audience. He'd shut himself up in the study again, probably doing nothing but that weird black magic of his. What he does for his hobby is his own damn business, but when he starts stinking up the place, it really gets on my nerves. He can just stay in that study and never come out again for all I care. <laughs> you shouldn't talk like that about the elderly. We're all indebted to him since he rebuilt the Yoshiramiya family. A little gratitude wouldn't hurt. Mm, well, sorry. After being rebuked by George Aniki, Jessica had no choice but to take back her thoughtless remark. The Ushiramiya family was wealthy beyond belief, but that of course meant that all of its members were eccentric people, completely at odds with the rest of society. The head of the family, standing at its peak, in other words our grandfather, seemed to be a particularly eccentric and terrifying person even for our family. Dad said he was getting a stomachache earlier, but I guess that was what all the adults who came here today were actually feeling. No doubt they were jealous of us, the grandchildren, just playing and laughing without a care. From the stories Dad told me, the head of the family was a violent man who rained blows on his sons with his own fists and even beat his daughters mercilessly with a wooden sword. If he was such a staunch traditionalist with his kids, why wasn't he the same with their names? Because of that, even us grandkids had to suffer. Well, I have absolutely no trouble believing that terrifying image they paint of him. I don't have many memories of meeting him over the years, but I do remember his face was full of menacing thunderclouds, always making the people around him shrink away with a sharp look. I remember that the room's atmosphere got so tense whenever he was around you couldn't even breathe. When my dad's, What my dad said right now about me being the guest of honor now carries a little more oomph for me. Six years ago I was in grade school, but I'm, in a, I'm a high schooler now so there's no getting away from it. If I don't show him respect, 
Things will probably get serious. Whew, scary. He does look frightening, but he's not completely terrifying. He's definitely never unfair. He's just not a pretty talker, that's all. But George Nissan, you've been the family darling since like forever because of your awesome grades, right? Grandfather treats us completely different. Like me, I've gotten slapped with a wooden sword. On my ass, my ass. On my maidenly, maidenly naked ass. Well, you're the her heiress of the head house, Jessica Chan. Grandfather's giving you special attention. You have to realize that his strictness shows how much he's expecting of you. Shut up, George. Oh, come on. Seriously, I could just turn the succession over to you, George Nissan. It's a bit of a heavy burden for me to carry. I think I already said it before, but Jessica's the daughter who will inherit the head house. The pressure on her shoulders must be different from us cousins of the branch families. Hmm? Huh? Jessica and Nissan, heavy? If I hold it, will it get lighter? Hmm? <laughs> Thanks. It's all right. It's not going to get pushed on you, Maria-chan. I'm going to bear that cross until my grave. Don't worry. While grateful for Maria's innocent consideration, it seemed that Jessica could not easily rid herself of the anxiety for the future that remained visible on her face. I guess I'm no different. Any high schooler with exams looming ahead is bound to have an anxiety for the future they can't hide. Maria, come here. You'll be in this room with Mom. Bathurkin, apparently you're with me in this room here. Oh? This is a surprise! It's bigger than our parents' room! Wow! I figured us cousins are all probably gonna gather in one place anyway. So I went and told them to make it a biggish room. Ooh, I like here best too. Here's better than being together with Mama. Ooh, ooh. Okay, you like it better here too, Maria. Alright, this room is George's and mine, but uh, we'll give you special permission to come in. Keep it a secret from your mom, alright? Ooh, secret. Her mother, Auntie Rosa, was right behind her, but Maria still answered, striking the air with her fists clenched tight. After our parents put the luggage in the rooms, they gathered again in the corridor. See? So, brats, what are you gonna do? You cousins just gonna stay here and chat? Seemed they were heading to the mansion to announce their arrival. Normally, we would have to, have to follow them and greet everyone together. But in, if that had been the case, Dad would have just said, you guys come too, and have been done with it. He's telling us that it's all right if we don't come, so what do we do? It's gonna be time for lunch soon anyway. Better let the kids unwind here. Besides, if worse comes to worse, this might be the last chance they get to play outdoors. Oh, I'll go too. Maria, you house sit for Mama, okay? You behave yourself and wait here. Mm. Now that Maria had been told to house sit, we couldn't just leave her behind. George Aniki realized that immediately and gave a clear reply for all of us. Well, we'll accept your offer and house it. We have lots of stories to tell each other after a year. That would be best. And Batlerkun has six years worth to tell, after all. Yeah, yeah. I'll take care of the house like a good little boy. Kimisawa-san, I'm gonna stay here too. We'll leave the rest to the adults and us kids will break rank. <laughs> that would be for the best. <laughs> I'll report it to Madam. Then everyone, I'll be guiding you to the mansion. Please, this way. The other kids aside, George is an adult now. Wouldn't it be better if he came with us? If we make him come, poor George will be the only one left out. Interacting with his cousins is also important. Well then, see you guys. The adults left one after the other. Like the time it, he had guided us from the harbor, Gotasan went ahead with Kumasawa-san at the rear. As we gathered in the cousins' room assigned to us, George Aniki asked us to excuse him for a second. He rushed over to Kumasawa-san, who, who, who was following behind the disappearing adults and seemed to be asking her something. He soon finished his business and came back. What's up, Aniki? Uh, nothing. Is she gonna show up soon? Am I remembering that right? Yes, I believe so. I believe that is coming up soon. Ooh, ask me too! Ask me too! Hmm? <laughs> what could it be that George Nissan asks Kumasawa-san and doesn't ask me, I wonder? Uh, I don't have a clue. Uh, no, you misunderstand. I'm not sure what you're misunderstanding, but... Aniki was getting pretty tongue-tied. It's like he has something to hide and Jessica has the dirt on him. Whatever it is, something only Jessica knows and I don't is no fun at all. Hey, Maria, it's not fair that we're the only ones out of the loop, is it now? We want to hear what they're talking about, don't we? Hmm. Battler and me want to know too! Battler and me want to know too! Ooh, 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 ooh! Both of them at the same time. I fooled around while ooh-ooing together with Mar Maria. 
No, I'm telling you, it's no big deal. <laughs> Liar! You suck at lying, now confess! Maria, you tickle his right side, I'll tickle his left. Ooh. Me on the right side, Balor on the left. Ooh. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Wait, you two. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> George Aniki rolled around on the bed in an effort to get away, and Maria and I played around, chasing him. There's something in the back of my mind telling, him, telling me that I'm a high schooler now and not a damn kitten, but in spite of that, I miss this kind of fun. A warm kind of fun. <laughs> what George Nissan was asking Kumasawa-san, see? Hmm? Well, you know how it is. It's been a year since he last came to the head house. Apparently, he's really dying to say hi to any servants that might have joined or quit in the meantime, see? Hmm? See hi? I'll say hi too. What the hell? That's not anything to feel guilty about, Aniki. Hmm? Huh? That's not it, is it? Maria, don't be fooled. Aniki is still hiding something. Resume interrogation! Ooh, <laughs> stop it, seriously! <laughs> Maria chan, you too, stop already! <laughs> They're probably busy with cleaning lunch and cleaning or lunch arrangements. It's alright, we'll go and greet them properly afterwards. Basically, you wanted Shannon out there to greet you, not that Gota getting in the way, right? <laughs> Shannon? Shannon? Ah, I remember that girl. She's still a servant now? How is she? All right, so I think we're, yeah, we're going over to the main house uh, for a scene. So I'm going to take a, like, I'm literally just a second. I'm gonna step away for just a moment to go to the bathroom and I will be right back. Okay. I told you it would only be a second. <laughs> I'm back now. I'm normal. <clears throat> Just uh, check some things real quick though. Oh, okay. That's what it was. I see. I see. I see. <clears throat> okay. One more drink of water and we'll be good. Okay. Uh, if this is the stretch that I think it is, oh boy, are we in for some drama. <laughs> By the way, Natsu Nesa, how's your headache been lately? Seemed to be pretty serious for a time. I've been much better lately. Thank you for your concern. Oh, right, here. A present for you, Natsune-san. Thank you, once again. I'm always receiving gifts from you. Is this black tea? It's herb tea with peppermint and lemon balm. It's a blend from a famous store and supposed to go go be good for headaches. I thought it might help you, too. Rosa was always a conscientious woman, probably because she was the youngest of four and by quite some distance. 
She managed to grow up without harboring the venom venomosity of her siblings. Yeah, speaking of attractive mothers, by the way, Natsuhi. Natsuhi, my, my poor, sopping, wet kitten of a woman. <laughs> she goes through so much, but, uh, but I love her. <clears throat> her consideration made Natsuhi soften her expression for just a moment. But it wasn't enough to undo the many years of anxiety that had curdled her expression into one of blend indifference. Oh yes, you were saying you were always saying you get those headaches. Pull yourself together. Jessica Tone will have her exams this year, won't she? Isn't that the turning point in her life? How can she count on a mother like that? Besides, Natsuhine san, you're three years younger than me. Can't you pull yourself together? I apologize. I was born with this discomfort. Ava sometimes fails to choose her words carefully, but even though she hit it with a smile, her comments aimed at Natsuhi contained shards of obvious malice. Of course, that didn't escape Natsuhi. She frantically contained her urge to grimace and pretended to ignore Ava. Our battler will have his exams this year too, right? Rudolph's son, shouldn't you be a little concerned too? For the sake of your own son, get serious to the point of getting headaches like Natsuhi-san. If I say anything, he automatically goes against it. So what should I say? Maybe the opposite, that it's okay for him to mess around? It's probably the only thing he'd obediently listen to. In your family, Hideyoshi Nissan, didn't George do really well on his exams? Please teach me the secret to controlling children. Mmm, well, it's probably because I convinced him why he should study. Study isn't worth anything on its own. That's right, the real point of studying is to train yourself in the art of research and what you don't know. If you can't do that, you can't be useful to society. I'm not talking about math or writing. You need to learn how to learn. That's splendid. It wouldn't be nice if our Jessica could understand that, though. I don't mean this too seriously, but as it is, as an heiress of the Ashuramiya family, she is. Do you really have to force her into becoming the successor? Women have to find their own happiness. Parents shouldn't be deciding that for their children, right? Hold your horses, Ava. Each family has its way to raise their children. You shouldn't be too pushy. I'm sorry. Natsuhine san, don't take it the wrong way. Though the light shining in through the window was quite warm despite the cloudy weather, there was a dark mood about the room, which probably caused headaches for other people besides Natsuhi. As if to brush away that mood, Kyrie brightly made a suggestion to all present. Still, this black tea has a really lovely aroma. Let's drink it at once. I believe that in Japan you can't buy something like Leopold's black tea anywhere but Ginza, right? Uh, Psycho Doggy with the five dollars, great voice acting. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Kyrie Nesan, how knowledgeable of you. Do I still have the alert box? Yeah, I do still have the alert box on. I guess it really is just late. I don't know why it's so late. It really was worth buying. Kyrie and Rosa stood up from their seats and made as if to prepare the black tea. Natsuhi forestalled them. Thank you both. Let us save that for later. One of our people will soon be coming to bring some tea, so please relax. Leave it for later, you two. Let them treat us to a welcome drink, at least. Rudolph gave a subtle signal with his eyes for them to sit down again. Curie and Rosa understood instantly and obediently returned to their seats. The guests had already been greeted, so it was time for some tea it was time for some tea to be prepared for them. That tea was late, and having the guests talk about making some themselves was an embarrassment for the host. Natsuhi bit her lower lip, frustrated with the ineptitude of the servants who were taking too long to bring the tea. Seeing her face, Ava, without hesitation, started to giggle. Of course, Shannon had no way of knowing what was taking place in the parlor. As she came in pushing a dish cart piled with teacups, Natsuhi gave her a pained look for no apparent reason, and Shannon couldn't help but flinch without knowing what she had done wrong. It, excuse me. I shall prepare some tea for you. Yeah, see, there it goes. It took that long to pop up for some reason. Oh, Shannon Town, it's been a while. You keep getting prettier every time I see you. Oh, um, thanks. Leave the chatting for after you've set the table. The tea will get cold. Uh, I apologize, madam. She apologized like a small frightened animal and bumping up against the serving cart made a jarring racket as she dropped several teaspoons. Her clumsiness made Natsuhi's expression even harsher, which made Shannon in turn quail even more. It's all right, Natsuhine-san. What does a single greeting matter? We've already been made to wait for so long, the tea must be quite cold anyway. <laughs> it, it's all right. It's not cold yet, so... Shannon, finish setting the table quickly. Uh, I'm sorry, madam. 
It was obvious that Natsuhi was getting irritated. The ineptitude that delayed the tea, the clumsiness of the servant, everything pointed to the incompetence of Natsuhi's everyday guidance, making her lose face. As the person in charge of matters of the Ashiramiya head house, allowing that clumsiness to be exposed today of all days was surely nothing less than total humiliation. Lay off, Natsuhi Nesa. Don't you think it's a little harsh to bully Shannon Chan when she's doing her best? I'm not bullying anyone. What a nice smell. May I ask you the brand of this tea? Um, I'm terribly sorry. I'll find out for you later. Kyrie had tried to be nice to her, wanting to cut through the tense mood. However, instead, Shannon had shown a disgraceful display, darkening Natsuhi's face and the room's mood. By this point, Ava's giggles were loud enough to be heard by everyone in the room. What's this? Shannon Chan, don't you even know what you're pouring for us? Come now, you mustn't serve something so suspicious to guests. We'll need a silver spoon at the very least before we can drink this. I, I'm sorry. I'll go get one immediately. Shannon Chan, do you know what silver spoons are used for? Or why they have to be silver? Do you know why? N no, um... Ava's eyes played over Shannon, who was setting the table as a catty smile floated onto her face. Taken on its own, the expression on Ava's face may have been charming in an impish sort of way. However, the words being spun from her lips held within them the keenness of a razor. Shannon tried with all of her might to avoid Ava's gaze, which continued to, fo to focus on her. Grasping that Shannon was hard-pressed for an answer, Rosa promptly gave some timely help. They say that the silver dims have touched by poison. Um, for everybody uh, asking about why they're so mean to Shannon, which, I mean, like, it's not a good reason, but if it, you're trying to parse the sort of family politicking going on right now, uh, Natsuhi is just embarrassed. Like, she doesn't want to be put on the spot uh, by people thinking that her servant is incompetent. Ava doesn't like Natsuhi, so she is intentionally pointing out when Shannon is being incompetent to embarrass Natsuhi on purpose. They say silver dims if it's touched by poison. <laughs> You've learned something, right, Shannon Chan? The tea being treated as undrinkable unless it could be first tested with, by po for poison. In Natsuhi's eyes, this was an insult to both the tea and herself for serving it. Rudolph, laughing flippantly, patted Ava's shoulder. <laughs> you don't need any silver cutlery. With just one lick of your poisonous tongue, even a silver plate would go pitch black. <laughs> I get to hear that poison tongue every day, so I must be poison-proof by now. Ava, I don't mind you doing it to me, but you gotta tone it down a smidgen for the poor souls without resistance. <laughs> My, how cruel. I only gave Shannon Chan a bit of information about the tea, didn't I? <laughs> Everyone followed the lead set by Hideyoshi's horse laugh and smiled, though sourly. There remained a single exception to this in Natsuhi, but even so, for the time being, the conversation inside the parlor could now be mistaken for a lively and friendly chat. As Shannon finally finished setting the tea table and made to leave, Kyrie apologized to her in a low voice for not being able to help. Shannon gave a light bow and made a hasty retreat. Shannon cast her eyes downward, pushing the cart down the corridor. The pitiful air around her made it obvious that she had borne the brunt of some bullying. Don't be sad. You didn't do anything wrong, Nesa. You were watching. That's my duty. <laughs> Madame and Ava-sama can go to hell, but the even worse coward is that guy. Kanon glared hatefully in the opposite direction of the parlor. The preparations for the tea had been delayed by a little bit of trouble in the kitchen. That trouble had not been Shannon's fault. The truth is that it had been Goda's mistake. In the first place, there was no way that a show-off like Goda would ever hand over a flamboyant job like carrying tea to the guests. He had needed them to make the tea all over again, which had made him late. So realizing that he wouldn't be earning any brownie points, he had pushed the task of setting the table on Shannon, who happened to be passing by. One tr could truthfully call it being shrewd, and one could unquestionably call it cowardice. It's all right, Ken Unkin. Thank you. I really don't mind. Kanon's silence vividly showed that Shannon's words weren't coming from her heart. Thank you. Even if you're the only one who understands, I still feel a little better, I think. You bottle things up too much, Nesan. You should be less hard on yourself for once. Yeah, thanks. Suddenly, they both felt someone's presence and whirled around. An elderly man stood there. It was Genji, the head servant. What are you doing here? Shannon, hurry back to the kitchen. Yes, if you'll excuse me. 
Shannon humbly obeyed and promptly made to push the cart and leave. However, Kanon appealed to Genji in silence, bearing something in his eyes that he could not express in words. What is it? Did something happen? Sh Shannon didn't do anything wrong. But those... Stop it, Kanon kun If you'll excuse me. I'll return to work immediately. Kanon kun you too. Go back to your post. Please. Uh, what is Kanon's and Shannon's relationship status? Uh, it gets explained a little bit later on, but basically... Uh, they regard each other as siblings because they come from the same orphanage, but they are not technically related to each other. Uh, they just have a very sibling-like relationship. If you say so, Nason. If there's nothing, then go. Yes, if you'll excuse me. From the shadows in the hallway, an old woman wearing an apron watched over them. It was Kumisawa. How heartrending, shannon son. Cannons, cannon song. There's no reason for you, those two to be picked on, but it cannot be denied that they're disliked by Godasan. Before Godasan was taken in by the Yoshiramiya head house, I heard he worked for a fabulous hotel somewhere. I do think the manner of work he learned there was quite something. It's just that Godasan is the newest servant here. He must have a lot of pride accumulated from his previous posts. Because Shannon-san and Kanon kun are his seniors here at the mansion, and yet are inexperienced and have gone through much less in life than he has, he picks on them at every chance he gets. And also, although it's terrible, they're hated by Madame Natsuhi, too. Of course, in terms of experience, Madame has been in the family much longer. However, I must feel some sympathy for Madame as well in this case. The Master is a truly cruel person. Why could he have not realized that his trifling whim would pass such an inferiority complex onto Madame? Naturally, deep inside, even Madame fully acknowledges that there's no reason to treat those two so harshly. However, the, the heart has reasons that reasons know not. Ah, uh, how heartrending. I cannot do anything but watch over them from the shadows. The clock ticks further. Genji returning from doing the old man yaoi with Kinzo. True. <laughs> the four of us cousins were shooting the breeze over all kinds of topics. After all, there are both girls and guys here, plus we've got people over a wide spread of ages, adult, high school, and elementary school. All each of us had to do was talk about ourselves, and it would be a great interest to the other three. I think I'm finally getting used to all of this. I mean, Jessica and Maria, you've both grown more than I could have imagined over the past six years. So to be honest, I was feeling a bit uncomfortable, but talking like this, I guess on the inside, really nothing's changed since back then. Right back at you. Even after six years, you haven't changed a bit. Although your body's gotten gigantic, you're still just a kid inside. Oh, I'm a kid too. I'm a kid too. Well, you aren't going to be a kid forever, are you, Maria? I mean, you're going to grow from being a kid to a cute young lady, aren't you? And when that... Uh, yeah, okay, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Shut up, shut up, shut up. We're just gonna skip past that line. No, no. Don't try to smooth over the co topic with the promise intact. Maria, that promise never happened. Never. Uh, promise canceled? Ooh. I realize now it didn't feel like a proper gathering of cousins without Batherkin in our group, did it? Thankfully, I think, I think that's like the only Maria joke here uh, in this episode. There might be like one more, um, but yeah, I always skip over that one because it is like, it's genuinely like the worst joke in the whole series. Um, thankfully it does not come back. I realize now it didn't feel like a proper gathering of cousins without Battler Coon in our group, did it? These six years have been kind of lonely. That's true. We weren't able to goof off like this. Still, we did have some pretty constructive conversations, don't you think? Stuff about preparing for our future, exam taking, or finding jobs. Ooh, ooh I'm sorry. Now that I'm here, this, there's just a stupid babbling. But I'm having fun this year. Ooh, ooh. That's true. I agree, this year's the most fun. Maria's sincere words probably spoke for everyone. When George Anneke stroked Maria's head, she giggled like a happy kitten. Pardon me. Your meal's prepared. Okay, so there, uh, there, there is a slightly cringe joke with Shannon here too. Uh, it's 
still kind of bad, but it does actually give you kind of a, like a piece of information that you need to know. So we're going to have to like stomach that a little bit. Jessica answered brightly. Shannon, come in. You remember Battler, don't you? Jessica stood up from the bed and opened the door. There stood a servant girl who was definitely about our age. It's been, it's been quite some time since we last met, Butler Summer. It's nice to see you after six years. I'm Shannon. Noting my presence and trembling a little, she bowed deeply. Wow! Jessica had me surprised, but shannon Chun, you've shocked me just as much. You've turned into a total beauty too, haven't you? It, your words are too good for me. Seriously, the food on this island must be really nutritional, no? What are you eating? What are you training to get boobs that big? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. With both hands poised and yep, yeah, uh -huh. For the sake of my honor and justice, I'd like to point out that I don't suffer from some strange disease that make my lymph nodes itch until I scratch my neck open, which can only be prevented by doing that. It just, my battler style way of communicating. Shut up. Uh, this is a, yeah, okay, so as, as you see, he's planning to get hit. That means I don't- I really do get to touch them in that 1 in 10 chance though, right? I'd never ask for that much though. By now my hands were less than a centimeter away from Shannon Chun's chest, but the counter-strike had yet to come. Y you'll- you'll get it in just a second. It's coming. She understood what was going on and she- and she was blushing and had her head lowered in embarrassment, but she was just standing there with both hands politely joined in front of her, not even trying to resist or cover- yeah. Whoa, I wasn't planning on this! Please, hit me right now! At this rate, I'm seriously gonna touch them! Which is why I was glad that Jessica chose that time to drive her elbow into the back of my head. So, yeah, uh, it, uh, it is really kind of cringe, but the, the bit of info that you're getting from this, uh, which is really, like, distressing, is that Shannon is way too, like, just like, oh yeah, I'll just bow my head and, like, take whatever. You know, like... Unfortunately, that is just how, like, she as a servant behaves. She has, like, absolutely no, like, you know, self-preservation in that sense. She's just like, whatever you want to do to me, do to me. Um, so it kind of gives you a very clear impression right off the bat of, like, oh, geez, the servants here are not treated very well, are they? <clears throat> what the hell are you thanking me? Why the hell are you thanking me? No, no, my bad, Shannon Chun. Looks like I got a little too absorbed in your hypnotic chest. No, more to the point. When someone gets that close, they've clearly got criminal intentions. Seriously, you gotta resist. But, but, you're an exalted guest, Butler Summer. Now, look here. A crime's a crime whether I'm a guest or not. Ten centimeters around a girl's chest is like an air defense identification range. If someone trespasses within two centimeters, that's already an invasion of airspace, and you launch a slap to the face on high alert. I couldn't do such a thing. We're... that is furniture, and... Of course she didn't want her... But if a guest so desired, she intended to sacrifice her own needs in an effort to accommodate them. A girl like this needs some urgent protection. In these days, to think there's such a dedicated and virtuous girl like this makes my head spin. But no! No, no, no! Yeah, yeah. I come up with you a perverted face, you smack me down! No pervert! You gotta complete the joke or it doesn't work. Please, it's a polite request. Smack me. Like this. Smack. Like this. Smack. I... I cannot comply with polite requests because I'm furniture. But I will comply if it's in order because that's my duty. <laughs> then I'll make it in order. From now on, if Battler Kun tries to touch... Yeah. You are to counterattack with a slap. All right? I yes. As you command. This is what I'll do from now on. Butler Sama, I hope you can keep this in mind. So Shannon Chan declared while bowing elegantly to me. Her facial expression was radiant. I gave her a thumbs up to signal, you got it. Six years ago, you might have been mistaken for a servant's daughter who just came in to lend a hand sometimes, but now you're a full-fledged adult servant. How many years has it been? Well, I've had the pleasure of serving this household for about 10 years. She's Shannon. <laughs> the kanji for her name is read Shannon. 
There's, this is another far from typical name for a Japanese person. Being a kid back in those days, I had taken in her name without paying it much attention, but for her to be called something like this is pretty unusual given that she isn't even a member of the Ishiramiya family. Maybe it's like a servant's professional name or something. If so, I can kind of understand why that, that Kanon-kun's name sounds the way it does, too. She's a long-term servant who served here since she was six. Yeah, Ch buddy, you you're gonna you're gonna put that child to labor or what? Like, God, that sucks. How are you gonna make a six-year-old work a nine-to-five? Since her body had changed radically, she didn't match my memories, but we used to know each other six years ago. It looked like she was just as shy as she had been in the past, but I got the sense that she had been become imbued with the charm befitting of a girl her age. It's, yeah, okay, shut up. <laughs> that kid we met earlier, Kanonkun, is her little brother. He's not exactly my little brother. Still, he loves me like a big sister. He didn't cause you any trouble, did he? <laughs> He's the same as always. It's such a shame that he doesn't act just a bit more sociable. It seems Kanonkun has caused trouble. I apologize. He didn't cause any trouble at all. As a fellow man, I understand how moody you can get at that age. It's no surprise that he's unsociable. Oh, I get called that all the time, too. I get called unsociable. Like Canon. Ugh. <laughs> Maria-sama, you're, you're not unsociable at all. Hmm? It was nice to be like him. Hmm. Um, you said the meal was ready, right? Uh, yes. My apologies. The preparations for your meal have been carried out, so I shall be guiding you all to the mansion. Shannon bowed again formally and returned to her duty mode. We realized that if we made her stick around for any more light conversation, it would actually make it harder for her to do her job, so we got up off our butts to avoid interfering with her work any further. Shall we go to the mansion, then? You're all probably starting to get hungry as well, right? Sure am. I always look forward to meals when Godasan here is cooking. That guy, seems he was a chef at this famous hotel, so he's super good at it. Oh ho! I'm looking forward to that! Let's go, Maria! We're gonna stuff ourselves like pigs. Huh? Oh, stuff ourselves like pigs. No, no. You can't just take everything Badlerkin says seriously, okay? Because it's all jokes. Come on, let's go. Under Shannon Chan's guidance, we headed towards the mansion. Oh, are we getting to that? Oh, okay. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. That's later. Okay. There's a there's another scene in the rose garden that's like, oh god, it's it's not like it's not the humor. Don't worry about it. it. It's it's just you know upsetting subject matter. Well, I'll warn for it when we get to it. <clears throat> Met once again by the magnanimous magnificent rose garden, we continued onward as it came into view. Oh my god, I'm so stuffed up. <sighs> Hold on just a second. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, sorry. That's just disgusting. Blech. The imposing ma mansion of the Ashiramiya main family. It had been apparently built shortly after the war, so you could feel the dignity of almost a half century hanging about it. On the surface, the building was gorgeous, but being as old as it was, it seemingly lacked in modern amenities like air conditioning. According to Jessica, midwinter was especially tough, what with all the drafts. Well, it's not like they could just take the kotatsu out. You guys know what a kotatsu is, right? I don't have to explain a kotatsu, right? I'll just do it anyway. A kotatsu is a table he heater hybrid often used as an inexpensive way to keep warm in Japan during the cold months. It consists of a low height table frame designed for use while sitting on the floor with a heat source built into the underside of the frame. This is covered by a thick blanket to trap the heat and a tabletop rests on top. The blanket can be removed so the kotatsu can be used like a regular table. I want one so bad. <laughs> Genji jump scare. <laughs> As we entered the entrance hall, an aged servant greeted us. Now him, I remembered. As the most senior member of the staff, Genji-san served as the head of the servants. Bathler-sama, we've not met in a long time. As our eyes met, he saluted us with a composed voice. He didn't give us as quite a refined bow as Goda's, but it was a bow that had feeling, even if it wasn't polished to the same degree. Genji-san, it's been absolute ages. You look well. Thank you. I've been quite well. 
And you, Battler Sama, I see you've become a splendid man yourself. I would even say you've grown to somewhat resemble the Master during his youth. I'm looking like Grandfather? I guess that means Grandfather was pretty popular when he was young. <laughs> uh, word is that the Umineko anime is terrible. Yes, it is especially terrible. Like, just the, the most terrible you could possibly imagine. Um, it is not even worth watching. Uh, they screw up one of the, like, fundamental, uh, clues of the mystery as well, so it literally makes it functionally impossible to solve, not even counting the fact that they didn't even finish it. They only got through episodes, uh, one through four, and there are eight. So, yeah, you just have to either read the VN or the manga. Uh, the anime will not be a good experience. From here on, I shall take Shannon's place and accompany you. Please, come this way. Shannon Chan bowed deeply and saw us off. Leaving the entrance hall, we headed to the dining hall under Genji-san's guidance. Genji-san, just like Kumasawa-san, stood in stark contrast to us young people who had grown beyond recognition over the last six years. His figure was exactly the same as in my memories of six years ago. It seemed like time had stopped since we last met. Genji-san was a silent and diligent person. He was like grandfather's close aide or caregiver. In fact, you could even go as far as to say he was Grandfather's right-hand man. Actually, it seemed that he was by Grandfather's side more than my late grandmother was. What did they mean by this? <laughs> According to Jessica, Grandfather trusts him more than any of his blood relatives. But I wonder how long he's served. I've never asked for details, but I think I heard he's been here since the beginning, when this mansion was constructed. That is to say, he's dedicated over half his life to serving here. No wonder Grandfather trusts him. As we cut through the open-ceilinged hall behind Genji-san, I found something I had no memory of from six years ago. Oh boy, here we go! It was an awfully big portrait hung in front of the stairs that rose to the second floor. Without thinking, I stopped walking under its spell. Since I'd suddenly stopped, Maria, who was following behind me, ran into my back. Hmm? Uh, sorry. Hey, Jessica, did that picture used to be there? I pointed at the large and conspicuous portrait hanging in the hall. Everyone else stopped, too. Oh, right. When you last came here, that been, hadn't been hung yet, had it? When was it again? I think... If my memory doesn't fail me, it was around the year before last. You're correct. In April of the year before last, the Master had this painting put on display, which he'd instructed an artist to paint for him some time prior. Grandfather did that? So he went out of his way to have it drawn. The portrait depicted a woman in an elegant dress, who gave off a sense of refinement and who seemed to suit the Western style of the mansion. I couldn't have guessed her age, but the sharpness and obvious strength of will in her eyes gave me the impression of youth. It was a different feeling than the composed mood of a middle-aged woman, middle-aged women who were often in famous pictures. If this woman had normal black hair, I might have thought it was a portrait of my long-deceased grandmother in her prime. However, the woman in the portrait had beautiful golden hair and didn't look Japanese at all. So, who is she then, that woman? As though trying to show off her knowledge, Maria answered that simple question with authority. Oh, I know. Beatrice. Be- what? Beatrice. She's the witch. Didn't you ever hear about her long ago? The witch? You mean, of this island? I think I already said this, but Rokenjima is a small island that's only about 10 kilometers around. However, considering that only the Ushiramiya family lives here, that's quite large. So only a harbor and the site around the mansion were set, to be lived up, set up to be lived in. Beyond that, the island remained as untouched as it was when it was still uninhabited. To understand just how dangerous a vast and empty forest with no lamplight phones or people passing through it all actually is, you need to shift your urban assumptions a little. You see, if by any chance you fell down a hole in the depths of the forest and sprained your ankle, cry or scream, no one would come to save you. If it then got dark, the forest, where there are no streetlights, would become enshrouded in complete darkness. Also, since there obviously aren't any guideposts here, it's easy to get lost and lose your sense of direction in the dark forest. Nowadays, most people would see forest as a, the for, a forest as a peaceful place. But to the people of bygone eras, before the light of civilization drove out the night, forests were like oceans on land, geographically separating one culture from another. 
Just as fishermen who go out into the ocean occasionally have their lives put in danger despite their technical knowledge, technical knowledge was also demanded of hunters who went out into the forest. And their lives were occasionally put in danger just the same. If a child were to go playing in that dangerous forest, something terrible might happen. Some parent must have had that thought. Maybe my grandmother, or possibly the man himself, my grandfather, might have said it. Or maybe it was a story handed down on this island from long, long ago. There's a terrible witch in the forest, so you must not go in. Thus Rokenjima's ghost story was born. This is the legend of the witch on Rokenjima. So when we say the witch on this island, we're referring to the master of the vast and savage forest. Which reminds me, when I was little and stayed at the mansion, during the eerie nights where the wind and rain struck the windows, stories like the witch of the forest is roaming around in search of a sacrifice would scare the heck out of me. Beatrice. Huh. As I searched my memory prompted by Aniki, I did vaguely remember being told that was her name when I was very small. Right. Still, I completely forgot that the witch of that legend had an elegant name like Beatrice. God damn. Don't tell me Grandfather went out of his way to have her depicted in this painting just because it, us grandchildren refused to believe him. It's that witch from the grand, Grandfather's delusions. Ever since he had this picture hung up, he's been losing the distinction between fantasy and reality. To us, it's no more than a witch from his imagination, but to Grandfather, she's a being who exists on this island. Exists. That's why he says he had that picture painted, so that we'd understand. <sighs> Creeps the hell out of me. Milady, to the Master. This is an important portrait. I must request strongly that you not say such things in front of him. I know that. You couldn't get me to say it even if you begged me. Jessica turned away after glaring a second at the portrait. Let's go. We're making every everyone wait in the dining hall. Hmm. Hungry! Only a small portion of this island is controlled by the Ushirimiya family. If all of the wild remainder was the witch Beatrice's domain, and one could say that she was the being who actually ruled over Rokenjima. That unsettling, ominous feeling I had felt on the boat trip when I learned that the shrine had been struck by lightning revived within me just a bit. At that time, Kumasawa-san had been trying to tell an ominous story about Rokenjima and had been stopped by Jessica. I didn't know what she had tried to tell us about this island, but there was one thing I did know. Rokenjima's ruler was not the Ushirumiya family. It was the witch, Beatrice. Yes, because this was the witch's island. Butler! Ugh, slow! When I looked around, everyone was already heading towards the dining hall. I hurriedly chased after them. We walked up to the huge double doors that led to the dining hall. Genji-san knocked. I brought the children, if you'll excuse me. The door was opened, and we were invited inside. The dining hall, which screamed filthy rich, featured a super long table which was obviously designed with no other purpose than to make the guests conscious of their rank, and our parents were already seated at it in accordance with that ordering. You're late, brats. Hurry up and take your seats. That old bastard pressed us to sit. Only the places where we would sit were empty at the t long table, which only made us feel our tardiness all the more. The seat at the very head of the table, which you might call the seat of honor, was for the most highly ranked and reserved for grandfather. It was still empty. He was probably planning to come in last to make himself look important. The seating order, as you face the seat of honor, went from right to left, left to right in rows of two, with the ranking being lower the further you were from it. So on the left-hand side of the row closet, closest to the seat of honor, was the second-ranked seat, belonging to the eldest of the adult siblings, Uncle Kraus. It looked like he hadn't arrived yet e either, so that seat was empty. And then opposite of him, on the right-hand side of the first row, sat the eldest daughter of the family, Auntie Eva, ranked at number three. The left-handed side of the second row was for number four. There sat the old bastard Rudolph as the third of the siblings. Opposite him sat number five, the youngest sibling, Auntie Rosa. Going like this, you might think that the next ones to come would be their husbands and wives, but guess again, because the left-hand seat in the following third row, meaning rank number six, was actually Jessica's seat. Opposite her was George Aniki. Then, the seat next to Jessica was me. And me uh, opposite me was Maria. And next to me, on the left-hand side of the fifth row, all the way down at number ten, finally, came Aunt Natsuhi. Opposite her was Uncle Hideyoshi. And next to Aunt Natsuhi, in the sixth and final row on the left-hand side, was Kiryasan. The seat opposite to Kiryasan had been laid out like the others, but was empty. According to this ranking system, that spot was where Aunt Auntie Rosa's husband should be sitting. 
He hasn't come, as far as I know, yet the table has been laid for his seat. These kinds of ranking orders usually permit the spouse of a corresponding status, but the Ushiramiya family had an original kind of ranking. Maybe it's a leftover of male chauvinism, under the notion that a mother's womb is only a temporary house for the child and she contributes no genes, the children of direct descent would have the highest ranking followed by grandkids, meaning that the spouses with no blood ties would be considered the last in line. It's terrible, but according to that ranking order, grandmother, if she was still alive, would be in a position even lower than mine. In youth, obey your father, after marriage, your husband, after aging, your children. A leftover of the times when they used to say, women no home in three worlds. Long ago, when I was still incapable of figuring all this out, I'd thought it was so great that we could all chat with the adult siblings sitting in their group and us cousins and ours. However, now that I can re-examine the seating order after growing up a bit, it stirs up some very complicated feelings in me. Aunt Natsuhi, married to the eldest son of the family, responsible for managing the household, and number two for all practical intents and purposes, sat to my right, which meant that she was two steps lower than me in the ranking order. It was difficult to guess what was going through her head. That's why I made a small apologetic gesture before sitting down. How nice to see you, Batlakan. You've grown quite tall, haven't you? Huh? Uh, yeah. Normal life, you know? Food, meals, eating, and then suddenly I was this tall. Boys do grow fast, don't they? How tall are you? I guess about 180 centimeters? No, wait, you missed your moment. You're supposed to jump in with, did you do anything besides eat? Huh? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. After a moment, she gave a small laugh, but it seemed she couldn't quite figure out what she was supposed to be laughing at. This woman is Aunt Natsuhi. She's the wife of the eldest son of the family, meaning she's my dad's older brother's wife. It's easier, is it easier to get if I just call her Jessica's mother? It feels bad to say it like this, but not that I hated her, but I didn't particularly like her. She never got into our kids' circle, and my only impression of her was as someone who always talked about complicated stuff with my parents while having a crabby expression on her face. The fact is that having barely ever exchanged words, I hesitated a lot even just now about how to approach her. And it was pretty much a flop. It's wild how 20 minutes ago Battler was doing what he was doing, and since then he's gone on about patriarchal structures and affecting the seating order and condemning it. I know, he lit it's so, it's so, like, the whiplash is so crazy. Um, the Ushirimiya family is so, they're such a family. <laughs> the silverware had been tidily set up on the table, but the meal itself hadn't been brought in. As a rule, the meal doesn't start until the man at the head of the table has taken his seat. So long as grandfather, the highest ranked, didn't come, lunch would be indefinitely on hold. Not even the appetizers would come. In other words, the silence in the dining hall was the sound of our parents as they withstood their hunger and waited on tenterhooks for father and grandfather to come. Except the grandfather I remembered always showed up at the right time when we ate together like this. He would never have been so late as to have everyone waiting on him. Grandfather's pretty late. As far as I can remember, he was always strict about staying on time. Well, maybe six years ago, yeah but not lately. Seriously, he's off in his own little world now. He doesn't even show up at family meals. I figured he'd at least stick around for today's meal, though. That said, if he doesn't turn up, I'll be a hell of a lot more relaxed and happier to boot. Jessica. After being scolded by her mother, Jessica faced the other way, sticking her tongue out. No way around it. Nothing to do but wait for the host to arrive. When I glanced at the clock, I saw that it was almost 20 minutes past 12. The aged master of the Ushiromiya head house, Ushiromiya Kinzo, he was there in his study. The clock showed noon, but it didn't even attempt to get up. With reading glasses on his face, he stacked up old-fashioned books with elaborately designed bindings on top of one another beside him, immersed him, immersing himself in their reading. It definitely didn't look like it was for leisure. On the contrary, he exuded impatience, crisis, as though every minute, every second was precious. The sealed room was dense with dancing dust particles, and the air stagnated with a mix of smells and various elixirs, each giving off its own suspicious stench. They were somehow sweet and heavy. For anyone with a good nose, the first thing they'd do after entering would be to open a window and ventilate the room. The knocking against the study door had been going on for a while. A voice calling, Father, sometimes mingled with the knocks. As Kinzo heaved a deep sigh, he snapped shut the old book he had in his hands and slammed it on the table. Then he yelled at Kraus, who was continuing to knock on the door. Silence! Will you not stop that noise, fool? Who taught you that doors shall be opened unto you if you knock? 
They crucified that imbecile. Do as you wish to, do you wish the same upon yourself? Father, today is the day of the family conference. It comes just once a year. Everyone is gathered downstairs. Please, come out. Kraus called out to his father through the door. Kinzo always shut himself up in the study and hated letting even his family into the room. For that reason, Kraus had no choice but to call out to thus, out thus from the corridor. Molest me not, everyone. Who is everyone? You refer to the fools trying to drag me out of here? Then kill them all. Chop them up and make them into firewood. Feed them to the witch's hearth. Put a pot in that hearth and boil wormwood. And if still there remains imbeciles foolish enough to dare and try to lure me out of here, force them to drink that broth of the apocalypse. Preserve the remainder in liquor. Genji, where are you? Call for Genji! Have my demonic absence prepared? The whispering of this green fairy reaches me no longer. Where is Genji? Call for Genji! Before the door, Kraus, Nanjo, and Genji kept waiting for the master of the house who would not come out. <laughs> Looks like he hates me to his core. My voice doesn't reach him anymore. Kraus shrugged as though saying it's no use and smiled bitterly. He himself hadn't believed for a moment that his father would answer his calls. However, as it was the duty of the eldest son, he had formally made the request. Kinzo son, your son's daughters and grandchildren have come to see you, you know. How about you show your face? Just a little? Shut up! Be silent! You dare admonish me, Nanjo! I do not call for you, I said to call for Genji! Now hurry, call for him this instant! Time is short. The apostles are already readying their trumpets. Why do you not understand this, you foolish sheep? Kinzo slammed the old heavy book on the table over and over. The racket obviously indicated his highest displeasure. Kinzo put his spectacles down and flew up from his chair. He spread his arms wide open as if to sing to a packed opera house, as if appealing to someone, and yelled, Why? Why is there always something in my way? I would throw it all away. I would offer up everything if there and there's only one thing I ask for in repayment. Oh, Beatrice, if I could see your smile but one more time, I would plunder the smiles of the earth and offer them all up to you. Oh, commanders of the Locust Legions, reap the smiles of the earth. <coughs> uh, all is filthy. All is irksome. Why must I suffer this impediment on my most precious of days? <laughs> Call for Genji! <laughs> I have no idea what he's yelling. I guess he's finally gone nuts. Krauson, isn't that a bit harsh to your birth, mother? My dad is already dead. All the tears a phantom of what he once was. At any rate, as long as he lacks the will to leave that room, there's nothing we can do. Kinzo-san. Choking coughs continued to pour from the study. I'm going back downstairs. It would be a waste to let that lunch go to so proud of getting it colder. It's one of the few things the others have to look forward to here. <laughs> Kraus spun on his heels. He looked at his wristwatch, mumbling and acting as though he had wasted time doing something he knew would be in vain. Genji-san, father is calling for you. Keep him company. Certainly. Dr. Nanjo, let's go eat. If we stay here any longer, even our sense of taste will go insane from this sweet smell. Without waiting for Nanjo, Kraus went downstairs. Genji urged Nanjo to go and eat. Nanjo looked to Kraus's back, first to Kraus's back as he disappeared down the stairs, then to the study door and let out a deep sigh. Sorry, Genji-san. Please. Yes, please leave it to me. If possible, don't give him alcohol. It's too powerful a habit. Is Genji not here yet? Who dares keep Genji from coming? Oh, where is Genji? Call for Genji! No, please leave it to me. Hmm. Sorry. Nanjo gave a small duck of his head and he descended the stairs. Genji saw him off and knocked at the study door. My lord, it's Genji. Genji, why must you make me wait so long? There's no one there I trust. Yes, I'm alone. Kinzo returned to his seat in the study and pressed an old-fashioned switch on the table. After a small delay, the heavy sound of the door unlocking could be heard. Kinzo believed that this fami his family might try to break into his study, 
Perhaps someone once opened the window for some air and scattered some important documents or something, and that had made him extremely upset. Now Kinzo had, pla now, Kinzo had placed a secure lock in his room, making it so that without his permission nobody could enter, and locking himself in the dungeon he himself created. Genji, who he trusted the most, was relatively free to enter the room, but even that was not absolute. If Kinzo was in a bad mood, even he wouldn't be able to enter. Anyone else would be limited to holding a conversation through the door, not even seeing his face. And most of the time, they wouldn't even get a real conversation. However, that didn't pose any particular problem for the family. That was because they had no reason to go out of their way to interfere with the retirement of the cantankerous and the aged head. The fact that he was completely immersed in his odd research and always locked up his hideaway was something of a benefit. They made the most of his refusal to leave the study, entrusting him to the hands of the servants while they themselves kept their distance. Genji, my usual. I'm busy. Yes. Genji headed into the corner of his study. There, suspicious-looking bottles boasted venomous boasting venomous colors about were on display. They were actually liquor, but considering that they were placed in this shady-looking room, you could almost suspect that they might be ghastly poisons. The insides of the study were filled with a mountainous library of outlandish books that Kinzo had amassed. They were bizarre old books, some banned, and each and every one of them either forbidden, cursed, or sealed. Of course, if one were to actually call them old books, Kinzo would fly into a rage and say something like this. Call them grimoires! There were candles which had melted in a suspicious-looking fashion, and taken on peculiar forms, and all manner of other strange objects, probably having something to do with black magic. The constellations covering the celestial globe would have caused anyone who knew the night sky well to raise an eyebrow. The illustrations inscribed in old books, haphazardly left open, ranged from the religious and mystical, to the demonic and grotesque, as well as bizarre diagrams of various magic circles, and above all, the sweet poisonous smell that filled the room, which to those in entering for the first time would surely be a profound assault on their sense of sm sight, smell, and all their other senses, making them lose their grip on reality. Inside that study, Genji, with his well-trained hand, prepared Kinzo's usual drink. If you didn't know that the ghastly dark green liquid that filled the complexly designed bottle was liquor, you certainly wouldn't want to put it in your mouth. He poured a small quantity of the spirit into the glass, placed a cube of sugar in a strangely shaped spoon, and then poured water from a pitcher over it. Strangely, when the colorless water was poured into it, the dark green liquid turned a cloudy white. It created the small the strange visual illusion that the water had caused a chemical reaction, which made it all the more difficult to perceive the concoction as liquor. To this, he added an original flavoring that Kinzo liked, and fine-tuned the taste. There was no recipe. It was a success, its success was measured only by Kinzo's mood swing when he drank it, and he had learned how to make it only after many decades. Genji placed the glass on the tray, and made his way over to Kinzo. Kinzo was now gazing out the window. As you ask, my lord. Thank you. Kinzo had regained his composure, so much that he was now unrecognizable as the man who had been shouting, screaming, and yelling just moments before. In that man's back dwelt a dignity and intelligence made plain simply by how he tilted his glass and gazed down at the scenery beyond the window. Genji, in order to allow Kinzo to set down his glass any time, motionlessly waited behind and to his left, as though he were a living sideboard. As he did, Kinzo stuck out just the glass, his gaze still directed at the world outside the window. There was just a mouthful remaining. It was not a gesture intended to set it upon the tray, as Genji expected, but was a motion to hand the glass over to Genji. Drink it, my friend. That is more than I deserve. No need for ceremony between us. Drink it, friend. Thank you. Genji re respectfully received the glass and inclined it a little to taste its contents. Then he downed it in one gulp. I attempted to imitate your concoction, but no matter how I try, I cannot replicate the taste. The way you make it is pure relish. Thank you very much. It is the fruit of your guidance, my lord. <laughs> Kenzo smiled at his loyal subject who refused to put aside even rank when asked to. However, he was not making fun of him. It was relaxed, like a smile at a close friend's unreadable bad habit. We have grown old, you and I. I forgot my age a long time ago. But I was permitted to live the life I have until today has all been thanks to you, my lord. Kinzo gave a thin smile as if to say he didn't need any compliments. You've se served me exceedingly well these years. My sons call me eccentric. The servants that were once many, all of them, retired in their growing fear of me. Only you, even now, serve me. 
That is more than I deserve. I doubt that I have much time left to live. My sons are vultures, lazily waiting for my inheritance to fall into their hands. And a fool Kraus squanders money like water, throws away two gold coins to obtain one. With that, he deludes himself into saying he earned money. Ava is a slave to money, thinking of me as a hen or whatnot. As if when I die, she'll even use my carcass to make broth. That dunce Rudolph just wants to fool around with women. Rosa bore the baby of a nobody. Jessica is incompetent and illiterate. George has none of what it takes to be a man. Battler is a fool who threw away the honor of the Oshiramiya family. And Maria is obscene to the eye. Why? Why is the Oshiramiya blood so incompetent? Is there anyone worthy to inherit the glory I built? Of course, I know. This is Beatrice's curse, I know it. The Golden Witch, is this supposed to be your revenge against me? Hate me if you wish. Run away if you wish. I won't let you go. I won't let you go, won't let you go, won't let you go! You are mine. You cannot be anywhere but in my arms. You are my entire life. You continue to whisper for all eternity in my birdcage to me. Only to me. Beatrice, why won't you give me back your smile? Oh. <laughs> Beatrice! <laughs> oh. After howling, Kinzo choked once again. <laughs> it's, it's every time. <clears throat> Hold on, I have to take a drink of water after that, actually. <laughs> Ugh. Genji set the tray and the glass down and patted his master's back. Genji's facial expression did not change. It was always like this. <sighs> Thank you, my friend. After his almost deranged outburst of the past few minutes settled down, Kinzo regained his composure once more. The way his attitude changed was like seeing two different people, a wild Kinzo and a composed Kinzo, living together inside one body. And so... Oh no, wait, that's Kinzo. And so... I have decided. I cannot stand spending the insipid remainder of my life procrastinating like this. If I have any final coins left to gamble, then I choose to abandon them all to the whims of the demon's roulette. The power of magic is always determined by the risks staked upon it. Like visiting a shrine at the Hour of the Ox in ancient Japanese sorcery, to nail a cursed doll to a tree. The magic power dwells in incurring the risk that it will be seen before seven days pass. The more dangerous the risk, the stronger the ma magic power will be. All the various miracles that appear in myth can be called crystals of astonishing magic power, obtained through miraculously low probabilities and astronomical risks. That Moses parted the sea was no miracle of gods. It was that the utterly desperate risk weighed upon the scales of oppression, of being cornered by soldiers on the Red Sea shores, which gave birth to miraculous magic power. Even if the same thing occurs again, on the same scope, the sea will not, no doubt not part. That is because Moses managed to spectacularly draw out the single miracle carved in the roulette of those power, which has more pockets than a sogi, and now to multiply together. To explain this one, <clears throat> Asogi and Nayuta are very large ancient Japanese numbers. Modern Japanese is more likely to express numbers of this size using powers of 10, just like Western languages. The English counting system expresses numbers using a thousands based system. Thousand times 1000 equals a million, times 1000 equals a billion, times 1000 equals a trillion. But Japanese uses a system based on 10,000s instead, which can make converting the two quite confusing. Uh, and then there's just a table of all of them. Multiplied together, Asogi and Nayuta give a number so large that it doesn't even have a Japanese name. So, you know, he's basically just saying, it's really fucking big. <laughs> the power to triumph over astronomical odds. Yes, magical power is, in other words, having the luck to grasp miracles. To obtain great magical power, one must bear a risk that is hopelessly great. Those who possess no magic would call this not a bet, but pure desperation. However, those who truly do possess magical power can grasp hold of that miracle and make the enigma come into being. And if that power exists within me, I will seize that miracle. I will be able to make the wish I devoted my life towards come true. Kinzo looked up to the sky outside the window. He spread his arms as if appealing to someone up in the skies. And if... 
And if I were to have what it takes to obtain that miracle... Beatrice... Beatrice... Show me your lovely smile once more. No matter how much time passes, your face does not vanish. I just want to see your smile, that is all. I'll return everything you granted me. I'll return all the glory I've gained since that day. I don't need fortune, prestige, gold. I'll return everything you granted to me. I just want to see your smile. I beg of you, Beatrice. Oh! <laughs> His nonsensical yells segued into a scream and then into a wail. Kinzo crumpled onto the floor and clawed at it with both hands. Genji had no choice but to wordlessly watch over his master's lament. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the head of the family is not in his best shape. He considers it a great shame that he will not be able to partake in lunch with you all. You've assembled especially, you having assembled especially for this long-awaited yearly meeting. Goda, let the lunch begin. Certainly. Well then, ladies and gen gentlemen, we shall begin today's luncheon. It will, it will be a, a luncheon to remember, Seymour. <laughs> yes, I made it here, despite your directions. Dr. Nanjo, is father's condition that bad? Surely he could have at least showed his face. Rather than his physical condition, it's his mood. And for that, there's no medicine I can prescribe. Oh, come on, for God's sake, mood again? You come to hear how he's doing, making time in our schedules in this damn busy, se busy season of autumn. That's just... Hm. And we got, you got what you wanted, Rudolph. You managed to hear how he's doing. Or do you want to take my place and try to persuade our ill-humored father to come join us? <laughs> Are you kidding? Rudolph shrugged. Apparently, even though Rudolph seemed to resent the way his father did whatever he pleased, he'd rather avoid seeing his face if he could help it. Does it seem like his mood will improve before dinner? And Kress Nisa? I, had no, I have no idea. You can try to ask father directly, although I think his mood will improve faster if we don't bother him. The only one who can bring grandfather's temper under control is Genji-san. Pretty damn pathetic when you have to have a servant deal with your own parents' bad mood. Jessica. Don't speak out of turn. She'd planned for her complaint to only be heard by her cousins, but it had reached even Krause's ears. Scout scolded, Jessica scowled and turned away, sulking. His condition can't be that bad, can it? With that kind of temper? I mean, if they were saying he's not feeling well, that'd be one thing, but if it's his mood that that's, that's that bad, it's at least proof he's got some fight in him. Well, Grandfather does have especially strong willpower, but it doesn't mean that his body will always follow that. Since last year, they keep saying that he only has three months left. If the initial diagnosis was correct, Grandfather has been prolonging his life by willpower alone. Alone. We have to be concerned for him. Lunch started with the family head st seat still empty. Uh, hold on, actually. Uh, I'm gonna get up for just a second to check on dinner stuff. Literally just a second, but yeah. Okay, we're good. I just wanted to check on the status of dinner. <clears throat> uh, whenever dinner is ready, I will probably, if like I'm still streaming by that point, which I probably will be, then I'll probably like take a pause to like eat for a bit. But uh, you know. <clears throat> the man who should have been sitting there was already old. And the brilliant glory which had rebuilt the Ushirimiya family in a single lifetime was slowly being forgotten. Nobody seemed to feel uncomfortable when the meal began with that seat still empty.
The Ushirimiya Family Conference was held once every year. It took place on the first weekend of October. If a normal family were to use a pretentious name like Family Conference, you'd expect it to be nothing more than a reunion of rarely seen relatives who greet each other surrounded by buckets of sushi. However, in the Ushirimiya family where the sons and siblings are lent great fortunes, and only those that achieve success in business are considered adults, it literally was a conference. How much of the fortune was invested? What kind of business was conducted? How much was earned? As a result, how much of the fortune borrowed from the main family could be repaid? Or alternatively, how much would be borrowed for future business ventures? What lessons had they learned, and what could they learn from their mistakes? It seems that topics like these had been discussed very seriously in the past. My dad called it a- oh wait, okay, it's back to battler narration. <clears throat> My dad called it a ba bed of nails. Apparently, it used to be a very serious family meeting where one would commonly be show showered with harsh and angry voices, and even get slapped in the face despite being well past the age for it. However, that was all a thing of the past. By now, everyone had achieved success in their own independent business ventures, and it was on the, ro it was on the road to becoming a normal yearly get-together. Even so, being asked by grandfather about the current state of play was an extremely stress-inducing event. And while to us grandchildren it was nothing more than a simple meeting, to our parents it was a, still a real stomachache. The absence of a man responsible for all of this, whatever the, the man responsible for all of this, whatever the reason behind it, must surely have made today's lunch even more delicious. The phrase, when the cat is away, the mice will play, comes to mind. Well then, let me introduce Jessica's father, whose face I haven't seen for six years. The man sitting to my dad's left is his older brother and the father of Jessica, Uncle Kudos. This name is sh sure is easy to read. Kraus. After so many weird names, it warps your sense of what's normal and you start to think, hey, what's wrong with Kraus? Sounds pretty cool, actually. Just like without Natsuhi, I, didn't have, I don't have many memories of speaking with Uncle Kraus. He had never been one to talk to children, and I felt like he was always talking with the adults, just like Aunt Natsuhi. From the way my dad talked about him, it seems he used to be pretty, a pretty spiteful and unreasonable person. If what dad said is true, he used to be very domineering as the oldest sibling, and was hated by Auntie Ava, Auntie Rosa, and the rest of our family. Odd, considering they're all having fun chatting together. Well, even if their relationship was bad when they were children, sometimes when people grow up and go their separate ways, their relationship changes. That's probably what this is. After all, they all have children of about the same age. Since they share similar family environments, they probably all profit by exchanging opinions. Maybe because of that, the parent circle has been deep in conversation for a while now about the exams Jessica and I are going to be taking. Jessica, in order to escape the discussion of exams with the old bastard sitting on her left, was purposefully facing to the right, firing off topic after topic so as not to give him an opening. Moving on, let's look at the end opposite from Uncle Krauss and the others. In the very last seat of the table, an old gentleman with a sturdy physique sat facing Kyrie-san. This was my first time meeting him. I had only just been introduced to him, but it seemed that he's father's gran person grandfather's personal doctor, a man called Nanjo. Apparently, he used to own a huge clinic on the nearby Nijima Island, but he turned it over to his son and then began living a life of leisure in his old age. He's known grandfather since the very beginning, when the mansion was first constructed on this island, and they have a history going back several decades. I thought he might be grandfather's companion in his, in his suspicious hobbies, but surprisingly, it seems that he's grandfather's chess partner. I see. That kind of hobby does seem very much like our grandfather with his love of Western style. He could probably also call him the only person able to enter Rokenjima who is neither a family member nor a servant. From listening in on his conversation with the womenfolk seated, seated near him, he gave the impression of a calm old gentleman. Considering he's managed to put up with our short-tempered grandfather for so long, I'm sure his big heart's nothing to laugh at. Still, even if he is his doctor, having someone from outside the Ushirimiya family attending the family conference is a little odd. From that fact, I imagine that grandfather's condition has grown much worse, and it may even be one of the major topics of discussion at the family conference. George Aniki was just saying it, too. For the past year, grandfather has been continually pronounced as having very little time left to live. It's awful to talk about, but Grandfather is an extremely rich man. At the time of his death, his wealth will suddenly be released, along with our parents' stomach acid surely leading to some serious ulcers. With this kind of thing, the greater, no the, greater the number of ways it must be split, the more trouble will be caused by splitting it. This kind of talk would probably also be included in the family conference. Oh well, it's not like it has anything to do with us children. Finally, even though he's absent, let me introduce our Grandfather. The person who should be sitting in that seat is the se in the seat of honor is Ushirimiya Kinzo. It really sucks. He gave everyone else in the family these weird names, but he himself uses one which is conservative as all hell. If only his name was written with those same characters for gold and vault, but he let us call him Goldsmith or something. 
That'd be totally awesome. As you can probably gather from all the talk about him, he's a frightening person with an extremely short temper. Because I'm just his grandkid and haven't met him since I was in elementary school six years ago, I don't remember ever having been beaten by him, but it seems that our parents were raised with an iron fist. That earlier conversation between my dad and Uncle Kraus about who should go try to convince grandfather to come out seems oddly funny if you take this into account. In order to tell grandfather's story, you have to take yourself all the way back before the Showa era to recount the tale of the Ushirimiya family. And of course, the Showa era, as helpfully pointed out here, is from 1926 to 1989. Until the Meiji, 1868 to 1912, and Taisho, 1912 to 1926, eras, the Ashiramiya family was great and prosperous. They owned several spinning mills and were very wealthy people who merely had to laugh about falling, uh, ha merely had to fall about laughing while the money rolled in. Incidentally, grandfather as a member of a branch family originally had nothing to do with the main family. Distantly separated from the head's inheritance, he apparently had very little involvement with the head house. However, during the Great Kanto Earthquake in 1923, the mansion owned by the Ushirimiya main family in Odawara was flattened. The spinning mills in Tokyo were all burned down in a huge fire, and the Ushirimiya family lost most of its wealth and family members in an instant. It then became a matter of who would become the heir to the main family, and as it turned out, none were left except for Kinzo, who was as far removed from the main family line as they come. Kinzo himself later said that it was such, a good, such good luck, it was as though fate itself had been turned upside down. With that, Grandfather's ordinary life did a 180. He was entrusted with reviving the wealth that the dying Ushirimiya family had almost completely lost. Of course, just because you suddenly dump a task on someone doesn't mean they can do squat to accomplish it. I doubt the people around him were expecting much. But this is where Grandfather began to display his extraordinary talent and good luck. Grandfather used all of the family funds and everything from the hair on his head to his toenails as collateral to borrow a massive amount of money created a gigantic supply of funds and immediately started a business. It was like tumbling down a hill on a bike without any brakes, and then jumping onto a neighboring bike and then another one. Just like some crazy street performance. Probably anyone would have thought that Grandfather had no business ability. But with an unbelievable amount of good luck and miracles, with coincidences piling up and every chance taken advantage of, before anyone knew it, he had forged powerful connections with the Allied forces. At that time, MacArthur and the GHQ were in charge of Japan. Grandfather, in a twinkle of the eye, began succeeding in business under the protection of the occupying forces, quickly becoming very rich. At this point, it was no longer luck, but information that won the day. He must have made some seriously thick connection connections with the occupying forces. Grandfather knew about the emergency demands that would be made for the Korean War before they happened. No, more than that, he must have foreseen these special procurements and started penetrating those markets from the very beginning. History textbooks say that all of Japan made a large profit off the emergency demands for the Korean War, but that wasn't the case in reality. Only a very limited number of the super-rich played the money game and made an easy profit. Most of the citizens remained poor. In other words, Grandfather was an extremely lucky member of this group of winners. This all happened during the year 1950, I think? And since the year of the Great Kanto earthquake was 1923, that means Grandfather was able to revive the near-dead Ushirimiya family to a level even higher than it had been before in the span of only 20 to 30 years. With that, you'd think he would revive the main family in Odawara, but for some reason he went and did something as crazy as buying an entire small island in the Izu archipelago. Buying an entire island's not something that you can ordinarily do today. However, Grandfather was clever. He contacted the GHQ and applied for the establishment of a marine resource base. He acquired this island as a business property, and then reneged on it and claimed, claimed it as part of his own plot of land. After the war, there were prevention measures against food shortages, and furthermore, he had the sponsorship of the GHQ, which meant that nobody could oppose him. It seems that Tokyo provided the land for next to no money at the time. Tokyo later made repeated complaints for the land to be returned, but not much could be done due to the involvement of the GHQ, even though they'd been pushed into it. No doubt he'd bribed everyone there was to bribe. In the end, the city gave up in frustration. Grandfather, with considerable skill and blessed with good luck, managed to weather the stormy seas of that period, obtaining a vast fortune in his own island. Of course, it wasn't all luck. He was skilled with English, and this was cultivated by his Western obsession. It was by using that as a weapon that he was able to make inroads into the GHQ. A mansion was immediately built on the island. That would be this mansion. Grandfather, who had always loved the West, made this once uninhabited island, Rokenjima, a canvas upon which he could realize his dreams to his heart's content. The Western mansion he had always imagined, overflowing with emotion, the beautiful garden where various roses had been planted. 
and a private beach where nobody other than himself would ever be permitted to leave a footprint. To have this much would be every man's dream. After that, making good use of his huge fortune, he became a large stockholder in the extremely stable iron and steel industry and was able to live an easy and comfortable life just using the dividends. Well, he's just that incredible. The kind of per this per kind of person normally gets portrayed after the fact as having the ability to foresee and predict the future or something, but Grandfather denies all of that, repeatedly saying that he was simply blessed with extraordinary luck. Anyway, even a lord like that, with all of his dreams made real, can't help but grow increasingly odd when locked up alone on an island. Everyone knows he's been obsessed with the West for a very long time, but none of our parents really know where his bizarre black magic hobby began. Perhaps his love of black magic began way back when he became fascinated with the West, or possibly his miraculous stretch of good luck which allowed him to revive the family caused him to feel a mysterious power in himself. At some point, Grandfather began to make the research of black magic his life's work, filling his study with suspicious books, chemicals, and magical items as he became increasingly bizarre. bizarre. Yo, no way! Bizarre? Like George's Bizarre Adventure? <laughs> These being the few remaining years of a person successful in life, those around him warmly watched over him, feeling that the, t the time was his to spend as he pleased, or so I hear, but no way in hell that's true. They probably were just driven away, thinking, that's disturbing, I don't want to get involved. Well, that war-torn period was a big time for gambles, with both opportunities and risks. No, literally, weeb for the West moment. He literally is. He's like a Westaboo. But, like, you know how people are like, you know, oh, d d d my my anime blurbos are so kawaii. He's he's probably like that, but like he'd be like, oh, Columbo, my favorite blurb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd be a big King of the Hill fan. True. I'd like to see Grandfather do so well if he'd been born into this time period. He would have had no opportunities and would probably have advanced like a chess piece from mandatory education to college at a leisurely pace never becoming more than an average company employee. If that had happened, he'd probably be sitting here with the rest of us, regaling us with tales of his shitty boss. No, no, not here, in the dining hall of a mansion. We might have been around a table at some bar. If that were the case, I'm sure this would have been a more comfortable family conference. <laughs> to be fair, a lot of people are like, oh, Columbo, my favorite Blorbo. True, me included. I do like Columbo. All right, that's enough talk about the old geezer who won't pop off. More importantly, let's talk about this incredible lunch! I was already sold by the sashimi, sh sashimi salad. Goto-san is one hell of a chef. Plus, these fish were caught in the oceans near here, weren't they? The sashimi you get at the supermarket don't even come close. Hey, quit it, Badler. Your upbringing will be exposed. Everyone let out a big laugh. Damn it, you say that even though you love those cheap pubs. <laughs> My job occasionally leads me to eat some quite interesting places, but even compared to those, this is an excellent dish. I imagine you could have become reasonably well-known in that field, Gota. I don't know too much about it, but at the famous hotel where he used to work, employee politics got pretty complicated and everyone split into factions. In the middle of all that, he was apparently forced to retire. And it just so happened that Mom had job offers for a servant out at the same time. As Gota cleared away the empty plates, he began to recount his own eventful past, never losing his smile. <laughs> the world is a difficult place. However, it's thanks to that that I was given a chance to display my skills as a chef once again, this time for the Ushiramiya family. Although I enjo also enjoy the smiles of a larger number of people, it's also extremely entertaining to be able to perform delicate work in order to please solely the limited number of people I've pledged to serve. All of this is thanks to the opportunity given to me by Madam. Goto-san respectfully bowed his head towards Aunt, Na Aunt Natsuhi. That's because among all of the applicants, you were the most talented. The decision was not based on personal feelings, but purely objective, so there's no need to thank me. Oh man, why does Aunt Natsuhi have to, al have to speak so always have to speak so frankly? If only she spoke more gently, she might give off a different impression. Oops, I clicked off the window. <laughs> Shannon-chan and Kumasawa-san entered from the hallway with a serving cart. Please, excuse us. Now then, let us move on to today's dessert. Goto-san and the others laid out the beautifully adorned dessert. I guess it's true when they say you have another stomach for desserts. I thought that being fed all that delicious food had totally filled me up, but as soon as I laid my eyes on the dessert, my stomach started yelling, MORE! I don't know much about desserts, but this looked really good. A white pudding-like substance was garnished with two shades of red sauce, and elegant rose petals adorned the dish. When you dine on such magnificent foods as this, 
First, it's distributed in front of everybody, and then the chef takes a moment to extol the virtues of his creation. Until he's finished, as a rule, you don't touch the food. However, Maria, who had no experience with these ceremonious rules, got excited by this beautiful and delicious-looking dessert and jumped into the fray as soon as it was placed before her. Auntie Rosa scolded her, calling it bad manners, but George responded by saying, No, no, it's all right. Huh? This one's sour. This one's sour. Battler, the wrong one is this... The wrong one is this one. Ugh. Maria exclaimed as she sampled the two colored sauces. What? There's a right one and a wrong one? All right, I'll give it a go. Mm. Apparently, the two sauces were one sweet and one sour. Despite it being bad manners, I also stuck my little finger in and licked it. Whoa, one of them was sour enough to make you pucker up. If it were yellow, I'd have suspected lemon, but I couldn't guess what kind of sourness would be red. I decided to ask Shannon, who was putting away the serving cart behind us. Shannon-chan, what kind of sauce is this sour stuff? Um, uh... Shannon-chan hesitated to speak. Maybe she was just setting the table and doesn't really know. She's hesitating a bit much for that, though. Did I ask something wrong? Or did they use something we'd be better off not knowing about? While Aunt Natsuhi acted as though she had a headache, Kumasawa-san, who was setting the other side of the table, began to laugh with a... <laughs> What do you think we made it out of? <laughs> it will shock you. Hmm? I don't have a clue. And Kumasawa Bachan, that laugh creeps me the hell out. So what is it? Don't tell anyone, all right? Let me borrow your ears. Kumasawa san leaned across the other side of the table. She'd asked to borrow my ears, so I leaned forward too. Their interest caught Jessica, George, and George Aniki, and of course Maria also put their ears closer. Mm. What? What? Tell me, tell me. The sour part is, well, actually, it's squeezed juice from a mackerel. <laughs> what? Mackerel? Don't be ridiculous, we all thought horrified. Only Maria accepted it, nodding with a, mm-hmm. Hmm? Mackerels are sour. If you squeeze them, this comes out. <laughs> When Maria started clamoring that mackerel were sour, the adults were unable to contain their laughter. You got it wrong, that's vinegared mackerel, Auntie Rosa said to Maria in a small voice while turning red. Now I remember it perfect. Oh no, wait, that's not Kumasawa, it's just Bowler. Uh, now I remember it perfectly. Kumasawa-san always made th was this kind of character, wasn't she? I think I remember her tricking me about all kinds of things when I was young as well. Amongst all of them, the most painful must have been that one. That flimsy black stuff you get in Chinese food. Kikurage mushrooms. She told me that it was penguin meat, and I went all around school like a smartass telling everyone, didn't I? Kumasawa <laughs> Bachan, you sure haven't changed. You know Maria's gonna believe now, right? <laughs> it's just a joke. Godasan will tell you what the sauce is in just a moment. Godasan looked a little put out from putting his, having his masterpiece laughed at in such a strange way. But after clearing his throat once, he introduced the dessert to us. <laughs> well then... Allow me to describe tonight's dessert. Uh, based on the rose garden that everyone seemed to enjoy so much today, I finished this panna cotta in rose garden style. The rose petals scattered across were selected just now from the rose garden. For the sauces, I've prepared two different reds for you, strawberry and rose hip. Please enjoy the strawberry sweetness and the rose hip sourness in, in turn. <clears throat> Finally, the rose petals are merely decoration, so please set them aside before eating. With that said, please enjoy. Ah, <sighs> man, I almost want to applaud before I've eaten, even eaten it. It's like when you take medicine, you know? How it seems to work better when you've read the instructions? Thanks to Godasan elaborating on the details of this dessert, I feel like he's knocked it up another notch. Seriously, should you call him meticulous or just talented? The dessert was probably planned from the beginning, but he took a cue from our stopping in front of the rose garden earlier today and displayed an incredibly timely awareness of the season by adding just a few rose petals from the garden. This combination of sweet and sour was also exquisite. If it was just sweet, you'd get used to it and become bored halfway through. But by bringing in the sour sauce at that point, you get a really vivid taste. And then, once you return to the sweet sauce, all of the sourness in your mouth is replaced with an enjoyable sweetness again. I'm sure everyone else felt the same way. Every time Goda Pusan passed one of the seats, someone praised the taste in his creation. How is it, madam? Splendid, as always. It's a worthy treat for our guests. I'm almost great. I'm most grateful for your words. Madam, did you know? I've heard that Rosehip has the ability to cure headaches. I thought you'd especially appreciate it, so I had it specially prepared. Is that so? Thank you. See, didn't I tell you, Natsuhi Rose Rosehip works on headaches. So it seems. 
I can only hope it has some effect. Ah, <sighs> Goda-san, I love ya! Hey, later whisper me how much compensation you're getting for this, would ya? If you're sworn to silence, you can stick up some fingers instead. Let me know your price. Having your talents monopolized by this small island is sacrilege to human humanity's cooking culture. Wouldn't you be willing to display your talent to all the customers at my company? <laughs> idiyoshi san are you trying to recruit our Goda? How troubling. We'd better make some improvements to his salary or he'll get, he'll get snatched away. <laughs> yes, you really should. If you don't, he'll be lured away and you'll be stuck with three meals a day of Kumasawa-san style mackerel cooking, won't you? <laughs> That's indeed harsh. It seems someone's holding a grudge. <laughs> Everyone let out a huge laugh. According to Jessica, Kumasawa-san's mackerel jokes were a type of running gag, and our parents had long since gotten used to it. Kumasawa-san often claimed that mackerel contained precious nutrients that could do things such as prevent aging and make people smarter. It seemed that while it couldn't stop the outward signs of aging, it helped prevent aging on the inside. She was still healthy enough to tell these kinds of jokes at her age. That benefit must be the real thing. <laughs> well then, if you'll excuse me. Prepare yourself for tonight's dinner. I'll be cooking plenty of mackerel dishes for you to eat, so look forward to it. <laughs> we sure will. I want to treat myself to some vine ma vinegar mackerel tonight. That sounds wonderful. I wonder if any delicious Japanese sake will be included. Oh, it certainly will. How about some of our famous Rokenjima mackerel liquor? <laughs> Kumasawa-san, together with Shannon-chan, bowed and pushed the serving cart away. Amusingly, Goda-san, who looked just as though his stock had been stolen from him, explained very seriously that tonight's dinner would actually be calf steak. God, I wish we were getting steak. Ugh. Um... Kumasawa-san, thank you for doing that back there. As she pushed the serving cart, Shannon bowed her head very deeply. <laughs> I haven't done anything that requires thanks. Kumasawa played dumb, but it was no accident that she had thrown Shannon a lifeline. Back when Battler had asked her for the details of the dessert, Shannon had unfortunately hesitated. There may have been several ways to dodge the question, but all of them should have been delivered deftly. Shannon, who hesitated when hard-pressed for a response, was always suffering because of this small weakness. If only Shannon, like Goda, had a little bit of the craftiness needed to skillfully shake off a mistake, her days would be a little more comfortable. The weak this weakness was especially unfortunate, considering how flawlessly she could handle her work. Of course, there were those who well understood Shannon's meek nature and her inability to remember to gloss over her mistakes, which is why Kumasawa came to her aid without hesitation. I just heard from Genji-san that there's been a change to the afternoon shifts. I believe you were given a break until this evening. <laughs> I'm jealous. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't checked the list of my shifts yet. Ah, uh, yes. I was thinking I might start cooking some mackerel in the oven. If you don't mind, I'd be happy if you'd help out a bit before your break. <laughs> yes, I'd be delighted to help. To Shannon, Kumasawa was like a mother among the servants. The dining hall needed to be cleaned up, so, as, so we were chased out. Instead, tea would be served in the parlor. It seemed that they would be preparing the black tea that Auntie Rosa had bought for Aunt Natsuhi. Maria insisted that she also wanted to drink the black tea, but was rejected by the old bastard, who told her and the rest of those kids to go play outside. Bethler couldn't... Why don't we go for a walk outside? Go look at the roses or something, but keep a close eye on the weather. The sky is still clear, but the weather report kept on talking about rain. Oh, I want the beach! Want the beach! <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful idea? Playing on a sandy beach isn't something that you get to do often, is it? I guess not. All right, let's go to the sandy beach then. Ooh, let's go, let's go. Maria, be careful not to get your clothes wet. Your shoes too. Hmm, won't get wet. <laughs> so obedient and cute. Butler can make sure you keep an eye out for Maria-chan, okay? Sure thing, leave it to me. Oh, you're pretty cute and obedient too when Kiryu asks you something, huh? Why don't you try listening to me obediently for a change? <laughs> Hell no! Let's go, everyone! Come on! The children flew out of the parlor. They were replaced by Genji, who pushed a serving cart in and prepared the black tea. The parlor was filled with a sublime aroma which entertained everyone while they waited to appease their thirst. Actually, n yeah, okay. So earlier I was thinking of the wrong scene when I said, like, oh, the adults are here. Maybe there's, like, if I'm remembering, it's drama time. Uh, I was thinking of the wrong scene. This is the scene that I was thinking of, I think. We are about to get so much catty shit from these people. Just, just witness the sheer, like, pettiness.
of the of the Ashiramiya family on full display. <laughs> Rudolph, your your family all seem to get along so well with each other. Good for you. No, oh, please, you have us beat on that front. So true. Jessica Chan really has grown into an innocent little thing, hasn't she? It's all the fruit of your training, isn't it, Natsuhine san? Thank you. Natsuhi answered coldly. With that conversation with that the conversation halted, and the parlor became silent. Possibly because he couldn't stand it anymore, Hideyoshi broke the silence while performing an exaggerated gesture. Still, they sure do grow fast. Thought they'd be kids forever, but they've been getting huge right before my eyes. Before I knew it, they joined the ranks of us adults. Badler can for once beyond recognition. His body's gotten much bigger, but he's still a child. Well, my husband is still a child as well. I wonder where the border between a child and adult is. I still don't feel as though I've grown up. <laughs> Isn't that pitiful? That's not something the mother of a child should say. That's right. We're not children anymore. We're all adults. So I would like it if we could hold an intellectual discussion without becoming emotional. When Ava smiled with sharp sarcasm, everything seemed to get grow more tense. It felt like the smell of the tea that had been prepared so carefully just flew out the window. We've always strived to hold intellectual discussions. Your sarcasm is ill-placed sometimes. You've never changed in that respect. Always strived, is it? My, my. I wish I could wrap those words up and send them to this room a few decades ago. Right, Rosa? <clears throat> Rosa smiled with a vague expression. Whether she agreed or disagreed, she knew she would earn the displeasure of either her brother or her sister. It was a bit of worldly wisdom she had needed to learn as the youngest sibling. Quit it, Aniki. We should enter into the main topic while the brats aren't around, right? Let us make our intellectual discussion. As Rudolph glanced over the faces of all present, some let out a slight sigh, and some let out a small look of resignation, let a small look of resignation cross their face. This was the unavoidable, true agenda. Last year, his life expectancy was estimated at about three months, which means he's already at minus nine. The Grim Reaper could come flying through the window in a blind panic at any moment. The family head is still in good health. Raising such an inappropriate topic while the sun is bright, I must question whether you're in your right mind, Rudolph's son. Still not to you, son. If we don't discuss this until something happens, it'll be too late. He's still healthy now, so we gotta figure out something while we still have some time left over. It's kind of a financial etiquette. It seems as though everyone's concerned about father, Dr. Nanjo. Could we hear the details from you? It seems as though they're also hoping for that. <clears throat> Nanjo, standing by the window and calling out at the Rose Garden, let out a single cough when he realized that he was being called. Dr. Nanjo, how is father's condition? Well, first... My estimate last year that he only had three months to live still appears to be making its presence felt, so allow me to start by correcting it. No need to explain. You're saying that measuring remaining life is only a prediction, not a promise, right? That's correct. Because of that, I can offer no definitive answer to the question you all ask, so often ask of me, of when he'll pass away. Uh, yeah, so uh, as, a, as a little tip off, since somebody mentioned the music track in the uh, chat, uh, every time a new music track starts in this version of Umineko, you can see the track title listed in the top left corner of the screen. Uh, if you wonder why I do uh, track titles in the top left corner of the screen in all of my video essays, uh, I got it from this. <laughs> a human's life is supported by their body and mind. If the body is weak, the situation becomes more dangerous, but if the mind is strong enough to compensate for that weakness, it's possible to maintain a state of remission. So you're saying that even if his body is weak, his mind is firm and spirited? Kyrie, sorry, but please stay quiet for a while. Sorry. That's correct. Kinzo-san's body has been ravaged by disease. With him continuing to partake of that kind of strong liquor on top of all of that, I really must think... So booze isn't the reason he's teetering on the edge. And booze is also the reason he's hanging on. Sounds like Dad, the heavy drinker. Well then, Doctor, I know you can't give any more, anything more than a prediction. But what do you think about Father's chances of living until this, ne this day next year? That is quite the rude question to ask about the head. Natsuhi jumped on Ava, unable to hide her astonished expression. 
In response, Ava returned a defiant look, but Hideyoshi noticed and tried to smooth things over with a forced smile. Natsuhi-san, forgive her. Ava, try and choose your words a little more carefully, okay? I'm sorry. I was just so concerned over father's condition. <laughs> Is that so? I hadn't realized. Dr. Nanjo, please, tell us. For the sake of this beautiful family love of a daughter worried about her father's lifespan. Krauss laughed sarcastically, and Ava, smiling sweetly, returned an identical chuckle. You ask whether he'll still be healthy next year, but it is a very difficult question for me as a doctor. While I do think this remission will last for a while yet, if he suffers some kind of fit, there may be nothing we can do. After all, Rokenjima is a solita solitary island. It's not as though an ambulance can come rushing in to save him. Uh, we haven't gotten to the umbrella scene yet, nope. Uh, that will be coming, w well, I say soon, but like, soon relative to Umineko time. <laughs> Normally, I would want to have him hospitalized in a large hospital on the mainland, but Father stated that he does not want his noble research interrupted. It seems he holds a grudge over the way we forced and tried to force him out last year. Okay, wait, okay. So it's been about ten minutes since then. So, okay. Dinner will be ready over here in about thirty minutes. So that's about, like, I'm fifty... 10, like 10, 10. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> sorry. Trying to keep track of uh, my dinner. <clears throat> Apparently, he strongly suspects that he'll be shut away in some hospital if he goes outside. And that's how things are now. Has Dr. Nanjo been examining him? Father trusts Dr. Nanjo. It seems he can be, be examined when in a good mood. I can examine his condition, but if I try to recommend medicine or hospitalization, he refuses to listen. I've really only been able to look. It's true that there are people that hate doctors. Still, what a hassle. Nanjo sighed deeply. The purpose of an examination was to determine what medical treatment was appropriate. Receiving an examination and then not following the advice given made the whole thing pointless. Then, in summary, his expected life is still three months. And there's no way to guess how long he'll continue to live while on the verge of death. Rudolph, son, couldn't you be more discreet with your words? Mm, sorry. I've always talked this way. Cut me a break. I understand Dr. Nanjo's opinion. What do you think, Kraus Nisa? <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I have to disagree with Dr. Nanjo. I find it truly difficult to think of Father as a person so sick that he only has three months to live. His yell is as healthy as ever, and I still get the chills at the thought of his fists raining down on me. Punish, pushing the task of caring for Dad solely on the shoulders of the eldest son is far from fair. <laughs> In the next world, be born after me. All right, let's return to the discussion. In that case, according to the impartial and neutral doctor's opinion, it wouldn't be odd for him to go any go any time. Sorry, Aniki, but I'd rather trust the opinion of a specialist. With that, I believe the discussion of Dad's fortunes no longer a premature topic. Father's personal funds probably reach into the tens of billions of yen, right? But, that, but it's not as though all of that is neatly gathered as ready cash. It's not as simple as neatly cutting a birthday cake with a knife. Interesting metaphor, Aniki. That's right, sometimes strawberries or chocolates are placed on top of the cake, making it hard to cleanly divide it into equal parts. Taking that into consideration, I think it's important to first discuss how best to stick the knife in, don't you? I truly don't understand you all. Even while the head is still alive, you're discussing the matter in loud voices as though he were already dead. Come now, don't you see how important this is? After all, when the time comes, the inheritance of his fortune must be carried out immediately, right? Moreover, the wealth of the glorious Ushirimi of house is vast. Don't you understand that a careful discussion is necessary beforehand? There's a huge difference between the assets of this family and your old one. How rude. The family I was born to has nothing to do with this. As Natsuhi resentfully responded in a low voice, the already dark atmosphere grew even more hostile. Give it a rest, Ava. Natsuhi, son, forgive us. Pardon her rudeness. Hideyoshi tried to smooth things over by glancing at both with a forced smile, but it only resulted in making the hostility between Ava and Natsuhi even more intense. It seems that I'll just be in the way if I stay any longer. Please excuse me. Nanjo like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Nanjo rose from his seat and exited the parlor. 
This may well have been a normal act of courtesy expected of an outsider, but even so, his back was watched by several glances envious of his ability to escape. After all, the doctor had exited and his footsteps had disappeared into the distance, Krauss recrossed his legs. So let me see if I understand your point of view complete and correctly. Father's remaining life is short. You want to quickly enter into a practical conference concerning the distribution of the inheritance. Why are you so eager, I wonder? Certainly, as you say, estimating and distrib distributing the Ishirimiya family's wealth is no simple task. In that case, shouldn't we carefully and deliberately calculate? It seems to me that you're all impatient to split up the cake tonight. Isn't that's true, isn't it, Rosa? Is something making you impatient? It's not that we're impatient, but a decision between the siblings is essential. It doesn't matter when, but if father's condition is worsening and the day is drawing near, discussing the, ma discussing the matter beforehand isn't what I would call impatience. Rosa sneaked a glance at Ava and Rudolph, as the youngest daughter in the family being cross-examined by the eldest was harsh. Yeah, if you've noticed, it's, like, it's a very subtle thing, but if some of you who have never read Umineko before have noticed this, uh, the older siblings, whenever they are trying to like make a point and get one over on each other, frequently target Rosa because she is the youngest. Because she has the less like the least footing to stand on, they intend to like Im intentionally embarrass her. Uh, it's it's super fucked up. Huh? Is that your true opinion? I didn't expect the most honest and pure-hearted of the siblings would say something like that. I wonder if those two told you to say that. Quit it, Aniki. Rosa's a sibling just like the rest of us. She has a fair right to Dad's inheritance. It's obvious she would be interested, right? After all, Dad de will definitely die, and that's not something that'll happen in the distant future. On the contrary, Aniki, you're far too relaxed. It seems almost as though you would like nothing better than to turn the discussion away from the discussion of the inherit distribution of the inheritance. What do you mean by that? Or are you trying to accuse my husband of something? Calm down, Nasuhi-san. Listen to what we have to say. Nissan, I hear these are very good times nowadays. That's right, since last year, the yen has just been going up and up thanks to the unprecedented boom in, pros in prosperity. It seems that it's no longer a dream that the dollar will reach 100 yen. Also, the ruling party says that we'll establish a health resort maintenance law by next year. At this moment, resort development companies across Japan are running about trying to gather as much capital as they can. You know your stuff. Soon, Japan will see an unprecedented boom. Just like when father revived the Ushiramiya family, another case like the Korean War demands. The people of Japan have worked at a frenzied pace, realized vast economic growth, and become the most prosperous people in the world. They're enjoying the height of their prosperity. Private spending has increased, and institutions that can profit from that can make easy money in this era. The people's needs are no longer merely the essential three electrical appliances. Places to ski, to golf, public pools, resort hotels, and theme parks. Have you gone to Delsneyland, which opened just a few years ago? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is Japan's economy in 1986. Uh, Japan's economy tanking... Um, I can't remember specifically when it was. Um, Krauss is kind of on the beat here, but, uh, but yeah, it was the bubble economy, um, which obviously popped... Uh, eventually, so, you know, he's not, he's, he's not completely off, but, um, it, it gets really unpretty not too long after that. <laughs> what an excellent theme park that is. In that place, even an adult can be a kid and have fun with his family. The old era, where the only virtue was to selflessly devote yourself to your country while failing to consider your family is ending. Now, as the most prosperous people in the world, we can finally accept that. Krauss Nissan, your foresight's something else. When I heard this several years ago, I thought it was ridiculous. But see, when I heard about the G5 Nations Plaza Accord, that changed. The yen's getting stronger and stronger, and the price of land will skyrocket soon, I bet. The day that Japan becomes the economic center of the world isn't far off. You have a very... you have a very forward-looking view. There's no mistake in that, at least. I feel the same as Hideyoshi Nissan. Aniki, you can read into the next decade of history. That keen sense surely came from Dad. It's incredible. However, unlike Dad, there have been cases where your ti the timing of your predictions has been mistaken, haven't there? Nissan, believing that Japan will definitely face an economic boom, you've been launching resort projects everywhere, and almost all of them continue to fail. 
While I'm sure that the era you predicted is arriving, it seems that you misread the timing of that boom. You were too early. And then you hurriedly tried to sell everything off, and as a result opened the wound even further. If your nose really was so reliable, and you predicted the coming of a boom, then there should be no reason for you to sell off your property. Isn't this the proof that you don't trust your own ability? How rude. Are you trying to insult my husband? Natsuhi's forehead creased as she rose from the sofa. Ava, paying this no heed, stared at Kraus with a confident smile. Kraus, who also maintained his confident appearance, told Natsuhi to sit down. Please stop, Natsuhi. My little sister is incapable of speaking any other way and always has been. Calm yourself a little. Your headache will get worse. He literally is like, um, your female hysteria is showing, honey? Proof that you have no talent is also right here. After all, Nissan, weren't you also excited about turning this island into a resort? Building a wonderful resort hotel, beautifully maintaining the garden. I'm just an amateur and don't pretend to understand, but you must have used a significant amount of money, right? What are you trying to say? My husband's business has nothing to do with you! Actually, that's not true, Natsuri-san. Rokenjima's not Aniki's. It's Dad's. The hotel that was constructed is Aniki's, of course. If you like, you can charge us lodging fees tonight. Right, Rosa? Well... If what I have on hand will suffice... If I can make it into a resort, the island's financial worth will rise. It's true that expenses have piled up, but we can hope to have a large harvest in the future. Uh, are the kids listening in on this? No, they went to the beach. When that happens, it should prove to be beneficial to all of you as well. I understand that. If the value of the island rises, that will increase our shares when we distribute the inheritance. Of course, we won't ask you to physically divide the island mansion into four equal parts. We're quite happy to settle this with whatever you calculate its financial worth to be. If you understand that much, what about my business makes you so dissatisfied? We aren't dissatisfied, we're uneasy. In the first place, Aniki, when do you plan to open that hotel? Keep this up and every square inch of it will be covered in our grubby handprints. That's right. It's an important tool for your business, isn't it? I understand that you can't keep it locked up until the moment you open it for business. Buildings go bad if you don't use them and air them out every once in a while. Even so, it's a bit extravagant for a guest house that we only use once a year. Wouldn't you say, Rosa? Um, that's right. If it's that wonderful, I'm sure it will become quite popular once you open it. Hmm. The hotel you mentioned earlier was referring to the guest house. I see. Hell of a building, isn't it? Just as Rosa said, I'm sure it would become popular if he were to open it. The lodging they had been guided to had not been constructed with the intent of building a guest house. It was originally constructed as a resort hotel. However, even though it had been completed two years ago, there was absolutely no schedule for it to be opened. Nissan, it's just like all of your enterprises. Your attention and planning are both fabulous. Then it always becomes unable to maintain itself part way and ends without being able to collect any profit. It was brilliant of you to spot that it was a waste to use this island only as a place to live. I think that turning it into a result, resort which could use things like marine sports, fishing, or honeymoons to attract customers was a pretty good plan. If I were the oldest son, I'm sure I too would have racked my brains over what kind of profit I could get out of this island. But two full years have passed since you finished building, right? After two years, you still don't know when you'll be able to open it? Where is the managing company you instructed it to? It, it entrusted it to. Impertinence! That is not my husband's fault! There has just been some trouble with the company that my husband contracted with. No matter how you look at it, we are the victims here. That's the thing, though. This company that Kraus Nissan hired, I haven't heard many good rumors about it, you know? Let's not beat around the bush. The project disintegrated midway due to non-payment, embezzlement, and other troubles. Did you think the rumors wouldn't reach our ears? I've been collecting evidence. I don't know what kind of evidence you found, but it's all baseless. As new members in the sightseeing business, it is necessary to lay the groundwork with various people. It is also important to discuss how trustworthy the other party is. This is nothing more than taking some time to meet that end. I'll accept that. In my rashness, the hotel was completed too early. However, we're not pay paying maintenance costs. It's a slow and vital strategic arrangement. Yeah, I bet. More like you want to sell it, but can't. There's no reason for anyone to buy at such an extravagant hotel on an isolated island with nothing on it and no established sightseeing routes. Besides, what's happening with the loans you gathered for this project? It might, might, might not be costing you maintenance, but the borrowed money you can't return is just going up and up. Sorry, Kraus Nissan. I investigated the development plan for this island a little. I gotta be honest, I've not heard anything good either. Hideyoshi-san. 
I'm sure that only looking at the current financial condition could lead you to that impression. However, that is a prior investment. I have no choice but to admit that my prediction was mistaken, and that up until now, several liabilities have been created. However, those times have finally caught up with me. I will soon regain everything that I lost up to this point. No, actually, all of the investments I have made until now will finally return to my possession. That's right, just like throwing away a small fry which then becomes a salmon, they will come back even bigger than before. Sure, I'm with you on that. Starting soon, the resort business will probably see, a, see an unprecedented boom. Though, who knows whether it'll be enough to bury all of your liabilities. But I gotta ask, Krauss-san. After all the crushing defeats you've suffered so far, who in the world supplied you with the funds? That's a heck of a sum we're talking. Enough to cover your massive debt, right? What are you trying to say, Hideyoshi-san? Ah, uh, Natsuhi-san, please don't get mad. We've done our research, see? We looked into it, trying to see who could have loaned Kraus Nissan, uh, who's lost all his battles thus far, enough to support his recently massive gutsy investments. And the result? No one. There's no backer. The iron rule of the money roulettes to bet against the unfortunate. And Aniki, you are well known unfortunate. You are a well known unfortunate in this neighborhood. Surely this era seems set to welcome an economic boom. But when we asked who, with respect to Aniki's failures, would find him worthy of funding? Well, there was no one. So you see, where did you raise that money from? That's where w what we started to question next. My investments will return soon. Have you heard of something called the blockchain? <laughs> literally, Kraus. Literally, I need you to understand. If you want to know what kind of person Kraus Ushirimiya is, he would unironically get into NFTs. Unironically. And he would be like, don't disparage that, that brilliant man who sold me that, that brilliant ape. <laughs> That's what we started to question next. Huh. Isn't this an interesting story? And? D dear how long do you plan to ignore these abusive remarks? Sit down, Natsui-san. Let me be blunt. Aniki, you've been diverting Dad's private funds for your own business. There's almost no doubt. If we made some mistake, please feel free to explain it to us. Rudolph, this isn't diverting funds. This is embezzlement, isn't it? It's a genuine crime that can be criminally prosecuted. But th this is rudeness in the extreme. How can you even face the successor to the Ushirimiya headhouse and level these wild accusations? They aren't wild. They're right on the money, aren't they? He wants to make his business succeed so that he can recover his losses, but his debt is actually growing. All he wants to get himself out of the all he wants is to get himself out of the hole he's dug by making an even bigger gamble than before. If he had cl funds close at hand, it's only logical that he'd try to use them. Let me say it clearly, Nissan. What you're doing is embezzlement. You are betraying our father. I imagine that you will that will we will leave you to the mercy of the courts after this is all over. Do you think these people will kindly agree to address you at the as the successor of the Ashirmia Head House? Of all things, saying he's betraying the head is not something I can overlook. You no longer have the right to darken the doors of the glorious Yoshirimiya house. Leave this place immediately! Go on! Get out! Natsuhi, who had already reached the limits of her anger, shouted at Ava in a rage. She then pointed alterna alterna alternately at Ava and the hallway, indicating that she should leave. Ava took out a folding fan and fanned herself with it glaring maliciously at Natsuhi as though silently daring her to repeat what she'd said. However, her mouth was still smiling, curved in the shape of a crescent moon. In that unpleasant silence, Rosa gasped, gulped, rather. Hey, Natsuhi Nesan, who do you think you're speaking to? I'm speaking to the extremely impolite sister of my husband. As the person in charge of family affairs, I cannot overlook any more of this. In charge of family affairs. <laughs> Shut up! You sorry excuse for a wife! Ava folded the fan with a snap and rose powerfully. Compared to the elegance and playful behavior she had shown until just now, she was unimaginably aggressive. How foolish! You leave! You would tell me, Ushirimiya Eva, me, Eva, the third ranked in Ushirimiya family hierarchy, who is granted the left shoulder of the head to leave. 
Learn your place, and then look in a mirror at your shabby figure. Where on your clothes is the wing? Where are you permitted to wear the one-winged eagle? Your only purpose was to birth a successor to the Ushiramiya family. Know your place, bitch! While Ava's face grimaced unattractively, her words pierced Natsuhi's heart like claws and painfully twisted in. <sighs> there were a hundred ways Natsuhi wanted to respond. However, her anger and sorrow crushed her throat, and not one of them managed to make it to her mouth. The anger, which had lost any place to go, became a single hot tear which slowly dripped down. <laughs> what? If you have something to say, please, say it now. Come on. Eva faced her with a provocative gaze. However, Natsuhi's fist was shaking. She trembled all over, unable to do anything. Krauss quietly broke that powder keg tension. Natsuhi, leave your seat. You should cool off your head. What? <laughs> Natsuhi, resenting the fact that her husband had not come to her aid, shifted the focus of her attack. Don't you understand what they're saying about you? These people are baselessly calling you a traitor to father. We protect the glory of the Ushirimiya family. We put forth effort day in and day out, striving to be paragons of nobility in order to take over that glory from father. And this inexcusable rambling trambles it all underfoot. And you, why didn't you talk back to them? I'm talking back because you won't. But you have been just relying completely on me. And now you are telling me to go cool my head? It's always me. I'm always thinking so seriously about this family's affairs. And you have just taken that and... <laughs> Not so he could no longer hide her tears. She flew from the room in that state. After all, all that remained was a somewhat embarrassed mood about the parlor. When the sound of footsteps grew distant and silence returned, Krauss shrugged his shoulders slightly. I apologize for my wife. She's always been bad at controlling her emotions. I too have a hard time with her. If you've gotten someone like that running things, you must be on edge constantly as well. Ah <laughs> oh, man, this sucks. <laughs> they treat her so bad, dude. I feel so bad for her. Oh, uh, I should point out, by the way, just one of the other, like, interesting observations that you can make about the social dynamic here. Ava, and you will learn this more as we go on, but Ava absolutely knows what it is like to be uh, on the receiving end of uh, misogyny. Uh, she has dealt with it through her family in, in direct response to her and her ambitions and, uh, you know, everything that she does. And so it is, like, particularly sinister in a lot of ways that, like, someone who knows how badly that can affect you is, like, <laughs> you know, like, I make the joke, but, like, Ava really is, like, feminism, but only for me. <laughs> like, she turns misogyny around on other women so sharply and so aggressively, and, like, she knows exactly how to utilize it. Adam, it's nothing. Leave me be. Natsuhi flew into her room and bent over the bed, wailing. Those heart-wrenching sobs reached Kumasawa in the hallway. How heart-rending, heart Madam Natsuhi. There is a deep enmity between her and Eva-sama. Explaining their relationship is very draining for a woman such as myself. The Ushiramiya family holds its bloodline in high regard, but if a daughter marries into another family, they would normally be removed from the family hierarchy. So under normal circumstances, Eva-sama should have been removed when she married Hideyoshi-sama. However, and this was not anyone's fault, Madam definitely bore no guilt. There's no way to say it other than calling it a whim of God. Kraus-sama and Natsuhi-sama were not blessed with children for some time, and of course, this was the patriarchal Ushiramiya family. A wife was just a tool to create an heir. If that wife could not fulfill her only duty, she would not be treated as human. It is painful to remember how much the master tortured Madam during that time. During that time, Eva-sama and Hideyoshi-sama's wedding was discussed. Eva-sama was sly. Taking advantage of Madam's inability to become pregnant, she gained the favor of the master. 
She inspired him to allow her to marry and gave birth to a successor herself, making sure to avoid transferring her name out of the Ashiramiya register. There was a vast difference in the Ashiramiya hierarchy between Madam, who married into the Ashiramiya family and was treated like an outsider, and Eva-sama, who was related to the family by blood and whose husband took on the Ashiramiya name. And beyond that, Eva-sama was the first to give birth, and what's more, to a boy. Perhaps you can now understand how much weaker Madam's position was compared to Eva-sama's. I'm sure Madam is tormented by the thought that if only she had gotten pregnant earlier, the master wouldn't have accepted Eva-sama's request to keep her last name after marriage, and Eva-sama wouldn't have been permitted to act as arrogantly as she did today. However, that was not Madam's fault. All of the blame lies with God's whims, and the stork that delivered Jessica's son late. Even so, Madam wouldn't allow herself to see things this way. She probably can't help but cry bitter tears at her inability to carry out the duties expected of a wife. Ah, oh, how heartrending. I cannot do anything but watch over her from the shadows. Oh, boy. Anyway, <laughs> on to more pleasant interactions. We crossed the hall again on our way to the entrance. Well, soon to be on to more pleasant interactions. There is a bit of creepiness here, but... <laughs> As we did, we once again saw the witch's portrait. However, the word saw is probably not the best word to describe that experience. It was more like our eyes were drawn to it. That woman's eyes, with their sage-like glamour, definitely had the power to make those who looked at her stand rooted to the spot. So, this is the witch Beatrice. Wonder if it's true. Hmm? Butler doesn't believe? Back when he had asked what this picture was, the first person to tell him it was Beatrice had been Maria. Therefore, when Battler showed signs of doubt, Maria must have felt that Battler didn't have faith in her. Of course, that's not what Battler meant. Maria ran up to the portrait and began banging on the plate below it. Maybe the title of the portrait was written there. Maria, trying to prove that she wasn't lying, obstinately continued to hit the plate. Ugh, sorry about that. It's not like I doubt anything that you said, Maria. Hmm. Battler believes. Ooh. When he patted Maria's head and apologized, she seemed to accept it, sticking out her chest and proudly ooh-ooing. Let's see here. My beloved witch Beatrice, behold the sweet fish river. Wait, what's with this weird long epitaph? The plate did have the title of the portrait written on it, but it was much too big to contain only that. Beneath the tile, title, what looked like a long epitaph was also written. As I skimmed over it, I was taken aback by the array of unnerving words that jumped out at me. Um, Maria's ooh thing gets explained way, way later on, like, not in this episode. Um, but you can mostly chalk it up to, like, vocal stim autism. Um, like, you know, kind of thing. <clears throat> Incredible, isn't it? Grandfather had that written. Pretty deep, huh? Oh, I know. It's the place where the gold is hidden. Wait, is that the story about the Ushiramiya family's hidden gold? There's an, there's another thing that takes me back. Wait, Aniki, is that for real? Grandfather had this written, but he refuses to say anything about this picture on the epitaph. Even so, amongst the family, it's often whispered that it points to the location of Grandfather's hidden gold, and that he'll relinquish the family headship and gold to the person who solves the riddle. Hmm. Oh. I heard that too, I heard that too! Lots and lots of gold! Well, who knows, really? Ten tons of gold bars? Sounds a bit too fishy to me. Still, if you read this all the way through, it almost seems real. I think I already explained Grandfather's upbringing, but let me also mention the Ushiramiya family's legend of the gold. Grandfather succeeded the Ushiramiya family after it had almost been totally destroyed in the Great Kanto Earthquake, but by successfully riding the stormy seas after the war, managed to accumulate great wealth. That much of a story everyone knows. However, this is where the strange part of the story begins. Part of it closely, t closely tied to Grandfather's black magic hobby, so its credibility is extremely low, but, well, wait until the end before you doubt or make fun of it. After the war, Grandfather successfully predicted what the future would hold. His big gamble paid off, and he accumulated a vast store of wealth. Uh, yeah, the dinner is probably about ready. Oh. Um, I thought I heard something. I'm listening out. 
but there's a mysterious legend about how he gained the funds in the first place. Grandfather came from a branch family and had no connections in the business world or the financial world, even though he later built connections with the occupying forces, in the beginning he was supposedly a nameless person who had not yet gained anyone's trust. Money can only be gathered based on trust. There's no way anyone would lend money to an untrustworthy person. How did Grandfather, whose trustworthiness was zero, manage to obtain the large amount of funds in the first place? It's said that when, he asked, when asked that question, Grandfather answered like this. One fateful day, I encountered the Golden Witch, Beatrice. He then went on and on about how he continued to research alchemy and techniques for summoning demons in order to become a great mage, and the entity summoned as the result of this demon-calling ritual was the Golden Witch, Beatrice. He then said that he could make a contract where in exchange for his own soul he would receive fortune and honor. The witch then granted Grandfather ten tons of gold. Grandfather used his gold as collateral to prepare a vast quantity of funds, and then used that to multiply his wealth by several times and revive the Ushirimiya family. It seems that this story is so old that our parents had already been told it when they were children. So our parents, when they were little, explored this island in various ways, believing that the gold that Grandfather had received from the witch might be hidden somewhere. However, since there was the danger of them getting lost in the abandoned forest, Grandmother or someone began to spread the story that the witch lived in the forest and approaching it was too dangerous. I remember that old story. When we were little, our parents told us about it and we all went over the island searching for the treasure. Did we get lost in the forest and start crying until one of the servants found us? Our parents were so mad at us. That takes me back. We sure were idiots, weren't we? I mean, come on, Grandfather used that to build up the funds that he finally bought this island with, right? That means he must have had the gold before coming here. There's no way it'd be here on the island. That's not necessarily so. Maybe the gold was hidden on the island from the beginning, and he bought the whole island just to make sure it was all his. There was a whole ten tons of it, right? It seems more realistic than he would try to secure the place where it was hidden rather than try to move it at all. This epitaph was written two years ago, and since Grandfather had it written himself, I see. This does make the legend of the gold more believable. Ten tons of gold bestowed upon Grandfather by a witch that it's said he used to revive the Ushirimiya family. It's sleeping somewhere even now, and Grandfather may be planning to turn it over to who, uh, whoever can solve his riddle. <laughs> I guess that sounds like Grandfather's style or something. <laughs> If it's true, that's one hell of an opportunity. The epitaph carved into the plate was very mysterious, something like a poem or a song. Its sentences were incredibly disturbing, filled with the signs of Grandfather's black magic hobby and, in tr and truly in bad taste. But it could definitely be viewed as a puzzle which, if solved, could lead to the place where the gold was hidden. I can't even imagine if it's what he intended or not. All I can say is this shady epitaph was displayed here so that everyone in the family could see it and that even with, while hinting at the existence of the gold, he still refuses to touch upon the subject of its hiding place. That caused our parents' imaginations to run wild and call it a battle of wits from Grandfather. Bet it's my dad who's talking this nonsense, taking this nonsense at face value, his greed exposed to the world. Even though he laughs at Grandfather's black magic hobby, he'll still believe this story about the hidden gold. He's all talk. Well, it's certainly not a realistic story. At that time, when Grandfather was still nameless without any connections, there's no way anyone would have lent him a massive amount of gold bars for free. Although it's not unthinkable to suggest that's exactly why Grandfather called his sponsor a witch. Yeah, but it's ten tons. Ten tons! If he traded that for money, how much would that come to? Anyway, it'd have to be a ridiculous amount, right? It would be a ridiculous amount. They say the total amount of gold mined by humankind since the dawn of history is at most a hundred thousand tons. That one ten-thousandth of the all-gold humankind has obtained throughout history should belong to just one person is insane. And that it should all belong in one place. And that there should be a witch who could just lend it to Grandfather as if it was nothing. That would be no ordinary person. As for me, I think the number ten tons sounds totally fake. In the first place, has anyone other than Grandfather ever seen it? And even if some generous witch lent him some actual gold, couldn't that ten be right but actually mistaken for ten kilos? Even 10 kilos would be pretty incredible sum, right? Hmm. 10 kilos of gold is how much? Maria, who couldn't keep up and felt like she was being spoken to in riddles, finally found a place where she could ask us a question. A question which I also wanted to ask right then. When I heard 10 kilos or 10 tons, I know that it's an incredible amount, but I couldn't put a number on exactly how incredible. George Aniki folded his arms and tried to remember the market price of gold. <laughs> there it is, that, that iconic quote. <laughs> Well, 
Gold is affected by speculation, and its price can also change depending on its purity and the trustworthiness of the foundry. You would also need to pay a commission to turn it into money. Still, it is definitely a precious metal, and some people estimate that if gold mining continues at its current rate, within half a century we will have mined all of it. Just guessing haphazardly. For one kilo, I think maybe a price of two million yen? Whoa! I know that I just plucked that ten kilos thick figure out of air, thin air, but even that would be worth twenty million yen? Huh? I weigh twenty-eight kilograms. Which means that if we had Maria-chan's weight in gold, we could estimate it's worth at over fifty million yen. That's just mind-boggling. How much would ten tons be, then? It's twenty million for ten kilos, times a thousand, so, um... That's it! Twenty billion yen?! What the hell?! How much is 20 billion yen actually worth? We would have to measure it by putting it in terms we could understand. I mean, they say that wages over a lifetime are 200 million yen. You grow up and work like crazy, sacrificing your life for your company, and as you approach old age, you're finally freed. And all that together, including the retirement money, comes out at 200 million yen. In other words, this is the cash equivalent of a human's life. No, you could even call it the price of a life. We're talking about a sum so enormous that it requ would require a hundred of those lives. Assuming you work for 40 years from age 20 to age 60, then it's equal to 4,000 years of work wages. It's a sum of money you could finally accumulate after working every day starting from the Jomon period. Ooh, is 20 billion yen huge? Yeah, it's huge. Maria, you could buy more, the, more of that shortcake you love than you could eat in a lifetime. However, while I could imagine 20 billion yen in cash, I don't think it's very plausible for it to all be in one place as gold bars. Just as I said, gold is extremely heavy, and it's not very convenient as a method for storing all of your accumulated fortune. If it was all highly valued stocks or bonds, or really expensive precious gems, it wouldn't be unthinkable. You often hear of people who in the chaotic period of the war traded their wealth for precious gems so they could carry it around with them. But you don't usually hear stories of people exchanging their wealth for gold. Of course it's heavy, but internationally it's the most trusted and stable, doesn't that mean something? With bonds, for example, if the country's destroyed, they're just scraps of paper. You can look at it that way. But even one ten, ten kilo ingot is pretty heavy to carry around. Have you ever have you ever heard this? Even if you say a, a fifty kilogram person, bleh, even if you carry a fifty kilogram person on your back, you can't carry a fifty kilogram bag over your shoulder. With that many gold bars, the amount of labor and risk for one person would be hard to calculate. So, what you're saying is if we're talking, if we, we were talking 20 billion yen in banknotes lying around, that'd be one thing. But given that it's supposedly 20 billion yen in gold piled up, it doesn't really ring true. That's right. Although the legend of the gold does have a pretty interesting ring to it, even just the part about the 10 tons of gold is a little bit of a stretch. If you think about it logically like that, it sounds obviously fake. <laughs> kind of brings you back down to reality. That said, it is grandfather we're talking about after all. He may have announced his financing from some kind of rich person in an exaggerated metaphorical way as ten tons of gold received from a witch. Even the number ten tons feels pretty symbolic. Do you mean like his gratitude for the money he borrowed was worth ten tons of gold or something? <laughs> Maybe some rich man's leisured wife generously granted it to grandfather. Maybe he started calling this lady a witch? Hmm, Jessica's example isn't bad. If someone was generous enough to lend a huge sum of money to Grandfather when his trustworthiness was still zero, she would certainly be something, someone worthy of being called a witch. Furthermore, Grandfather later used that money to build a vast amount of wealth. With such incredible ability to judge people, again, she might be fittingly, well be fittingly called a witch. And since she went to all that trouble of lending all that money, she might also have enthusiastically guided how it was spent. Come to think of it, the idea to get involved with the occupying forces and profit from the Korean War demands might have come from the witch as well. With all that considered, saying he received wealth and honor from a witch might actually be a fair description. I see. So in other words, this witch granted the funds necessary to revive the Ashiramiya family and Grandfather Oder big time. If that's the case, and Grandfather had that huge painting drawn and displayed out of feelings of gratitude, yeah, that might not be such a strange story. Hey. What if this person looked like an old witch like Granny? And then Grandfather idealized her appearance and turned her into this beauty when he had the painting drawn. <laughs> How better if we ever did meet this person, she wouldn't be nearly this pretty. <laughs> That's possible. The name Beatrice sounds pretty Western, and if you think about how everyone in our family has Western-style names, maybe even the name Beatrice is the result of Grandfather trying to rearrange some of Japanese person's name to make it sound Western. I get it, I get it. That means this pretty girl doesn't exist outside of the picture. 
Guess that means I won't be able to rub those and yeah, 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 shut up. In the first place, isn't a witch a little weird? Like, you could find something like that anywhere on Earth. As I laughed and made fun of the witch in an attempt to differentiate myself from the kid I was six years ago, who was afraid of the witch of the forest, Maria tugged on my sleeve. The strength with which she did so displayed a little annoyance. Hmm? What is it, Maria? Hmm. Hmm. Beatrice exists! Maria stared up at me. She had on her usual sour look, but I could tell that she was angry because of the color of her eyes. Witches exist! Witches exist! <laughs> well, sure, they do exist if you turn on the TV and watch anime or something. Exist! Witches exist! <laughs> I started to feel pressured, not knowing why Maria was jumping on me like this. Then Jessica tapped me on the shoulder and told me in a small voice, Dumbass, don't go smashing a kid's dreams. Maria really believes that things like witches and Beatrice exist. Come to think of it, Maria-chan, in social studies at your school, when you were asked to write with what you wanted to be when you grew up, you wrote a witch, didn't you? Maria nodded seriously. Tears started to run from the corners of her eyes. I see, to a girl who wanted to become a witch in the future, this Beatrice is proof that witches do exist in this world, and is also someone who she admires and strives to be like. Exist! Exist! Witches exist! But Battler doesn't believe! It's all right. They exist. Witches. Oni-chan believes it. George Aniki kneeled down and held Maria's head. Watching this, Jessica poked me in the side. So that's what it is. It's basically like I just dropped the bomb that Santa Claus doesn't exist, in front of a child who believes in him on Christmas Eve. I'm not the kind of guy who likes to shatter kids' dreams. Uh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to make fun of your dreams. I apologize. Of course Beatrice exists. Ah, food is ready, so I will be back in just a second.
Hello again. Um, <clears throat> I don't know actually like what I want to do here while I'm eating. Uh, do you guys mind if I just sit here and chat with you while I eat? <laughs> because uh, trying to eat curry and read Umineko at the same time seems like it would be a bit challenging. Anywho, so, uh, oh god, that's hot. Should have been a bit more mindful of the temperature. Anyway, <laughs> what I was going to say, though, is, uh, what do you guys, uh, who haven't read Umineko think about it so far? Uh, what are your suspicions? What are your favorite characters or your least favorite characters? Please tell me your tales. Did go to make your curry? God, I wish. He is magical Goda chef after all. You don't like Shannon. Interesting. She's my mentally ill little meow meow, but I understand. I like Nanjo so far. That's based. Liking Nanjo is pretty good. Oh, okay, you're suspicious of her. I see, I see, I see. Liking it so far, but skipped a chunk, so I can't judge. Fair enough, uh, you can catch up on the chunk that you missed on the VOD, I guess, uh, whenever it's done. I've read it up until five or six episodes, which is a long time ago. Is it really possible to solve the riddle in the first four episodes? It is, technically. It would be really, really hard, but it is technically possible. <laughs> Canon is awesome. I enjoy Maria a lot. Can't remember why I hate Maria's mother so much from something trying to watch the anime. You will find out. It was cool in a despicable way. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's the general impression that most people tend to have about Ava at the very least. Is that like she's a terrible person, but she's a very interesting character. Um. Do the cousins have a better relationship than the adults? Absolutely. Uh, they, aside from like these little things here and there where they kind of like argue about stuff like this, they are like way uh, better in their dynamics in terms of like actually getting along. It's kind of one of the like heartbreaking contrasts of like you see the kids who are so innocent and they haven't really gotten to that point in their lives where they're yelling at each other over all this like family drama bullshit and then you have the adults who are like completely jaded and just going at each other's throats hideyoshi on top true i love hideyoshi he's such a guy of all time yeah and that's taking battler's antics into account true also true Hideyoshi gang rise up. True. Um, somebody said a minute ago, by the way, I should be taking notes just in case. That is actually one thing that I would definitely recommend while reading Umineko for the first time. Do feel free to take notes. It will help you later down the line. Actually, while we're waiting also on me. Why don't I go to the characters menu since we haven't looked at it yet. It gives you a bit of a flow chart here um, to read character descriptions. So I will leave one up for a little bit and then move on to the next one after eating a bit and keep talking with you and all that kind of stuff. So people who want to read these can get them. Oh yeah, and you can also see everybody's uh, full character designs like this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Ava wearing pants. It's a very deliberate thing. She's, um, uh, definitely wants to put forward 
that impression of like being in charge and not like you know being looked down on because she's a woman Yes, Kenzo is definitely obsessed with Beatrice. Or B Beatrice. Why did I say Beatrice? That was the first time I've ever said it in my godforsaken life. Beatrice. <laughs> uh, yes, he commissioned the picture. Will I ever do a Sonic IDW retrospective? Maybe. It depends on how long the comic runs for and like if it's just like a thing where it's like I want to reflect on a specific arc or if it's just like if it ends, like do the whole thing, something like that. But I would definitely like to talk about IDW at some point because I like it a lot. can't get over how much Krauss looks like Saul Goodman. True. No, yeah, this guy, this guy is Jessica's dad. Uh, and we will be moving on to his wife. Natsuhi's enormous dress. Natsuhi the goat. True. Saul Goodman jump scared. <laughs> no, yeah, true. Natsuhi deserves so much. Um, the thing is, like, the thing that I actually really like about Natsuhi in episode one is that she doesn't have, like, the most likable personality or anything. In fact, in some ways, she's actually quite abrasive. But you still, like, empathize with her suffering, and the more you learn about her circumstances, the more you're like, oh, this woman is just, like, the most tired woman on Earth. So it makes sense. Do you, Jessica? Oh, yeah, I forgot they mentioned this in the notes first. Uh... You don't actually learn it in the game until later. Uh, Jessica has asthma. So sometimes she will have asthma attacks. Just like Nenten, for real. Um, and we got Ava. With her little fan. Whew, slow your roll on the curry. This is so filling. I can probably afford to go a little faster with these. We have Hideyoshi. Oh, his description's a little bit longer. Well, it's just that one line. I already said this one to correct my wording. Have you played Rain Code? And if not, do you intend to? Uh, I have not played Rain Code. I do intend to. Uh, up until now, I actually haven't owned a copy of it, but thanks to a very kind mutual of mine on Twitter, um, let me get the at again. Her at is, yeah, uh, at Puffy Death God on Twitter, my, my beloved mutual, uh, actually physically mailed me a copy of the game, uh, and it arrived today. So I now own it. So there you go. Um... Looking over to George, banana suit looking ass. Uh, 
everybody boo for George right now. Who's my favorite Sonic IDW character? Uh, probably Surge. Probably Surge. Of the original IDW characters, that is. Um, a sec- like, a close second would probably be Tangle, though. Um, I forgot what did George do. You'll find out. You'll find out. <sighs> Rudolph, the <laughs> mafia man. <dot> PNG. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, I forget that they mentioned that a little bit more directly here as well. So yeah, um, he uh, Rudolph was formerly married to a woman named Asumu, who was uh, Battler's mother uh, six years ago, and then married his current wife, Kyrie, straight after that. Um, straight after she died, that is. That's what they mean. And uh, the implication being, obviously, that he was probably messing around with Kyrie sometime before Asumu's death, which is why Battler was so mad at him and why he left the family for six years. <laughs> Moving on to Kyrie, the woman of all time. I just, I don't even know what to say. What, what do you say about this woman? How could Battler leave the family when he was a kid? Uh, he went to his maternal grandparents' uh, place. They basically took him in and took care of him for the remainder of their lives. But when they died, uh, he basically had no choice but to move back to uh, his, you know, his dad's. But the outfit is weird. Yeah, it is a little weird. <laughs> I, I I commend her sense of style, but she does have some things going on. Um, they're not related to the Ashiramiyas. As in, like, Ashimu was not part of the Ashiramiya family. Rudolph is. Battler. Ah, yes, and they clarify some of that here, too. Ah, Kiri Giri coded. Some people were saying about uh, Kyrie. That's kind of true, a little bit. I, w I would agree with that a little bit. Um, Kyrie is a little bit more playful, though. Uh, she's not as muted as Kirigiri is. Moving on to Nanjo. And th isn't this before Danganronpa, though? No, yeah, we were, like, just... Not saying that they actually inspired each other, just that they have similarities. Umineko came out well before Danganronpa. Is this character chart complete? Um, mm, well, I'll just let you think about that. Rosa.
Was there ever a Toho and When They Cry crossover? Not that I know of. Uh, but Ryukishi has referenced Toho quite a bit. <clears throat> Maria? Yeah, let's move on from a character everybody hates to a character everybody loves. <laughs> Uh, in this house, we will all protect Maria Ushiromiya with everything, everything that we have and everything that we are. We have Genji. Give it up for Mr. Old Man Yaoi himself. I'm almost done eating, by the way, so we will get back to it in just a second. Shannon. Um, the person in the chat, uh, you underestimate my hate for the ooze, despite being fully aware of why it said. Um, well... Uh, I would simply like her if I were you. Skill issue. I'm, I'm kidding. People can have their own opinions. I'm just saying, I love Maria. <laughs> Canon. And that, with that, I have finished eating, <clears throat> and we are ready to get back to it. <clears throat> Hold on. Here back. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to make fun of your dreams. I apologize. Uh, of course Beatrice exists. Even now she's living in the forest and comes every night to the mansion to peek in and see what everyone's doing. That's that's why you shouldn't go into the forest. Oh, hey, uh, thank you, the cat lurking, for becoming a channel member. Really appreciate it. And at night, you mustn't stay up staring into the dark forest. You might sit and be seen by the witch of the forest, Beatrice. After all, grandmother said so. Hmm. Really? Fatler really believes? Yep, I believe. Sorry for doubting it. Come on, let's make up, okay? I stuck up my hand, and Maria grabbed it with her tiny hand, and we made up. Maria didn't grumble any more than that, so Georgianiki and Jessica were relieved. Oh, uh, uh earlier comment from Wampadilla. Uh, random side note, but I love your Kumisawa voice. It's so accurate to an old lady. Thank you. Um, I, I, like, for some reason, I just have this really big pet peeve whenever I see, like, people read, like, dialogue-heavy games, and they come to, like, an old person character. And they're like, oh, I'm going to, like, give them a really, like, stereotypical, like, ah, I'm going to talk like this kind of voice. It's just like, I don't know, it just bothers me. So I uh, try to do something a little bit more realistic. Also, it's ephemeral. Thank you for the channel member subscription as well. <clears throat> oh, this is where all of you were? I was sure you had left to go to the beach. 
Shannon Chan, carrying a basket, was surprised to find all of us gathered in front of the portrait. Ah, Shannon. Well, this is the first time Butler has ever seen Beatrice's portrait. He was just fascinated by it. Yes, she does that, doesn't she? Beatrice Sama truly is beautiful. I'm sure that she captivated the master. <laughs> in addition to the patron theory, there's also a theory that she was grandfather's first love. Wow, uh, Agag, thank you for becoming a channel member as well. Gosh. <laughs> We're getting a lot of those. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, is it fine if I send you a Twitter DM? My DMs should be available to send. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Um, I will have to look at it later. Either way, although it's been several decades since he met her, even now she holds a special place in his heart, which must mean that he's still captivated by her even today. Sheesh. That must have made Grandmother pretty jealous, huh? I don't know everything, but yeah, that did happen, actually. Apparently, Grandmother believed that he was cheating on her with some blonde-haired woman. Hmm? Good smell. Good smell coming from Shannon. Maria, sniffing, approached the basket Shannon Chan was holding with interest. Literally does the, like, boo-boo picnic basket. Like, what you got there? <laughs> now that you mention it, I do notice a fragrance scent with the essence of vanilla. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Zephemeral. That's precisely what I was hoping to do with this stream, was uh, give everybody kind of a more accessible route into episode one, and uh, hopefully that would help get people into the series. Ah, I apologize. I was told by Kumasawa-san to bring them to you all. What is it, I wonder? Oh, excellent. Cookies. Oh, wanna eat cookies? Wanna eat cookies? Ooh. <laughs> Certainly. You may eat as many as you would like. But, um... Unsure whether it was really acceptable to serve cookies in a place like this in front of the portrait, Shannon Chan sent us a glance which seemed to ask what we wanted to do. Well, thinking about it, yeah, that would be bad manners. Maria, why don't we eat someplace else? Let's put the cookies in a bento and have a picnic. Ooh. Have a picnic, have a picnic! If we can eat cookies, let's go! Yeah, let's go get some fresh air. We shouldn't pick at food right in front of the witch. Oh, right. Didn't we say we wanted to go down to the beach in the first place? Let's go, let's go. Shannon Chan, sorry, but could I ask you to get us a blanket to sit on and some flasks of tea? Right, certainly. Shannon Chan received her instructions and gracefully bowed before retracing her steps. Archiver of Worlds, thank you for becoming a member. Goodness gracious. It seems like those member notifications come in, like, way more timely than, like, the uh, donation messages do for some reason. I wonder why that is. We headed for the beach on our own. Everyone headed for the entrance in a group. Feeling as though that witch was staring down at our backs, I turned around once more. Oh, Butler, you still don't believe? Oh, no, I believe. That way is more fantastical. The Golden Witch Beatrice gave Grandfather ten tons of gold, and that gold might be sleeping around somewhere. Plus, they're saying that Grandfather wrote that strange epitaph as though challenging us to find it if we can. I think that kind of romantic story is way better. Twenty billion yen's worth of gold. <laughs> Even if we split it up between the four of us, that's still a ridiculous amount of money. It's five billion yen for each of us. Incredible. With that kind of money, any business would prosper. No, wait. We could live our whole lives fabulously without ever working at all. Not fill bi 5 billion yen. Cookies, cookies! <laughs> Maria would take cookies over money. Still, 5 billion yen, that's like a dream. God, the, the contrast gets to me so much. You have the kids talking about like, oh, we could just break it amongst ourselves and we'd have like enough money to live forever. That would be awesome. That would be great if we could just split that money amongst ourselves. And then you have the adults who are like, we want to get every cent that we can possibly wring out of you. And, like, just trying to, like, dominate each other in a discussion. <laughs> God. <clears throat> Ridiculous. Is it truly possible that you all believe in Father's legend, the gold? In the story about a witch who gave him the gold and so forth, we obviously don't believe. However, there's no mistake about the gold. Multiple sources have confirmed the fact that Father was in possession of gold bars from an unknown source. 
We heard that before the Mar before the Marisu Company president died, father showed him a large amount of gold somewhere. Father stated clearly to him that there was ten tons worth. That's just the nonsense of a senile old man. Along with father, he was just fabricating a story. You can't take it seriously. If that gold didn't exist, he wouldn't have been able to gather so much funding. Before the president died, he was a person whose sincere personality gathered a lot of respect from many in the business world. He wouldn't have been become partner to such a fraud. Aniki, the president of Marisu definitely saw it. Canada K- Oh, yeah, for some reason your uh, channel member message didn't show up, uh, Canada Caden, but thank you so much. I really appreciate your joining as well. The president of Marisu definitely saw it. Ten tons of it, clearly with his own eyes. Even more, Dad let the president take one ingot at random and have it examined. The ex results of the examination showed that the 10 kilogram ingot had a purity of four nines, 99.99. He said that the Ushirimiya family crest, the one-winged eagle, was carved into it. Almost instantly, the Ushirimiya legend of the gold spread amongst the fixers of the business world. Uh, Jolene's imp, uh, Jolene simp number four. Uh, what contrast I just got here, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, definitely look back at the VOD for later, because we're pretty deep in... I mean, like, not deep, but I mean, like, we're a, a few hours into the, uh, the first episode now. But yeah, they're... Basically, I was just discussing how the cousins are very, like, innocently talking about, like, if they got a lot of money, they would just split it amongst each other, while the adults are, like, viciously discussing the inheritance and talking about, like basically trying to wring every bit of money they can out and like trying to screw each other over. Gold from an unknown foundry has a poor rate of conversion into money. Thinking that it was a chance for device decisive profits, they accepted it as collateral, and as a result, Father was able to receive a giant loan. This is the most ridiculous nonsense I've ever heard. How old are you people? Are you still taking that fairy tale you heard as kids at face value? Where is the proof that this ten tons of gold even exists? Isn't it just the lies of father and those who are closest to him? Of course it's just a story. But still, Aniki, the amount of money that Dad raised required a suitable amount of collateral. Even if the gold was just a rumor, then he must have shown them a treasure of comparable worth as an unmistakable truth, don't you think? It was just a fiction of gold created by our penniless father. He made it seem that non-existent gold actually existed and fooled his sponsors. It was probably the gamble of a lifetime. Fortunately, his use of those funds proved successful. If the Korean War demands hadn't come and the Ashiramiya family had not been restored, father would probably have been hounded after as a crook of the century. In that case, are you saying the gold never existed and that father made it all up? Of course. Therefore, after he had become sufficiently successful, the fr fiction of the gold was nothing but an inconvenience. So father made up that absurd story about the witch and black magic and made the whole thing seem less believable. In other words, he revealed that the gold was a complete fiction. If he says that he received the gold from a witch, no one would believe that it exists at all, right? Yo, thank you, Kamikaze, for the uh, donation. Very much appreciated. A neat blue message. Hideyoshi, li Hide Hideyoshi Leavers Rise Up. <laughs> oh, God. That's really funny. He may have even said it for all of your sakes. Nevertheless, some stupid offspring wanted to divide up this non-existent gold with the rest of the inherit with the rest of the inheritance have appeared. Rosa, don't tell me that even you believe this kind of fabrication. Always deferring to Rosa. Always getting getting on Rosa's case. I can't prove whether or not father really has the gold. However, as one of father's four children, I just want to claim my rightful share. Hmm. It seems even Rosa has to learn to assert herself. All right. Maybe this is what you all want to say. That I'm trying to keep the gold all to myself. Nissan, the fact that you've obtained a massive amount of funding. If we rule out the possibility that you've been, you've been embezzling father's personal funds, then there's only one possibility left, right? Aniki, maybe you've already found the ten tons of gold bars. Yep, there it goes. <laughs> Again, the, the donation message is so late for some reason. It sure looks that way to us. Ridiculous. Something like that never existed in the first place. Then explain yourself. Embezzlement of father's assets, father's hidden gold. How could you have gathered so much funding if you didn't use one of these? 
I also have many friends in the political world and the financial world. I've done nothing more than gain the resistance. And as for that, I have no responsibility to explain it to you. You understand, don't you? There are some topics that can't be talked about. If that's the story that you insist on, then fine. But Aniki, Dad doesn't have long. Nobody can ensure that he li will live to see this day next year. When Dad dies, the inheritance will be passed on immediately. We'll all set up impartial lawyers and accountants to inspect the state of Dad's finances. Um, yeah, so people talking about the hour count of Umineko. Basically, like, um, to, to give a comparison, to get through, like, on average, to read through the entirety of Umineko would take about as long as it would take to watch the One Piece anime from the very beginning to, like, uh, like, Water 7. If at that time the fact that our brother has unjustly interfered with father's money comes to light, you understand, right? I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You're starting to make me feel as indignant as my wife was. Father's gold's definitely one of father's assets. I understand it's money you can't reveal openly. Even so, the four siblings should have an equal right to it. In short, we'll also have your financial situation investigated to determine whether or not you're hoarding the gold. You have a good opportunity right now. Prove the existence of this backup and friends, from friends and acquaintances that you mentioned. Yeah, somebody mentioned uh, Red Bard made a video about Umineko's length. It's a good video. You should check it out. It will prove to you just how long the series is. And uh, also, shout out to Red Bard. Makes great videos. Uh, did uh, agreed to like do a little cameo in my Umineko video actually, and that was very nice. <clears throat> In that way, you'll be spotless. And we can sportingly apologize for foolishly doubting you. Right, Rosa? That's right. Kraus Nissan, you're the one who's avoiding the topic. If you were guiltless, you could just prove that you were in the right, yet you aren't even trying to respond. <laughs> However, Aniki, we still have to consider your position here. As Dad's representative, you're probably bearing a large, larger share of the burden than we are. It wouldn't be fair to the rest of us who've been living terribly relaxed lives until now to complain without taking that into account. Hmm. I'm spoken ill of one moment and flattered the next. It's quite tiring. Please, get to the point. In short, randomly investigating nitpicky aspects of father's wealth seems a pretty darn boorish way to do it. Yeah, to give you all uh, an, an idea of how insanely committed to the bit I am, uh, I reread re the entirety of Umineko once in two weeks. Uh, I pretty much only got up in the morning, started reading, took brief breaks to eat food, immediately went back to reading, then slept, then got up and repeated that for two weeks. As you said, Kraus Nissan, you probably got move movements of money that are difficult to explain. We understand that, and that's why we've come to consult with you. A mutually beneficial consultation. Consultation. Huh. Oh yeah, I reread Umineko and said I've reread Umineko at least like two or three times. <laughs> when the I, I also read the entirety of Homestuck in like a week and a half. <laughs> reread Homestuck in about a week and a half. When the inheritance is distributed, you'll be rewarded for your years of hard work taking care of Dad by an agreement that's in your favor. Don't misunderstand us. It's not like we're saying that we'll abandon our rights. It's just that when we claim what we deserve, it wouldn't be bad if there was a generous understanding of your position. That's what we mean. In other words, if you'll accept our conditions, at the time of the division of the inheritance, we won't mind leaving the investigation of Father's financial status to you, Kraus Nissan. All of the siblings from Ava downwards suspected that Kraus was trying to steal their father's wealth. In that situation, letting Kraus report on the state of their father's wealth by himself was extremely contradictory and a huge concession. Homestuck video when I made a Homestuck video. <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> I made one uh, the year the epilogues came out. Uh, 10th anniversary retrospective. It's kind of old now, but I'm still pretty proud of it. I think it's pretty good. Besides that, it would also be possible for him to control the distribution of the inheritance in a manner favorable to himself. Kraus also realized that this sounded too good to be true, couldn't and couldn't help but feel doubt. 
He had to worry about what they would ask in return for such a compromise. Huh. After mistrusting me completely, you now say that you're willing to restore your confidence in me as the eldest sibling. And what you're at, and what are you asking for? Just what we deserve as siblings. You aren't the kind of person who would steal Dad's property. However, there's no patron financing you. Considering all that, there's a certain explanation that would satisfy the rest of us. Nissan, you found the ten tons of gold, and used that as collateral to gather some funding. Yes, just like Father did in the past, right? If that's the case, there won't be any funny bits in Father's finances. You've always been a good son, looking after Father. Why would we mistrust a person like that? You've been, you're being so roundabout, I can barely understand you. Say it more clearly and specifically. Our first condition. Aniki, you must admit that you found Dad's gold. Are you asking me to admit that I possess gold that does not exist? Our second condition. Recognize our rights to a share of the gold and pay it to us. How foolish. With the non-existent 20 billion yen of gold, that would be 5 billion yen per person. Are you telling me to pay a total of 15 billion yen? Preposterous. Keep listening until the end. We know that much money can't just appear out of nowhere. We're not asking you to make an impossible deal. Of course, regarding the portions of the gold, we plan to reward you sufficiently for your hard work until now in our calculations. Our third condition. The portion of the gold to be the one bearing the title and successor to the Ushirumiya Man family will be 50%. The remainder will be split fairly between all the siblings. Of course, this also includes you, Kraus Nisa. Of the 20 billion, 12.5 billion will go to Aniki. 2.5 billion will go to Ava Nesan. 2.5 billion will go to me. And 2.5 will go to Rosa. A distribution that makes me so grateful that I could cry. So you're saying for the sake of the gold that doesn't exist, I must pay you 7.5 billion. What's wrong? Nissan, your share is five times the size of ours. That's such a good condition. I'd be jumping with joy. <laughs> Our fourth condition. The dividends will be paid out along with the distribution of the inheritance at the time of Dad's death. However, as a deposit, 10% of our portions will be paid to us promptly. The payment must be made before March of next year. What do you th- What do you think, Krasny, son? This is an ideal chance for you to restore the trust you need to run Father's assets, isn't it? Of course, it might be impossible to get a whole 7.5 billion before Father dies. However, you can't say that you couldn't manage a deposit of 750 mil, right? Paying 700 million in half a year might be slightly bothersome. But someone like you, who has many friends in the political and business sphere, should be able to manage it. Normally, I'd hope to receive the 7.5 billion right now, all at once. But out of concern for your position, if you'll just show your sincerity by delivering 10% for the time being, it's all right to let the remaining 90% carry over until the distribution of the inheritance. Right? Surely even you can offer a mere 10% to show your sincerity. So, the right to investigate the status of father's assets is being sold to me for 750 million. <laughs> Isn't that great? You all sure have grown. I never thought you would all become capable of offering a deal to me. Nissan, if you accept these, the rest of us siblings will leave the investigation of Father's assets to you. However, the results of the investigation will be subject to appeal. It's only natural, right? We'd be sad if you adjusted our portions downwards by 7.5 billion. As a general rule, we wouldn't complain. As long as you do it neatly, it's fine. As long as you don't do anything significantly obvious, we don't plan to aggravate anything. We want the inheritance quickly as much as you do. Um, yes and yes, close in time. Um, they are talking about money quite a lot, but it does actually set up some pretty important things. We don't want it to get all drawn out and led astray. In the case of an appeal, who would do the second investigation? That can be you as well. This will probably be the first and last opportunity to discuss this. I trust you not to let it come to that. <laughs> Rosa, you really can talk sometimes. That Krauss was not to be not trusted whatsoever as the oldest sibling was by now so obvious that it required no explanation. The formerly tyrannical older brother would always abuse his privileges and infringe upon the other sibling's shares. In response to that, the other three, now adults, were now for the first time striking back at him by working together. I'm sorry, but there are further conditions. Our fifth condition. This decision must take precedence over Father's will. Later on, we don't some want some will to appear and make this decision completely useless. I see that you're very cautious. Then let me ask you, if the gold really were found, what would you do? 
As long as you've settled this matter with a corresponding payment, then whether the gold really appears or not makes no difference to us. You can think of our share as an advance payment. <laughs> Gives you something to live for. You plan to turn this island into a resort, right? During construction, you might stumble upon the gold by chance. Ava let out a high-pitched laugh. Kraus watched without even flinching. Let me add a seventh condition before I accept. In the situation that any other sibling other than myself finds the gold, they will immediately turn it over to me. Yes, yes, of course, we'll guarantee you that. <laughs> Insignificant details. The others, who were forcing Kraus to pay money for some non-existent gold, would of course not ensure Kraus's portion if they actually found the gold. From the beginning, this deal had been nothing more than a threat directed at Kraus. While the truth might be different, the probability that Kraus was embezzling his father's assets was extremely high. When at, least, when at last Kinzo faced death and it came time for the inheritance to be distributed, surely some unpleasant facts would come to light. That situation would likely be fat a fatal wound to Kraus. They had latched onto that weak point and were threatening their brother under the veil of compromise, trying to wring out a huge sum of money. However, they had let one thing slip their minds. The three of them had forgotten that their oldest sibling, who they couldn't defeat unless they banded together, was a very nimble thinker when it came to being crafty. Kraus relaxedly let out a gloating laugh as he spoke to Ava, who could not hide her smile, so certain she was of her victory. <laughs> this all sounds marvelous to me. I had a feeling that I had been feeling a deep pain in my heart at the estrangement from the rest of you. If by accepting these conditions I could make our sibling relationship friendly once again, I would be quite pleased. I'll gladly take you up on your offer. Be happy, Rosa. We have a deal. <laughs> Rosa's expression dimmed. When her brother started talking like this, the conversation would never change for the better. Ava was also sensitive enough to realize this. Therefore, even though Kraus had obediently accepted the deal, she was unable to wipe away her feeling of insecurity. My... How obedient. That's not like you, Nisa. That's harsh. You think I have an ulterior motive? Of course I don't. I'm just like all of you. I'm just like all of you. It felt as though only that part was emphasized. The color of Rudolph's face darkened. I have a plan, just like all of you. That's what it sounded like to him. That gave him a sense of urgency. Trying to bring this near-finished discussion to a conclusion, he rushed to wrap it up. Then we're good. So, Ariki, would you mind signing here? This is a written contract containing the discussion we've been having. There's one for each person. Everyone will sign the same con for the same contents. Rudolph took four written contracts out of his breast pocket that had the details of their deal written on them. Of course, we'll also add the seventh condition that you proposed straight away. Don't worry. Ariki, will, will you use a pen? Rudolph took a fountain pen out of his breast pocket and offered it to Kraus. Kraus made as if to accept. But then, with a small laugh, drew his back his hand without taking it and spoke. <laughs> Actually, in order to make sure this agreement is definitely effective, I'd like to propose a single amendment. When Kraus said that one sentence, all of the siblings felt at the same time as though something annoying was creeping up their backs. Th that won't do. We've already decided, haven't we? Be quiet and sign it. Ava, why are you so impatient? Of course I'll sign. I promise you all your share. 7.5 billion yen. I also promise that when Father's inheritance is distributed, I will cleanly and neatly liquidate it. However, there is just one point on which I must ask you to compromise. What are you talking about? What point don't you like? The part about promptly paying 10% of each portion, 750 million yen. As you pointed out, my financial situation is snob. Prosperous. Uh, while I'm guaranteed to definitely collect on various future investments, at this time I have no choice but to admit that I am very poor. In short, I have absolutely no money that I can move around freely right now. I am incompetent and my business skills and senses are dull. An unfortunate, such as me, to use your words, has no power to move 750 million in just half a year. <laughs> that can't be true. Are you trying to deceive us with offhand remarks? At the time of the division of the inheritance, I will liquidate everything at once. Remove the condition that I must pay you 10% in advance. That is all that you have to do to get me to sign. Kraus Nissan, that 10%'s nothing more than a number to measure your sincerity, isn't it? Strictly speaking, we wouldn't even be making you a deal in the first place. We're doing you a big favor by offering to let things slide for just 10% in good faith money. 
We explained that all to you, so don't you think rejecting that part damages our trust and relationship a little? Hideyoshi had a humbled expression on his face and had his hands clasped together, but his eyes were not calm at all. Krauss had already seen through the shadow in the depths of those eyes. <laughs> Why are you all so hurried? Or are you possibly afraid of something? Rosa, won't you at least tell me? Secretly, without telling the rest of the siblings. It, it, it's not like I... Quit it, Aniki. We're all, all we're asking you to do is, if you're, is whether you're going to sign or not. Just forget about it making any strange deals or anything suspicious. Oh? So I have no margin for negotiation. Do you claim that my position is so weak that we're not even in an even relationship? Shivers began to crawl up Rudolph's back. Ever since he was a child, he had never been able to overcome the height of the wall that separated him from his older brother, and now again he began to feel, him, feel himself getting sucked in by it, and the long shadow it cast. Shouldn't deals be made on even footing? To me, this deal is something to restore the long-lost trust of my younger brother and sisters, and deepen the love between us siblings. It has been a cancer in my heart that I wish to resolve quickly. I'm very happy to resolve it all today. But you too would be very happy to see this deal quickly concluded, wouldn't you? Krauss stared at each of the siblings. They avoided his gaze with animal-like instinct. Only Hideyoshi was slow, avoiding it. So he was caught in Krauss's gaze. Hideyoshi Nisan, I hear that your company has been going extremely well recently, hasn't it? You didn't hit any problems getting it listed as a stock, and both its performance and stock prices are constantly growing. I'm truly jealous. My husband's situation surely has nothing to do with this. However, it's unfortunate that you've neglected your stockholders. It's also horrible that you were unable to solidify your base when you became stock-listed, before you realized that some bad-natured fellows had bought up a considerable amount of your company's stock, hadn't they? <laughs> How could you know something like that? The same way as you. If you can collect evidence proving that no one would offer a loan to me, then I can collect evidence on you. <laughs> it's really that strange of a thing. Krauss grinned broadly. In contrast, Hideyoshi's face was obvi turning obviously pale. Hideyoshi's company was a fast food chain operating company that he had started from nothing. Though Hideyoshi's management efforts, performance of the business repeatedly rose and magnified, and ultimately it succeeded in becoming a stock-listed company, the greatest advantage of being in the stockholding system is that by selling stock certificates, a large amount of financing can be gained. That amount is far greater than the actual profits from the business. This made it an extremely effective way to gather the massive funds needed to grow his company even further. However, in exchange for financing the company, the stockholders have certain rights. Namely, the right to observe and guide the company that they have financed, in order to raise its profits above their investment. That right is a guarantee to all stockholders, and they sometimes even use it to reorganize ineffectual management. It is the right to prevent the money they have spent financing the company from going to waste by watching the management of the company. However, if they use this right forcibly, they can eject the former management and take over the company. Because the general body of all stockholders has the power to dismiss the management and nominate new management, that right is exercised in a majority decision by the stockholders, and people who hold more stock get to cast more votes. In other words, if some person or group holds a majority of the stock, they can freely chase out the old management and make the president anyone they would like. If they want, it's even possible for them to make themselves president. Many companies, in order to prevent their stock from being bought up by malicious people and their position from being threatened, take some kind of defensive measures, such as having their own employees or people close to them buy a lot of stock certificates, in order to prevent a hostile group from securing the majority. However, since Hideyoshi's company had only recently become stock-listed, they hadn't had the time to strengthen those defensive measures. No, maybe Hideyoshi himself was engrossed in the management of his company, so engrossed in the management of his company, that he hadn't realized the dangers of being stock-listed. It's hard to say whether he should be viewed as a kind-hearted and skilled manager immersed in management, or a foolish manager who had his feet swept out from under him. But in any case, there were people out there who would not let him get away with that naivete unscathed. They rapidly bought up Hideyoshi's company's stock and inst instantly gained a significant amount of power. They then sent anonymous documents to the stockholders and began to capture the majority. The documents read, The current management continues to make pointless investments and is ignoring the needs of the stockholders. Let us force the current management to retire, cut the current wasted investments, and let this company be born again as one that gives more back to the stockholders. 
It is very difficult to make the actual state of a company's management known. They maliciously twisted the figures Hideyoshi had produced from a tiny amount of sleep and a constant concern for his company and made him lose the trust of his stockholders. Their efforts had almost collected a majority of the stock in the company. At that point, even Hideyoshi noticed and started to buy back the stocks, but the stockholders, who realized that the company was undergoing an acquisition maneuver, demanded a ridiculous price for the shares that Hideyoshi was trying to buy back. They continually tortured Hideyoshi, who had no leeway in the negotiation of the price. One of the certainties of capitalism is that value will rise when both parties vie for the same thing. And one of the certainties of democracy is that the majority controls everything. So in the end, whoever manages to buy up the most stock wins. So whoever has the most money wins. If Hideyoshi could obtain a large sum of money at this critical time, he would be able to avoid losing all of which he had built up. Therefore, more than anything else, he wanted a lot of money right now. <laughs> He couldn't wait for the division of Kinzo's inheritance, which may not happen for some time. And you, Rudolph. You've been in a lot of trouble lately, haven't you? They say it's scary overseas, but it seems that's really true. American trials are settled quite emotionally. They won't give a generous judgment to a foreigner. Weren't you advised by your lawyer that making a settlement with the other party would be more economical in the end? What is he talking about? Uh, it's just troubles at work. It's no big deal. Yeah, it'll be settled with money. Curie quickly realized what Rudolph's complicated expression meant. Her husband had gotten wrapped up in some kind of trouble without her knowledge and had been suffering alone. That's right. In this world, anything can be settled with money. After all, it can even buy back the broken bonds between siblings. America's very fussy about the violation of rights. But with money, anything can be settled. Long live capitalism. Although, rumors around that settlement money may reach several million dollars. God, that's such a line. <laughs> Rudolph had been building a large amount of wealth for a certain type of niche market. However, a niche is a niche. It's definitely not a sunny job. An American corporate giant was trying to accuse Rudolph's company of violating their rights. For various reasons, it was thought that winning the trial was extremely unlikely, and Rudolph was being pressed to surrender outright. But even so, there was a way to resolve it with money. If he could only pay that money, though it might be painful, he could still pick himself back up. But if he didn't pay, he'd lose everything. Therefore, more than anything else, he wanted a lot of money right now. <laughs> Rosa, you're a good and noble little sister. You wouldn't even touch a dangerous money game. However, your soft-hearted nature was your ruin, wasn't it? I would think that one should agree to becoming a cosigner so- wouldn't think so one should agree to become a cosigner so lightly. Um, that has nothing to do with you, Krausnissan. Rosa uncharacteristically lay her bo emo emotions bare and yelled, because she had thought she had kept it a secret. As Kraus watched, he let a, let a muffled laugh slip. There was nothing to fear. Every one of them more than anything else, wanted a lot of money right now. In other words, the situation had been reversed, because only Krauss, who they were threatening, had no urgent need for a large sum of money. Compared to that, the three who were threatening him wanted money quickly, no matter the cost. So the longer Krauss postponed this deal, the greater the advantage to him. Krauss was very sly. He had known of their Achilles' heel from the beginning. Even so, he had not been certain. Therefore, he had hidden that until the very end, and upon closely and completely examining their attitude, he had struck back. If I could, I would love to raise some money for my darling brothers and sisters in their time of need, but unfortunately, I have nothing on hand. If you have any sponsors in mind that can raise a whole 750 million, I su su suggest you try there first. Krauss's elated words were horribly blunt. The other siblings could do nothing more than listen, grinding their teeth. If they could think of a sponsor that convenient, they wouldn't have kept up this charade. They had entered this huge battle specifically because they had exhausted all other options. If you're still set on relying on your older brother, I could use my influence to find you sponsors. Oh, wait. <laughs> you already said that I have no influence. Well then, I can't do anything, can I? <laughs> Krauss's low, gloating laugh began to fill the parlor. The younger siblings who had until now been driving the oldest brother into a corner could do nothing more than grimace and grind their teeth. Ava, don't make me laugh. As if I would put myself in your debt! Don't make me laugh! Don't make me laugh! If, if 
we relied on you, how would you help us? I told you, didn't I? All I can do is find other sponsors for you. Of course, I will do my utmost to negotiate so that you can borrow the interest as well. <laughs> Damn you. Taking advantage of us. Baby, please calm down. I am calm. I'm extremely cool. You bastard. Kyrie gripped her husband's hand. But that action made him feel even more pitiful, so Rudolph shook it off. Krauss laughed as though seeing that made him extremely happy. <laughs> if only we could truly find Father's hidden gold at a time like this. <laughs> then I could split it up into 2.5 billion yen portions for you right away. How sad, how sad, how very sad. How extremely, totally, truly, hopelessly sad. Tonight, let us drink together, as brothers and sisters, and discuss the whereabouts of Father's hidden gold. Solve the riddle of Beatrice's epitaph together, why don't we? With four friendly siblings all together, there's surely no puzzle that can't be solved. <laughs> he ate. He ate a little bit. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. He is a scoundrel and a capitalist, and he does look like Saul Goodman, but he ate a little. <clears throat> anyway, back to a crazy old man. Hmm. How interesting. And what are the conditions that they attached? Certainly. Whether or not Kraus Sama actually discovered the gold, he would pay Eva Sama, Rudolf Sama, and Rosa Sama a total of 7.5 billion yen for their shares. However, 10% of that would be paid before March. <laughs> <laughs> Kraus, you dunce. Then it, that he would have his feet swept out from under him by his younger siblings. Truly amusing. But it seems they couldn't seal the deal. Yes. Kraus Sama exposed that Eva Sama and the younger siblings all had an urgent need to get money. Hmm. So if he's given something that simple, he can see through it then. He can't even manage incompetence. What are they doing now? The conversation has been put on hold for the time being. Now Beatrice Sama's epitaph is being discussed. So they're trying to solve the riddle and find out where my gold is hidden. Yes. Kinzo set down his glass and snorted. Will the miracle be fulfilled first? Or will those fools expose the gold first? What a sight to behold. If those fools solve my puzzle, at that time I will be completely defeated. They can suck my corpse down to the last fragment of bone. The magnitude of the fool's greed imbues my great magic with its miraculous potential. But if, if the fulfillment of the miracle comes first, if it comes first, Beatrice will be resurrected again. That smile which I have been chasing half my life will be restored. Oh, Beatrice, the sacred night when the miracle is wagered will come and the devil's game will begin. I will definitely win and will definitely remain alive. You can have the lives of the others. I don't need wealth or honor or assets or gold or anything. I only want to see your smile one more time. <coughs> Water. Kinzo choked, apparently in great pain. Kenon got closer and tried to pat his master's back, but Kinzo signaled that he didn't need to. Do you know why I went to the trouble of exposing the hidden location of the gold so that everyone could see it? No. It is because magical power is determined by risk. The greater the number of people who try to discover Beatrice's gold, the greater the danger of that happening. Then assuming that the bet is successful despite those long odds, the po magical power will bring about an even grander miracle. In other words, magic is a game. It is not true that the most superior person will become the winner. The winner becomes superior because he is granted magic. Do you understand? Just as the miracle of life is granted precisely because of a victory against divine odds of several hundred to a million to one, several hundred million to one. Is that a little difficult for you to understand? My apologies. That's fine. It all comes down to this. The jewel containing the ultimate power. That's a chaos emerald! No. <laughs> to the one that solves the mystery of Beatrice's epitaph. I will give all of that I, of which I have built up. Wealth, honor, 
Gold and succession to the Ashiramiya family headship. Everything that I have established. The right to tackle the riddle is not limited to my children. Even if it were you who succeeded in solving it, that would make you qualified to gain everything. Yes. However, I couldn't possibly understand such a difficult riddle. Of course. I made it difficult. But you must also challenge it. That will become the seed with which the miracle of my magic will be summoned. If everyone challenges it, and everyone fails, that will be that. However, if the miracles are gathered and the magical power is born, it will happen then! Beatrice will revive! Therefore, you too must challenge it. All must challenge it. And in doing so, they must give strength to my magic. Do you understand? Yes. I will try. For a long while, Kinzo repeatedly muttered to himself, agitated and grabbing onto his head. Kenon stayed where he was, alert and unmoving, until he was given the next order from his master. Kinzo finally realized this. That is all. Leave me now. There is a bag of sweets on the liquor cabinet. You can take some with you as a reward. I'm fine. After all, I am furniture. Hmm. So furniture doesn't eat sweets. Indeed. In that case, leave me. As you ask. Please excuse me. Kenon bowed and left the study. As the door was closed, a heavy locking noise resounded. Faker, I think you're the one who needs a lot of money right now. <laughs> you're comparing yourself to me? Ah, I'm not even financially insecure. <laughs> but that was not the sound of Ken unlocking the door. It was the door locking automatically. No one could ever enter without Kinzo's permission, and once they left, they could not enter again. It was a mechanism that Kinzo, unable to trust his blood relatives, had created to lock himself up in his own study and to isolate himself from the outside world. The only ones he could trust now were not the sons who shared his blood, but those servants who called themselves furniture. Dr. Nonjo, is something the matter? Hmm, Genji-san. Oh, it's just that I had no place in there anymore. With a bitter laugh, Nanjo turned to face the door to the parlor. It seemed that because of that motion, Genji understood what Nanjo wanted to say. For the most part, Genji also understood the family situation. It must have made him want to frown, knowing that right now in the parlor, the master he served was being discussed so disrespectfully. But it would have been very difficult to gather that from his indifferent expression. Still, it isn't clear to me. Why did Kinzo-san have something so provocative written, I wonder? Nanjo looked at the portrait of Beatrice. No, he actually directed his gaze beneath the portrait, at the plate with the epitaph. I fail to understand the Master's thoughts. I sense that they run very deep. For as long as I can remember, whenever Kinzo-san played chess, he would always make moves based on some far-sighted reading of the board. Yes, sometimes even moves that were incomprehensible. For an average person like me, it's impossible to see through to whatever he's planning. I personally suspect this may be some kind of rule from the Master. He most likely intends to entrust his assets and the family headship to whoever managed to com manages to comprehend it. Hoping that the danger of some outsider like myself may solve it. Would force the four siblings to work together to solve the riddle. It could be something like that, then. Kinzo-san may be rudely disparaging his children, but he might also be hoping that the siblings repair their relationship. If, as Nanjo had said, the epitaph had been written to repair the relationship between the siblings, how heartwarming that would be. However, Nanjo and Genji both knew that this was one thing that could never be the case. Here were the two who had held the long longest relationship with Kinzo, more trusted than his blood relatives, and even they could not guess at Kinzo's true motive. The Master is always saying that the right to challenge the riddle is granted to everyone, whether they're a member of the family or not. How about you, Dr. Nanjo? No, no. It's a little too hard to understand for this senile old man. Actually, I wrote this epitaph down in my notebook at one point in time. Night after night, I would try to solve it before going to sleep, but... <laughs> it truly is hard. I believe it shall continue providing me enjoyment for the rest of my days. What about you, Genji-san? I'm nothing more than furniture that serves the master. Gold and assets are useless to me. My, my, you're a humble person. 
That's probably why Kinzo-san trusts you so much. If so, I'm honored. As Nanjo lightly laughed in response, he once again looked at the epitaph. Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved home of old. You who seek the Golden Land follow its path downstream in search of the key. That which is written on the epitaph of the portrait of the, my beloved witch Be Beatrice is as follows. Behold the Sweetfish River running through my beloved home of old. You who seek the Golden Land follow its path downstream in search of the key. As you travel down it, you will see a village. In that village, look for the shore the two speak of. There, the key to the Golden Land sleeps. You who laid hand upon the key must journey as follows to the Golden Land. On the first twilight, sacrifice the six chosen by the key. On the second twilight, those who remain shall tear apart the two who are close. On the third twilight, those who remain shall praise my noble name. On the fourth twilight, gouge the head and kill. On the fifth twilight, gouge the chest and kill. On the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach and kill. On the seventh twilight, gouge the knee and kill. On the eighth twilight, gouge the leg and kill. On the ninth twilight, the witch revives and none shall be left alive. On the tenth twilight, the journey ends and you shall reach the home of the gold. The witch shall praise the wise and bestow four treasures. One shall be all of the golden land's gold. One resurrects all the dead people's souls. One even revives all the love they possessed and one for the witch to eternally rest. Rest in peace, my beloved witch, Beatrice. And that uh, noise was also a little menu update. The epitaph was added to our uh, little grimoire glossary thing, so we can look back on it anytime we want. To the beach! So, on the tenth twilight, the journey shall end, and you shall reach the Golden Land. You really are diligent, Maria. You did a good job taking notes on all this. Hmm. I forget a lot, so I write things down. Write things down like Mama said. There was a notebook inside the handbag Maria was always carrying around, and Beatrice's epitaph was copied onto it. Thanks to that, we were all able to challenge the puzzle of the epitaph while we he we're here on this beach. For Jessica and the others, this was a puzzle that they had already tried to solve several times and had already gotten bored with. But it was a first for me, and I was so excited that I couldn't stop. It really tickled my male sense of romance, whatever that means. <laughs> Let's start with the first line. Behold the sweet fish river running through my beloved home of old. Where was grandfather's old home again? I heard that before the war, the Ashiramiya family had a mansion near, Do near Odawara. So that said, you'd want to know about how a sweet fish river that flows through Odawara, right? Yeah, because the river's the starting point. And then it's got you who seek the Golden Land, follow its path downstream in search of the key. What rivers are in Odawara? It's gotta be one, of, one with sweetfish swimming in it. Mm, for sweetfish in Odawara, it'd have to be the Hayakawa. It's famous for its mountain fiend st stream fishing. Mmm, I hate fish. <laughs> Maria, you'll understand when you get older. You'll all be, you'll be all lick, 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 salty, salty roasted sweetfish. Yummy! Even though we just ate, I'm getting hungry again. Um, shall I bring you some biscuits? Huh? Oh, sorry, that's not what I meant. Don't mind me. Shannon-chan, who didn't have any afternoon chores for a while, was faithfully keeping us company. I would have thought that as a servant, accompanying us would force her to take care of us and tire her out, but it seemed that wasn't so in her case. To the contrary, it seemed she was having fun joining in on the conversation with people of a, people of a similar age. When I asked, she told me she was a live-in worker, so normally the only person close in her age was Jessica. I get that. I get it. That must be pretty wearisome. Alright, so I get that the sweet fish f filled river near Odawara is the Hayakawa. In that case, we have to go down it. Don't you find anything if you head down the Hayakawa? Um, if you follow it downstream, you'll arrive in the ocean. Of course, you reach the mouth of a river. And the third line of the epitaph was, as you travel down it, you will see a village. By the way, since long ago, the mouth of rivers have generally been key points for transportation, and large cities tend to be built there, that'd be the next checkpoint. Hmm. That's a pretty good theory. Just like you imagined, in ancient times, there was a very prosperous old city there. That's where Odawara Castle is. I think I might have gone to Odawara Castle on a field trip once. It really was a wonderful castle. Yeah, I went to Odawara Castle too. Even though I live in a Western-style house, it sure is true the Japanese people feel calmer with Japanese style. Hmm, oh, I think castles are boring. Theme parks are better. 
Uh, what? What, what, what? Uh, no, yeah, uh, at Gentoki, yeah. This is not my first time reading through it. This is like my fourth or fifth time reading through it. Um, but this is for the benefit of people. I'm trying to get more people into Umineko, so no spoilers for anything in the chat, please. I see, I see. All right, all right. If we find the gold, the great battler Saba will generously reserve a whole theme park for a day and let you play all you want. Still, what a war castle. What? What? Oh! I accidentally opened the log. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, do I have any uh, advice about making essay videos? Um... <sighs> I don't know, like, as far as advice goes, I think the best way to do it, or, or like, one thing that I would at least recommend doing is figuring, like, figure out all of the individual topics that you want to approach first and, like, how you want to structure the sort of, like, outline of it, um, like, what you want the sections to be, and then I would, like, list them all out for yourself, and then I would incrementally chip away at those. And if you, at any point, get, like, kind of burnt out on one in particular, and there's like one that you want to write about more, then you can like jump around, just like, you know, adjust as needed if you want to have like certain things that are mentioned earlier in the video get mentioned later on. You can feel free to like kind of tweak at the wording and figure out where to insert things and stuff like that. Uh, that's generally how I tend to handle it. And then once obviously all of it's scripted, then you can record it and edit it. The hidden gold of Odawara Castle. Oh ho! Kinda has a ri right ring to it, don't you think? <laughs> well, we figured out that much when we tried this two years ago. The village down the river where the sweet fish swim in Odawara. We figured that it was probably somewhere near Odawara Castle. The problem's the next line. All right, let's see where your strange reasoning could take you. Jessica, Jessica dr grinned broadly. It was like she was saying that if the puzzle could be solved so easily, she would have found it long ago. Damn it. I'll definitely find it and keep it all to myself. The fourth line. In that village, look for the shore the two speak of. I don't know what it means by the two, but anyway, the shore. What does it mean by the shore? Hmm. Is there any place with shore in its name? Um, I've heard that there's a place called Sugash Sogakushi in Odawara. Huh? Wow. You sure know a lot. So, what does that mean? Shanaton, are you also after the gold and trying to solve the riddle? That makes us rivals. It's not like I'm interested in the gold. It's just that George Sama told me about it before. And that's because we reached the same conclusion two years ago. We even went and laid out a map and looked it all up. It was about five kilometers to the north of Odawara Castle. Though cer there certainly was a place called Sugash Sugakushi there. But after that, we get stuck. The fifth line doesn't say where the key is hidden in that place. Maria-chan, could you read it for us? Hmm. There the key... There the key to the... Golden Land sleeps. Oh, I read it. Sugakushi is probably large, and there wasn't ever any house built there by the Ushirimiya family. With no hint to where the key is hidden in that huge area, we pretty much have to throw it in, in, throw in the towel. You're right. And without the key, we can't advance to the next line. George Aniki, what kind of place is Sugakushi? I'm not sure. I've never been there, so I don't really know, but according to the map, it's in the mountains. I'm pretty sure it was at the base of Mount Asama. Hmm, something doesn't sit with me here. Aren't puzzles for the hiding place of treasure meant to be a bit more exact than this? I get the feeling we're barking up the wrong tree with Sogakushi. I don't know about that. Sogakushi looks kind of suspicious to me. There might be some kind of house there that we don't know about that Grandfather lived in when he was a kid. I mean, the first line did go on about his beloved home of old. Shannon, Grandfather has you pouring drinks and stuff for him a lot, right? Haven't you ever been to... Haven't you ever been made to listen to stories from his past? The master almost never speaks of his past. However, I'd heard him speak of the great Kanto earthquake that almost destroyed the Ushirimiya family, as though it had nothing to do with him. So he may have been living far away from the Kanto area. The Ushirimiya, the Ushirimiya main family may have been living in Odawara, but the branch families probably weren't limited to that. The grandfather often called himself a branch of a branch family, at least the least connected to the succession. Yo, succession! After all. So, in other words, the beloved home of old might not even be Odawara at all. I've never even asked about grandfather's old home, and he probably wouldn't give it away if I did. 
And if the so-called beloved home of old isn't referring to the Ushirimiya family's roots, then the Odawara theory is wrong from the beginning. Of course, this doesn't remove all possibility that it was Sogakushi. For example, he could have lived in Odawara when he was very young, but then moved far away later. Hmm. I don't get what you're talking about. Hmm. Maria had been completely left out of the conversation, and now sat puffing out her cheeks in boredom. Well, basically, if we can't decide where the start is for our golden game of shoots and ladders, we can't even begin to play. But wait. In the first five lines, the thing we're searching for is a key, right? You can enter a door without, even without a key just by bursting right through it. Can't we just throw away the first five lines and start figuring out the rest? Hmm. I hadn't thought of that. Oh well, we're just killing time anyways. Let's hear the rest of your reasoning. But in the next part, it quickly becomes disturbing. Shannon Chan frowned slightly. After looking back at Maria's notebook to recall what was written there, all right, I agree. In the first twilight, sacrifice the six chosen by the key. It sure does get horrible quickly. On the second twilight, it says to tear apart the two who were close. Does that mean to make them break off their romance? Or literally tear them apart? I don't know, but either way, it's pretty disgusting. Even if we ignore the meaning of that second line, on the first twilight, it's six people. And on the fourth through eighth twilights, it's five people. So at least eleven people must become sacrifices. Oh, sacrifices to revive Beatrice. I see. Sacrifices to bring back the witch. I guess you can take it that way. As a result, the witch revives on the ninth twilight. This last part is glorious. On the ninth twilight, the witch revives and none shall be left alive. So everyone dies in the end anyway. And then it's got the goal finally being reached on the tenth twilight that follows. Not sure how anyone shall reach the Golden Land if everyone's dead. It seems to allow for different, different interpretations as to whether or not the traveler who holds the key would be included in the none shall be left alive part. But there's something pretty interesting written at the end. The lines about how, after reaching the goal, four treasures will be given by the witch. One shall be all the gold. The problem is the next one. It says she'll resurrect all the dead people's souls, right? Doesn't it seem like this refers to everyone that died in the earlier lines? If you put it like this, the next one, the part about even reviving the love they possessed, might be referring to the pair torn apart on the second twilight. That's right. And the fourth one refers to the ninth twilight. The fourth treasure is putting the witch, revived on the ninth twilight, back to sleep again. If we interpret it favorably... It's hectic with people dying and being broken up, but it's all made well in the end. The awakened witch once again sleeps and all that's left is plenty of gold. The witch must have her hands full with all this killing, reviving, breaking up, and reuniting people. Not to mention waking up and sleeping. <laughs> oh well, just when the tale of the hidden gold was getting interesting, as soon as the witch's story is tied in, it quickly gets pretty shady. No kidding. <laughs> I laughed along with Jessica. After all, a witch was just ridiculous. Of course, once we started laughing like that, Maria, who believed in witches, got angry. I'm so curious if this is something that happened or is going to happen. I guess we'll just have to see. Oh, witches are awesome. They can do anything with magic. Even kill. Even bring back to life. Even give love. Even take it. Can fly in the sky, become invisible. Can even make gold and bread out of nothing. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh no. My bad. It's just a joke. Jessica apologized, sticking out her tongue, but Maria didn't accept it. She grabbed her notebook back out of my hands and, opening to the other pages, tried to prove that witches existed. Those pages had colored illustrations of the witch drawn on them. Hey, thank you, Claire Bear, for the channel member join thing. I could have said that better. <laughs> thank you for becoming a channel member. Yes, that's the words that I wanted. And conveyed the, and conveyed the fantastical image Maria had of witches well. They were depicted, not depicted as the normal, sinister, crooked-nosed hags flying around on brooms, but as dreamlike people with mysterious powers who could do anything and wore beautiful dresses. Just what you would expect from an imaginative young girl. Dancing through the sky, crossing a rainbow, dancing around all night with magical teacups and teapots that would never get empty no matter how much you poured out of them. With a flourish of their wands, the stars in the sky would become candy and pour down, and flowers that produced sweets would bud by the roadside. To Maria, witches were the sole thing that could give form to the magical dreams that so captivated her. The last thing enriching her reality, which revealed more and more of its bland nature to her with every inch she grew. That was why Maria believed in witches. She didn't want that dream to be insulted. And for that very reason, nor did she want the epitaph, which affirmed the existence of witches, to be insulted. Because the witch Beatrice is Maria's dream. 
to Maria Chun, that's not something that points to the hiding place of the gold, but magic to revive the witch. So, it was the single bridge between Maria and the witch. Maria was very angry and clung on, and clung on to Georgianiki. Jessica and I scratched our heads and apologized. It might not be possible to smooth things over again like the time she got mad in front of the portrait. Maria didn't want to be easily consoled. As Jessica and I hung our heads, wondering what we could do, Shannon Chan timidly opened her mouth in our place. Um, Maria Sama, did you know? There's a ghost story about Beatrice Sama that's been passed down amongst the servants. Hmm? Uh, I, yeah, that's right. Uh, Shannon, tell us about it. I don't really know, but it's apparently pretty famous among the servants. What's this? Ghost story? Yes, it seems it's a story from before we were born. I've also heard it from my mother. Yes, it's been passed down since the mansion was built on this island. The servants of that time whispered that the mansion had two masters, one of the day and one of the night. The tale that Shannon told was just like a typical campfire ghost story. If there was a forest with a witch living inside it, then inevitably the witch was going to pay the mansion a visit. At some point, this ghost story naturally sprouted up between the servants. Doors and windows they were sure they'd shut or locked would be open when they came around to double check. Lights they definitely turned off would be on, and lights they definitely turned on would be off. Things would disappear from where they'd been placed, and things would appear where no one had any memory of putting them there. When any of these things happened, the old servants would say that the witch had visited the mansion, invisible, and had played pranks. Oh, see? She exists! Beatrice exists! Yeah, she exists. I remember often being unable to find my bag before heading to school. Maria puffed out her chest with an ooh, ooh as though this was the final proof that the witch existed. If she said it out loud, Maria would probably be hurt again. If I, said, if I said it out loud, Maria would probably be hurt again, so I didn't, but... I mean, you hear that kind of story everywhere. Depending on the place, it might be blamed on fairies or something. It's just that on this island, they call it the witch. Of course, you would expect that walking around a vast, elegant mansion at night would be a little unsettling. It's an island devoid of people. Since the mansion is so drafty, walking around on the night of a thunderstorm would certainly be eerie. In addition, some serpents have also seen will-o'-the-wisps and glittering butterflies dancing around. Canon Kun also said he saw something like that when he went patrolling one night. And recently, the servants have been talking about strange footsteps inside the mansion near midnight. We've whispered together that Beatrice Sama from the portrait sometimes makes herself invisible and walks through the mansion. It happened a long time ago, but I have also heard those kinds of footsteps while patrolling at night. Whew! That's scary! Uh, but there's nothing to be afraid of, you know. And Beatrice Sama is another ruler of this mansion separate from the master, so she won't do anything bad as long as you respect her and don't act oddly afraid. However, she's fearsome if you don't respect her, right? Yes. I heard that someone who quit just before I began working, after falling down the stairs and receiving a large injury to their back, had been speaking badly of Beatrice Sama. Because of that, there was a rumor between the servants that Beatrice Sama's anger had been brought down upon this person. Hmm. Anger will definitely be brought down on Battler and Jessica. Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't want her anger brought down upon me. I apologize, Maria. Oh, of course I also apologize to the witch. I'm sorry, Beatrice Sama. Please, forgive an outsider's nonsense. I'll apologize as well. I'm sorry, Beatrice Sama. Will the witch be able to forgive us now? Hmm. Don't know. Witches are fickle, so they may forgive when they forgive and don't when they don't. Hmm. That's no good. Maria Chun, isn't there some kind of charm that could prevent Bather Kun and Jessica Chan from having Beatrice Sama's anger brought down upon them? Maybe something to ward off magic? By relying on Maria, who was proud of knowing the most about witches, George was trying to revive her self esteem. I was once again forced to admire his ability to comfort children. After crossing her arms and pondering seriously as to whether there was some charm capable of protecting Jessica and myself from the witch's wrath, Maria began flipping through the pages of her handbook. I had thought it was just a simple scribbled diary, but it turned out that there were also many pages that looked like they had come from the book on black magic. She was intently comparing several such pages, onto which had been copied what looked like magic circles. It looked like the black magic hobby wasn't limited to grandfather alone. Perhaps she had finished her research. She vigorously closed the notebook with a snap, threw it into her handbag, and began fishing through that bag's contents. It seemed that various jumbled up things were in there. For a while, she continued to take out various pieces of junk, although they were probably important magical items to her, and repeatedly threw them back in, saying they were wrong. She looked a little humorous, almost like Santa Claus deliberating over which present to give. Finally, it seemed that she had excavated what she was looking for. 
With a face unimaginably brighter than the difficult expression she had worn until now, she stuck them out to Jessica and me. Ah. As I reached out to grab it, I noticed that it was a very cheap-looking charm. It looked like a bracelet made from a plastic rosary, with a scorpion motif metal attached. I mean, you often find cheap accessories that correspond to the constellations. It felt like a gift you might win in a crane game in an arcade. It literally looked something like that. There were two. Probably one for me and one for Jessica. However, considering the odd fact that there were two of them, they looked like cheap manufactured goods, and it was quite hard to think of them as magical items. You're giving these to me and Battler? Hmm. Oh, with these charms, even Beatrice is no problem. Uh, there is the sound of seagulls in this uh, music track, yes. <clears throat> because the scorpion has the power to block magic. Huh? Really? Didn't think scorpions could do that. Oh, Battler doesn't believe. Oh, oh, oh. I had inflamed Maria again because I said too much. Maria took out her notebook again and turned and pointed to page after page. Going on and on about how the scorpion had holy power. Blech, I went too fast. What did it say? Uh, and had been drawn on magic repelling circles since ancient time. A magic repelling magic circles since ancient times. Okay. Uh, I've heard about that from some of the other young servants. There's something about how a scorpion is drawn as a magic repelling symbol in sorcery. Huh, really? Huh. The scorpion protects against bad magic and disasters. An emerald brings peace to the heart. So it has double the effect. Oh. It's true. The scorpion's wrapping around an emerald, protecting it. I see. That seems very useful. I really want to make fun of this worthless-looking charm. But as I watched Maria explaining the charm with all of her heart, and realized that she had prepared them out of consideration for us, it felt as though, even if it were just a prize from a game center, it would still be beneficial. Material quality isn't what's important about charms. It's the strength of the feelings behind them. I'd like to think that I have enough respect for myself not to make fun of those. Okay, thank you. I apologize to Beatrice-sama, but even in the worst case where I'm cursed, I'll be safe now thanks to your char charm. Right, Jessica? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Maria. Hmm. Wear it on your arm when you want a peaceful heart. If you put it in your wallet, your money won't go down. If you hang it from a doorknob, bad things can't get in. A really useful charm. What an incredible effect. It's a charm that Maria Sama can recommend with. If it is a charm that Maria Sama can recommend with confidence, I'm sure it will be reliable. As Shannon Chan tapped her arms together lightly, Maria stuck out her chest. She was completely cheered up again. It would keep. If it would keep her in this good of a mood, it would probably be worth it to let Maria lead the discussion for a while longer. When you think about it, she hadn't shared in our excitement when we talked about the gold's hidden location, so I think she had gotten a little bored. While eating the cookies Kumasawa-san had baked, Jessica and I asked Maria to think this and that about black magic. Maria happily chatted away in response to our questions. For each one, George Aniki and Shannon Chan would act surprised and agree with everything she said. The color of the clouds in the sky grew progressively heavier, but the cousins really enjoyed communicating freely after one year of separation. Hmm. Did I just feel a drop on my forehead? Huh? Ah, uh, you might have. As George Aniki rubbed his forehead, he looked up at the sky. Considering the color of the sky and the dampness of the air, raindrops could easily have started falling down any moment. It all also seemed like the wind had gotten a little stronger. Huh? Well, I didn't feel a drop. I'm the only one. Hmm. Oh. Calm down, neither did I. Anyway, I'm sure it'll rain so much tonight that everyone will get the same amount of raindrops. That's right. Maybe we should head back soon? Shannon Chan looked down at her watch. It may already be well into the evening. Time to get back to work already? Yes. I enjoyed this time I spent together with you all. I s thank you very much. Tell Kumasawa-san thanks for the cookies. I wish the VNs were on Switch. They are, but only in Japan. <laughs> because no licensing company will uh, pay the amount of money it would take to translate such huge visual novels in English, unfortunately. All right, everyone, help out with the cleanup. Shannon Chan declined our help, saying that this was a servant's job, but picking up a dropped fork before the waitress has to is like the, my purpose in life. We folded up the blanket, gathered up the trash, and helped clean everything up. Uh, yeah, I actually do uh, own copies of both the Higurashi and Umineko Switch ports. 
uh, as well as the PS2 version of Higurashi for my collection, just for display. Uh, for the Switch ones, though, if you have a, um, shall we say, Switch that was produced before a certain point and is susceptible to a certain amount of tinkering, you can find uh, fan-made English patches for the Switch versions that actually work if you have them uh, put on there and have a physical copy of the game. So I'm actually able to play both of those games in English on my Switch because I did that. <clears throat> oh, the trash is getting away. Oh, oh. oh no, it isn't. I'll grab it before you. Oh, I'm going to get it. Oh, oh, oh. Maria. Don't get your shoes wet, you'll get in trouble. To Maria, chasing after some trash that the strong winds had sent flying was just like an extension of our playtime. By the time we finished cleaning up, the wind had started blowing very strongly. It looked like a good chance to head back. You all really helped me out. Thank you very much. It really looks like you're out of time. It's all right if you head back first. Georgianiki perceived from her hurried appearance that very little of her free time was left. Genji-san's very rigorous about time. If you're into the right place at the right time, he can be very strict. We'll see you later. Do your best with your work. Y yes. Then, if you'll excuse me. After making a respectful bow, Shannon Chan hurried off in the direction of the Rose Garden. Okay, let's head back to the guest house. We can watch TV or something re and relax a little. Oh, watch TV. Watch TV, ooh. Then it's decided. Let's all head back and watch TV together. Even Maria, who was still not tired of playing, agreed what she thought when watching TV. We headed up the gentle stairs and returned to the Rose Garden. Oh boy, okay, yeah. We're, uh, we're getting to that part. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. I'm gonna have to warn you guys ahead of time for this. So, in a moment, uh, Rosa is going to show up. Content warning for uh, verbal and physical child abuse. Pretty bad. Like, genuinely pretty bad. Uh, if you are sensitive to that kind of thing, then, yeah, please, please be cautious. The wind has be had become very strong, and roses shook throughout the garden like ripples on water. This might be our last chance to see those beautiful roses. Tonight's typhoon is sure to ruin them. These roses might be done in by tonight's winds. Yeah, I'd say they were lucky, though. After all, they got to welcome all of you before the typhoon. A flower will always lose its petals at some point. However, because of that, we can admire them even more when they're in bloom. That's right. Maria, burn this image into your eyes. At this moment, they're the best roses of the year. Hmm. Burned into eyes. Right then, Maria suddenly clapped her hands. It looked like she had remembered something. My rose! The typhoon will send it flying! Oh! Oh, you mean that unhealthy rose George Aniki marked with a ribbon? It seemed that Maria remembered where the rose was. She ran at full speed. The rest of us followed her. Hmm? Mm. Where was that again? I'm sure it was somewhere around here. We searched everywhere around the area, but after all, it was only a single flower amongst all of these roses. Even though we knew it was somewhere close by, it wasn't proving easy to find. The winds that made up the front lines of the typhoon were making the roses throughout the garden undulate. It was almost like teasing us by making the location of Ro Maria's rose impossible to find. Maybe it isn't here. Let's try spreading our spreading a bit, spreading out a bit in our search. Sounds good. Let's go for strength in numbers. Hmm? What's up, Maria? As we made to split up in search, Maria tugged on my jacket with an unhappy face. It felt like her intention was to stop us from going to another place. What is it? What happened? Hmm. My rose is here. It's here. But it's actually not, is it? Uh, maybe it was on the other side of the flower bed. If we all look, we'll find it fast, right? Hmm. It's here. My rose is here. Look for it. Look for it. Hmm. Maria stomped her feet in irritation. She was pointing at the spot, saying it was definitely there, yet it actually wasn't. And yet, if we went to go search elsewhere, she got mad. We were at a loss for what to do. For a while, we would have to stay with Maria and pretend to search through this rose thicket. Uh, uh, not here. 
Not here. Not here. Ugh. Maybe she's saying that it should be here, but isn't. Maria became increasingly ill-tempered. Oh, man. Maria really is losing her temper. Maria sometimes starts to really care about really pointless things. If she gets what she wants, that's all right, but... You can't find something that isn't there. That's not good. Just as we were starting to despair for a way out of the situation, Maria shouted out loudly. Mama! Oh, oh. In the direction she was waving her hand, Auntie Rosa's figure was visible. Maybe she wanted to look at the garden one more time before the typhoon came. Or maybe she had some business at the guest house. Auntie Rosa was coming from the mansion. She quickly noticed her daughter's voice and came over. Oh my, what happened, everyone? Are you looking for something? Look for it! Mama, you look for my rose, too! Oh, oh. Your rose? We found an unhealthy rose around here and marked it. We tied a candy wrapper or something around it, right? Tight. But Maria, if I remember correctly, it was growing right in front and really stood out, didn't it? Unless it grew legs and ran off somewhere, it must have been somewhere else. Aren't you just remembering it wrong? It is here! It is here! Butler doesn't believe! For the umpteenth time, will you please stop that ooh nonsense? Mama will look for it, so stay quiet. I was a little surprised to see Auntie Rosa, who I had only ever seen as gentle, get angry. Auntie Rosa began searching as well, so we went along with her for the time being. But we were already more than sure that it wasn't around here. And so, Auntie Rosa also realized very quickly that it wasn't here. The rose isn't here. Did you mistake this place for someone uh, somewhere else? There are so many roses around. Uh, uh, that's wrong! It is here! Mama doesn't believe! Uh -huh. I do believe you, that's why I'm searching. But it isn't here. Uh -huh. But it is here! It is here, but it isn't! Uh -huh. Then someone must have ripped it out. Just stop whining like that. Uh, who ripped out my rose? Who? Give it back! Give it back! Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How should I know? Stop it! Stop that whining! And, yep, there it is. Sorry. Yep. Last warning. We're getting into it. <clears throat> Auntie Rosa slapped Maria's left cheek with her palm. For that instant, Maria was shocked into silence. Ferris, welcome to channel members. That was such timing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course, it was only for an instant. When Maria realized that her wish was being rejected before it could be fulfilled, she started yelling with an increasingly louder voice. <laughs> my rose! My rose! <laughs> Didn't I tell you to stop that weird habit? That's why all of the kids in your class make fun of you! Cut it out! Once again, her palm slapped Maria's cheek. This time, she didn't go silent. She choked as she started crying and began to bawl in an increasingly louder voice. Auntie Rosa was clearly irritated and lift her hand once more to try and shut her daughter up. Uh, Auntie Rosa, no, no, she's just a little kid. There's no reason to get so serious. I attempted to intervene with a forced smile and my hands clasped together, but the deadly serious look I was thrown by Auntie Rosa taught me quickly that I shouldn't butt in. I'm sorry, would you all return to your room for a little while? Your auntie needs to have a little talk with Maria. <sighs> Nobody believes in my rose, even though it was here. <laughs> Look for it. Look for it. Here, it was here. <laughs> but it's not here. Then you must be confusing it with somewhere else, mustn't you? <sighs> it is here. It's definitely here. <laughs> then it has disappeared. Give it up. Why? Why did my rose disappear? Why, why? <laughs> I don't know that. So stop saying ooh. Auntie Rosa once again raised her hand and overrun by emotion slapped Maria's cheek. It was so strong that it knocked Maria over. Uh, hey, uh, Auntie Rosa, even if she is your daughter, you shouldn't be violent like that. I stepped between them to protect Maria who was still on the ground crying ooh. -hoo. I know that the problems between parent and child are none of my business as an outsider, but I wasn't brought up just to silently observe something like this. Don't you think it's weird, Butler Cook? Do you have any girls at your school that mutter, ooh, ooh? 
Uh, well, I am in high school, but for an elementary schooler, I think saying ooh's pretty cute. Cute. Saying ooh ooh is cute. Cute! It seemed that my reckless words had brought Auntie Rosa's wrath down upon me. She grabbed my collar with a terrifying expression. Don't say such nonsense! Do you know how old Maria is? She's nine years old! She's a fourth grader, you know! She's not a kindergartner! And even so, she says, ooh, ooh, during class. Do you understand? This kid, do you know what they say about her when they bully her? Thanks to this weird habit, she still hasn't made a single friend. Don't turn your eyes from reality and recklessly call Maria cute. Think much more seriously about this kid's future. <laughs> I told you, stop saying ooh. ooh. Didn't I tell you to stop it? Auntie Rosa struck Maria's quivering head from which an increasingly unsatisfied voice was rising. I tried to stop her, but she thrust me away. My back collided with George Aniki. A long time ago, Auntie Rosa also thought of it as nothing more than one of Maria Chun's baby words. But now she's midway through elementary school, so the fact that it hasn't been fixed has bothered her a lot recently. It's not like it matters what kind of word she uses. You can't become a proper member of society like that. So even though it's not a pleasant scene to watch, this is a problem between mother and child. Fuck you, George. <laughs> well, my mom's always giving me hell about how I speak, too. If you look at it that way, maybe an outsider shouldn't interfere with this, even though it's painful to watch. Batherkin, didn't you ever have any bad habits as a kid that you couldn't fix and got you into trouble? Well, one or two. On Parents' Day, I got a huge telling off in front of everyone, and it was so embarrassing I couldn't stand it. Well, then you can understand Maria Chan's feelings right now. I'm sure she doesn't want to be here now. Do you understand as well, Jessica Chan? I don't think anyone likes to be seen when they're being punished. Let's go. Let's return to the guest house. Then, after Maria Chan comes back, let's welcome her as if nothing happened. That's probably for the best, isn't it? We thought that George Aniki's point was probably correct. And if we could use that correct-sounding reasoning to justify our retreat from this painful scene, that was probably enough for us. Jessica and I nodded at George Aniki, and we all left. We called towards Maria that we were going to head to the guest house, but since it didn't seem to reach her ears, we felt guilty and shameless even saying it. In that case, look by yourself as much as you want. Mama doesn't care. <laughs> look for it. I'll look for it by myself. Look for it even if Mama doesn't care. <laughs> Have it your way. After blasting over those last words, Rosa spun on her heels and quickly returned to the mansion. Maria probably viewed that as a cold, hurtful gesture, but from Rosa's perspective, that was not her intention. It was because the hand which she had so emotionally struck Maria's cheek with was still numb. It was because if she stayed there screaming, she might again be taken over by her emotions and continue slapping her daughter's cheek over and over. After Rosa left, only Maria was left in the rose garden, all alone. The wind began to blow stronger and stronger, and every once in a while a raindrop would fall on her forehead. However, Maria couldn't leave that place, not until she found that poor withering rose. It had definitely been there, and yet, it wasn't there. Even though she knew the place, and even though this was it, it wasn't there. Maria, while bitterly staring at the place it was supposed to be, thought frantically, Maybe the angle I'm looking from is wrong. Maybe the height I'm looking from is wrong. While gazing at a single point, Murray repeatedly changed her position and continued to stare. The wind was getting increasingly stronger, but Maria kept on looking for that rose in front of the flower bed. Ugh, God. Okay, yeah, so the scene's over, so don't worry, that, that, that part's over now, but uh, God, that really, it always gets to me. Oh, man. And yeah, that was that was my first moment of being like, ah, oh, George, dude. Like, what the hell, man? <laughs> like, yeah, it, it really is kind of revealing in terms of like, you know, he sort of values that sort of like, uh, like respectability and like kind of has these ingrained things in him from like the way his parents have taught him that like he has some really bad uh views uh about some certain things and like battler is the type of person that combat or like combats that a bit more um but overall is still kind of like you know 
uncomfortable with it enough to be like to concede to George's point and like therefore like they all become a little complicit in the situation not that you know there's a whole lot they could do uh against Rosa like if they tried to escalate the situation with her I don't think it probably would end well for any of them but it is just like a shitty situation all around and George is like definitely not helping <laughs> Uh, George is the the guy with the glasses in the the banana colored suit. <clears throat> Kinzo noticed the sound of raindrops beating on the window. Uh, I believe Ryukishi based some of this on his experience as a social worker. No, yes, um, Ryukishi before he wrote Higurashi and before he wrote Umineko worked as a social worker in Japan. So he has frequently worked with like abused children and stuff like that. He very very realistically depicts situations like that in like an almost uncomfortably realistic way but he does so for a purpose because he's trying to make a point about like how complicity uh can be like you know can be bred in like even the most banal circumstances like people can just let these things fly without even really thinking about it because it's an uncomfortable thing to bear and they don't want to talk about it um yeah he just he, he does a pretty good job with that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Kinzo noticed the sound of the raindrops beating on the window. It had finally started to rain. It had begun later than the weather report had predicted. Kinzo, as if being summoned by the sound of the rain, approached the window. The sound of the rain is a sound of silence. That fa sound feels quieter than any silence, and makes humans remember that in the end... They're alone from when they are born to when they die. You're late, Beatrice. Were those words directed at the rainy sky? No one could see the direction of Kinzo's gaze. Be seen in the direction of Kinzo's gaze. So, shall we begin our banquet of miracles? In this very moment, this island has been cut off from the world. Now there are none who can interrupt my ritual. There are many fitting sacrifices for you, four of my children. Three of their companions, four of my grandchildren, me and my guests and my servants. You may eat up as many as you please. The key of fate will select the sacrifices in accordance with the demon's roulette. If that roulette chooses me, even I will become your sacrifice. However, because of that, because I will bet on that madness, I will definitely create a grand miracle. No, yeah, uh, absolutely, Wampadilla. Like, uh, I agree. Um, that's the that's the response that everybody should have to a situation like that. I, um, it's just like you know, um, I think George is in probably. And this, to be clear, uh, I think he is being totally shitty. So I'm not like saying this as an excuse or anything for him because there is no excuse for it. Um, but I think he's like basically the type of person who is internalized that like these kinds of things are just something a parent does to a child. It's implied that he himself has also received, you know, sort of like beatings and stuff like that as a kid. So he basically just kind of views it as like, well, you know, it may be excessive, but like, uh, you know, she's, she, you know, it's just a part of growing up or whatever. And it's like, it's, yeah, it's bad. It's really bad. They all have very antiquated views on certain things like that. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I figured I was just wanted to, you know, kind of chip that in. Um, but yeah, um, that's what I, I, one of the things that I find really fascinating about this story is like how a lot of these people have like fundamental flaws in their understanding of things and it's just very tragic. <clears throat> Come, devour as much as you wish. I will overcome that roulette. Yes, I'll put everything on the line. First, I will return the headship of the Ushiramiya family. Take it! As Kinzo violently opened the window, he ripped the golden ring from his finger and forcefully threw it away. At that moment, thunder resounded, giving the illusion that the lightning had accepted the ring. And when you are resurrected, it will be me who stands there. I will live until the end and watch over you as you awaken. Now come, Beatrice. Welcome to my banquet! In exchange for all that I've created, show me a miracle one final time! Ooh. 
Beatrice! getting to it some things are gonna start happening soon some things are gonna start happening soon <laughs> um i have been streaming for a very long time at this point but there's a particular point that i really want to get to before we stop um and you guys in the chat who have read umineko before you know what that point is um, to get there will probably take, at minimum, another, like, hour and a half. Something like that. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you completely, 100% for sure, how long it will take. Maybe longer than that, probably. But, we're, that's what I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to get to that. So give me just a second to go to the bathroom real quick, and I will be right back. We will, we will be getting to this.
Are we ready to enter hell? Let's get to it. <clears throat> A news ticker popped up on the top of the TV program we were watching. The disaster report told how municipalities all over were continually sitting out ra sitting, sending out rain, flood, and wave warnings. Of course, the harshly beating raindrops on the window were much more convincing. This rain's incredible. Still, when it's raining this hard, it feels like it's gonna stop soon. You wish. They said the typhoon's moving slow, so it could be like this all day tomorrow. And even a little weather that and even a little weather'd be enough to stop the boats. It looks like we won't be able to head out on Sunday after all. I'm glad I was cautious and didn't make any appointments for Monday with the outside world. Um what do I mean hell? Don't worry. Um nothing like like the the previous thing. I'm not like vaguely alluding to something that's going to be wildly triggering or anything. Um however, I will put it like this. If you like games that have, um, shall we say, murder mysteries in them. I'm sure that you will understand that that carries with it a certain connotation of some specific content you should expect to see. So, uh, anyway, I guess this means, <laughs> looks like we'll be skipping school Monday. Living on an island starting to look pretty good. Come to think of it, Jessica, you have to take a boat to every day to school, right? What do you use when the boats are closed down? Do you stay home when it rains and show up late when the wind's blowing like King Ka Kamehameha? If the boats don't come, I stay home. Still, it's not as good as it sounds. Most of the time I get ordered to do private study and they're super anal about checking it, so it's not like I can take it easy. During the rainy season, when the weather stays bad for a long time, you must be forced to miss a bunch of days in a row. Yep, that happens. But then every single day I'll get a call from my homeroom teacher, sourly instructing me on what to study and what to turn in. She can't slack off as easily as you're thinking, Bathurkin. She has to follow the rules for people to travel to school by boat and get a good amount of studying done. It'd actually be easier just to go to school. In my own room, I get distracted and can't concentrate. Plus, being made to do nothing but workbooks for several days straight's really mentally stressful. When I'm all ready for college, I really just want to go place, place with dorms and say goodbye and good riddance to this pain-in-the-ass island. Huh. So, by the way, what do you do when the weather's good in the morning but then gets bad, so bad on your way home that the boats are closed? Do you spend the night at school? That actually happens a lot. So they have some lodgings there for people who can't get back to the island. I stay over there. Sometimes when it gets really bad, I can't get back home for a few days at a time. If you look at it from the perspective of those people who have to go to school every day on a train packed to over 200% capacity, it's easy, it's easy to irresponsibly think that going to school on a boat seems interesting and fun. But it's actually hard work in a lot of ways. Inconsiderate tourists say that kind of thing all the time. I've had enough of island life. I want to finish high school quick and leave this island behind. There must have been a full boarding school you could have gone to. Why did you go and choose the school on Nijima? That's where I, what I wanted from the very beginning. It's mom. She's always going on about how I need to learn manners and discipline and successor to the head. In the end, I got stuck with the high school close to home. Man, I hate this island. I just want to go live in a city. A city where it doesn't matter if rain or even spears fall from the sky. Because as long as you stick some casual clothes and sandals on, you can still get to a shop in less than five minutes. <laughs> Hold out just a bit more. It's only a little longer until you graduate high school, right? I can't wait a little longer. Uh. Jessica stretched out and reclined on the sofa. Maybe now, because now was a bad time slot, there weren't any interesting programs on. We had nothing to do but languidly kill time until we were called f for dinner. In the end, Maria had not returned to the cousin's room. She had probably been brought back to the mansion by Auntie Rosa. It had to be pretty boring for Maria all by herself while the adults are having a confusing conversation. We thought we might head over to the mansion to see her, but after all, there was this lousy weather. And there wasn't much time until dinner, so we stayed where we were. At that time, we heard the sound of a humble knock. Jessica answered. Hello! The preparations for dinner are complete. Please come to the mansion. It was Kanonkun's voice. He went to all the trouble of coming to the, from the mansion in this rain just to call us over. Couldn't he have just called us on the telephone? Oh, well, maybe sometimes a part of a servant's duty is to go against common sense. Just when I was getting hungry. Let's go. George Aniki turned off the television and stood up. My stomach's been growling for ages. 
Main, fam main family dinners were always fancy as hell every time. And didn't go to Sensei with calf steak or something? Oh, I can't wait. They get even more fabulous on the day of the family conference. Even I'm looking forward to it. Let's go, let's go. As we left the room, Kanon Kun bowed silently and respectfully. All right, let's go. Is the rain dusty out there? Yes. And please take care not to get your garments wet. God, hold on. Let me mute for a second and get this mucus. Oh, trust me, you did not want to hear that. <laughs> After seeing the three of us out, Kanon Kun peered into the empty room. Is Maria Sama not with you? No. Isn't she with Auntie Rosa? Rosa, lying on a sofa in the empty parlor, had fallen asleep at some point. She was bearing a burden on her shoulders that the children could never even imagine. Therefore, when she let herself relax, that exhaustion quickly led her into the world of sleep. Realizing this, Genji brought a blanket over to her. When he tried to spread it over her, her eyes snapped open as though she had received an electric shock. <laughs> oh, it's you, Genji-san. Thank you. When she realized that the thing that had touched her was just a blanket, and that Genji had been considerately giving it to her, she let out a sigh of relief. Did I wake you? My sincere apologies. No, it's okay. I hadn't planned on sleeping in the first place. What time is it now? Asked for the time, Genji checked a pocket watch that he took out of his chest pocket. It's slightly after six o'clock. Rosa gave her head a little shake as she realized that, even though it had felt like she had slept for a long time, not much time had actually passed. Even though she didn't feel rested at all, the drowsiness that wrapped around her felt very deep. Thank you. I'll be fine without the blanket. I mustn't sleep at such a strange time. My sense of time has been completely thrown off. The rain... has finally come down, I see. Rosa's finally realized, that, finally realized the peaceful sound that had put her to sleep was actually the rain that had started falling. The wind is blowing hard, too. Perhaps the typhoon's finally upon us? That's what they're saying on television. The typhoon is moving slowly, and they expect it to be like this all throughout tomorrow. I see. That wonderful rose garden. That must have been my last chance to see it. From the window, what she could see of the rose garden was completely blurred by the wind and rain. Maria. That's right. Uh, where is Maria? I've not seen her. I would, not th I would think she had returned to the guest house. Rosa knew her daughter's nature well, and a chill ran up her back. Maria was stupidly straightforward, to the point that stupidly could be repeated seven times, and if she was ordered to find something that didn't exist, she would look forever and ever. Even if rain was pouring down. No. The cousins left earlier, so Maria was alone. Unless someone told her to stop, she would stay there even if spears fell down from the skies, without even opening an umbrella. What have I done losing control of my emotions? As her mother, she had known that Mar about Maria's foolish straightforwardness better than anyone, yet she had once again lost control of her emotions and had done such a horrible thing. Maria! Rosa pushed Genji away and ran down the hallway. The outside really looked like a typhoon and was pouring down magnificently. Maybe because of some figure of the terrain, the winds were not as strong as a typhoon, so an umbrella wouldn't be torn out of one's hands. Even so, it was enough to call it a storm. There was no time to admire the roses being soaked by the rain. Anyway, I'm getting pretty worried about Maria. You don't think she's still rebelliously searching for that rose alone, do you? I'd wonder. Surely not with this much rain. Is what I'd like to think, but Maria-chan is sometimes really stubborn and foolishly simple. We hadn't worried much, thinking that Auntie Rosa had taken her back to the mansion. However, it was concerning that Kanon Kun had thought Maria was here when he came from the mansion to call us. I did not see her in the mansion, so I'd assumed that she was here. Since Rosa-sama was taking a nap. You didn't see her on your way over here? My apologies. I opened my umbrella and ran as fast as I could, so I did not pay much attention. If he had cut through the rose garden on the shortest line between the mansion and the guest house, then he would have missed the place where Maria had been looking for her rose by a little. And it was raining this hard, too. There's a good chance that Kanon could have failed to notice her. Enough debating around here. It'd be faster to just check it out directly. Aniki, you up for a little race? So you think you can beat me now that you have six, you've had six years to grow? All right, let's find out. Let's go! 
George Onike and I flew out into the rain. Jessica and Canon could followed us. Maria! If you're there, answer me! Maria! It's Auntie Rosa. Auntie! When George Onike called back, Auntie Rosa flew at him in what almost amounted to a tackle. Where's Maria? Isn't she with you? No, we haven't seen Maria-chan since then. Maria! Six years ago, Maria had been three years old. She had been a cute and pure kid who would just accept whatever anyone said. But six years had passed since then. She was nine now, and experiencing the good and bad parts of life... And experiencing the good and bad parts of life should have taught her something. And yet she's still just as innocent and pure as she used to be? Maria! As I circled the rose bed, something white unexpectedly turned to face me. It was a white umbrella. Maria, holding a white umbrella, was crouching, still searching for that rose. Mm. Her face, which had turned bright red from her crying her eyes out, was dirtied with water and mud. It was a truly pitiful sight. You idiot. Are you still looking? Mm. Can't find it. My rose. Can't find it. Mm. Maria had probably been here since the rain had started to pour down. It looked like her shoulders were freezing. She looked tired to the bone, but fortunately, since she was holding an umbrella, she was not completely soaked. It was probably an umbrella from the handbag that Maria was always walking around with. Thank goodness. Seriously, thank goodness. Vatlerkin, thank goodness you found her. Maria! Sorry. So sorry. Auntie Rosa threw out her own umbrella threw her own umbrella away and hugged Maria. Hmm. It's not here. My rose isn't here. Oh. We'll, look, we'll look with for it with you later. Okay? So just let it go for today. Okay? Oh. Let it go for today. It looked like Maria still wasn't able to accept it, but she no longer had enough energy to resist. Jessica and Canon couldn't caught up with us. I'll have a towel ready in the mansion immediately. Maria, were you here the whole time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being such a bad mother. Auntie Rosa, why don't we head back to the mansion for the time being? Maria Chan will catch a cold like this. You're right. Maria, let's go. If we don't get you cleaned up, Grandfather will get mad at you. Hmm. I'm hungry. It's already time to eat. You did a good job searching. Once the weather gets better, we'll all go search together. We couldn't stay in the rain forever. We took Maria with us as we headed back to the mansion. Maria apparently wasn't as weak as I had thought. When she remembered the dinner was calf steak, she started chanting, I'm hungry, hungry, and returned to her usual normal, healthy self. Auntie Rosa didn't chide Maria or her uru. So that's it. You had an umbrella. You sure are good at packing the right stuff. Oh, I didn't bring an umbrella. Oh. What? Then how'd you get the white umbrella you're holding? Oh, borrowed it. It seemed that some caring person had brought her an umbrella. A normal girl would look for shelter once it started raining, but there was no way Maria's stubbornness would be broken by something like that. So maybe that person gave up recommending that she find shelter and at least brought an umbrella for her. Really? I'll have to thank them. Who was it? Oh, Beatrice! The name Maria mentioned very happily was that of the island's witch. Rosa took a deep breath and asked again, trying to avoid hurting Maria's feelings now that she was happy. Really? Well, that's nice. So, who was it? The person who brought you the umbrella? Oh, Beatrice. Oh. Maria, who quickly picked up that her mother didn't believe her, made an angry face once again. So Rosa stopped pursuing the subject. It looked like it would be faster to ask the person who had lent Maria the umbrella during dinner rather than ask Maria herself. Father, please at least join us for dinner. It won't be a family conference like this. Along with a dull pounding on the door, the sound of Krauss's entreaty could be heard. However, that voice seemed to harbor a sense of resignation, that its sound would not reach its intended ears. Kinzo-san, won't you at least go out for dinner? Haven't all of your children gathered here to see your face? Silence, Nanjo. So the bishop won't work. One move short. Apparently, Kinzo was completely focused on the final battle of his long-lasting chess mass match with Nanjo. His brow wrinkled, he continued to glare at the game board through his spectacles, 
Krauss's voice didn't reach his ears. Kinzo-san, I'm also hungry. Won't you go down and eat? In that case, you can go by yourself. Let me consider this next move for a little while longer. We're going to finish it tonight. Otherwise, it looks like this match will never end, never in eternity be settled. Nanjo stood from his seat, hoping this would prompt Kinzo to do the same, but Kinzo's eyes never left the chessboard. He knew well that Kinzo always displayed a blind concentration when it came to chess. But he had never seen Kinzo as, he, as focused as he was now. Oh, uh, talking about uh, Rose's problem, I assume, close in time? Um, I get the general impression that basically, because this takes place in 86, um, and uh, definitely, like, Japan um, in particular uh, has had a, definitely, like, a bit of a, like, hard track record with, in, like, getting people to recognize mental illness and stuff like that. So basically, Maria is very visibly autistic in a way that Rosa is embarrassed of and can't explain, and she is, like, she doesn't really understand it so she's not empathetic to it and so she doesn't view it as like something that she should learn and you know understand about her child she views it as a source of embarrassment that needs to be fixed uh so yeah it, it sucks it's a terrible situation all around he was almost acting as though just as he had said if the game wasn't finished tonight, there would never be another chance for them to continue their contest. Further attempts to persistently call him would surely not reach his heart. Nanjo gave up and headed to the door that Kraus was still banging on. The door to the study opened. Kraus took a step back. Surely Kinzo hadn't actually come out. But it was Nanjo who stood at the door. Kraus breathed a sigh of relief. Dr. Nanjo, his father... I'm sorry I couldn't be of service. Kinzo-san's world is nothing but this room now. Nanjo shook his head with a completely defeated expression. Kraus raised his fist once more and banged on the door, shouting, Father, can you hear me? We're heading down now, but at any time, if you feel like it, please join us. All of your children are waiting for you. The voice was very loud, and the door was being noisily pounded on. There was no way it wouldn't reach Kinzo's ears. It was reaching him. However, he was ignoring it anyway. However, unlike the time he was being called down for lunch, he did not get into a rage. Kinzo was now simply calm at heart, and it was almost as though he had attained peace by turning himself over to fate. I'm not interested in dinner, nor in my son's faces. I will only leave here when Beatrice is resurrected or when I am chosen as a sacrifice for the key. The demon's roulette has already started spinning. What meaning does dinner have at this point? As though the painfully loud banging on the door had completely failed to enter his hearing, Kinzo, in a state of total peace, silently thought about his next chess move. Just as always, Kinzo was the only one missing from the dining hall. Kraus, wearing a bitter smile, returned with Nanjo. Just as always, Father is not feeling well. He truly regrets missing this once-in-a-year opportunity to sit together with his gathered relatives. Eva and Rudolf snickered. Judging by Kinzo's character, he didn't regret it at all, and none of his relatives regretted that he hadn't appeared either. Then why don't we start dinner? Gota, get it started. Certainly. Well then, ladies and gentlemen, we shall begin. Upon finally being told to begin the family conference dinner, his highlight scene for the whole year, Gota nodded, grinning broadly. Um, I was wondering, who was it that lent Maria an umbrella? When Rosa timidly cut through the silence of the dining hall, everyone there turned their attention to her at once. Umbrella? What's this about? Um... It started raining when Maria was in the Rose Garden a short while back. It seems she borrowed a white umbrella from someone, and I wanted to thank them. Hmm. It wasn't one of us. After you went out, Rosa, we changed rooms and continued our friendly chat the whole rest of the time. <laughs> That's right. Even after that, us siblings kept on with our friendly chat. The word friendly fell awkwardly from Hideyoshi's lips. So that even those who hadn't been there realized it hadn't been a pleasant conversation. At the very least, it certainly couldn't have been me, Eva, Rudolph, or even Hideyoshi-san and Kir or Kirie-san. We were together the the whole time, even after Natsuhine-san and Rosa-san left, the whole time until the meal started. 
Nisan went up to the study with Genji-san to call father. At that time, the rest of us went to straight to the dining hall. She, so it wasn't one of us. For, considera for a consideration like lending an umbrella, wouldn't it be one of the servants? And so, Goda-san? I've been in the kitchen the whole time preparing. My sincere apologies. Goda looked slightly disappointed about missing this chance to show off. At that time, Shannon and Kumisawa appeared, pushing a serving cart loaded with hors d'oeuvres. Uh, then perhaps it was Kumisawa-san or Shannon-san. Chan. I'm sorry? Uh, have I made some kind of mistake? Shannon shrunk, mistakenly thinking she was being accused of making some error, having come, on, come in part way. No, you haven't. When Maria Chant was alone in the Rose Garden, it started to rain. Someone gave her an umbrella. Auntie Rosa said that she wanted to thank that person. Hmm. Beatrice. Maria, her mouth a thin line, said the witch's name in a small voice. Auntie Rosa explained the situation one more time. As she did, Kumasawa-san cackled. <laughs> it wasn't us. Shannon-san and I were preparing the rooms together, so we did not go outside. Yes, I apologize for not being able to help. Preparing the rooms? What do you mean by that? Because of the rain, this rain, I thought that it would be difficult for all of the guests to return to the guest house. So I ordered the servants to prepare the guest rooms inside the mansion. Really? How thoughtful. That's right, it would be rude to chase us outside in all this rain, wouldn't it? Could you give it a rest? Yes. We received the order from Madame and I, Kumasawa-san, and Kanonkun were pre preparing the rooms. And then it became time for dinner, and since we had received an order from Genji-sama to go to the guest house and call the children, Kanonkun left on our behalf. Yes. In that case, did Kanon-san find Maria on the way to the guest house and hand her the umbrella? Oh, that's not it! The person who had actually received the umbrella denied it. Rosa was troubled. All she wanted to do was give a word of thanks to the person who had lent the umbrella, but she couldn't find them. And she had thought of asking like this with everyone gathered for dinner would work immediately. Then, Natsuhine-san? I'm sorry. After my friendly conversation with everyone, my headache was so bad that I've been resting in my room. Therefore, I did not go outside. Then, who? A Georgekin and the kids? That can't be right. No, it wasn't us. We were watching television in the guest house the whole time. Actually, we thought Maria had gone back to the mansion with you. Then Kanonkun came and he asked whether Maria was with us. That was when we first realized she wasn't in the mansion. In the first place, if it were me, before lending her an umbrella, I'd have grabbed her hand and pulled her under a roof. Rosa was completely baffled. One by one, the relatives and servants were claiming that it wasn't them, even though it really wasn't something anyone would need to hide. With that, by process of elimination, the number of people it could have been wasn't large. Of course it wasn't me. Right after it began raining, I visited Kinzo-san's room and have been playing chess with him up until just now. Which means that it also wasn't Grandfather. Wait a sec. Isn't this starting to get a bit weird? Who's left? Then who? Ganji-san? Huh? Um, wait a second, don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm searching for some culprit or something. All I wanted to do as a mother is thank that person who gave Maria an umbrella in the middle of the rain. Giving an umbrella to a girl loitering in the rain was something to be praised, not hidden. Despite that, no one raised their hand. Why? Everyone started whispering about how strange this had gotten. Calm down, Rosa. Why don't we just ask the person who borrowed the umbrella? An idea that everyone would agree makes sense. They were all scratching their heads at why she didn't just ask Maria, who had been given the umbrella. However, Rosa bit her lower lip. After all, she already knew how Maria would answer if asked. Of course! Rudolf Kunz here got it, here's got it right! maria Chan, tell your uncle. Who lent you the umbrella? Beatrice! The dining hall was wrapped in silence for an instant, but that soon broke it and was wrapped in laughter. <laughs> I see. Beatrice, the witch of the forest, felt pity and lent her an umbrella. What a nice story. Rosa, there you go. <laughs> Rosa didn't seem satisfied. She just wanted to say thanks for the umbrella. Why did everything have to be so clouded in smoke? Oh, just like Uncle Krauss said. Beatrice lent it to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Oh, innocence. Such an enviable thing. Don't you all agree? <laughs>
Krauss was laughing with a face that was clearly mocking her. But Maria, apparently feeling that her claim was being believed, was overjoyed. What's going on? Don't tell me a witch has really appeared and lent her an umbrella. Jessica asked me in a small voice that wouldn't carry over to Maria, who was sitting across from me. Has Maria ever been the type to joke? If we heard that kind of story pop out of that old bastard's mouth, we'd have just taken it as another joke. However, coming from Maria's mouth, it became somewhat inexplicable, strangely unsettling. No way. She's always been frank and serious. Hasn't she just swallowed up jokes that were supposed to be obvious lies? I've never heard of her cracking a joke. Auntie Rosa probably knew better than anyone. It appeared that because of this, situa this weird situation, she had no idea what was going on anymore. So, if Maria says that she borrowed an umbrella from Beatrice, that definitely was Beatrice? We're talking about Maria here, so I can't imagine it was some kind of metaphor or joke. It might be best to take what she says at face value. Then what's going on? Are you saying that Genji-san or someone put her up to- put her up, put on that fancy dress from the portrait and gave Maria the umbrella? I have no idea. Actually, that's what I want to know. Jessica shrugged jokingly, but her expression wasn't completely joking. Once the hors d'oeuvres were sent out, and Gota showed off his vast store of knowledge, the meal began. A couple casual chats broke out here and there, but they seemed somehow distant. It was a quiet dinner, granting no respite from the intrusive sound of rain that was creeping into the dining hall. Kumasawa and Shannon, pushing the serving cart, ran into Genji and Kanon on their way to the kitchen. Genji-san, were you the only the one who lent Maria-sama an umbrella? Umbrella? What are you talking about? Right. I heard that when it started raining, Maria-sama was alone in the rose garden. And it seems that she borrowed an umbrella from someone there, but we don't know who it is. It wasn't me. After all, I thought that Maria-sama was in the guest house. When Battler Sama first found her, she was already holding a white umbrella. My apologies, but it was not me either. Then you don't think it was the master, possibly? Everyone in both the dining hall and the place they were sit standing now had stated that it wasn't them, which meant that only Kinzo was left, but... Maybe he went down walking down the corridor for some reason when, by coincidence, he saw Maria Sama in the rose garden without even an umbrella. The master does not particularly like Maria-sama. I agree. I can't imagine that just for Maria-sama he would trouble himself to go all the way down the stairs to carry an umbrella to her directly. Oh my, how troublesome. So that means the one who lent Maria-sama an umbrella really was Beatrice-sama? <laughs> Kumasawa laughed, just like the relatives in the dining hall and laughed it, had laughed it off. She couldn't think of any other way to break through the smoke veiling the current situation. Just then, the crisp sound of hands clapping twice rang throughout the hallway. They all turned around at once to see that it was Gota who was coming out of the dining hall. Chop chop, everyone. When serving a dinner, it's essential to make sure the dishes are served with proper timing. Please immediately see to setting out the soup. Genji-san, the women are in the middle of an important job, so please don't get in their way. <sighs> Kanon glared at Gota for being rude to Genji, a person Kanon respected. Genji, realizing this, patted Kanon once on the shoulder as if to warn him. Kanon reluctantly turned away and returned his expression to normal. Obey Goda's orders. Let us now hurry to prepare the dinner table. Come on, we have no time. Don't just dawdle around. Hurry! Goda grabbed the serving cart from Shannon and drove it past her, heading towards the kitchen at pace. Then please allow us to return to the kitchen. After all, Goda-san's patience is very short. <laughs> Please excuse me as well. Kumasawa and Shannon left. Only Genji and Kanon remained. Through the window, the darkness of the rainy night could be seen, along with the occasional thunderbolt. Genji-sama. Has Beatrice-sama really returned? I don't know. Should we inform the master? There's no need. If she truly has returned, she'll appear eventually before the master of her own accord. Furthermore, she is a fickle person. It would be pointless to report to the Master only to find that she does not appear. I wonder if this means that the Master's ritual has already begun. Probably. However, that has nothing to do with furniture like us. We must return the favor that we received from the Master. Until our final moments. Yes. As furniture, that's our duty. The thunder crashed once more. Except for that instant when the lightning lit up the sky. 
All that could be seen out of the window was the darkness of the night. Just as humans rule when the sun is up, the time when the sun is down is ruled by those who are not human. The darkness of night that now surrounded Rokenjima was ruled not only by the Ushirimiya family, but by another master. Did this master take pity on Maria when she was alone and pummeled by the rain in the rose garden and lend her an umbrella? Kanon looked at the rose garden's lights, dimly visible beyond the window. The dim lights were not enough to illuminate the surrounding area. Looking at those lights felt like making eye contact with the witch, and Kanon forcibly averted his gaze. If he didn't, it felt like his eyes would be absorbed by that light. Perhaps the weather was also a factor. You often hear stories about how things like atmospheric pressure can influence people's moods and physical health. For some time now, everybody had been making periodic attempts to clear the gloomy atmosphere, but any conversation was quickly cut off, and in the end, the dining hall was simply buried by the sound of the rain. Dessert was some kind of chocolate cake accompanied by a pear sherbet. Godasan enthusiastically explained the recipe as if delivering the coup de gras, but I quickly forgot the details. The guest of honor, grandfather, was absent, but the weather was horrible, and the person who had lent Maria the umbrella was still a mystery. When dinner ended, no one even felt a bit refreshed. It was too late now, but I realized painfully that taste wasn't the only important part of a meal. The whole atmosphere was also critical. Godasan, the supposed conductor of this performance called Dinner, did his best to enliven the place, dropping little jokes left and right, but it seemed they didn't quite get there. After taking orders for after-dinner coffee, tea, and orange juice, he left for the kitchen. As soon as he disappeared, Uncle Kraus spoke. <sighs> my, my. How truly irksome that this dinner which Goto worked so hard to create has been so poorly received. Yes, seriously. Feels like nothing would taste good today. It's just that kind of mood. Hmm. I would love to hear why you feel that way. Sometime later, allow me as your older brother to help cheer you up. Auntie Ava grimaced slightly. I had already heard that she was not on good terms with Uncle Kraus, but now I could clearly feel it. When I looked around, I noticed that my dad and Auntie Rosa were also grimacing. Anyhow, it looked like there was something besides the weather that was troubling all of them. Auntie Ava and my dad, they both look like they're in a bad mood. Really? I don't think so. I asked Aunt Natsuhi, who was sitting on my right, but it looked like she was also in a bad mood. She snapped back as though she was absolutely not interested. Well, our adult conversation got a little complicated. It's not some kids like you need to worry about, Badlerkin. <laughs> right, Natsuhi-san? Curious, son? Uncle Hideyoshi laughed as he spoke, but without his usual brightness. So I could vaguely imagine just how complicated their adult conversation had actually become. On top of that, even Aunt Natsuhi and Kyria-san, the people he had directed his comment to, ignored him as though they hadn't heard anything. I didn't know what kind of conversation they had been having while we kids were away, but it reminded me of how Dad had said that he had stomach cramps when we arrived at the mansion. The family conference might have been a playful reunion to us kids, but it was definitely different for the adults. After Uncle Hideyoshi was ignored by the other adults, an awkward silence fell over the room. Kyria-san spoke up. We were talking about how the kids' careers would turn out. What will you do in the future, Batlerkin? Just drift on to college? Wouldn't that be a little disheartening as a starting line for the long race of life? Hey, wait a sec. Kyria-san, if you start talking about something like that in the middle of a meal, it won't digest well and we'll all get constipated, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. We were talking about Batlerkin and Jessica-chan's careers. He can take, can't take the future too seriously. <laughs> Hideyoshi heartily agreed, as if they really had been talking about that, but they probably hadn't. Kyria-san had obviously been trying to avoid talking about something. However, if Kyria-san had determined that this was the best course of action for now, she was probably right. Taking this into account, I decided to cast aside my suspicions as to the cause behind Auntie Eva and Dad's bad moods. At long last, the serving cart returned, filled with coffee and tea. Kamisawa-san and Shannon-chan served it to everyone. Goda-san then explained that this, with this, tonight's dinner was over. If I had been able to eat more in a more cheerful mood, it might have been the best dinner of my life. It was a shame that this greatest of dinners couldn't have been under the greatest of certain conditions. Oh, Giorgio Nitan, is dinner over now? Over? Yes, we're all done now. That's not ladylike. Stay in your seat and calmly drink up. Oh. Maria looked like she was really excited about the occasionally crashing thunder. Maybe she wanted to quickly finish eating and run over to the window. She had been fidgeting for a while, waiting for the meal to end. Some people were afraid of thunder, while others found it interesting, and Maria was apparently one of the latter. So when she heard from Georgianiki that dinner was over, a huge smile broke across her face. 
She then stood from her seat, took out her handbag, which she had set under her seat, never having left it even while she was eating, and began fishing around inside it. No one seemed particularly concerned with this behavior. What's that? Where did you get it? George was the first to notice it. As he spoke, Battler also noticed. When they looked, they noticed that Maria was now holding a beautiful Western-style envelope. On the front of the envelope, the Ushiramiya family crest, the one-winged eagle, was done in gold leaf. Furthermore, it was sealed with a dark red wax, imbuing a level of class upon it that made it clear that it was not something that Maria should be carrying around for fun. maria chan what is that? It seemed that Natsuhi had also noticed the strangeness of the envelope that Maria was holding. Because her voice sounded too serious to be admonishing a small child, the other relatives around her finally noticed. What's up, Natsuhi Nesan? What is that? Maria, where did you pick that up? That envelope has Kinzo sons. As Nanjo muttered that, even us kids could understand why everyone seemed to be frozen solid. The envelope that Berea held was one of the Ushiramiya family head's custom-made envelopes for private use. In other words, it could only mean one thing. This envelope contained a message from Kinzo. Hmm. What is an envelope like that doing here? It looks like something interesting has jumped out at us. J just let me have a peek! Oh! No, I'm reading it! I was told to read it to everyone! Uncle Hideyoshi tried to snatch the envelope from Maria's hands, but she protected it as though hugging it and didn't let go. Hideyoshi Nisan, you shouldn't take something from a child by brute force. Maria chan, where did you get this envelope? Oh, got it from Beatrice when she gave me the umbrella. She told me to read it to everyone after the meal was over. I'm the witch's mess. mess. Uh, messenger. Oh. Messenger? <laughs> the witch of the island sure is like to mess around. Battler tried to joke around about it, but no one went along with him. I... I wonder what's written inside of it, Maria Chan. Oh, reading. Oh. Maria casually opened the envelope. It was sealed only with wax, so she just had to remove the sealing wax to open it. That sealing wax fell onto the desk. Hideyoshi hastily picked it up and stared fixedly at it. He then set it at the center of the table, where Natsuhi, Kirie, and Nanjo glared at it. Imprinted there in the sealing wax was the one-winged eagle, which was the Ushiramiya family crest, and also Kinzo's personal crest. This is the family head's personal crest. I know because I've received letters from Kinzo-san before. Without a doubt, this is Kinzo-san's wax seal. But in this mansion, couldn't there be several identical seals? For example, if there was some kind of stamp for wax seals, couldn't someone other than Kinzo-san have sealed it? No. Kinzo-san would always use a ring on his finger, his proof of the Ashirimiya family headship when he sealed the wax. The shape and complex design is definitely Kinzo-san's seal. That's not necessarily so. Uh, no, uh, this is a part, but the part that I was talking about earlier is something that does happen a little bit later. <clears throat> Anyone in the family must have received a letter from Dad at least once. We can't eliminate the possibility that someone using that wax as a model created a fake seal to pass themselves off as father. I agree with Aniki. Aniki. No matter how the seal resembles Dad's, we can't prove that it isn't the real thing. That it is the real thing. Therefore, it doesn't prove that this envelope came from Dad. I feel the same way. I cannot approve of arbitrarily deciding that this is father's letter only by the seal in the wax. Dr. Nanja, would you mind refraining from such speaking such vague words? I apologize. I said too much. One after another, all of the siblings from Kraus on downwards rejected Nanjo's statement, saying that the envelope that Maria was holding had not necessarily been sent by Kinzo. They were afraid. Kinzo's intentions were written in there, and they feared from the bottom of their hearts that it might be something decidedly unfavor some decidedly unfavorable announcement regarding the inheritance. Maria, the person who gave you the envelope was the same person who lent you the umbrella, right? Hmm. I don't know what who means. Is it true? Oh, yes. Oh. So, in other words, the witch, Beatrice, gave you that envelope along with this umbrella? Oh. Maria nodded forcefully. I, I agree with my husband. It's a dubious letter handed over by some suspicious person. It's, it's not even worth reading. Oh, go on. What's the worst that could happen, right? 
Battler said it to Jessica in a small voice, pretending to stir things up, but Natsuhi heard him clearly and glared at him with threatening eyes. And then... Um... Beatrice told you to read it after the meal was over, right? Mmm! Why not, everyone? This isn't Grandfather's envelope, it's Beatrice's. Who cares who read it? Like, can't we just hear what's inside before passing judgment? Uh, that's right. Even if Father didn't necessarily write it, I'm still concerned about its contents. Maria-chan, I'm sorry I tried to take it from you by force earlier. I apologize, so will you read it out loud in front of everyone? Maria... Read it. Hmm. As all of the relatives stared fiercely at Maria, she spread the letter open with a rustle. Do you really think it is Dad's letter? Impossible. Whenever Father has announced something to us in the past, if he didn't do it directly, he would always send Genji-san, right? I can't believe that he would use such a joke-like approach. That's right. Maria, a messenger? That's seriously not his style. Rosa, this must be Maria-chan trying to surprise us with some kind of hidden talent, right? I... Maria's not a kid capable of something so clever. Reading. Hmm. Huh. The words came out of Maria's mouth, but for some reason it felt like her voice was different than usual. Everyone went suddenly silent. Welcome to Rokenjima, ladies and gentlemen of the Ashiramiya family. I am Beatrice, the alchemist for this family, under the employ of Kinzo-sama. How absurd! Quiet. I have served him for many years in accordance with our contract, but today, Kinzo-sama has announced the termination of that contract. Therefore, I ask that you acknowledge my resignation from the position of family alchemist as of today. How oh, foolish. What nonsense. I can't stand to listen to it. And there, now, is- and now, there is one part of the contract that I must explain to you all. Beatrice. I, Beatrice, lent Kinzo-sama a vast quantity of gold under certain terms. One of these terms specifies that all the gold is to be returned to me upon the termination of the contract. Furthermore, I am to receive everything of the Ashiramiya family as interest. R ridiculous It's been ridiculous from the very beginning. So, it's basically one of those things, right? Just like one of those contracts with the devil you always hear about. And the contract is expired, so she's come to collect the interest. Is she trying to grab some retirement money for her old age or something? What a cheeky witch. Bathler, now is not the time to joke around. Bathler made a face as if to ask, If I can't make fun of this, what can I make fun of? At the same time, some of the adults' faces were pale, while others looked completely shocked. After hearing this, you may feel as though Kinzo-sama has been savagely ruthless. However, Kinzo-sama did append a special clause to the contract so that you would have a chance to preserve your wealth and honor. If only, if and only if that special clause is fulfilled, I will lose my rights to the gold and the interest for all eternity. A special clause? Wh what is it? Special clause. Beatrice has the right to collect the gold and accumulated interest upon the termination of the contract. However, if someone is able to discover the hidden gold of this contract, Beatrice must abandon the rights for all time. The collection of the interest will proceed shortly, but if any one of you fulfills the terms of this special clause, I shall return everything, including the portion that has already been collected. Furthermore, as the first step in this collection of Kinzo-sama's debt, I have taken possession of the Ushirimiya family's head ring, head's ring, which signifies the passage of the Ushirimiya family headship from one individual to another. I ask that you confirm this for yourselves by examining the imprint on the wax seal. You want me to accept this as real? That Dad would relinquish his ring is unthinkable! Kraus was staring at the ceiling wax as though he was trying to burn a hole through it. Ava and Rudolph were doing the same over his shoulder. I, I did have the odd feeling that something was missing from Kinzo-san's finger when we were playing chess. Dr. Nanjo, don't say something so careless just because of a vague memory! We can't prove its authenticity here. The questions of whether Father really has handed over his ring and whether this letter tells the truth, we can determine simply by asking him directly. That's right. It's just as Curious on curious says. Well, now I wonder. Will Kinzo-san answer you? After all, that person's thoughts are sometimes impossible to predict using common sense. In any event, this does not leave the realm of nonsense. In the first place, the fiction of the gold is, it is itself a deception by Father. If you want to talk about non-existent gold, leave me out of it. But you heard what the witch is saying, right? 
about how the headship and all of the assets would be handed over to the one who finds the gold. So could this mean that Beatrice Sama is father's legal advisor or maybe in charge of his funds? We can't possibly trust the kind, that kind of strange person who would entrust such a suspicious paper to a child. Aniki, time for you to open up. Is it possible that some someone you don't know is actually handling Dad's assets? No, that's impossible. As the agent to the head, I have total knowledge of all the father's assets. There shouldn't be anyone who can manipulate them without me knowing it. Then there must be some kind of assets that you do not have full knowledge of. Mustn't there, Kraus Nissan? Absurd, there's no such thing. Oh, yes, there is. One asset of father's that you know nothing about. There is no way that something like that exists. No, it does. That'd be father's. No, Beatrice's hidden gold. Let's put things in order. In short, Dad is some trusted confidant that not even Aniki knows about. Furthermore, this person has always been in charge of watching and managing the gold. It's possible this person is a di dilettante of a very rich family who provided his financing in the first place through a mock devil's contract. Could it be that this confidant, this Beatrice-san, is trying to test which one of the sons and daughters is the most fitting to be financed by her gold? What Kyrie said was something that all of the siblings wanted clarified. Upon reflection, they realized that during the time Kinzo's strange epitaph had been displayed in the hall beneath the portrait of the witch, they had always whispered that the one who solved the puzzle would receive everything, yet no one had ever clearly stated it. It was just something that they'd hoped might be true. That had here, right, ne right here, right now, been ex clearly expressed by Beatrice's letter. It clearly specified that everything of the Ashiramiya family would be given to the one who found the gold. Kinzo-sama has already publicly displayed the location of the hidden gold within my epitaph under my portrait. The rules apply equally to all those who can read the epitaph. If you discover the gold, I shall return everything to you. Tonight, I ask that you enjoy your battle of wits with Kinzo-sama to the fullest. I sincerely pray that this night will be both intellectual and elegant. Beatrice the Golden Father, I know you can hear me. Please respond. The door to Kinzo's study was being violently, violently beaten against over and over again like a percussion instrument. The screams coming from the other side were Krauss's, Rudolph's, and sometimes Ava's voices. It was the siblings who were trying to intrude upon Kinzo's study to question him about the truth of that mysterious letter. Oh, I, I just realized, by the way, since we basically just passed that point, so... The point at which, um, like, they, if I remember correctly, the point at which they discover that Maria has the umbrella in the Rose Garden, imagine literally everything from the beginning of this stream, like, through to the beginning of the stream, up until that point where they find the umbrella, that is what they co cover in the first 25-minute episode of the anime. That will give you a good idea of how bad that anime is. <laughs> Kinzo was eating. An elegant tablecloth was set over the desk, and the fabulous dinner that had colored the table down in the dining hall was once again laid out. Kinzo continued his meal in silence. Shannon, taking away an empty plate, looked uncomfortably between the door being beaten on and Kinzo's face. Everyone is calling for you, but... But what would you like me to do? Leave it. I was in the first minutes of the second episode. Yep, yep, yep. God values silence, and so do I during dinner. Should I silence them? There's no need. It does not even reach my ears. Kinzo coolly tasted his food. Genji quietly lowered his head and took a single step back. As he did, Kenon, who stood in reserve like a shadow behind and to the side of Genji, opened his mouth. Maria Sama seems to have received a letter from Beatrice Sama, so I assume they went to want to verify its authenticity. <laughs> well, dear devil, she's started already. Come, Beatrice. There's nothing lacking in the coins that have been wagered. Shall we enjoy this night to the fullest? I have no intentions of losing. Your smile is mine for all eternity. If I could see it one more time, I wouldn't regret losing my wealth, my honor, or even my life. Well then. The roulette has begun to spun, spin. Which pocket will the ball fall into? Noir? Rouge? Or is it rogue? I, I don't know. 
or house takes all. Come, you may begin, Beatrice. I'll show you the power of miracles once more. The strange letter that the witch had entrusted Maria with had wiped all memory of dinner from our minds. Maria had been repeatedly barraged with questions by Auntie Rosa and the other parents, and was now in the worst of tempers because no one would believe her. Even when the kids tried to talk to her, she would just ignore us. Our parents were all stirred up over the gold, firing back and forth about the distribution of the assets, and completely forgetting that we were children. We children were even there. Even though I'd already figured that they had been talking about this in the shadows, I never thought they'd be bl this blunt about it and at least to us kids, it was a considerable shock. From what we could overhear, all of our parents wanted as much money as possible, as soon as possible. Back and forth about grandfather's inheritance. Back and forth about the distribution of the gold if it was found. About advance payments and cash. It was so despicable I couldn't bear to watch, even though one of them was my dad. It looked like Jessica felt the same way. We left our seats, although no one had asked us to leave, and went to hang out somewhere apart from the parents. I see. Now I really understand why Grandfather didn't want to show his face during meals. I'm so disillusioned with our parents now. The money, the inheritance. How could they act like that right in the open? Well, I'm already completely disillusioned with that old bastard. There's no way I could think any worse of him. <laughs> and do you think I'm not? But even so, that freaking shocked me. Shocked me to the bottom of my heart. Jessica looked down at the floor, irritated. She was always talking about how bad her parents were, but maybe she hadn't really felt that way deep inside. I could realize that from the depth realize that from the depths of Jessica's shock. You're both minors and still being brought up by your parents, so you might not understand. But getting money is neither a simple nor a pretty thing. You're still minors, so I won't try to force you to understand right now. But still, I'd like you to realize that your parents are just doing their best in their own way. Oh great. George Aniki's gotten all mature. I know that you're working hard as a full-fledged member of society, but does that mean that when the conversation turns to money and assets and stuff, you're capable of turning into shameless, greedy vultures like our dads? If it would be just about me, then no, I wouldn't want to do that. However, when your family and your, and your employees, your subordinates and their families are all counting on you, there are some times where you must fight. I hate that kind of fight. The back and forth about grandfather's inheritance it just makes me want to puke. Jessica pretended to spit violently. That harsh reaction made the depths of her pain very clear. Uh, people talking about it, yeah. My throat uh, is doing okay at the moment, but <laughs> it's definitely a little bit weaker than it was when I started. <clears throat> but this is what I do for a living. <clears throat> Let's stop talking about this. All of this about grandfather's hidden gold, about property and inheritance is our parents' problem, not ours. I agree. At the very least, I think that being considerate and staying out of the parents' way when they're ta talking is the duty of the children. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? Everyone knows the phrase, adults are filthy. But now we had seen for ourselves, and that really did give us a shock. George Aniki was now pretty much an adult, and I had already been disillusioned with my dad in the first place, so the shock wasn't that big for us. But it looked like it was different for Jessica. It looked like the shock that Jessica had received was even bigger than I had thought. Readjust my headphones. <clears throat> this girl, she was always talking badly about her parents, but it looked like she hadn't changed at all on the inside since long ago. Even now, she was still a pure-hearted and delicate person who couldn't doubt others. I'm sure she respected her parents as much as anyone else does. And then her parents started joining in with all the other parents right in front of us children, going, money, 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 inheritance, inheritance, my money. So it was no surprise that the shock of hearing that was so big. Jessica Chan. Please don't start hating your mother and father. I won't ask you to understand them, but at least don't hate them. I get it. Just leave me alone a bit. Six years ago, I would have further taunted the dejected Jessica, but even I had grown up over the past six years. I realized that it would be better to leave Jessica as she was right now. Jessica suddenly looked all away sulkily and left the parlor. She probably wanted to be left alone for now. I could do nothing but wordlessly watch her back as she left. Come to think of it, I wonder where Maria-chan went. She's probably still huddled up on the floor in front of the portrait. 
Maria, who truly looked up to the witches, up to witches, had expected that coming in direct contact with Beatrice and receiving the letter as proof would be an event that would surprise everyone and make them happy. However, the adults had doubted its authenticity, had not taken Maria's story at face value, and had thoroughly bombarded her with questions. Even I didn't find it hard to imagine how much that must have hurt Maria. We couldn't speak to either Maria or Jessica. In the end, George Anaki and I just abandoned ourselves to the sound of the falling rain and the dark night. I wonder what's happening with that typhoon. Maybe there's some news. George Anaki walked over to the corner of the parlor where the television was. He hadn't called me over, and I really couldn't have cared less where the typhoon was on the sea right now. So I didn't go over to the television, but instead loitered around the window. The wind hasn't picked, that much up, picked up that much here, but I wonder if it's horrible over the sea. I did hear from the weather report that there were severe storm warnings. Ah, curious, son. How's it going with you adults? Lots to talk about? It looked like she caught the, it looked like she caught the sarcasm. curious on shrugged. That stomachache of a discussion could continue all night. It's very tiring. Well, all I can say is this. I hope you enjoy playing vultures to grandfather's property to your heart's content. It's disgusting. I'll agree with you on that. If I could just slip away like you, I would do it. Unfortunately, I can't. Even if I'm not allowed to speak. It's not easy being a partner, you know. Curious on smi side, smiling bitterly. Well, yeah. They probably won't let Curious on who married into the family speak. Still, as Dad's partner, she has no choice but to stay by his side and support him. Being in the line of fire, she must be having to fa bear far greater mental pressure than me. I wasn't going to apologize, but realizing that I had spoken too harshly, I cut the sarcasm for the time being. So, how does it look? They still stuck on the topic of the mysterious witch Beatrice? Uh, closing time, I know you probably won't read the entire thing since I'd be a crazy insane ask, but man, over multiple streams, I would love to hear you read the whole thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you never know what will happen. Right now, I'm just planning to get through episode one to sort of give a entryway, entry gateway to people who haven't gotten into Mineko up to this point but have been interested in it, but if these streams do unexpectedly well, then, uh, you know, maybe by that time, by the time we get to the end of episode one, it'll be feasible to continue on to episode two. We'll just have to see. More or less. They've been piling up secret agreements for some time, hoping for some kind of agreement between the four of them on the distribution of Grandfather's inheritance after his death. And now, some unknown fifth person has appeared to make things even more complicated, so there's no way that'll make for a peaceful conversation. They're snar- One moment they're snarling at each other, the next they'll set up a common front. natsuhine sons not the only one getting headaches. On the one hand, they all wanted a larger portion than the other siblings, so they were all rivals. But on the other hand, they didn't want one yen to be snatched up by anyone other than the siblings, so they were all also allies. I couldn't get her to tell me the details, but they were apparently arguing on and on about their ceasefire agreement and rules to prevent anyone from getting ahead, the situations under which their portions would be protected, and what legal measures would be taken in the worst-case scenario. By this point, my emotions had shot straight past disgust, and now I perceived them as a force to be reckoned with. So basically... Beatrice is like a saboteur sent by Grandfather. He probably wanted to scare the hell out of his children for just talking about the distribution of the inheritance without him. <laughs> who is this Beatrice, I wonder? If she is who she says she is, then she's a mystery that no one knew about until today, and she also knows about the existence of Grandfather's hidden gold. Furthermore, she was even entrusted with the head's ring. She must truly have been trusted by him. Well, obviously, I don't think she's a witch riding around on a broom. But she's surely a myster person mysterious enough to merit being called a witch. I just hope Maria-chan will go into more detail about that. Even though she's just a little girl, everyone has been chewing her up over this. They really scared her, and now we can't even ask her for things she might have answered. I wonder if those people have ever read The North Wind and the Sun. What is it for certain that Maria re What's for certain is that Maria received a letter from the person who took the name Beatrice entrusting Maria with the letter and hiding away even now when she could have just appeared and talked to us directly. She sure is shy for a mystery person. <laughs> hey, Batlerkin, do you think that someone called Beatrice actually exists? Who knows? It's probably just a false name, right? Like she's grandfather's representative, so she was permitted to take the name of the witch from his delusions? No, that's not what I meant. Right now, there are a total of 18 people here on Rokenjma. Do you think that there's a 19th person? Are there really a whole 18 people on this island? Wondering about that, I began counting on my fingers, and it really did come out to 18 people. 
Do I think that a 19th person exists, you say? What exactly do you mean? Just what I said. It looks like the person who lent Maria that umbrella was not one of us 18. Therefore, isn't it reasonable to think that a 19th person exists, and that this person who, it was this person who lent Maria the umbrella? Well, yes, I suppose. Then where exactly is this person now? At the very least, she must have been on this island when it started raining. And since that time, the weather has become progressively worse, so taking a boat out would be pretty much impossible. In that case, that person must still be on the island, hiding from the rain somewhere, and without being spotted by any of us. Certainly. Uh, certainly, all of us have been randomly prowling around all over the mansion and guest house, but no one has bumped into a 19th person. Even so, this island is huge. There might be other places to hide from the rain outside the mansion and the guest house. At about this time, I began to realize what direction Kyriason's doubts were taking us in. Kyriason was denying that a 19th person existed. Beatrice was one of us 18. In other words, she thought that someone we knew well was using her name. If Beatrice really was as she described herself, this person would definitely be the most honored of guests, the most honored of confidants trusted by Grandfather. There's no way the Grandfather wouldn't give that kind of person a warm reception. She would surely have been ushered into the mansion. However, we haven't seen anyone. Wait a second. Isn't this line of reasoning a bit, little bit too hasty? Yes, no one spotted them, but that doesn't mean that you can deny the possibility to the 19th person exists, right? Maybe for some reason they landed on the island stealthily and have been hiding ever since. It's what they call the devil's proof. It's easy to prove that something exists. If this Beatrice appears in front of all of us and says hi, then everything's resolved. But it's impossible to prove that there is no 19th person. Yes. Butler Kun, your way of reasoning isn't bad. In the current situation, there's not enough information to either accept that a per 19th person exists or deny it. But if you flip over the chessboard and think of it that way, we can be nearly sure that the existence of a 19th person is impossible. Flip over the chessboard was one of Curious Sun's favorite phrases. I had also been influenced by those words and used them myself from time to time. When you get stuck trying to find a move in chess or shogi, by flipping the board over and looking at everything from your opponent's standpoint, you can often see a strategy that would give you the upper hand. Derived from this, it means to think by putting yourself in your opponent's shoes. Okay. Let's say that a 19th person called Beatrice actually exists. That person must have managed, without being seen by anyone, to stealthily arrive on this island and remain hidden ever since. They had some reason for this, yes? In this case, why did they deliberately appear before Maria and hand her the letter? It really was a contradiction. If they had some reason for hiding themselves, then they should have stayed hidden the whole time, but they had appeared openly in front of Maria. Well... Wait, even Maria said it. Didn't she say that she had been made a messenger? Since Maria was the youngest and looked the most innocent. Why would they need the message? W need a messenger? If they wanted a letter delivered to the family conference, they could have mailed it. If they mailed it to each of the four siblings, they would be unable to ignore it. There was no need for them to carry it themselves and secretly hand it over. That really does sound pretty weird. In the first place, if Beatrice existed and she wanted to make her presence known to everyone, she could have just openly presented herself to all of us. Despite that, she chose the vague method of appearing through a little girl called Maria-chan and only gave us an indistinct impression of who she was. Contradiction. Let's go a little deeper, shall we? She appeared in front of Maria, trying to give us the impression that a 19th person existed, and yet, she still hasn't appeared before us and is hiding somewhere at this very moment. The contradiction between these, keep it in mind and flip over the chessboard. In other words, the question is, why would a person want to give the impression that Beatrice exists as a 19th person? If this person wanted to hide, then they wouldn't have made their presence known. And if they wanted to show themselves, then they wouldn't have used the roundabout approach of entrusting someone with a letter. Which means... It's simple. Beatrice is one of the 18. This is why they're creating the illusion that there is someone outside of the uh, outside of the 18. A powerful suggestion of a 19th person. The only person who could profit from this would not be some 19th person in hiding. It would be one of the original 18 people. Of course, this reasoning is full of holes. If you turn over even a few of its premises, it will simply fall apart. But I think it is almost certainly correct. This was quickly starting to sound pretty creepy. Who had lent Maria the umbrella and handed her the letter? All of the 18 had been ruled out. And yet, Beatrice was hidden among those 18. What was the person planning, hiding their true form and pretending to be Beatrice? 
I also suspected that it might have been Maria Chun play-acting, but the contents of the message were extremely complicated, so it's hard to think that Maria Chun prepared it herself. However, I can't deny the possibility that Maria Chun is working together with someone. Wait a sec, Maria is a nine-year-old kid. What on earth could you suspect her of planning, and with who? And what about her serious, too honest, and obedient character? Yes, I also understand what kind of person Maria Chun is, but I think that's exactly why it's possible. That girl's a dreamer who looks up to and blindly accepts the existence of witches. So if a person appeared in front of her and said they were the witch Beatrice, Maria Chan would be so happy that she would just swallow it up, I think. So you're saying that if someone disguised themselves by wearing that fancy dress from the portrait, tricking Maria wouldn't be that hard? Of course, with that reasoning, all of us women would become the primary suspects. Anywho. What? Anyway, what? who did Maria Chan encounter? Asking her the details of that would be our best and closest key to solving this riddle. But that key has been obstinately locked up inside of her heart. Everyone denied the existence of the witch without listening to her and barraged her with too many questions about who Beatrice actually was. Maria Chun probably won't open her heart to the adults now. In the dim hall, in front of the portrait of Beatrice, Maria was sobbing. <laughs> No one believes I met you! I showed them the letter you gave me, but they still don't believe! <laughs> anyway, Maria Chan is holding the key. The key to whether Beatrice is one of the 18 people or a 19th person. Maria's stubborn, you know. That girl, when she gets angry, it's pretty hard to make her feel better. Bathurkan, I think there's a higher probability of a kid like you cheering her up than an adult like me. After she feels better, try asking her. I know you don't care about all this back and forth on the distribution of the inheritance, but don't you think this classic western man mansion mystery situation is exciting? Who in the world is this person who gave Maria Chan the letter? It makes my intellectual curiosity tingle. Even while being made to sit through those boring money talks, you, call that ex you can call that exciting? You really are tough. Adults are something else. I shrugged, exasperated. But I had realized. She had noticed the dejection I was feeling because I had overheard our parents' turbulent discussion, and was probably trying to turn my mood around. She had at least managed to make me feel good enough to hurl abuse. She wasn't my real mother, so I never felt like calling her mom. But it did make me think she's a real adult. Hey, brats. So, this is where you were. Curie, you really took your time fixing your makeup, didn't you? From now on, I'll start wearing it too. <laughs> I'm sorry. A woman's makeup takes a long time. So, how has the discussion been without me? <laughs> I'm sure everything was all peaceful and harmonious. Curiason poked the weak spot under my arm with her elbow. We decided to take a break to cool our heads a little. It looks like it'll last all night. I could cry. His way of talking hadn't changed, but he couldn't completely hide his fatigue. I couldn't say I was sympathetic, but he looked pitiful compared to his norm normal, energetic self. Still, that rain's just awful. I really don't want to go back to the guest house. Looks like Natsuri Nason made preparations for us to spend the night here in the mansion. What do we do? We don't need to think about that until you're done, right? If you run out of enough energy to head back to our room, then we can let them take care of us. You're right. We can think about it later. What about you, Butler? If I stayed, I'd just get in the way. I'll be nice and go back over there. Okay. Will you go back soon? I don't know. It'd be lonely to head back by myself. I'll head back with the rest of the kids as a group. Yeah. That'd be good. So, Butler. You won't just be going to sleep that easily, right? Yeah, I'll probably be talking with the cousins. It feels like we might be up all night. Is there a problem with that? Okay. If when the adults' discussion is over, you're still awake, I want to have a little talk as a family. A what? <laughs> that doesn't sound like you. Apparently, curious and was thinking the same thing. What are you talking about? She asked him in a small voice. It looked like curious and didn't have a clue what Dad was talking about either. I want to talk to you about it as well. I'll tell you later, so don't ask now. Please. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anyone who ignores their family as much as this old bastard, and this was the guy who was asking us to have a talk as a family. Both Curious and I couldn't help but get wide-eyed. 
Don't make that scared looking face. I'm the one who should be scared. I mean... At that point, he swallowed his words for an instant. I don't remember Dad being the kind of person to artificially drum up suspense. You're freaking me out, Dad. You've got your family all here right now. Quit beating around the bush and spit it out. I'm probably gonna get murdered tonight. There was a huge crash of thunder. It must have been really close. Dad's expression, brightly illuminated by the lightning, was burned into my eyes. Dad's face, which always looked so sure of itself, and which always wore a taunting expression, was for some reason that I couldn't explain strangely frail. It was so worn out that he looked like a different person. Wh what What are you talking about? That doesn't sound like you. <laughs> I agree. What happened? He looked so timid all of a sudden. It's not like you. I'm gonna go fix my makeup. Don't follow me. Dad turned away weakly. After that, only curious and I were left, still wide-eyed. What the hell was that? He's gonna get murdered tonight? You don't think that mysterious letter scared him? Hasn't he been watching too many serial murder movies? Oh, wait, he wears makeup. No, uh, he was making a joke because Kyrie excused herself from the uh, conference by saying that she had to touch up her makeup, but she was just making an excuse to get out of there for a little bit. So when he came into the room after a minute, he was like, you know, oh, it sure takes you a long time to fix your makeup. I should start wearing it too. So now he's making the joke like, ah, I got to go fix my makeup. <laughs> hmm. Kiryasan didn't answer my light-hearted words and continued to stare at my dad's disappearing back. Bantherkin, when he to told Rudolf-san to talk about it, he left without telling us anything. Even though he said he had something to say to everyone, he didn't answer you. Why? Flip over the chessboard. And when you do? There's the contradiction that he said he wanted to talk, but then couldn't. What can you see? What, can you see anything by looking from dad's perspective? <laughs> yes, I can see something. He wants to talk about something. However, he doesn't have the courage to bring it up. So he actually means, in that case, chase after me, talk to me, and question it out of me. He also means the opposite when he says don't follow me. He actually means follow me and force me to answer. Honestly, what a spoiled little child. What? Are you sure that theory's okay? That's ridiculous. <laughs> Can great detectives deduce the emotions and feelings between men and women? They can't, right? Figuring out the feelings of the opposite sex is an even more advanced art than exposing the tricks in difficult crime cases. If you ask me, romance novels have much deeper mysteries than masterpiece mystery novels. <laughs> I see. Is that how it is? I'll be what? I'll be with that spoiled little child. He normally loves to act tough, but tonight he's completely tired out from that heated discussion. He probably wants someone to lean on at the moment. And responding to that needs the duty of his partner. <laughs> Sounds passionate. Then I'll leave the old bastard in your hands. Yes, leave it to me. As Curious on departed, I called out to her. Hmm? What? Um, I wanted to say thanks. Thanks to you, my gloomy mood's cleared up a lot. That's good. Communication is important. After answering with a wink, Curious on followed after Dad. Okay, um, I need to grab water real quick, because we still have a little bit of a stretch to go. So, excuse me for just a minute, I will be right back.
Okay. Let's go for it. <clears throat> Natsuhi could be found in the dimly lit hallway. Now and then, the thunder would crash, but this had no effect on Natsuhi's expression. Her expression was completely worn out. The discussion that had just taken place between the relatives in the dining hall was repeating itself inside of Natsuhi's mind. Beatrice had proclaimed that in addition to the gold, the headship, and all of the assets of the Ushiramiya family would be given to the person who could solve the riddle. Uh, what? Hold on. I'm on the Danganronpa side of Twitter, so I keep seeing people upset about that one Danganronpa 3 video, and I'm just, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I honestly, like, there are things about the Danganronpa 3 video, and I've said this before, like, multiple times, that I think that we definitely could have done better, that I wish uh, we conveyed, like, differently. Um, it doesn't change my opinion about the show. I still don't like it, but, like, I would definitely phrase things a lot differently in some respects, um, or make points in a different way. Um, and I've tried to directly follow up on the things that I felt I could have done better about that video with other videos that I've done since then. So like the Shadow the Hedgehog video, if you watched that, was literally a direct response to the criticisms of the Danganronpa 3 video. Like I tried to basically handle that video in the way that I would want to handle a Danganronpa 3 video instead in some ways. I mean, obviously I come down a lot more positively on Shadow than I think I would about Danganronpa 3. But, you know, that, basically that was the logic behind it. I, I hope that people who really disliked the Danganronpa 3 video, which I can understand to some extent, would maybe watch that one to see kind of where I ended up trying to take that sort of direction. Um, but I understand that a lot of those people probably just don't like me, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Um, I, I, I hate that because, you know, I wish that I could like, you know, uh, communicate that um, I wanted to do things differently, but like, unfortunately, uh, as much as I would like to just like do a different thing or like something like that, YouTube punishes you for um, like getting rid of videos or privating videos or replacing that with something else. Um, and I mean, that was a lot of work too, so I definitely wouldn't want to do that, but you know. Um, e either way, you know, not to ramble, it's just like, it's one of those things that like, can't really, th there's nothing that I can really do about it at this point, um, but, you know, um, it does, it does bother me a little bit sometimes because I, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I do wish that I could kind of redirect in some ways, but it's just kind of too late to do that now. So all I can really do is try to adjust my direction and hope that people notice the effort being put in to do that. Anywho. <clears throat> in other words, she planned to undermine the absolute guarantee that Krauss as the oldest brother had to succeed the family head. Originally, the other siblings had absolutely no chance to succeed that head, to them, this proposal by Beatrice was extremely desirable. It was obvious that they would accept Beatrice's proposal. Even without playing clumsy detective games, she knew that the so-called 19th person, Beatrice, couldn't exist. This was a message employing a fictional character called Beatrice as a messenger. It may as well have been a writing in Kinzo's own handwriting. The proof was that Kinzo remained stubbornly neutral as to that letter's authenticity. He was completely ignoring these reckless claims that he shouldn't be able to ignore, that he had given up the head's ring. Oh, no, no, no. We're not talking about a, a V3, Astralina... Oh. <laughs> Hold on, sorry. I... Sorry, I just like had trouble pronouncing it. But yeah, uh, we were talking about Danganronpa 3, the anime, not the V3, the game. Mm. Okay, I gotcha. Astra. Sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, just a point of clarity. <clears throat> Most likely, one of, the, one of the servants had given Maria the letter. Kinzo had probably worked out an elaborate plan where they dre the dress from the portrait would be prepared, and someone, probably Shannon, would be made to wear it and deliver the letter and the umbrella. 
By doing that, he could make it seem like the witch from the portrait actually existed. No, if anything, that's why you could be certain that Kinzo was behind all of this. In that case, it was just as if Kinzo had butted in on the sibling's private discussion, and by announcing that he would get ev give everything to the person who could solve the riddle, Kinzo had weakened Krauss's overwhelming advantage. Now it was certain. Kinzo had listened in on the sibling's discussion in the parlor earlier that day. So he had known how Krauss had staved off the attack by the other three. And to make the scales of the battle go back into balance, he had sent out this strange letter, which benefited the other three. Ava and Rudolf had dragged Rosa in, who had a weak position among the siblings because of her age, and they were trying once again to overwhelm Krauss three-on-one and push through their crazy reasoning. And so, they had resumed what once had been a nearly decided conflict and were repeatedly pressing Krauss to make them pay a large amount of money. Talk about the, ad talk about the advance payment, which had been denied once already, which was being, brought up, was being brought up again under the terms that all of the siblings would guarantee Krauss the succession to the family head. Mm hmm okay, I see what you mean. Of course, even without a story about the hidden gold, the Ushirimiya family's store of wealth was vast. Just that the, that store was worth more than enough by itself. Even if the hidden gold was buried forever along with Kinzo's death, there would be more than enough to satisfy. Therefore, even if they had no interest in the gold itself, there would be a lifelong fear that on the off chance that someone found, finally found the gold, that person would be granted the position of family head. And this kind of Achilles heel would definitely be taken advantage of by someone sooner or later. The only person with this fatal weakness was the successor to the head, Kraus. The other siblings had found, no, they had been told by Kinzo about something that only Kraus could lose, and they had thoroughly taken advantage of that. Natsuhi, as Kraus's only ally in his pos painful position, and as his wife, had believed she was fighting alongside him. Actually, um, to loop things back to uh, Umineko in an interesting way, for those of you who like trivia about this sort of thing, ja not Jessica, uh, Rosa, uh, Rosa's Japanese voice in Umineko is shared with that of Ibuki from Super Danganronpa 2. Two totally different characters. <laughs> She kept trying to point out to him that the existence of the gold itself was a farce, and that there was no need for him to compromise. Krauss had always told Natsuhi. He had told all of the siblings. He had always, always said that the hidden gold was nothing more than a fiction created by Kinzo. Therefore, Natsuhi had believed that as his wife, and on the foundation that on, had believed that as his wife, and on the foundation on that foundation had supported her husband. Uh, for those who also know of any of the later characters in, the, in Umineko, um, I won't spoil anything about her, but uh, if you know of uh, Nox, Glanor Nox, that shows up later in Umineko, she also shares a voice actress with uh, Fukawa, Toko Fukawa from Danganronpa 1. So that's fun. Yet her words would not reach him. Even though she was fighting so hard and lending all of her strength, he continued to fight by himself and was trying to compromise with the other three siblings. Wondering why she could not be of use to him, Natsuhi felt sorrow, shame, and then anger. It had happened when everyone decided to take a short break to cool their heads. Natsuhi had flared up against Kraus. Enraged, she had asked why she could not be useful to him. The one that always gets me is Ava's VA being Taiga from Fate's Day Night. Yeah, yep. <laughs> he had told her that she wanted to talk about something, and had invited her into one of his private rooms, which she normally was not allowed to enter. The room had been sealed with a heavy-looking padlock, and just looking at it had given her an uncomfortable feeling. Oh yeah, um, I guess as long as we're bringing up notable VAs, by the way, um... Battler is voiced by uh, Daisuke Ono, who has voiced many notable roles, but uh, one of the ones that is the funniest in this context is that he voices Jotaro Kujo from part three of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> and onward, but yeah. <laughs> and they, he does really different voices for both of them. There's no reason for you to worry about what those three, or even the suspicious person who calls themselves Beatrice, says. After all, the gold is just a ruse created by father. There's no way something like that could be found. It's set in stone that you will be successor to the family. What are you afraid of? Krauss removed the padlock on the door. 
He then motioned for Natsuhi to enter. Enter. Wh what is this? There's something I want to show you. I've never shown it to you before. Natsuhi timidly opened the door with a dubious expression on her face. It was pitch black. She searched for a switch to turn on the lights, but since this was her first time in the room, she didn't know where it was. Kraus entered behind her, pushing her in, and closed the door before making any attempt to turn on the lights. The two were swallowed up by the darkness. Only the sound of Kraus locking the door rang out through the dark. What are you doing? The, the lights? I'm turning it on now. Wait. True to his word, Kraus pushed a switch on the wall, and a flickering light turned on and lit up the room. What is this? Natsuhi, ha Natsuhi had her breath taken away. The room with no win had no windows, and at a glance it appeared to be empty. In the middle of the room, a small round table had been set, and the lights brightened only that table, as if it were the leading part in a play. Laid out on top of the table was a red tablecloth of elaborate design, covered with dust. And on top of that, something about the size of a grown man's arm had been set down. That something took Natsuhi's breath away. It's a gold ingot of incredible purity. Without this, no one would have believed in the legend of the gold. It was an ingot of solid gold. Even in the faint light, it sparkled with a noble and dignified gold glint. This is not a proper ingot. I don't even know whether it was cast inside or outside of the country. It takes a high level of skill to make the purest of solid gold ingots. And in order to verify that purity, it is standard to have the original foundry in the name of the bank that guaranteed it imprinted on the gold. However, this ingot did not have that kind of seal. This mysterious gold bar had come from an unknown foundry. Look here. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a bar of gold. Natsuhi, following Krause's words, timidly approached the ingot. Right there. Krause pointed at the surface of the ingot. Natsuhi concentrated on that section. <sighs> right there was the thin imprint of the one-winged eagle crest. Natsuhi's breath was taken away once again. That's right. This is the legendary ingot that Dad said he received from the witch that the president of Marusu witnessed and was allowed to select at random to take back with him. But gained the trust of the fixers in the business world. Uninspired name, we're still going. Yes, yes we are, because I want to reach a very specific point to leave this first stream off on, and it's a little bit away, so... We're still going until I get to that point. And then I will be able to rest. <laughs> and, uh... I don't know, take that as a gift, as a, as a long VOD for people who can't stay around or have to view it later. <clears throat> I had to find all possible means to... I had to use all possible means to find it before the other siblings could. How could... Then the legend of Father's gold is... It actually exists. The gold that Ashurmi Akinzo received from Beatrice actually exists. How could... <gasps> How could it really exist? Natsuhi was shocked. Kraus had always said that Kinzo's gold was just a fabrication, so she had believed it as his wife. However, the reality was different. He had, definite, he had held definite proof, and had been more certain than any of the other siblings that the legend of the gold was true. Because of this, Kraus was deeply frightened at the possibility that someone other than himself would find the gold that he had failed to find costing him everything. But to Natsuhi, this truth was more than enough to split open her heart. She had thought that as Krauss's wife, she should be his closest confident, confidant, which is why she had been selflessly supporting him. And yet, he had hidden this fact from her until today. Why? <laughs> I bet so undeserving of your trust. I didn't mean it like that. It was only that there was no need to mention it. Is that all a, a wife means to you? Calm down. Becoming passionate and easily is one of your bad habits. You're the one who's making me like that, aren't you? I have been supporting you as a wife ever since I walked into this married into this family. 
For your sake, I threw away the family that I was born into. I've been offering up my heart and my body to serve you. And in return, I get this. How could... How could you? Kraus grimaced, looking annoyed. His expression effectively communicated how much he disliked this part of Natsuhi. I don't think I can be of any use to you anymore. Mm, and that's fine. I can resolve problems between the siblings by myself. I don't need your help. That's wrong. This is the Ushiramiya family's problem. It is true that I am not permitted to have the family and crest imprinted on my body. But I am still your wife. Even so, are you saying I'm not qualified to help you? Are you? I deliberately chose not to involve you out of consideration for you. Let's not talk any further. It will only worsen your headaches. Take a rest for today. The siblings will deal with the siblings' problems. It has nothing to do with you. That's all. A dull headache tormented Natsuhi. No matter what medicine she took, no matter what sense she burned, it wouldn't heal. On the other hand, by standing here alone in a dimly lit corridor, her head filled with the sound of the rain, she felt like the pain had softened a little. I may have been Natsuhi, but I was not Ushiramiya Natsuhi. Denigrated as being a sorry excuse for a wife, verbally abused for not even being able to take care of that. Even so, I tried to properly perform the duties of a wife, but I was rejected even by my husband. I did my best raising my daughter as though it was the last job left to me. However, my anger and sadness having no place to go caused me to subconsciously strain that relationship too. Because I have been excessively strict in Jessica's education, I am thoroughly disliked by her. Jessica despises me for not being interested in anything but grades. There is no longer anything I can do for the Oshiramiya family. No, it's no good. Even so, I must help my husband dislodge the schemes of the other greedy siblings. The head won't be around much longer. Eventually, Kraus will succeed the head, and the next successor will be Jessica. Strictly speaking, the man who enters the family by marrying Jessica will become the next head, but it all comes to the same thing. I have to make Jessica an excellent successor who everyone will accept as worthy to take over the Ushirumiya family. In the years to come, that greedy Ushirumiya Eva will surely be continually plotting to find some fault with the main family. So if all goes as she plans, Jessica will be dragged down from the succession with George in her place. It's regrettable, but George is a man, even more matured as a person. If you compare him to Jessica, who's right in the middle of her rebellious period and whose grades are below average, you can see at a glance who's more fit to succeed the head. So in order to succeed Jessica's position, I need to turn her into an excellent person. After doing that, I want to find her an excellent husband worthy of the excellent person she will have become. A wonderful man who will truly accept Jessica and stay with her through all of life's joys and sorrows. Was that... Natsuhi trying to entrust her daughter with fulfilling some desire of her own? Natsuhi thought back to the days when she'd had no choice but to marry into the Ushirumiya family because of that unavoidable fate. She had tried to block that from her memory. She had consciously forgotten that and had actively attended to the life she had been given as Ushirumiya Natsuhi. And this was the new life that she had built. But it felt like, just now, all of that had been casually rejected. Should I think as I live my life? I don't know. Natsuhi helplessly rested her head against the glass of the window. The glass cooled by the raindrops beating against it was somehow refreshing, and even though it had no emotions, right then it seemed to be the only thing that could understand Natsuhi. Even if something showed up there and saw her like this, Natsuhi had no intention of caring in the least. But she found herself caring, because it was her beloved daughter. Oh, it's you, Mom. What the heck are you doing here? Thought you were a ghost. Just like always, her words were rough, not at all like a girl's. Instinctively, words of rebuke rose to Natsuhi's throat. However, they only did so weakly, and so she was able to prevent them from escaping her lips. Jessica, I'm sorry. Your, 
Mother has an awful headache. Please, leave me be. Oh. Jessica was more than slightly disconcerted by this first ever sight of feebleness from her mother. Until just now, she had been filled with contempt for all of her, all of the parents, including her mother. But now, not the slightest bit of that feeling remained. All of it had been wiped out by her mother's completely exhausted face. In its place, the words that George had told her floated back up in her mind. The parents are doing their best in their own way. They're supporting their family so they can't afford to keep everything pleasant and have a heavy responsibility to fight. Couldn't her mother have been standing around in this dimly lit hallway because no one had tried to understand that? Jessica didn't like her mother. She had no instinct to give her mother's words of kindness just because she looked a little frail. Therefore, in order to give those words regardless, she had to clench both her fists and wrench the words out from the depths of her heart. It, it looks like you really have your hands full with that discussion. It has nothing to do with you. Please, go somewhere else. Is your headache bad? Should, should I go get some medicine? You don't have to trouble yourself. Please, leave me by myself. Natsuhi was not being cold to her. She just wanted to get her daughter far away from her so that she could avoid subjecting her to her short temper. But there was no chance that her intentions would reach Jessica. Okay. Jessica hung her head, looking sad. Looking at that expression, Natsuhi realized that Jessica was trying to muster up the strength to be kind to her mother. She gave her head a small shake to drive away her own unkind feelings. Then I'll leave. I'll be with the other cousins so I don't get in the way of the adults. See you. Wait. She called Jessica, about to make her desolate exit to a stop. What? Thank you for being considerate. It isn't good of me to go to sleep and leave you alone. Don't talk like that, you'll bring bad luck. I apologize for worrying you. I'm alright now. I'll go. Staying here any longer with a feeble expression would actually make her daughter feel more uncomfortable. Thinking this, Natsuhi left Jessica with words of gratitude and made to depart. This time, it was Jessica who called out to her mother's back. Natsuhi stopped, turned around, and asked what she wanted. But Jessica herself didn't know what, why she had stopped her mother. And for a while, she muttered to herself with a slightly forced smile as she hesitated over what to say. She was poking around in her pocket when her hand touched something, and she took it out. Um, hey, Mom, I, um, was given a charm today. Uh, what was it? Um, a charm against magic? Um... I'm pretty sure that you were supposed to hang it from your doorknob, was it? <laughs> I forgot. There's no reason for me to have it, so I'm giving it to you. It was the scorpion charm that Maria had given her the uh, at by the beach that day. Although she had heard of its various effects from Maria right now, Jessica's mind was blank and it was all she could do to say even that much. Thinking that her mother probably wouldn't accept the charm anyway, Jessica had immediately drawn back the hand offering it to her. So when Natsuhi came back and took hold of that hand, she was extremely surprised. What is this? Some kind of giveaway? <laughs> well, I think it's something like that. I guess you can't expect any benefits from a charm that looked like a toy. But her mother took the scorpion charm from her grip. Thank you. I'll take good care of it. Sometime soon, in exchange, I'll give you a charm that was important to me when I was a child. It's not like that's why I gave it to you, but, well, if you really say so, then I'll rest for now. My headache is awful. Try not to stay up too late. Sure. Natsuhi put the charm in her pocket and turned away. She then disappeared into the dark hall. I was performing crying for that. However, some of it, a little bit, was genuine. You won't be able to tell which. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> it looks like the weather will be like this all day tomorrow. After all. Damn, it's hard to believe it's dry out earlier. George Anaki and I were killing time in front of the parlor television. At that point, Jessica returned. Her face was still blank, but it looked like she had calmed down a little since she had left. Is Maria, is Maria still in front of the portrait? Nope. She just came back and she's sleeping over there on the sofa. It's getting pretty late for her. 
Looking at the clock, it was a little past 10 p.m. Even if we were going to stay up all night, it was about time to head back to our room. How did I become a voice actor? Um, persistence. <laughs> it, it would just like, um, when I was about, I want to say around like nine to 10 years old, maybe a little bit younger than that. I, um, I just kind of became conscious of the fact that like, while I was playing video games that I liked that, you know, it was somebody's job to do the voices that I was hearing in my favorite video games. And, um, around that time I, you know, was also like discovering people's like fan dubs online and stuff like that. And I was just kind of like, oh, I, I think I could do that. I want to do that. Um, I had always like, even as a kid too, like kind of wanted to be a screen actor a little bit too, because I just watched so many movies that I was like, oh, I want to be in that movie. That would be cool. It'd be cool if I was in Home Alone or like, you know, something like that. So, um, I just kind of like, I don't know, practiced it around for fun. And then whenever I discovered fan dubs and stuff, I was like, oh, I could audition for something. And like I did a couple of amateur projects as a little kid and then I just kept doing it because I like doing it as a hobby and I kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it and then um, that's how I got to the point that I'm at today and like why in the last several years I've actually done like paid work and stuff so um, I mean obviously there's a lot more to it uh, as far as like you know um, making industry connections and stuff like that some of that has to do with the fact that I started doing YouTube and then people found my YouTube and then they saw me voice acting on my YouTube. So it was like, you know, then that opened doors for me a little bit, but, um, yeah, it's just kind of been pretty much just me doing it because I want to and, uh, stacking practice upon practice for like, since I was little. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> my mom did prepare a room for us in the mansion, but what do you want to do? I think I'd rather head back to the guest house. Judging by our parents' appearance, I think it'd be better if we weren't in the mansion. Second that, feels like they're telling us kids to mind our own business and stay out of their way. Let's do that like little, good little boys and girls. After we discussed that, Auntie Rosa came into the parlor. She was looking all over restlessly, probably trying to find Maria. Auntie Rosa, if you're looking for Maria, she's over there on the sofa. Thank you. My, she's out cold. We must move her to a bed. If you would like me to, I can carry her to her bed. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Will all of you return to the guest house? Or will you stay in the room Natsui Nesan's prepared? We were just talking about that. We decided to head over to the guest house. Really? Then I wonder if you wouldn't mind taking Maria with you. I think it will be much more comforting for her if she's with all of her cousins. It seemed that in the shadow behind those words, there was some regret that the adults, herself included, had deeply hurt Maria's feelings. Leave it to us, Auntie. After all, we do have an expert at comforting Maria with us. Uh, if I remember who was my favorite at this point in my first playthrough? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, honestly. I think, like, by, I guess by this point, then it, it would have probably been, like, somebody like either Battler or, like, Natsuhi, maybe. Um... Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a good question. I don't really remember super well. It's it's been a long time since I first read Umineko. Are you talking about me? I couldn't do it by myself. We'll need everyone together. That's right. Battler, weren't you the one who hit it off with Maria when you were messing around earlier? As we said this, Auntie Rosa smiled, looking truly happy. Thank you, everyone. It looks like our meeting was will last until very late. So, I'm sorry for the burden, but I'll have to leave Maria in your hands. Hey, Maria, you awake? We're going back to the guest... guest house. Maria muttered something indistinct as if answering, but then rolled over and fell back asleep. It looked like she was sleeping deeply. She's really out cold. It'd be bad to wake her. Right, I'll carry her. Maria's body was much lighter than it looked. George Aniki picked her up and pulled her over his back. It was raining hard outside, and Aniki couldn't hold an umbrella and carry Maria at the same time. It looked like Auntie Rosa would come with us as far as the guest house to help out. However, when she heard Uncle Krause's voice call out to her, she had no choice but to return. Oh dear. I have to go back. Is everyone returning to the guest house? 
After we left the hall on the way to the entrance, the door to the servant room opened and Shannon Chan stepped out. It's become very dark, so allow me to guide you. Perfect timing, Shannon Chan. George Kun's going to carry Maria there. Could you please hold an umbrella for him? Yes, certainly. Uh, most important question, favorite sprite versions. Um, yeah, I do have a bias for the original sprites. I just, you know. I'm using Umineko Project because it's the most, like, it's got the most effects and it's the most, like, wide consumer friendly. But uh, if, if you like the charmingness of, like, rough art made by, like, one dude that's very obviously, like, done with passion, then I would definitely recommend looking at the original sprite stuff. The Pachinko sprites hold a deep place in your heart. Really? That's an interesting one. I haven't heard many people advocate for the Pachinko sprites. That's that's definitely interesting. <clears throat> As we opened the front door, the downpour was quite terrific. It looked like we wouldn't have had any spare time to take a pleasant walk and enjoy the nighttime rose garden. Aniki, is she too heavy? Want me to carry her? It's all right. I can at least carry Maria, Chan. I'm truly grateful. Please take care of Maria. Right, we understand. In that case, good night, Auntie. Then I'll see them over there and return here. Yes, please. Auntie Rosa saw us off. Maria. I'm sorry for everything. R Rosa's mumbling voice didn't reach the person in question, nor anyone else, but disappeared beneath the sound of the rain. Uh, so to answer your question in closing time, um, there are three sets of sprites that Umineko has. One is the original set of sprites, which Ryukishi 07, the author himself, drew. Ryukishi is not much of an artist, so it's a little amateurish, but it has its charms. Um, that was used for the original release of the visual novel before it was ever ported to uh, any consoles. Then you have the console sprites, which were done by Alchemist. Those are the ones that we're looking at right now. So this is the art that was used in the console ports of Umineko. And then you have the Pachinko sprites. Uh, the Pachinko sprites are redrawn sprites done by one of the artists of the Umineko manga, which was used for the official English Steam release. Unfortunately, they're not very good, despite the fact that I really, really like that particular artist. Um, she does great work in the manga, I just do not gel with her sprites, unfortunately. After cutting through the rainy rose garden, we arrived at the guest house. Uh, if only I'd applied for the position of Maria Carrier. Then I'd have gotten a ru Yeah, okay, yeah, shut up. <laughs> That's not on purpose, it's a misunderstanding. I thought that if I didn't, George Summer would get all wet. Come on, quit babbling and go in. After being nudged by Jessica, Shannon folded up her umbrella and went into the guest house. Has anyone gotten their clothes wet? I can bring some towels if you'd like. You don't need to worry about us that much. Thanks, Shannon John. Oh, yes. Well, we were saying earlier that we'd play some cards. Do you want to stay with us for a while? Huh? Who had the night shift on tonight's schedule? I believe there's a special schedule for the duration of the family conference. I think there were a few changes, so I'll go check. Wait if, you ha wait, if you have to go all the way back to the mansion to find out, you don't have to force yourself. It's all right. I can find out from the servant room in the guest house. Please, excuse me for a short while. Shannon Chung gave a quick bow and went to the guest house servant room. The rest of us headed for the cousin's room and put Maria in bed for the time being. Maria was sleeping very deeply, and there was absolutely no sign of her eyes opening. We got some drinks out of the room's refrigerator and spent some time playing cards while drinking. Oh, the Kanonkun? Even Genji Sama's here. What's happening with tonight's shift? Kraus Sama's given an order. There have been modifications made to most of the schedule. Indeed. Goto's been changed to the night shift at the mansion. You and Kanon have been given night shift at the guest house. Kumasawa san and I have been ordered to spend the night in the guest house. We just now had a phone call stating that you're to remain here as well. Huh? That's quite a large modification. The shifts at the guest house and the mansion have been completely reversed, haven't they? Originally, Shannon and Canon had been given the night shift in the mansion while the night shift in the guest house with while the night shift in the guest house, where all the relatives were staying, had been assigned to Goda, who had been had an abundance of experience in entertaining. Kumasawa had been scheduled to stay in the guest house while Genji had been scheduled to stay in the mansion. However, it seemed that Krauss had suddenly ordered that the schedule be modified. 
The shifts at the guest house and the mansion had all been reversed, and Genji was spending the night in the guest house. It's probably because of Beatrice Sama's letter. Probably? Why? When such a mysterious letter appeared, it was only natural that Kraus Sama would suspect one of us. We served directly under the master, so Kraus Sama probably wanted to keep us as far away from the family conference as possible. Genji, Shannon, and Kanon were all permitted to wear the Ashiramiya family crest, the one-winged eagle, as the servants who served directly under Kinzo. Of course, since they were working for the Ashiramiya family, they had to obey anyone's orders, but their only boss was Kinzo. Since only Kinzo held the right to employ them, even Kraus could not have them dismissed of his own accord. Because of this, they were often viewed by Kraus and the others as Kinzo's underlings and shunned. And in reality, Kinzo would seldom let anyone other than them enter his study. You could probably call this sudden shift change a clear expression of that sense of distrust. Considering the time Kinzo had left to live, this would definitely be the last family conference before the problem of the inheritance would come up. On top of that, the mysterious letter that claimed to be from Beatrice had dropped in out of the blue. Kraus definitely wanted to keep Kinzo's loyal subjects away from the table of such a delicate and important discussion. If you were to excuse me, I'll go rest. If anything happens, call me immediately. Our company tonight is... special. Yes, certainly, Genji-sama. Genji nodded back, went behind a screen, took off his jacket, and slowly began to relax after a day's worth of tension. The ones who returned just now, were they the children? Yes. The other relatives are having a conference in the mansion. It looked like it would drag on until much later. Then that would be comfortable. It's already this late, and there's this weather. <laughs> Which Danganronpa character could land on Rokenjima and derail the entire plot in the funniest way? Um, Komaida. I, I want to imagine that Komaida would just just absolutely introduce such a rogue element into this whole thing that, like, everybody would be completely baffled as to what was going on. <laughs> um, but then again, that does actually remind me of another character who does actually show up in Umineko later on. Um, not in this episode, though. Probably the rest of the relatives will spend the night in their rooms in the mansion. Yes, probably. I'm only saying this because Genji-sama isn't around, but I'm a little happy I was sent to the guest house, I think. Oh? Why's that? Because you were able to distance yourself from the bullying of Madame and Eva-sama? Or do you have another reason? I... I don't have any... other reasons. I see. Then let's do our best together with our midnight shift. I'm counting on you, Nason. <laughs> um... Just now I was asked to go to the children's room and play with them. Shannon hung her head apologetically and made uncertain glances toward Kanon's eyes. Kanon didn't try to meet her gaze and spoke curtly as he sighed. It didn't, looked like he didn't plan on indulging his sister. You can't. You were assigned the night shift. And besides, that's not, that's not necessary for furniture like us to respond to an invitation to play. You understand, right? Yes, I do understand. Mm. Shannon dropped her shoulder slightly. She had already expected that Kanon, who considered rules to be very important, would probably say something like that, but even so, she was a little discouraged. As Kanon turned the pages of a logbook, he spoke without facing Shannon. In that case, you must be keeping the children waiting. You'll have to go apologize and tell them you have the night shift and won't be able to stay with them. Off you go, then. Hm. Uh, yes. I'll just go apologize. Shannon hurriedly stood from her seat before her brother's mood could change, gave a quick bow, and flew out of the servant room. As he watched her disappear, Kanon took a single bre deep breath. <sighs> Genji's voice came from behind the beyond the screen. Kanon, I'll be here so you shall go too. Genji summoned. Shannon was the only one called. It's not like I was invited. That's only because you were not there at the time. If you had been, you would have been invited as well. It's good to play as a child from time to time. No, that's not something I need to do. A human child has need may may have a need to play, but we are furniture. Is that so? Nason is also furniture. Even if she pretends to be a person, it will only hurt her later. I understand that, so I try not to get too close to people. Genji did not say anything say anything after that. A few moments passed and he stood up, using a pot of hot water to make some hot chocolate from powder, and served it to Kanon as well. Holy crap, seriously? I did not know that! Keep it down, dumbass. You wake Maria up. 
Battler was so surprised that he yelled obnoxiously and scattered his cards everywhere. His voice caused Maria to turn over once, but she soon fell back into a deep sleep. Jessica gave him a jab, and he lowered his voice. No, but yeah, now that you said that, they really did have that kind of atmosphere, didn't they? Ha! <laughs> now I see that George Aniki... George could not be seen anywhere in the room. A short while ago, when Shannon had come into the room, George had suddenly said he, forgot, he had forgotten something in the mansion and needed to go back to get it. Shannon said, had said that she would guide him, just like she had on the way to the guest house, and the two of them had departed together. They've been showing signs of it for a long time, you know. Asking what the other person liked, asking what their hobbies were. I always knew it was too much to be a passing interest. Come to think of it, I get the feeling that George Aniki has always been overly nice to Shannon Chan. Now I get it. Yeah. So, aside from the excusing Rosa's behavior, for those of you who have been waiting for the other reason why I don't like George, here it is! <laughs> George is, um, let's say, having a bit of a tryst with Shannon. You might remember the fact that George is in his uh, early 20s. He is uh, 23. Shannon is 16 years old. <laughs> So, yeah, there's that. Um, not great. <laughs> and on that unfortunate note, um, I have to go to the bathroom real quick, so. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> so yeah, um, it, I do think it is kind of a mixture of um, uh, things like, you know, <sighs> let me be clear, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I just think the way it is played is probably a result of like the time and like the time period that it takes place in and also like cultural expectations and stuff like that. It is not good at all. I hate it. That's why I don't like George. Um, but yeah, that being said, uh, this gets even more complicated later on and I can't tell you how. <laughs> it sucks. I don't like it. It is uh, one of my lesser favorite parts of Umineko for sure. Anyway, let's uh, get through this <laughs> so that we can get to actual good content. <clears throat> According to the weather report, it looks like it'll be at its worst tonight. It also seems that it won't stop at all tomorrow, but it should get a little better. Really? Then the boat might not arrive until the day after tomorrow. I'm concerned that it might interfere with your work on Monday. <laughs> I already knew that the typhoon would be coming beforehand. That being said, uh, let me interject just one last time. I do think that the fact that like there is a weird power dynamic here is something that is intentionally being honed in on by the narrative. Um, I don't think that like this is being done in a purely like, oh, I'm super ignorant of the implications here. Like again, it's one of those things where it's like the Ashuramiya family sucks. Um, so I do think that is definitely being pointed out by this. Um, some of George's lines here in particular are things that I do, do not think that uh, somebody could write without being like aware of how that sounds. 
But yeah, the age gap does feel a little slept on, unfortunately. Or, well, slept on. But, like, you know what I mean. Like, I don't think he was thinking as much about that, unfortunately. Um, but the power dynamic definitely is, like, an intentional element. <clears throat> Just in case, I made sure that I didn't have any plans for Monday, so it's all right. I may not look like it, but I really am the type who can plan ahead in the schedule. George puffed out his chest, acting proud. Compared to the normally composed appearance that George always had as the oldest cousin, he now looked amusingly like a little kid. Shannon chuckled at this gap. It's no surprise that someone who will make his company soon make his company prosperous is so well prepared. Well, making a company prosperous really is a tough job. Money isn't the only thing that's important. I learned that well by studying from my father. Making a company prosperous is like having a castle and leading your subordinates. My father, true to his name of Hideyoshi, really loves reading about the great leaders of the Sengoku period. Most of his philosophical speeches on business managers, management start with one of them. Did you know? Takeda Shingen, who is feared as the leader of the strongest cavalry corps in the Sengoku period, started out with his troops in complete disarray and didn't have the kind of strong leadership necessary to utilize them well. He's just, like, launching into this big, long explanation. She's like, wow, damn, did not ask. <laughs> is that true? That's a little unexpected. In order to unite his troops, Shingen utilized several strategies. For example, when a soldier succeeded well in battle, he would immediately honor them with a medal. Normally, that kind of thing was put off until after the war and they were all awarded at once. By doing that regularly on the field of battle, he immediately showed his appreciation for his troops' military exploits, which motivated them in an extremely significant fashion. Furthermore, whenever one of his troops was brought down by an illness, he would be the first to rush up to them and care for them. Things like that. Takeda Shingen wasn't just the man who led the strongest cavalry corps in the Sengoku period. He was the person who cared the most for his troops throughout the Sengoku period. That must be why all of his troops followed him. The truth was, Shannon had already heard this story several years ago. But when George started to tie his father in with one of these stories, he would always be be beaming, looking like he was having a great time. So Shannon did not interrupt, but merely smiled to encourage him to continue. Of course, in a capitalist world, money is power and is also the height of your castle wall. But you can't build up a castle to succeed in a war all by yourself. That kind of thing can only be created with the support of many subordinates by borrowing their strength. After understanding this, when I look at my father's back, I realize how immature I am. I see how much my father has cultivated his character by working hard and understand well how he was able to build up all he has today. Until today. George Sama, you truly look up to your father. I'm jealous. Uh, sorry, that's not exactly what I meant to say. I'm sorry, I also didn't mean it that way. The two of them awkwardly looked at their feet. Shannon had no parents. She had been brought up in a welfare institute owned by Kinzo called the Gospel House. Under the guidance of the honorary director, Kinzo, the Gospel House offered excellent students a chance to live a life of service. If they were accepted, they would be able to leave the institute and work as servants for the Ishiramiya family. This was considered to be the highest honor for a student. Servants from the Gospel House all took names with the character Own in them while they served. So Shannon wasn't her real name. The same goes for Canon. All of the students of the Gospel House were orphans. Or failing that, people who had been disowned by their parents through some special circumstances. <laughs> disowned by special circumstances. What do you mean by this? I love how they have absolutely no chemistry with each other. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <coughs> That's why it seems so natural to Canon to call Shannon his sister. And while only Shannon and Canon were working today in the mansion, there were other servants who worked in the shift rotation named Manon and Lennon, who also inherited the own character in their names. However, there were not many servants who stayed with the Ishiramiya family for long. Gee, I wonder why. It was standard for them to quit after three years. So you could probably say that Shannon, who had been working for over ten years, was a very rare exception to the rule. Working as a servant for the Ishiramiya family was a heavy, bur heavy burden to bear, but the pay wasn't bad at all. Working for a full three years would earn more than what was needed to er enter mainstream society. That was why, even though the students realized what a harsh task working for the Ishiramiya family was, they still hoped to be accepted. But in Shannon's case, maybe the fact that she had managed to continue for more than ten years should not be viewed as her having more willpower than any of the servants. 
Maybe it was a lack of courage to say that she wanted to quit that forced her to continue working for those 10 years. To Kinzo, who could not even trust his own blood relatives, those excellent servants sent from the gospel house were the only ones he could trust. Because of that, uh, do we ever get to meet them? Um, sort of. That's the only response I will give to that. Because of that, Kinzo would sometimes allow them to wear the family crest as servants under his direct control and have them work close to him. Um, you've actually been working here about ten years, was it? You've saved up a lot of money by now, right? I don't know, really. It's not like there's anything in particular I'd like to buy. And just because you have a few million yen doesn't mean you have to live the rest of your life with... So, you have, haven't been working here to reach a target sum? No, I haven't. I have nowhere else to go outside of this mansion. I have been getting along well with Milady and the other serv young servants, too. I'm sometimes scolded by Madame, but caring for the Rose Garden and cleaning the mansion is fun. But that isn't your life, Sayo-chan. Um... Shannon cast her eyes downward when she heard her real name. She understood what George was trying to say and closed her mouth. Even after becoming an adult and a full-fledged member of society, I've been studying and I've learned something. A human's life is not as monotonous or as short as we once thought when we were kids. That horrifying thought that everyone has in their student years. Will the rest of my life be like a monotonous, boring, sleep-inducing after-school class where I endlessly, lazily walk away, walk away the time, eh, lazily while away the time until finally it ends without anything interesting ever happening? However, these thoughts only arise while a person is still an underage student. Compared to a human's life, the time they spend as a student is nothing more than the blink of an eye just the period before they break out of their shells and cast off their immaturity. The inside of the shell might be a hot, suffocating, and boring world, but the world beyond that shell is vast and filled with limited, limitless possibilities. So far, your life has only been spent within a shell called Shannon. Aren't you making the mistake of thinking that your life will always continue like this? That is... Shannon couldn't deny those words. She hadn't been able to find any concrete issues with her way of life, and since she'd never had any desire or goal to change herself in any particular way, she continued her life idly. And if she were asked whether her life was already fulfilled, she wouldn't necessarily have been able to nod. That may have been a truth she was deliberately averting her eyes from. As long as George did not realize that truth, she would have continued pretending not to notice, as her real life slipped away, neglected bit by bit. George Summer, is it wrong for me to continue living this way? It's wrong. Uh, and by the way, didn't you break one of the rules just now? George immediately gave a strict answer and then broke into a mischievous smile. Shannon already knew what she was being chided for, and it seemed that it embarrassed her as she hung her head. Didn't you promise not to use Sama when the two of us are alone? Sh shut up, dude. I, I can't obey that as a promise, but if it was an order, I would have to obey it. Because I'm furniture. Then it's an order. <laughs> <laughs> yes, certainly, George son. As Shannon hung her head, her face red, she said George's name again, this time using son. Yes, that's better, Sayo John. A smile rose to George's face, praising Shannon's no, Sayo's small act of bravery. The way they talked with each other gave off the sense that their relationship had already been ongoing for some time. For a long while, as if the weather raging around them didn't even enter their consciousness, the two of them talked about the many memories they'd built during their relationship that no one else knew about. Every once in a while, a flash of lightning would attempt to dampen the mood, but it could not sully these moments, which seemed to flush even the roses outside a deeper shade of red. I have not heard char George's character song, actually. That's mostly because I like to pretend that George doesn't exist whenever I have the opportunity to. <laughs> Oh, oh yes. I have something I wanted to show you. What could it be? George, who had been speaking so eloquently, start suddenly started to stutter. From his manner, Shannon too understood something. George timidly searched through his pocket for it. It got caught in his deep, deep in his pocket somehow, and came out somewhat slowly and awkwardly in the same manner as his speech. It was a very small box. Uh... A small box covered in a deep blue velvet. Its characteristic shape was enough to make anyone realize what was resting inside. 
Shannon had been preparing her heart a little, sure of what it must be. But even so, when she actually saw it, she couldn't avoid blushing once more. George opened the small box, took it out, and held it for Shannon to take. I want you to accept this. I... I can't accept something so valuable. You can't accept it? That's... that's not... I meant... something like that is too... good for me. Sire, this is not a request. It's an order, okay? SHUT UP! I will... I will do violence to this man. I will bring out a hammer and I will break his kneecaps. His stupid banana-suited kneecaps. <sighs> Accept this ring, okay? How? Uh, I, I can't disobey an order. Yes, that's right. Good. Uh, I'm not even gonna say that. Shut up. Shannon, not wanting to show her bright red face, timidly accepted the ring from George's hand while staring at the ground. The ring wasn't a simple accessory. It was a noble object which since ancient times was meant to be offered to a special woman with a special meaning. So while George could order her to take it, he could not order anything beyond that. Anything beyond that would depend not on an order, but on Shannon's no, own Sayo's own will. So from here on, it's no longer an order. Sayo, I want you to answer me tomorrow without using words. Do you understand? Um, how? I won't order you anymore, so this isn't an order. But a ring is something you put on your finger. If you like it, you can just put it on any finger that you choose. Shannon had only pretended not to know. She had already understood what he wanted her to do. But she was standing at a huge crossroads of her life. Look at how late it's gotten. Let's call it night. No, yeah, literally, like, this, this whole thing is like... You know how Ace Attorney has, like, the shit with Max and anybody with a brain is like, dude, that sucks. But the author didn't really seem to get the memo somehow. Yeah. George faced away from Shannon, seeming slightly uncomfortable. It might be possible for me to order you to put it on a finger of your left hand. You too might be timid and dependent enough to actually obey that kind of order. But I want you to do this very last part of your own will, Sayo. You understand, right? I yes So, that's my order. I want you to think about it well tonight and show me your answer tomorrow. Hey, closing time. Yeah, understandable. It is very late. Please get some rest. Um, I, I hope you've been enjoying and uh, definitely I, I hope you enjoy the rest whenever you get around to it. See ya! Shannon nodded back. Today was the culmination of their long relationship. This moment had not come as any surprise to Shannon. We should be getting back to the guest house soon. If we take any longer, we'll make everyone worry about us. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I, I just remembered I had something to do in the mansion, so, um, I have to go back to the mansion. I have to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> something this late? Really? George stared into Shannon's face as he laughed mischievously. He had seen through that obvious lie of Shannon's. But imagining how she felt, it wasn't as if he couldn't understand her embarrassment and why she might ask to be alone. And so George, having understood Shannon's lie and all that was behind it, allowed her to leave. <sighs> Thank God, the scene is over. Uh, you guys are God's strongest troopers for enduring that bullshit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. That's like easily one of the worst parts of episode one. It is all uphill from here. Thank God. <clears throat> Less George. Don't worry. Uh, the further we go into the series, uh, there are definitely episodes where there is a uh, less George than others. Unfortunately, episode two actually has probably the most George in the series. <laughs> but after that, it's a smooth, mostly George-less sailing uh, in a lot of places. <laughs> um, to be fair to some people in the chat, they were like, oh, I thought this was like cute when I first read it. What the hell? It's because they don't draw very close attention to George's age that often. Um, they only mention it very briefly, like, pretty early on. 
So it can be easy to forget like that a gap that large exists between them because they're like anime characters, so you can't really tell the difference just by looking at them. Um, it's only after you look, look back at their profiles and are like, oh, wait a minute, yeah. Well, and I mean, obviously the servant stuff is pretty cringe too, but like, other than that though, you know, yeah. <clears throat> Shannon entered the entrance hall to the mansion with a tottering gait. Wait, how much of a gap is it? Uh, he's 23 and she's 16. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Her chest was filled almost to bursting with a mixture of exaltation and uncertainty that she couldn't easily describe. After stopping for a second in front of the servant room to take a deep breath and calm her heart, she opened the door. Inside, Goda, who had been ordered to take the midnight shift at the mansion tonight, was absorbed in an old, worn-out crossword puzzle magazine. He looked up for an instant to see whether one of the family had come, but when he realized that it was a fellow servant, he returned to his puzzle as if nothing had happened. No, yeah, definitely. Uh, I agree, Kamikaze here. Like, um, it is one of those things, too, that it's like, it's not good. It just happens in enough, like, VN or anime media that, like, if you read a bunch of that kind of stuff whenever, whenever you were younger, it kind of glosses over you at the time. Um, and it's something that you kind of, like, only realize how bad it is when you look back at it later when you were older. Um, d hands up for anybody in the chat who was reading Clamp stuff when they were younger. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he looked up for an instant to see whether one of the family had come, but when he realized that it was a fellow servant, he returned to his puzzle as if nothing had happened. Um... I was told by Genji-sama to help you. Ah, really? That will be useful. I was just about to go make the rounds to close up the mansion, but I was in two minds about whether I should leave this place empty. After all, the meeting Kraus-sama and the others are conducting appears as though it will last for quite some time. They might order some tea at any time. That's true. Then what shall we do? Should I remain here while... In that case, Shannon-san, sorry, but would you please make the rounds around the mansion? I'll stay here awaiting the family's orders. <laughs> Dude, Goda! He's just like, um... Well, if you're willing to do all of the work, then can you please do it? <sighs> yes. Shannon felt a twinge of annoyance. Despite the fact that she had come here to help out as a favor, she was being forced to do the job of the person on duty as though it were natural. Furthermore, after one-sidedly forcing that task on her, Goda had once again gone back to his magazine and, become an Im and had become immersed in his crossword puzzle. What is Clamp? Uh, Clamp is a group that uh, makes manga. They have made commercial manga, like a Cardcaptor Sakura and stuff like that, and they also make doujins, of which there are many not safe for work ones. They've made a lot of JoJo-related ones, in fact. Um, Clamp is also responsible for designing all of the characters in Code Geass, if you're familiar with Code Geass. Um, they're kind of notorious for having stuff like that in their manga. So, that's why I brought it up. For the time being, as a sign of respect for her elder, Shannon bowed her head and she left the room to make the rounds. Getting a little angry had enabled her to bring the airy sensation she had been feeling until now under control a bit. Besides, she couldn't show this kind of face to Genji and Kanon. Until her heart was able to calm down, she wanted a little time to herself, and maybe going around the mansion wasn't such a bad way to do that. We are so close. We are so close to the point that I want to leave off on. From the dining hall, she began to hear the tumultuous voices of the family's discussion. Someone would speak at great length and would then be opposed by someone else. That rebuttal would continue in a very long, drawn-out fashion until opposed by yet another person. That kept on repeating. Oh, uh, yeah, you were a f huge fan of Sailor Moon. Yep. Sailor Moon has some of that stuff, too, unfortunately. That's just a 90s anime for you. 90s and 2000s anime, especially. That kept on repeating. It was as though their displeasure was seeping out through their voices. She had been told to go to the guest house, so it would be bad if they were discovered by Kraus. Thinking that, Shannon quick-footedly slipped by the entrance to the dining hall. Then, inside the mansion controlled by darkness, she began to check that the house was all closed up, following a prearranged route. 
She walked down the hall, checking that each window was closed. On Rokenjima, there were no humans other than the family, so in actuality, closing up wasn't that terribly meaningful of a task. Until Natsuhi had scolded them that this attitude was careless, closing up had not been customary in the Ushirimiya family. The metal fixtures on the completely chilled windows were freezing, and every time she went to check on them, one by one, it felt like the glow in her heart seemed to cool down. Hmm? <laughs> Just then, she thought she saw something flickering across the hall. Flickering. Something like that shouldn't be visible beyond the darkness of the hall. Although she thought it was probably her eyes playing tricks on her, she killed her breathing for a brief moment. And grasping a curtain, she fearfully gazed into the center of the hall. However, other than the occasional crack of thunder brightening the hallway, she was una unable to glimpse any flicker again. It must have been her imagination after all. Maybe she couldn't calm her heart. She saw something that didn't even exist. She had... <clears throat> Shannon resumed checking the windows. However, in the back of her mind, a certain unnerving possibility had been resurrected. It was that which had been passed down amongst the servants who served the Ashirimiya main family, that ghost story, in which the mansion had different masters of the day and the night in which the master of the night, Beatrice, would sometimes fly around the mansion in the form of sparkling butterflies. Come to think of it, hadn't Kanonkun said he had said once seen it for himself? He got sulky when I didn't believe him and told him he was just seeing things. Could it possibly? Really? The roar of the thunder gave no answer. Yeah, the the whole, like, Sailor Moon thing where they, like, censored the gay characters and made them cousins is, like, so... Like, what were you even hoping to accomplish with that? Like, were you just hoping that the fruitiness would disappear and that people would be like, oh, well, they're related, then that's, you know, fine. Like, no, it makes it worse! <laughs> it makes it much worse than if you had just admitted that they're gay. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a mess. Oh, here we are, at midnight. Let's get a head count, shall we? What's everybody doing? Beatrice's portrait sits in the hall. What was she cooking? Rudolph is in the dining hall with Krauss, Rosa, and Kyrie, as well as Hideyoshi and Ava. Shannon is in the mansion, cleaning. Goda is in the servant room, in the mansion, doing nothing. Kanon is in the servant room with Genji in the guest house. Uh, Kumasawa is also in the guest house. Nanjo is in the void. <laughs> George is in the cousin's room, along with Battler, Jessica, and Maria, who is asleep. Kinzo is in his room, being thoughtful. The stage is set. It's time for shit to get fucking crazy. And once we get to that first crazy event, I will be wrapping the stream when we get to that point. So look forward to the escalation because we've gotten all of the setup out of the way. It is batshit insane from here on out. The second day, October 5th, 1986. Genji once again tightened his bow tie and looked outside through a crack in the curtains. Maybe the rain had died down a tiny bit since the previous night, but it didn't look like the thick rain clouds were planning to let any trace of the morning sun get by. The morning was dim and far from refreshing. As expected, it doesn't seem that it will stop today. My apologies for keeping you waiting, Genji-sama. Kenon finished checking his appearance and exited the washroom. In a normal schedule, it was rare for anyone to have, su have to suffer going straight from a midnight shift to a morning, morning shift. 
Um, yes, uh, Beatrice's name is uh, the Italian pronunciation. <clears throat> uh, if you listen to the Japanese voice acting, they uh, go out of their way to pronounce it like that. I mean, obviously it gets a little <laughs> shifted around because it's Japanese trying to pronounce the Italian, but uh, yes. <clears throat> It was a special system for just the two days of the family conference. But then, as long as the typhoon didn't leave today, the relative stay on this island would last until tomorrow. Canon thought that it was best not to be prepared for the special schedule to be extended one more day. The two of them left the guest house, opening their umbrellas. The rose garden had been devastated by the wind and rain last night. Even though they had spent several days making it beautiful to welcome the guests, it had only taken one stormy night to ruin it. Canon sighed. The two headed for the mansion. They were supposed to meet up with Gota and prepare breakfast. Gota was such a perfectionist that he would undoubtedly have been up for some time already, and now be in the middle of preparing a breakfast both exquisite and elegant as glasswork. They reached the overhang by the entrance to the mansion and folded up their umbrellas. Genji took, it from, his took from his pocket a bundle of several keys and used it to unlock the front door. There was nothing on Rokenjima outside the Yoshirimiya family mansion, so they never used to be a, there never used to be a custom of locking it up. However, Natsuhi had ordered it be part of their duties to lock up the mansion from around midnight to early morning. And unlocking it in the early morning was to be done by the servants who had the morning shift. Since Goto would be preparing breakfast as soon as he woke up, this task was to be undertaken by G Genji and Kanon. Silence had fallen in the mansion, giving the impression that the mansion itself was still asleep. Well then... Let us begin the morning chores. Yes. The two of them split up and began opening the curtains throughout the mansion. If the curtains remained closed, the inside of the mansion would be unable to shake off its gloom, as if it hadn't yet managed to escape the previous night. Kenon, following a well-versed procedure, went around the mansion, opening one window after another without having to retrace his steps once. Even with this horrible weather, by opening the curtains, it began to feel just a little bit like morning. While doing that, he passed in front of the kitchen. Even though he hadn't yet smelled anything, his empty stomach started aching in anticipation of the scent of Goda's much-bragged-about cooking. Good morning. Hmm? He tried to greet Goda, who he had thought would be preparing the meal inside the kitchen, but Goda was nowhere to be seen. The kitchen was darkly lit, and never mind the curtains, the ventilation fan wasn't even spinning. It was still cold in the room, without a hint of a flame, and of course no preparations for breakfast were taking place. Although it must not be allowed to happen, maybe Gota had overslept. Servants are humans, too. They can sometimes fail to wake up or something and be late as a result. In the rare case of that happening, it was the virtue of a servant to casually smooth the situation over so as not to cause an unsightly scene, and to make sure that their masters never even noticed that such a mistake happened in the first place. Kenon took up the receiver of the phone fitted to the wall and dialed the extension number for the room where the servant slept. Hmm? He couldn't hear that characteristic sound of a dial tone. Kenon tried picking up the receiver again, but even so, he couldn't hear the usual dial tone. He tried dialing again, but it had no apparent effect. Could it be that the lightning last night had knocked out and caused a mechanical fault and broken the internal telephone lines? The equipment in the mansion was all worn out. Kenon fully understood that even the smallest thing could have caused it to break down. Kenon gave up trying to wake him with the phone and dashed off to the room where the servants slept. Because you're always on that damn phone, <laughs> How long had she slept until? How long had it been since she had awoken and started lazily staring up at the ceiling? That vague sense of awakening was Natsuhi's usual morning experience. Her sleep was always light, and she wouldn't even be able to t sleep at all without medicine. To Natsuhi, sleeping was definitely not a happy thing. When she looked outside, she saw that it was still pouring. If she hadn't sensed a tiny amount of light, she might have mistakenly thought that it was still last night. She herself was one of the hosts, so, much, so she mustn't wake up later than her guests. Urging herself on, she raised up her body, which still hadn't completely recovered from yesterday's weariness. While she was inside the room, no one would torment her. Her headache wouldn't get any worse than it already was. This room was her only peaceful space. So when she left, it meant returning to the world of her husband's siblings probing each other's minds. Then wouldn't it be better to just stay locked up in this room forever? Natsuhi smiled bitterly at this fantasy. She was starting to sound like Kinzo. Even though most of the time she would call Kinzo names for staying locked up in his own room and taking no notice of anyone, the truth was that she actually longed to do so herself. 
Natsuhi gave her head a small shake, and her fantasy was replaced by the reawakening of her usual headache. When she reached for the doorknob, trying to leave the room, her hand touched the scorpion charm that she had hung from it before going to sleep the previous night. It was Maria's charm that Jessica had given to Natsuhi. If she remembered correctly, Jessica had said something about it having the power to repel magic, and that she should hang it from her doorknob. Maybe it was thanks to the charm that at least this room had been protected from her husband's m sibling's malice. As though she thought this, her mood began to as, as she thought this, her mood began to get a little more cheerful. So perhaps it was thanks to Jessica that I was able to get a little peaceful sleep. Then Natsuhi remembered. That's right. Last night I promised Jessica that I would give her a charm of my own in exchange for this one, didn't I? Natsuhi opened a drawer of her dresser and took out an antique accessory case that she had treasured ever since she was a child. Inside, there were many small objects that Natsuhi had thought were valuable at the time. From amidst those, she pulled out a red pouch. Inside was a small round mirror about ten centimeters across. It looked quite old, but the design on the back of the mirror was very ornate, and it felt like something with historical value. At the very least, it looked much more effective when compared to the other charm, which looked like a plastic scorpion keyholder. She had heard that this mirror was a spiritual mirror to ward off evil spirits, and she had given it specifically by she had been given it specifically by her grandmother when her father's me grandfather's mementos had been distributed. It has been believed since ancient times that strange powers dwell within mirrors. Most likely, the way they reflect light created a belief that they also deflect misfortune and malice in the same way. Natsuhi returned the mirror to its pouch. It would probably be a fitting object to hand over to Jessica. Just as she was placing it in her pocket, the sound of someone knocking on the door suddenly echoed throughout the room. Yes. Good morning, madam. It's Genji. My apologies for waking you so early. I'm coming now. What is it? No servant had ever come to her this early in the morning, and especially not directly. Maybe something bad had happened. For example, maybe some fatal oversight had been made during the preparations for breakfast, and the household would be put to shame in front of the guests or something. Natsuhi breathed out slowly, as if getting a head start on the trouble she was surely about to be told of. When she opened the door, Genji once again said a morning greeting to her while bowing deeply. Natsuhi tentatively responded. Good morning. Did something happen? My apologies. It seems the telephones are out of order due to last night's lightning. The internal lines have gone dead, so please forgive my coming to see you directly. The internal lines have gone dead? That will be troublesome. Will it be possible to repair it? I'm afraid that we don't know the location of the damage. I'd like to call an expert and have him repair it. Which means that we'll be unable to repair it until the typhoon has passed. In other words, the lines will be out of order for the remainder of our guests' stay. Will there be issues with providing them proper service? We'll do all we can to make sure there are none. Very well. I'll be counting on you to ensure that everything goes smoothly. Natsuhi let out a small sigh of relief. She had been prepared for the worst, but a telephone breakdown wasn't the kind of trouble she was worried about. But then, even though this would probably be enough to spark sarcasm from Ava, Natsuhi gave her head a light shake. Are the preparations for breakfast proceeding well? About that. We haven't been able to find Goda. The arrangements for breakfast have yet to be carried out. What did you say? Natsuhi was indignant. To her, this was a much bigger problem than the phones not working. And despite that, this piece of information was the part that had been postponed. Why did everything go well most of the time, and then come to something like this when the relatives were visiting? Natsuhi placed a hand to her forehead and shook her head sharply. Most likely he's oversleeping. Anyway, it doesn't matter who does it, just hurry with preparing breakfast. What? Natsuhi had exited into the hallway and turned around for a second to close the door to her room. The unpleasant thing that she saw there silenced her completely. It was an unsettling sight, as if someone had dipped their fingers in a dark red liquid and clawed at the area around the doorknob, as though someone had soaked both of their hands in blood and groped at the door and the knob like someone had wanted to stage something like that and left this mark as an awful prank. What, what mischief is this? How awful! I also just noticed it as I came to call you. I'll clean it later. Most likely. A vulgar joke by one of the guests. Disgusting. Truly disgusting. Who in the world would pull such a childish and disgusting prank? Natsuhi had a pretty good idea, but of course there was no proof. 
so even if she pushed the issue, it would just seem as though she was making a fuss about nothing. On the contrary, it would definitely be better for her to say that she hadn't even noticed that such a prank had been played in the first place. Natsuhi gave the order to have it cleaned, and headed off to the parlor with clacking heels. When Natsuhi and Genji arrived in the parlor, Eva and Hideyoshi were already there. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Natsuhi-san. Heard Goda-san would be making us breakfast, too, isn't that right? My stomach's been getting all excited since I woke up. <laughs> yes, food is about the only thing worth looking forward to here, isn't it? <laughs> you too, Eva-san. I'm pleased to hear that you're well this morning. Natsuhi returned Eva's gaze, which was fiercely competitive, even though it was early in the morning with a weary expression. Then Kanon jogged in. After bowing an apology to the relatives for running inside the mansion, he approached Genji and told him something in a small voice. Kanon, have you still not found Goda? My apologies, madam. I went all around the inside of the mansion in the guest house, but still... Where in the world has he gone? For now, breakfast is a higher priority than finding Goda. Quick, quickly, take care of it. Yes. Kanon glanced at Genji. It looked like he had something else to report, but needed to ask Genji whether he was the right person to say it. Genji nodded and decided to give the report himself. Madam, it's not only Goda. Your husband is also nowhere to be found. My husband? Yes. I thought I would report to him before you about the lack of preparation for breakfast and visited his room, but I did not find him there. Furthermore, it was not only he who was missing. Rudolf Sama and his wife, as well as Rosa Sama, are nowhere to be found. Not even in the guest house? And not in the mansion? Yes. Nor are they in their rooms within the guest house. When she heard that Goda alone was missing, she had thought that he might have slept in or was loafing around somewhere. But once she heard that several of the relatives were also missing, she began to start thinking a little more optimistically. Last night's family conference might have continued all night, and in fact might still be going on. It would then be ima imaginable that they had wanted to cool off their heads after being in that stuffy room. And had all gone on a group walk through the rain. I'm going into this blind but getting serious and then there were none vibes. Uh, good, uh, good thing to point out then uh, is that Ryukishi was heavily inspired by that novel when he wrote this. <laughs> The part about cooling off their heads really sounded like something Krauss would say. Probably Goda had been called to go with them to aid them in something. Goda was not a man who lost track of time. He had to understand that if he did not return, the preparations for breakfast would, not, would be hindered. So perhaps, as much as he'd like to leave, the atmosphere would not permit him to, and the conference was continuing in that manner even in this very moment. Yes, Natsuhi thought this to be an extremely persuasive theory. Natsuhi remembered the illusion that she had felt that morning of being sucked into a continuation of the previous night, and upon learning that the feeling wasn't just an illusion, she once again let out a deep, weary breath, because the banquet of the filthy vultures circling around Kinzo's property was still continuing. Most likely, they're still repeating the same discussion about the inheritance somewhere in the garden, or maybe the beach. In any case, we must call Goda back or we'll never be able to complete the preparations for breakfast. So, what are you saying? Are Nissan and the rest continuing their discussion? She had thought she'd spoken in a small voice, but Hideyoshi had overheard her and managed to grasp the situation. Nissan and Rudolph sure are tough, and maybe it's just youth in Rose's case? The two of us were so tired that we had to go back to bed after midnight. I do rem remember that Nissan and the rest were still having a heated discussion at that point. Men sure are nasty when they get excited. Natsuhi snorted, her face still blank. Kanon, search outside. If you find Goda, tell him to return immediately and begin preparations for breakfast. Certainly. Natsuhine-san, they aren't necessarily outside, right? Couldn't they also be inside Father's study? Ah, uh, sure, I could see that. I don't know what they've been discussing, but there's also a decent chance they've moved to Father's study and included him in the discussion. I cannot imagine that Father would willingly invite that detestable topic into his study. You really think so? Well, then there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry, Genji-san, canon could but could you search outside? I'm sure it wouldn't be odd for Nissan to propose that they go outside for a walk to cool their heads. Even in this weather. I'll go to Father's study. After all, there's still some chance they'll be there, isn't there? Eva-san, 
A guest like you must, mustn't trouble herself. I'll go. I can also tell him good morning. Really, then? I'm counting on you, all right? But I somehow doubt whether he'll return your greeting. Natsuhine-san, were you on good terms with father? I don't know whether it could be called good terms, but I'm certain that I've gained his trust as the wife of the successor to the Ushiramiya family. Then I'm sure he will at least he will at least answer you, won't he? I want to at least eat breakfast with father. I wonder if you could convince him to come down and join us. It seems that he thoroughly despises the rest of us, but I'm sure if his trusted Natsuhi asks, he'll surely listen. If you can't convince father after speaking to me so sharply and have to come down by yourself, I doubt you'll ever be able to say again that you have gained his trust, will you? <laughs> I'm not confident, but I'll try. Natsuhi responded, discouraged. However, knowing Kinzo's temperament, she had absolutely no confidence in her ability to bring him out. Eva herself was treating it just like a joke, expecting that it couldn't be done. But even so, Natsuhi would lose face if she gave up, said it was impossible for her, and let Eva go instead. Eva's mean-spirited and unreasonable demand caused Natsuhi's tightly clenched fist to shake. When Genji realized this, he softly spoke to her over her shoulder. Madam, if you would, please take this. Is that... Genji handed Natsuhi a sparkling gold key of ornate design. It was the key to Kinzo's study. The study would always lock itself and couldn't be unlocked as long as Kinzo forbade entrance. However, since Genji was especially trusted by Kinzo, he was allowed to carry a key to that door. But if this key is used, won't you also receive the blame? When the master is sleeping deep, deeply, simply knocking on his door may not reach his ears. And when, the persuade, when persuading master to leave his room, it would be more difficult if you must talk through that door. Please, use it. Genji. Until now, Natsuhi had thought as Gen of Genji as a cold servant who worked directly under Kinzo and would never work for her. But it looked like she would have to alter her understanding of him. She wanted to communicate her feelings of thanks, but by then Genji had already turned his back on her and was walking down the corridor with Kanon. But as Natsuhi watched them go, the words that reached her from behind were sneering. Be sure you bring father with you then, okay? After all, it's his son's darling wife who's asking. I'm sure he'll listen to you. <laughs> we are guests, so let us leisurely relax here. Quit it, Ava. You're talking too much. Sorry, but Natsuhi nae son, we'll leave father to you. Natsuhi left without replying, at a swift pace, her heels clacking loudly with every step. I have to go to the bathroom again. It will only take a second. Okay, sorry. It's just that I have to drink so much water to keep my throat uh, maintained while doing this, so, you know, it's been sending me. <clears throat> but yeah, we are like this close uh, to when I'll be able to stop, so. <clears throat> um, one possible downside of Marcy not playing with voices on is we might not get to hear ahaha.wave. I don't think so. I think ahaha.wave is counted as a sound effect, so I think it will still play. After all that excitement the previous night, there was no way anyone was going to wake up soon. George Aniki, Jessica, and I were snoring loudly on the bed in the cousin's room. But Maria, who didn't join in, and who had gone straight to bed the previous night, suddenly and completely opened her eyes. As she rubbed her sleepy eyes and looked around, the loud snoring coming from the three cousins continued. For a while, Maria had to think about what had happened. After that, she realized that her mother was no longer with her, and quickly got lonely. Maria left the cousin's room, trying to head to the room that had been arranged for her and her mother. Paying no heed to the three who were sleeping soundly, she made a loud slamming sound on the way out. 
In response, Battler mumbled and rolled over in his sleep, but it wasn't enough to wake him. After a while, Maria returned, once again opening the door with a lively bang. Hmm. When she had left the room, her face had been sleepy, but after returning, she now looked discontent. After that, she climbed up on Battler's bed, which happened to be the closest, and started yelling and jumping on it like it was a trampoline. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Wake up! Ooh, ooh. What? 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 Is it a raid? Surround them! After making sure I was awake, Maria jumped over onto George Aniki's bed and started bouncing on that, too. In that manner, the three of us were all greeted with an extremely pleasant awakening. Thanks, Maria Chan, for waking us up. You stopped us from sleeping in after that late night. But it would have been perfect if you could have just been a little more gentle. George Nissan, you really are an adult. I respect that. It's almost seven. Well, not a really bad time to wake up. Woo! <sighs> Ooh. Mama's not here. Uh -huh. Auntie Rosa? She wasn't in her room? I wonder if she's already woken up and gone to the mansion. She's not here! Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mama! Uh -huh. Maria kept groaning, ooh, ooh, and looked unhappy. It seemed like she wasn't simply lonely because she couldn't find her mother, but actually unhappy because her mother wasn't in the place she thought she was, and this made her feel like she'd been tricked. If we could, could have just told her where her mother was, that might be enough to satisfy her. But unfortunately, as long as we were here, we had no way of finding that out. How old is the child? Maria is nine. Uh, marathon effort, Marcy, nine hours and counting. Thank you so much, Horse Fry. I appreciate it. We're going to get there. We're going to get to the moment, and then I will be able to rest. And then you will have to stew on it. Uh, people who have not read Umineko before, you will have to stew on that moment until I decide to do the next stream. <laughs> it's time for breakfast anyway, so let's head over to the mansion. Good idea. Maria, let's go to the mansion together, okay? I'm sure Auntie Rosa will be over there too. Hmm? Mama's in the mansion? Then I'll go. Oh. That's what... Right. Let's go to the mansion. Our parents have probably already gone there. Maria regained her usual composure, as though her earlier temper had never happened. We got dressed, left the room, and headed for the mansion. The door to the study was once again knocked upon, but there was no answer. He was still sleeping, and she couldn't wake him. If she returned downstairs saying something like that, Ava would be very amused and triumphant. When does the next Umineko stream begin? When does the previous one end? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all a loop. <coughs> it's all an Ouroboros. Uh, do you think many streams will go this late? Because this is pleasant to wake up to. Um, I don't think so, probably. This is kind of a special case because I began this stream knowing exactly where I wanted to end it. It just happens to be later than I thought it would take me to get to. <laughs> And even aside from the whole Ava issue, was the, there was the problem that yesterday, during this once-a-year family conference, he had stayed locked up all day and had still not come out to greet the guest. Even though he was the head, no, especially because he was the head, he couldn't fail to make an appearance. Could she convince him? Natsuhi readied herself and, using the key that she had borrowed from Genji, opened the door. I mean, you say that, uninspired man. It's, it's kind of the vibe that I was going for a little bit. A sweet stench that seemed to be eaten into her brain poured from the narrow opening she had created, and though she was prepared for it, she couldn't help but grimace. Thinking that he might still be sleeping, Natsuhi entered the room quietly. When she did, Kinzo, already awake, was looking down out of the window. So you're awake. Good morning. How did you get in? Kinzo spoke with his back still facing her. His vo voice was not harsh, but calm, and Natsuhi was slightly reassured. However, he was at least in a bad enough mood that he had ignored the sound of all that knocking even though he had been awake. Natsuhi wasn't able to break the tension. My sincere apologies. I asked Genji-san and he allowed me to borrow the key to the study. Hmm. Genji did. If my friend thought it was that important, then I have no choice but to listen. 
$10 Prince Violet. Thank you for this. My partner wanted to get into Umineko for years, but has trouble focusing on reading text, so he really appreciates your reading everything else so he can listen in the background. Thank you so much. I'm glad that uh, I can help anybody get into Umineko. It's one of my favorite things ever. Despite the flaws that we have brought up over the course of this stream, it really is like something very near and dear to my heart. So the fact that I can share it with people um, and help them get into it more easily is something that I am very happy to be able to do. Tell me, what business do you have? Yes, breakfast will soon be prepared, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would join us. I will eat here. Have it brought here as always. But father, this is the annual family conference. Please, at least let them see your face. You may you ask me to go downstairs and join in on the, on the discussion of how my her inheritance is to be chewed apart after I die. How oh, foolish. They can keep talking about that kind of thing as much as they like without me. And if that's what you call a family conference, it's nothing so important that I should leave my room for it. I'm busy. Do not bother me. With his last words came the threat that any further questions would be useless. Natsuhi realized that adding any further pleas would finally bring his wrath down upon her. It would be annoying to hear Eva sarcastically say that she hadn't been able to convince him after all, but there was nothing more Natsuhi could do. Is that so? Understood. I'm sure that everyone will be sorry to hear it, but I will tell them. Natsuhi decided to give up. Bowing silently, she made to leave the room before Kinzo's spasmodic temper could fire up. As she did, Kinzo called out to her. Compared to the usual Kinzo, this voice was calm and gentle, like it came from another person. Natsuhi, it's been quite some time since you married into the Ashirimiya family. Yes. It's been a while since I was first permitted to bear the name of Shiramiya. Do you sometimes long for your previous family? No. Marriage means throwing away your parents' family. I am a Shiramiya Natsuhi. If I have a family to return to, or to reminisce over, it is only the Shiramiya family. It was definitely not an exaggeration. Such was the level of Natsuhi's resolve in calling herself an Shiramiya. That was why she was so sorrowful that despite all of her effort, it had been fruitless, and she was not even accepted by her husband. If Kraus had been a woman, and you had been a husband... No, I won't say that. Um, it's not necessarily that they made her cut off her birth family, no. There are just some interesting circumstances going on that we won't hear about for a very, very long time. <laughs> what do you mean by that, father? Natsuhi was shocked. If Kinzo's words just now had been meant literally, they would have been more than enough to make up for all she had suffered up to that point. Forget it. It's just the nonsense of an old man. Kinzo once again faced away from her. He had told her to forget it, but Natsuhi couldn't help feeling a warmth in her heart. Father, even though I'm not connected to you by blood, I'm still your daughter. The honor and the glory of the Ashirimiya family, and everything that you have left, I guarantee you I will see it protected myself. You do not have the qualifications to wear the one-winged eagle. However, the one-winged eagle is surely engraved in your heart. In that case, you're unmistakably my blood relative, and one who will inherit the glory of the Ashiramiya family. Some will sneer that there is no eagle on your clothes. However, that is nothing to lend an ear to. Only to those who hold the eagle in their hearts are my true blood relatives. I now believe it an honor that I was able to welcome you into the Ashiramiya family. Without saying anything more, Kinzo remained with his back to Natsuhe. However, Natsuhi couldn't help but feel something warm well up inside of her that she hadn't felt since long ago, when she had been just a child. Natsuhi bowed silently to his back and left the room. Ah, what perfect timing. How is father? You were taking so long I came to check, you see. When Natsuhi left the study, she saw Ava climbing the stairs and their eyes met. Eva was smirking unpleasantly, thinking that Natsuhi had just left the room trudgingly after failing to convince Kinzo. However, the way Natsuhi was now, such a frivolous laugh would not disturb her. She was not permitted to wear the family crest on her clothing, but she was permitted to wear it in her heart. So she spoke calmly, clearly, and confidently, with the dignity of one who would protect the glory of the Ashiramiya family. 
Father said that he would not join in on the family conference. He says that he has no interest in such an obscene topic. Yes, yes, excuses, excuses. If you weren't able to persuade Father, say so frankly. How pitiful. I'm beginning to understand Father's feelings of regret. What, what do you mean by that? Natsuhi did not answer. Just as Kinzo had done earlier, she showed Ava her back as she headed down the stairs. Struggling to gather what had happened, Ava could only determine that she had been made fun of and that something had happened to quickly bolster Natsuhi's confidence. Even so, she didn't have the courage to risk Kinzo's wrath. Unable to even knock on the door, she could only scratch at the air in front of it, cluck her tongue, and follow after Natsuhi. So were Nissan and the rest there? Did Father tell you about them? I didn't get the chance to ask, but they were not inside the study. Father would never let them into his room to discuss such a lowly topic, so it's unlikely that he knows where they went. Let us go downstairs and wait for the servants to return from their search. Breakfast may be late, but how about some tea, Ibiza? I'll be fine. Ava couldn't hide her confusion over the complete difference in Natsuhi's demeanor. She was acting so boldly, and while Ava hated to admit it, she even had a sense of dignity about her. Unable to find fault with anything, she could only follow Natsuhi back to the parlor. When the two of them returned to the parlor, not only Hideyoshi, but the four children and Nanjo as well had gathered there. Genji, who had been talking with Hideyoshi, reported the current situation when he noticed that Natsuhi had returned. You still have not found my husband in the rest. Yes, my apologies. Also, Kumasawa has begun preparations for breakfast. She said that she'll need just a little while longer. The clock read a little past 8 a.m. 8 o'clock was the time the breakfast was supposed to have started. The mere fact that the hosts had gone over that time limit was a disgrace under normal circumstances. Kanon is now searching outside. Furthermore, no one has seen Shannon. Even Shannon? Honestly, how many people has my husband taken on this walk of his? How many people couldn't be found? With the number of people having grown so large, it was starting to feel truly unpleasant, as though they were on the only ones being left out on something interesting. At the very least, it looked like the children, no, Maria especially, felt the same way. She was indignant, her stomach rum grumbling, almost as though her mother and the others had left her alone to go off and eat something delicious without her. Trying to fix her bad mood, the other children were flipping through the channels on the television, trying to find a program that might interest Maria. Nanjo was sitting on the sofa, gazing blissfully at the children while reading a book. No doubt it was a book about chess. The sound of footsteps came rushing toward them with a pitter-patter. There was only one set, so they realized before they saw the source that it was not Krauss and the rest, but probably Canon. Madam, excuse me. Judging by your appearance, you still haven't been able to find them? My apologies. I still... That will be enough. You've worked hard. She didn't know where they were, but they had to be somewhere on this island. They hadn't put anything in their mouths since last night, so their stomachs must be growling about now. They would surely saunter in any time now. Natsuhi was already dumbfounded, and she began to think that there was nothing... that there was no urgent need to find them right there. Right then... I will go to the kitchen to prepare some tea for all of our guests. Thanks to both of you for all of your hard work so early in the morning. Natsuhi, acting as though the release in tension had caused a new surge in her headache, left the parlor. Kanon Canon tried to call her as she left, but Natsuhi departed swiftly. What is it? Was there something else? Yes. I was unable to find her husband or anyone else, but... Um... Kanon sounded evasive. He still didn't know where they were, but maybe he had found something with some relation to that. When Eva and Hideyoshi noticed this exchange of words, they came over. They had probably noticed a slight strange way Kanon was acting. What's going on, Kanon kun Did you find Kraus Nissan and the others? Actually, something looked odd about the Rose Garden storehouse. Something looked odd? What do you mean by that? It was, um... How should I explain it? Kanon once again hesitated. He wasn't speaking anything like you'd expect from the usually fearless Kanon. Eva and Hideyoshi exchanged quizzical looks at this display. What do you mean? You don't mean to say they're inside the storehouse? No, I'm going to inspect the inside now. I was just returning to get the key, but... Um... I don't really get it, but it sounds like we just gotta investigate inside, right? Where's the key to that storehouse? It's in the servant room. Let us check inside the storehouse immediately. <laughs> Kanon dashed, dashed off to the servant room and returned with the key. Genji left the parlor saying he would go check, but Eva and Hideyoshi had also followed. 
What was this something odd about the storehouse that had caused the usually fearless Canon to hesitate? It was still pouring outside, but their curiosity over this something that Canon couldn't talk about had won out. When the children, while the children made a big fuss watching television, Canon and the rest dashed off to the entrance. The Rose Garden storehouse was a place that housed various tools used to manage the garden. It was definitely not a pretty building. Because of its appearance, it had been built hidden in the corner of the Rose Garden. Kenon, Genji, Eva, and Hideyoshi came cr cutting across the Rose Garden, holding umbrellas. They entered a small path just off the Rose Garden, which was not used by those simply appreciating the garden, but only by those maintaining it. As they dashed further along it, the front of the storehouse came into view. It was a very odd sh old shed of a storehouse, and compared to the flawlessly perfect beauty of the Rose Garden, it was pretty seedy looking. It was easy to understand why it had been built in a hard-to-see place. Eva and Hideyoshi arrived at the storehouse long after Kanon and Genji. <sighs> you two sure are fast! Thought my heart was gonna explode. I guess they did build a storehouse over here. But what? what is that? When Eva looked at where Kanon was pointing, she was at a loss for words. Noticing this, Hideyoshi also followed Kanon's finger and was likewise too shocked to speak. The entrance to the storehouse was kind of a shudder. And there... Everyone there now understood why Kanon had been unable to find words that could only describe what he saw. On the shutter, which was completely filthy from being exposed to wind and rain for so long, plastered on it. Something that looked like a strange, dark red... liquid? Mucus? Or maybe it was some sticky paint. Some kind of ghastly substance had been used to draw an indescribably eerie shape. The rain had caused it to drip down in several places, like fresh blood leaking from an open wound. There was no longer any point in being choosy with words. A ghastly dark red substance, meant to look like blood had been used to draw some kind of figure or mark, intended to suggest something ominous. Two concentric circles were drawn there, and inside them was a design that looked like a cross. The four ends of the cross were widely exaggerated, and it looked like some kind of crest from somewhere around Europe. And in the cracks between these shapes, written closely packed together were some unfamiliar characters, or possibly symbols. What a vulgar bit of graffiti. Could this be one of those... Oh, one of those magic circles used in demonic rituals? With reference to this ghastly shape, drawn with a deep red dripping substance, Hideyoshi's comparison was not unreasonable. When was this drawn? Last night. I came here before it started raining, but there was nothing drawn here at that time. We must do something before anyone else sees this. If they laid eyes upon it, it will cause them great, dis great discomfort. That's right. Even though it's just a shed, I don't want to leave such an unpleasant scribble untouched for even one second. There's some paint inside the storehouse. Let us paint over it temporarily as an emergency measure. Then repaint it again someday when the weather is good. Genji remembered that he had recently seen another piece of graffiti, and that it, too, had been made with a strange dark red substance of the same color as this. That must have been... That's right. He had seen it on the door to Natsuhi's room. Kanonkun, let's remove this graffiti quickly in return, all right? Even though it's just a storehouse, it's really irritating to have graffiti around the home I was brought up in. Yes, I'll take care of it immediately. Kanon squatted in front of the shutter and unlocked it. He then lifted it up with all of his strength. A boisterous noise resounded, and the eerie shape drawn on the shutter began to get sucked in through the top as the shutter was raised. At least for the time being, that ominous thing disappeared from their direct gaze, and they all breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks to a kid's program that they had come across, Maria was feeling much better. Battler and Jessica were making fun of the kid's program at every turn, cackling. George was enjoying the program along with Maria. Nanjo sat on a sofa by himself, passing the time by reading quietly. They heard hurried footsteps coming from the hallway. They were footsteps from a single person. Did that mean that it wasn't the group of four that had just left? Genji was the only one who had returned. 
It was very rare for Genji, who considered being out of breath a violation of a servant's virtues, to be gasping for air. He had probably come dashing back from outside the mansion. His shoulders were soaking wet, and he didn't have his usual smart appearance. When Genji noticed Nanjo looking at him, he gave a small, silent bow and quickly approached him. Dr. Nanjo, my apologies. Please, come with me, quickly. What, what has happened? As Genji whispered something into Nanjo's ear, Nanjo's face changed color. He stood from the sofa, trying not to be noticed by the children who were still engrossed by the TV, and the two of them rapidly left the parlor, muffling their footsteps. Just as they were leaving the parlor, they came across Natsuhi, who was pushing a serving cart loaded with a tea set. Genji whispered something into Natsuhi's ear, and Natsuhi's face too changed color, shocked. Then, leaving the serving cart where it was, the three of them started dashing towards the entrance. George noticed them running down the rose garden through the window. What is this? Genji-san and Dr. Nanjo, and, and that's how Natsuhi, isn't it? What's up, Aniki? Maybe something has happened. They look horribly flustered. Jessica and Maria also noticed that something had happened from the fact that Eva, Hideyoshi, and Nanjo were no longer in their seats, and because the serving cart had been abandoned at the entrance to the parlor. Could there have been some kind of accident? Let's go check it out. It's no fun if we're the only ones left out, right? <laughs> For some reason, what Battler said sounded extremely indiscreet, but they couldn't deny that they were a little insecure and concerned after seeing the adults run off into the rain disregarding their appearance. Let's check it out, all right? I do. I need to know what's happened. Jessica's insecure words spoke for all of them. Hey, Maria, you coming too? Or will you watch TV? Oh, want to watch TV. Oh. Then the rest of us will go by ourselves. Maria Chun will be back soon. Stay here watching TV. Oh. By the time the kids went outside, they had lost sight of the adults who had left earlier but it looked like Jessica had a pretty good idea of where they had gone from the direction they had been running. Following Jessica, they ran through the rain-soaked rose garden. It felt like the wind suddenly got stronger. The malicious sound of thunder began to ring out like it had the previous night. It felt like something eerie had surrounded the island and was trying to stop them from moving forward. Jessica, what's over this way? I'm pretty sure there's a storehouse for gardening tools or something. What in the world could be in a place like that? Just as Jessica had said, a storehouse came into view in front of them. They could also see the adults there. The shutter to the storehouse was open, and several of the adults looked as though they were searching for something. For some reason, only Natsuhi was inside the storehouse, outside the storehouse, not even holding an umbrella. She was facing away from them, and it looked like she was hanging her head. The ones who had just left, Genji, Nanjo, Natsuhi, and the ones who had left before them, Kanon, Eva, and Hideyoshi, made this a large gathering of people, but there was absolutely no bustle of activity. When Natsuhi realized that the children had come, a terrible expression rose to her face, and she ran at them with her arms spread wide. Don't come over here! Go back to the mansion! However, no, because of that, the kids saw the scene which Natsuhi was trying to keep them away from. Inside the storehouse, with the shutter wide open, a flickering fluorescent light shone down, and over there... Ah! Jessica's piercing shriek rang out, but that was just because Jessica's scream was the loudest. The same thing spilled out of Battler and George's mouths as well. Ava, just like Natsuhi, spread her arms and with a terrible expression roared at the kids. George, take everyone and return to the mansion! Now! Quickly! Right now! When Natsuhi had spread her arms, one might have thought she was trying to prevent them from advancing any further. <laughs> Miku Miku Kumaida dancing to Golden Slaughterer. Thank you, Kamikaze, for the donation. Really appreciate it. Golden Slaughterer, baby! One of the best tracks in the whole series! However, right now, that wasn't why Eva was spreading her arms. She was trying to hide that terrible scene from the kids. It was her mother's heart, trying to protect the eyes and hearts of us children by attempting to block our view of that terrible scene by at least the width of one of her arms. Is this some kind of check? Is it? I had seen this kind of cheap scene all too often in manga, TV, anime, and movies. I had seen it over and over again. This was just... Just seeing something appear in real life that I had seen plenty of times before in some of those more sensational movies, wasn't it? 
That alone shouldn't... But that's soon. It's that old bastard, isn't it? I get him. And that's Uncle Kraus. And curious son. And Auntie Rose. <laughs> Dad! Dad! You mustn't, Jessica! You mustn't go in! You mustn't look! Dad! Dad! <laughs> Rigor mortis has set in across the entire body. Probably at least six hours have passed since death. As far as I can tell by looking at the damaged area, there's a high probability that they were damaged after their deaths. No, I must watch what I say. I'm a general practitioner examining corpses is outside my area of expertise. So what does this mean? Just to kill them wasn't enough? So they went on to do something like this? The devil! This here's a work of the devil! But Natsuhi caught Jessica in her arms. Nanti Eva caught George Aniki. So I was the only one who could approach the entrance to the storehouse. If only there had been someone here to catch me too. I wouldn't have needed to have this horrible, evil scene burned into my eyes. No, that's not it. I'm standing here not because the people who wouldn't catch me aren't here. Because the people who would catch me are right here. Just as Jessica had said, it did look like a storehouse used to keep gardening tools. A lawnmower and its replacement blades. A grass sickle and a hammer. A saw and some construction tools, piled up potted plants and bags of fertilizer. I'm treated just the same. The corpses of several people have been laid to rest there. No, had been thrown in there. I could tell them by their clothes. That old bastard and curious son, Uncle Krauss and Auntie Rosa, further back go to son. There's still more of them. How many people died? Fucking hell, I can't even count them on one hand! Go fucking damn it! I didn't know whether it had been one of those gardening tools which if used for something other than their intended purpose could definitely be wielded with a naked brutality, or whether some horrible tool had been brought in here specifically for this. Whatever the case, the bodies lying about here, each of them, have been given an atrocious makeover. This isn't a damn makeover, this is more like... Their faces have been plowed! Faces were smashed, forced into an expression that a normal person couldn't even make after death. I couldn't tell where the eyes or the nose were, but I, I could find the mouths because it was gaping wide with the ridges of the teeth exposed. But the front teeth were missing, and even the cheek that should have covered that wall was torn and exposed. Stylish makeup that you spent way too much time fussing over for a guy. No help at all. <laughs> Dad! Sure, I always thought you were going to hell, but you weren't this bad, right? You weren't such a son of a bitch to have this done to you. I'm curious, huh? Oh God, didn't I tell you to stop going out with this guy? There was no reason. You had to go through this as well. There's no face. There's no fucking face. Shit! 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 Adler, son, you mustn't look anymore. There's no way that your mother and father would want you to see them like this. For your mother and your father's sake, you mustn't look anymore. Dead people are supposed to have faces that look like they're sleeping peacefully, aren't they? There's no face. My dad and curious son have no faces. I don't even know what kind of faces they were wearing when they died. What the hell am I meant to do? Are you telling me that I have to see these mangled monstrous faces every time I remember Dad and the rest? Oh, that's perfect. Because I didn't even want to remember that old bastard's smug face anyway. This is perfect. Perfect! You know, my curious son's face as well. Curious son wasn't a bastard. I sometimes got a little sick of her, but... She was a little cool, just like a big sister to me. She didn't deserve this. She didn't deserve this. At least Uncle Krause is better, isn't he? It's not his whole face, just the sides. He at least has half of his fucking face left. Better than this. Better than this. No! Trying to shut out my reckless words, Jessica tried to feel her ears with 
the sound of her own screaming. Stop it, Babakun! Just stop it! Stop it! I'm gonna kill <laughs> Disregarding age and appearance, I fell to my knees, clinging to Aniki's waist and sobbing. It was, as if crying behalf it was as if crying on behalf of everyone here. Representing the feelings of everyone there, I screamed over and over. Whew. Yeah, I'm okay. <clears throat> We're almost to the end of this scene, so I will almost be able to end in just a few minutes. Father. The ones who... Who are lying over there are Uncle Kraus, Uncle Rudolph, Auntie Kyrie, Auntie Rosa, Godasan. Five people? No. Six. There's uh, one more here. The body that Hideyoshi was looking down on now was hidden in the shadow of a mountain of random objects and a blind spot to George who stood by the entrance. So George couldn't tell whose body it was. Therefore, George cursed himself. He cursed that part of himself that imagines the worst and is always right. So, one lying at your feet is... Shannon, isn't it? Yes, it's Shannon, John. George was completely silent. He shook slightly, his lower lip trembling. He wanted to run up to his beloved, screaming and crying, but before rashly running up to her, he mustered all of his strength and asked his father. And then also, it's the same as Uncle Cross and the others. <laughs> Hideyoshi deeply understood the meaning of those words. So he couldn't give George a quick answer. No, he thought that to George right now that was the only possible sincere and loving response. When George had asked whether she was the same, he had meant to ask whether her corpse was the same as the others. Since Hideyoshi hadn't denied it, it meant that the body was just as horrible. Can I... Can I get you? No, you can't. Why? After all, I won't be able to see Shannon's face again, right? Why can't I see Less face? The last time you met Shannon, John, was yesterday. Yes. I see. When you left her, what kind of face was she showing you? It was a wonderful smile. After receiving the ring, she was bewildered even though her heart should have been decided, bashful, and so embarrassed to show him that face that she ran away. That expression was revived in George's mind. I see. But I'm sure Shannon John would also have wished to leave you with that smile. Hideyoshi looked down upon Shannon's body lying at his feet. Just like the other bodies, it was in such a horrible state that it would make anyone want to cover their eyes. Half of the face had been smashed off, and no more than half of her expression remained. If that remaining half, soaked red with blood, had been wiped clean, that graceful, smiling face might have peeked out. Only half of it. Without thinking, Hideyoshi slapped his hands over his eyes. How cruel. If only all of it had been crushed. If they were going to crush it, then he might have been able to deceive George's heart for a while by saying that it was just someone else wearing Shannon's clothes. Yet, they had left half of her face. It caused the body so much humiliation, and also made it clear that this body was none other than Shannon. How inhuman. How monstrous. There, at Hideyoshi's feet, trying his best to burn the image of the remaining half of Shannon's expression into his eyes, was Canon. K 
Kenon was not crying. Tears had risen to his eyes, but they did not drip down. But that didn't mean that he wasn't feeling as much sadness as everyone else. Losing Shannon, who had lived with him in the gospel house, whom he had loved as a sister, it must have been the same as losing a blood relative. George, I'm sure Shannon Chun would be grateful. <laughs> she wouldn't want you to see her like this. I'm sure she'd be thanking you for staying strong. I understand. I understand, Father. I understand. George leaned against the outside wall of the storehouse, sinking down powerlessly. Father, I have a request. What is it? I want you to look for me on Shannon's finger. Is there a ring? A ring? Let me see. Hideyoshi, Hideyoshi crouched down. As he did, Kanon silently pointed to one of Shannon's hands. Yeah, there is. It's a diamond ring. Not a chip diamond. Must have been pretty expensive. And which hand? Which finger is it on? Hmm. The ring finger of her left hand. I see. So Shannon John was engaged. George, you couldn't have... Ava, right now that doesn't matter. A man made a lifelong promise to Shannon John. A man promised her happiness for life. It doesn't matter who it was. Being told that by a man, it's a woman's dream, isn't it? I don't know when she received this ring. I also don't know who gave it to her. But, even so, Shannon Chan took this ring. And she accepted it and put it on her left ring finger. I'm sure the man who gave it to her was happy too. To most of the people there, Hideyoshi was simply disturbed by this extraordinary situation and was blurting out strange things. But, to those who really knew the truth about George and Shannon's relationship, everything he said made sense. I see. Thank you, Father. No, yeah, it does suck that I can't find this cute. Um, I, I do find, like, Hideyoshi's, like, consolement very touching, though. Um, disregarding the uncomfortable aspects of the relationship being mentioned. George stood up. The traces of tears still streaked his face, but his expression retur had returned to its usual calm. Let's go. Father, come. Jessica Chan. If we stay here any longer, we'll get in the way of the adults. <laughs> right. Jessica sniffled once, and trying to say that she was all right, she showed her face to her mother, who had been holding her the entire time. When she faced George again, she once again had her usual face. Although she couldn't recover, still couldn't recover her smile. Butler, don't lose heart. Butler kept on crouching in front of his parents' bodies. I'm sorry. It took this much crying to calm me down. You bastard. Dad. I bet you're laughing at me. I'm always talking shit about you. Crying then crying like a baby just because you died. It's not my fault. It's wired into our genes to cry when our parents die. Butler's face was still bright red from the tears, but even though it was forced, he had at least recovered enough to fake a smile. Kenon, you mustn't remain here any longer either. Take the children and return to the mansion. Natsui, unable to take a step into the storehouse, had been standing under the rain the whole time. Maybe she had her own way of grieving, different from Butler's. She had realized that to take on a sense of responsibility now that her husband was dead. So she she had to take on a responsibility, yeah. So she had gave Canon those orders. Yes, madam. Canon rose silently and turned to face them. His face was pure white, almost as though his own heart had died alongside Shannon. 
there was no life in his expression. If during the course of a normal day he had been instructed to do a tour of the be beautiful rose garden, Canon may have led the way for them. But now there was no distinction between Canon and the children. They were just now kids, about the same age, with the wounds of having lost someone close to them. After seeing the children go back, Natsuhi gave orders to Genji. Genji, contact the police immediately. They probably won't be able to, do, to come until the typhoon passes, but they should be able to tell us about what to do next. Understood. There's an emergency radio, so I'll use that to contact them. When she heard that, Natsuhi remembered. That's right. The telephones were out today, weren't they? However, since it had already been assumed that there could be trouble with the phones on this isolated island, a radio had been installed. Anyway, let's contact the police and seek their instructions. Everything else can wait. Dr. Nanjo, is there anything, anything further you can do here? Unfortunately, I cannot do anything. Understood. Genji, could you at least cover their faces with something? Exposing them like this is humiliating to them as well. Yes. Genji picks up several, picked up several towels hanging inside the storeroom. When Ava stopped him in a shrill voice, Wait a second. Stop. This is the scene of a crime, isn't it? Then we can't disturb it. In our confusion, we've tracked muddy footprints all over the scene, and I'm sure that that will have caused trouble for the police's investigation. Natsuhi glared at Ava testily. Objectively speaking, Ava was right. Even so, she glared at Ava as though accusing her of refusing to do those tragic corpses, which had been humiliated even after death, the simple kindness of covering their faces. However, Ava had spoken both calmly and correctly. This horrible state was definitely not an accident. It was a crime. Someone had killed them. It was a murder case. In that case, they should be careful not to disturb, further disturb the site. They had to aid the police as much as possible so that they might hand over a clue that could be used to find the detestable culprit. I agree with Ava, sir. Until the police come, we should leave everything be. What do you say, madam? You're right. Understood. Close it up. And just in case, we should put a different lock on it. A different lock? Yes. When we came here, the shutter was locked. That means the culprit used the key from the shutter to lock it. That makes a lot of sense. Then does that mean the key which opens this shutter will have the killer's fingerprints? Okay, they're just, I, I was waiting for there to be like a scene transition, but I don't think there's going to be one until like a minute from now. And I'm tired. <laughs> I have been going for so long. <laughs> so, I think that means we've had about enough for now. Like I said, I am leaving you to stew in the most uh, wild shit that has just happened. So for those of you who have never read, read Umineko before and stuck around for this whole thing, I hope you've appreciated <laughs> my stamina and I hope you've enjoyed this so far. I don't have a specific date for whenever uh, the next stream will be, but uh, you will be seeing it. So thank you all for watching. This was a time. <laughs> And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, everybody, and I will see you later. Bye!